Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. I don't know about you, but to me... There is no story with a deeper fascination and compelling attraction than one about a haunted house. No matter how often the bells are rung, there is an infinite variety in the changes. The possible musical combinations in a scale of eight notes are not infinite, but they are wide enough and complex enough to provide more variety than most of us will encounter in a lifetime. We were on our way back to America, but some way down the road, the bridge is out. Ah, tis a most annoying bridge it is. One day there, and then the other nowhere. There there must be some way so my daughter and I can continue south. Now, there is a strange thing entirely. Do you know that that's the only bridge that exists anymore? You mean we're... Trapped in this old ruin of a house or castle or whatever it is. As to that, it's up to your honor and herself. Who who are you and what are you? Now that's something else for you to judge. Our mystery drama, A Very Dear Ghost Indeed was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Russell Horton and Court Benson. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule. I'll be back shortly with Act One. In 1898, the world was a remarkably stable place. In the fall of that year, Mr. William Donovan and his daughter Constance lived through an experience which was to mark the rest of their lives. An experience sheerly accidental and coincidental. Or was it? Well, it's Mr. Donovan's story, not mine, so let him tell it. In the autumn of that last year of the 19th century, business had brought me to Europe and the British Isles. Having traveled so far, and my only daughter being with me, a sudden fancy had taken me to visit the island of my forebears. So it was that Constance and I, having hired a small chaise in preference to taking the public stagecoach, first saw Carrick Moran from high in the mountains, on the way from Limerick. To Cork. Oh, look, Papa. That lovely big old house, bald in the clearing in the forest, halfway there down the mountain. Isn't it magnificent? With all its turrets and battlements and buttresses. Well, it may have been once, Constance, my dear. <gasps> What's the matter, dear? Oh, 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 nothing, Papa. I, I'm sorry. It just went out of sight. Good heavens, daughter. Don't startle me like that. What? What went out of sight? The castle. But suddenly there was a, a sort of patch of mist came drifting, and the, the whole building seemed to dissolve and disappear into the trees. <laughs> what a romantic you are, my dear. <laughs> Don't you suppose it, it could be haunted or, or some fairy castle like King Arthur? 
Well, we're a long way from Camelot. Oh, but we're in the Emerald Isle. The home of bogies and banshees and leprechauns and all kinds of strange magical things. Oh, thank heavens we haven't run into any of them so far. Oh, well, there's the little village. You can see it again. Isn't it quaint? Hmm. What happened to your magic castle? Well, we must be down about level with it. I do wish we'd be able to see it up close, and then we... What is it? Oh, confound it. Look, that sign. God save you, travelers all. Don't try to cross the bridge. Tis dangerous for both man and beast. Oh, damnation. If we can't get across the gorge here, well, let's take this road, turning off to the right. <gasps> Castle Carrick Moran, it says. So it really exists. What do you mean? Well, it, it must be that wonderful old building we saw from higher up in among the trees there. Well, I suppose we haven't much choice. It's the only other road. There must be a bridge of some sort there. Oh, Papa. Suppose there was no place else and we had to spend the night in that lovely old ruin. Now, don't be ridiculous, Constance. We're on the doorstep of the 20th century. Even in this out-of-the-way place, there are some forms of communication. Well, I'm sure you'll handle it, Papa. <laughs> You're always so resourceful. Oh, but it's all terribly romantic and exciting. I have the strangest feeling we're somehow lost in a whole world of yesterday. <laughs> I don't know. Silly horse doesn't want to go through the gates. Is it so far to the house, do you think? Well, it's hard to determine with all these trees shadowing us. I, I wouldn't mind a little walk. Oh, we haven't much choice. There isn't any other road. I'm sorry, my dear. I'll tether the horse to the hitching post and let's head for your castle and see if it can produce some magic for us. <laughs> It was a surprisingly long walk through that winding, tree-shadowed lane, like some strange expedition on the bottom of the ocean, so overgrown and darkly shadowed was the carriage path. The house itself, seen close to, was a further, almost chilling shock, all overgrown with vines and lichens. The stones half collapsed on themselves, the mortar dry, crumbling, and running to powdered dust. There was about it a smell of decay, of damp fern and creeping moss, a fetid odor of the dead. The bell pull produced a cracked, rusted sound which brought no answer. We might have abandoned it all. Except that suddenly, out of the darkening mountains, came a driving rainstorm with low, grumbling thunder in the not-so-far distance. There isn't much question it's a deserted ruin, Constance. But still, until this rain has passed, we're more or less sequestered here. Pop, couldn't we go in out of the rain? And I must admit, this portico offers little protection from the weather. Let's see. <laughs> Hanging in the hall, and the, the dust on the floor is undisturbed. Yes. <clears throat> well, I doubt if we'll find much help here for our flight. Uh, we better get back to the chairs. Oh, can't we explore it just a little? No, it's, it, it's, it's far too dangerous. Dangerous? Well, the how? floors are half rotten, my dear, and I don't know how much I'd trust any of the ceilings. Little on the cross beams. Oh, is that all? Uh, what does that mean? I thought... No, it's silly. I just thought you were worried about all the other things. What other things? Well, the things I can't put into words that I feel sort of swirling around me. Voices from the past calling, trying to reach me. Voices from the past? <laughs> Why should they want to speak to you? I don't know. Ooh, it's a creepy sort of feeling. 
somehow we're meant to be here. There's something about this place that we ought to know. What on earth is there here that we have business with or ought to know? Well, maybe no. It's myself could answer that for you. At the strange, crackled, young old voice, we both of us looked up in sudden shock. Halfway up the great curving oaken staircase in a window niche, darkened by the storm outside, sat a small hook-shouldered man in a dress of bygone days. He was all in green, save for his square, buckled black shoes. And he wore a truncated conical hat with a wide brim that shadowed his face. Now, suddenly, using a little walking stick to support himself, he hopped down and came to us, saying, uh, Is there some way now I could be of service? Well, uh, my daughter and myself were on our way to Cork. Uh, some way down the road, the, the, the bridge is out. Ah, uh, tis a most annoying bridge there, so it is. The one day there, the other nowhere. Uh, yes, but... There must be some other somewhere so we can continue south. Do you know that is the only bridge exists anymore? You mean we're trapped? We ought to go back to the main route and back over all those mountains or we wait till the bridge on the main route is repaired? Wait, well, now as to that, it's up to your honor and uh, her sense. If you was to ask me... Well, uh, let, let's put it that I'm asking you. Well, then, I would trust the folk here about that the bridge would get put back to itself before the posterior of the day, as you might say. And in the meanwhile, what would you suggest? Why, as to that, it's up to your honor. With an hour or two to while away, you might be interested in a bit of the history of Carrick Moran. Better <laughs> to make a lean purse a little fatter. It could make interest in this. Uh, could we... Uh, oh, forgive me, Papa. C could I see your purse? <laughs> sure. Little fear I have of showing what has a smart interest. <laughs> there it is, then, for honest work. <gasps> a shilling. Ah, uh, so it is. All oh, that's there. But if I took it from you, it would make no difference. Another one would take its place. <laughs> sure and all, you'd have me with one shoe in my hand is all. I'd busy remaking it at the same time. What are you two talking about? I think your daughter, if she be so, takes me, perhaps, for a leprechaun. <laughs> and what are you? Oh, just what I see, God save you then. A man minding his own business till you stumbled in in my privacy. Oh, Forgive us. Ah, sure, Makushna, though it came on us, I'm not one bit ungrateful for the invasion, do you see? Ah, you're not one to go out in that. With the weather what it is, maybe you'd like to perhaps hear the legend of Carrick Moran? <gasps> oh, yes. You have my daughter completely under your spell, Mr. Uh... <laughs> I don't believe we've exchanged names or cards. Ah, there's no need for formalities here. We're all children of the fates. Twas all ordained, eh? Hmm? Hmm? So, hear my story now. Indulge an older man. Uh, what would you guess my years to be then, sir? <clears throat> well, it's hard to say. Um, the 50s? Middle, perhaps. Oh, yeah, yeah. A long, long span of years beyond that. <laughs> And a long, long span still to go. I've a way of thinking you were led to this door. And that what I have to tell you may affect the rest of your days. <laughs> William Donovan does not entirely share his daughter's eager expectancy. He eyes his unexpected host with a much more puzzled eye. Who is he? And what is he? And some uneasy twinge deep within him even suggests to his practical mind that perhaps he has been wrong to deny the supernatural all his life. Maybe at last he has met up with it. I shall return shortly with Act Two. Three 
three people sit in a melancholy, dusty old room of Carrick Moran Castle. The girl is young, lovely, and still pale from a recent tragedy in her life. Her father is a square-set, successful American businessman. The third is... We're in Ireland, the Emerald Isle. Just before the dawn of the 20th century, halfway from Limerick to Cork, he affects the dress of the 18th century. Knee breeches and stockings, buckled shoes, wide lapels, and tails on his coat. Tis a story about the devil himself. Oh, you'd have to go back near a hundred years or so to just before the union of the English and the Irish. It was a time of trouble, you understand. And anyone who owned a property at all was after yearning for peace and stability. Like the owner of this castle, who had a daughter the likes of you, Mavornin, was too much spunk and spirit for her own good. Damn the young rapscallion, I tell you, Marine, I'd put a bullet in him out of hand if he so much as shows himself near you again. But I love him, Father. How can you love a man who hasn't two pence to rub together? Oh, Jamie can't help it if he's poor. No more can I, so it seems. The more reason I'd not see you married to anyone who can't support you and keep a roof over your head. But I love him. And I love your mother who dies in the will of God confined to her bed. I'll not see her put forth from Carrick Moran as long as she lives. And what has Ma to do with me? We're in a bad way, daughter. The potatoes fade us. There are no men to work the bogs and bring in peat, and there's no money at all, at all. The only thing will save us all is Lord Connor and all the gold he offers. You're going to sell me to that fat old pig. I won't marry him. You'll do as you're told, tis for your own sake and your mother's. Ah, oh, you should be ashamed, Da. Well, tis done and will not be changed, and it's Lord Connor you'll marry, or the devil himself will have us all. Ah, oh, it's you we should take and save the rest of us. No, there's that terrible thing for a daughter to say to her father. Oh, that's so terrible. He half owns you already. You might as well go all the way and make a pact with him to sell your soul entirely. Well, many a word is said in anger we'd all like to recall. And sure, a sweet Colleen born the likes of Maureen never meant at all the sort of curse she laid on Sir Seamus, her father. Now, look, sir, if you think to entertain us with some thinly disguised version of the Faust legend about a pact with the devil, I'm afraid... No, Papa. No, let him go on, please. Oh, we can't leave anyway in weather like this. Or until the bridge is fixed. Uh, very well. Hey, you came down over Steve about a horror, of course. No, well, what? Oh, forgive me since you don't have the tongue. Over the mountains, I mean. Oh, yes. Then, on the way, you'd have passed where Moreau Wood used to be? Well, I wouldn't know. Ah, well, well, it is no matter, perhaps. Uh, but it was there that Padre Dunin and Maureen used to meet among the black thorn and the rowan with a carpet of buttercups and daisies spread at their feet and the song of dapwings and robins all around. Oh, Maureen, a Oh, Paddy, beloved. Oh, my own, my own... What is it then? Tears? Why? Oh, because I'm not your own. I can't ever be. My dad has promised me to Lord Connor. Well, that fat old toad, I'd as soon see a tie to some old boar hog that wallows in the mud. Ah, oh, don't blame Dad too much. He's about to lose Carrick Moran unless he can find enough money to save it. And he'd sell you for that? Oh, my mother is sick, Paddy. Sick to the heart. He has to protect her, too. He should have thought of that before he gambled away a fortune. Oh, Lord, if I only had some money. But how? How I'd sell my soul to the devil just to raise it... That won't be necessary, Padre Dunin. 
Well, if you won't leave my daughter alone, I'll be happy to send you there to join him at no cost. Stand aside, Maureen. Sir Seamus, I beg you, in all conscience... If you to... had any conscience, you are trespassing on my property. You'll show yourself here once again, and I'll shoot you down like a poacher. Come, Maureen. No. No, no if I have to make the choice... I'll go with Paddy. You'll do as your father says. If that's her choice, then we'll face the future and find it some way. And as to you, sir, may the devil take the hindmost. Come, Maureen. Yes, Paddy. I warn you, you're taking her in lust and against all the laws of man and God. As you forced me to, you made her choose. You'll never have her. I'll kill you first. You wouldn't the care. The devil, I wouldn't. Oh, 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 with no absolution. Oh, you've killed him. It's dead. Hey, on good riddance. That's the end of him. Oh. Only it wasn't, you see, the end at all. But only the beginning. Bad enough a daughter that first wept herself out and then took to her bed like her mother. Bad enough the dreams of tortured conscience that kept Sir Seamus awake night after night with his shame at the sudden blind rage that had made him pull the fatal trigger. But worst of all, the final outcome that it had all been for nothing. <laughs> You'll have another round of port, Lord Connor. Ah, no, sir. My gout is nagging at me enough already. What I will have, Sir Seamus, tonight for once is some converse with your daughter. In a pox on all the backings and fillings, I want her, sir, while I'm still capable. Well, now, you must understand that my daughter has been ill-disposed. That's it. Towards me? No, no, not toward you. I, I, I meant her health has been such that she is not ready to enter into a marriage contract. Damn, I hide them at the last peak for herself, for one. Oh, I'm afraid that is not possible tonight, Lord Connor, but... It's some... quite possible. Well, Father, I'm here to speak for myself. Ah, well, Maureen, you, you, you look pale, girl. You'd... Please, Lord Connor. I want to put an end to this farce. I want to put an end to silly dreams. Both for you, Lord Connor, and my father. I have been studying and discussing with Father Ignatius, and from his instruction have met the Holy Mother of the Sister of Mercy at the convent. I have been accepted as a novitiate, and after serving my term, I will become a nun in that order. But, but, but what about your mother, girl? I have arranged with the sisters that she shall be nursed and cared for until she passes away. And uh, what about me? Oh, you are the last person, dear father, who should demand anything. Oh, from you me. don't care about Carrick Moran. You let her home go to ruins or whatever parvenu wishes to pick it up at a bankrupt sale. Ah, oh, the only worldly possession I desired. My paddy. You took away from me. I renounce everything else gladly and give myself to the service of God. I am not going to mince words, Seamus Moran. You tricked me and your daughter toast me and by heaven, you shall suffer the consequences. Don't expect me to have any mercy unless your debts are paid in full to the hilt. I shall foreclose. Oh, your lordship, if you could give me just a little time. Not a to... minute, not a second, sir. I shall be happy to crush you like an ant under my heel. Oh, Seamus was beset. His word was fallen apart around him. He wrapped himself in his riding cloak and going down to the stables picked himself Ben, his favorite hunting horse, and galloped off into the early night. By twilight, he had tethered his horse and found himself in Moraw Woods, wandering on foot, a rope in his hands. Every step he took was as long as three, and as dark came down and the moon went riding, 
he was looking for a stout oak tree on whose branches he could suddenly end it all. And then, and then facing him in a dapper glade, was the shape, if not the substance, of Padraig Dunne. A fortunate meeting, Sir Seamus. Oh. Since you're long dead and buried an ill one, I'm afraid, Padraig. What brings you back seeking for me? Why, I would have thought it the other way. That perhaps you came seeking me. Since you can be nothing else but a specter, sure, you must know that I was not looking for you. Are you so sure? As of anything in my life, which I was about to take. And consign your immortal soul to the devil forever? As you did mine. I had nothing to do with your soul. I only saved my daughter from your mortal self. By putting a bullet in me at the moment, as you yourself said, of last. By dispatching me from this world without the comfort of extra mountain, clothed in all my sins, unshriven. The devil only claims his own. As he would if you were to take the rope. I warn you, you would regret it. I don't even wish you, my worst enemy, the eternal torment you wished on me. I had no wish to place such a punishment on you. I regret it, but, but what can I do? Now, there's an interesting point. Since you yourself are doomed in any case, you could put off the awful moment and at the same time do the Christian act of saving me. And let me go to eternal rest. It would be well worth your while. Oh, what do I care about you? You're only a shadow in my mind. A little more than that. Your conscience. But better still, by a trick of fate, your benefactor. My benefactor? How? Would you like to have a full and never emptied purse to pay off all your debts? Save Carrick Moran for the future, perhaps persuade Maureen to leave the convent. I could offer you such a bargain. How? Oh. My soul for yours. A pact. I would find peace this moment, and you would not have to reap the whirlwind for as many years as you could manage to escape it. Seamus. What better chance have you ever been offered in your life? In the dusty old parlor room in the decaying castle, William Donovan and his daughter Constance are trapped in the enchanting spell of this ancient story, as I trust you will be also long enough to wait till I return shortly with Act Three. outside the lichened walls of Castle Carrick Moran, and the evening sunlight glistens in the cobwebs that festoon downward from the ceiling, creating a magic background for the little green man with a hooked back, who leans on the silver head of his ivory-tipped cane as he spins his own web, an alluring and hypnotic skein that has enmeshed his American listeners. You're not going to suppose that Sir Seamus was about to accept a pig in a poke? Taken aback and awed for all he was at holding converse with a ghostie. A man he had shot himself in cold blood. No, there was still a mite of bargaining to be done. You'd uh, have to be a little more exact. I mean, what are the terms of the pact? Seamus, I've laid it out for you. I've got a patron now, as I'm trying to explain. Old Nick himself. Aye. Who else? You delivered me to him. And, and, and he is willing to take me for you. When you're ready, 
a better chance than I had, sure. Well, what does it mean when, when, when I'm ready? He'll make a compact fair and square. I'm authorized to act in my present master's behalf. You can make your own terms. A full purse that's never empty? Like the leprechaun who always has a shilling whenever he opens it. I'd want a bag of gold on the same terms. You'd have it. And how long would I have it? How long would you ask for? No. There's the whole trouble, do you see? I'm willing and allowed to make any reasonable bargain. Even... Even to giving you a trial run, as you might say. From now... To the first of March. Here. What is that? A bag of gold coins. Oh, you know what they say about the devil's gold that with the morning light it turns into pebbles, chips, and nutshells? It won't happen with this. How can I be sure? I am only a messenger, but I am empowered to say this. Take this money. Use it. It will multiply cards, rents, dice, however you use it. But mark this well, famous. By the end of next February, it'll vanish. Unless you meet me here again. Or my master. I can say no more. No, 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 no. Wait, 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 Paddy boy, wait, wait. There are still things to be said. He was God in a puff of smoke and the sharp smell of glowing cinders and brimstone. Well, Sir Seamus went home to sad news that his wife had passed away. Oh, he would have been hard put to it to manage the funeral, except that his daughter arranged it all through the convent. And never a word he dared to say to her about Padraig and the devil's gold. But once his wife was laid to rest, oh, 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 he went back to his dicing and gaming and carousing. And then, all of a sudden, the last day of February was upon him, and his overseer came to him in great distress. I've just written over the whole estate, and forgive me for saying it, but it's a disaster. What disaster? Speak up, man, speak up. There's a pestilence on the pigs and cattle. No rain has made the earth dry up, and not a rent can I collect. Uh, there's little to hold you through the rest of the winter. Oh, is that all? I've no worries. Attend me a minute. I'll give you golden guineas to satisfy our debts. And just as soon as I open the bag, watch out for the gold now. We can... uh, gold, sir. Uh, these are nothing but pebbles. Pebbles? What? It's, it's the 28th. Today's the last day of February. Oh, it is right. The morrow will be the first day of March, Your Honor. The start of a new month. Oh, the start of a new life. Or the end of an old one. Saddle up, Ben, for me, Moriarty. I'm, I'm going right now. The, 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 the tax collector will be back at sundown. Will Your Honor be there to talk to him? The last guinea's gone. Carrick Moran would follow it. Unless I turn up some fresh. But when will you be back? The question is not when, but if. And you'll know that within the next two hours. So, Seamus, are you sure you should ride to Murrow Woods this day? Why, what do you know of where and why I'm going? I? Oh, not a thing. There's only a foot to cross my grave, lad. Oh, Whoa, wait a minute. Who, who, who's that coming up the parkway there? Sweet Mary, bless us. It looks like the little mistress herself with the nun driving the shay. Maureen come from the convent? Today of all days? Ah, uh, uh, hold Ben here while I talk to her alone. Well, Maureen Nakushta, what brings you here? Oh, hello, Da. Our sister Aloysia had to go marketing, and the mother superior gave me permission to visit a little with you on the way back. Oh, well, there, now, it's, it's good to see you. Da. Oh, you look pale, though. Da. I had a vision last night when I was telling my beads, an angel that spoke to me and said you were in trouble. But when I asked if I could help, the vision only shook her head and said that it was a devil's choice at best 
and perhaps it was the only chance for remission of your sins. And so what did you think you could do about it? Only to offer my prayers and my help and my love. If you'd offered them sooner and kept your love directed where it belonged, your father might not find himself with one foot buried in the wrong grave. Now just remember, what I do is in part for your sins as well as for mine. <laughs> Padraig? Padraig, Donine, are you here at all? I mean, you Seamus. Seamus, do you have to sneak up on a man like that? I was here, only you didn't see me. Padraig, I, I'm, I'm having second thought. Oh, uh, now I wouldn't do that. There'd be the devil to pay for both of us then. Seamus, you have nothing to lose, for he'll get you in the end. But I have everything to gain. For I never should have been his slave. In the name of your daughter, take advantage of a pact you couldn't hope for otherwise. What oh, oh, terms? Oh, 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 what terms? That the bargain dates for seven years until March the first of that year. That you shall have all the pleasures and the glory of the world and unlimited money to enjoy them. And, and, and when, when, when the lease is out? That is between you and. The principle I represent. Oh, what do Mary protect me? I'm out of hell. And that's the end of the story. Well, now, isn't it where it should be? Where everyone lived happily ever after? Not quite, Mr. Storyteller. What about Sir Seamus? Did the devil ever call to collect his due? Yes. There is an interesting aspect of the whole thing. Ah, but you're right. I've taken enough of your time, and, and something tells me the bridge will be fixed by now, and you can be on your way. So if we could just uh, settle up for the trouble we've all been to, to set things to right and uh, keep you entertained. Oh, uh, wait a minute. Who is all? Well, sure, the little folks that have done what has to be done. They all have to be compensated. Oh, yes, they all like to see a little of the color of gold. Otherwise, who knows, the repairs might take an awful length of time there and no one else to How oh, much? I, uh, I was thinking in the neighborhood of, uh, a hundred guineas. A hundred guineas? Well, that's a fortune to an Irishman, perhaps, but a mere bagatelle to an American, our rich cousins. Oh, just a moment, Papa. What, Constance? I'm not leaving until I have the rest of the story. Now, what happened to Sir Seamus when the seven years were up? Do you know, no, that is an interesting tale. And why not let you have the rest of it, eh? For six years after that second visit to the woods, Sir Seamus prospered. Oh, he took to his old ways and never a dice table or a card game or a horse race that he wasn't about. But then, as the seventh year began and dragged on and on, the fear of death gradually had him by the throat. The priest would have not to do with him, and finally he had no recourse but his daughter, Sister Cecilia now in order. And on a certain day, he was allowed to see her and to tell her the whole story and throw himself on her mercy. I can pray for you, but that will not be enough. Well, what else would you ask? There are just nine months left before your time comes due. Ah, perhaps that in itself is a signal. The cycle of life, reborn. Ah, you must renounce all worldly things fast and pray, as I will for you. And perhaps God in his infinite mercy will find a way to intercede. And so he did for all those long months. Till on that last day, February the 28th, his daughter, Sister Cecilia, the Maureen that was, received permission from the Mother Superior to sit with him the whole day and to fast and pray against the arrival of that dread hour. Oh, hum, hum, a sad sight, the once ruddy and stout Sir Seamus was, nothing but skin on bone and white as a haddock's belly. 
but the hour of midnight passed, and glory be to God, the fiend dared put in no appearance. And twas time for his daughter to leave. You've been saved, Da. Uh, thanks to you, daughter. No, thanks to your own fasting and prayer. I must leave you now. But I caution one thing. I, oh, what's that, Maureen? I've sprinkled holy water all about the edges of the house and a little bit of the garden back where you can walk. But something warns me. Never step outside, for you may not be safe. And so saying, she returned to her convent retreat. And Sir Seamus? Well, no, that wasn't all too simple. For, you know, there was a little mistake there, do you see? It happened to be leap year. So there was a whole day to go till the 1st of March, and the contract was due. So what happened? Say, he just stayed on here at Carrick Moran and is still alive this day to tell the tale. That he waits for passing travelers sitting up there in his little window niche and ready to recite his story. So he can still live inside the magic circle of the house. And that when time for questions arise, that are too many, he just... Where did he go? I'm damned if I know. He just disappeared, like a puff of smoke. Papa, you don't suppose that he is so shameless and that... Oh, don't be ridiculous, darling. What, he'd have to be nearly 300 years old. What is it, Papa? Do you know, if you keep me here any longer, I might begin to believe such nonsense. <laughs> this damned enchanted isle. So, that's the story, landlord. What do you make of it? Uh, no more nor less than I do every time I hear it. What do you mean, every time you hear it? Bless you, Miss Donovan. You'll not be the first that's come over the sleeve of Olivora and found that bridge closed. You mean that little man, whoever he was, is just a common bandit? Extorting money from unwary travelers? Well, now, as to that, I wouldn't know how to answer. I've never seen him myself. Nor anyone I know still living in these parts. You mean he doesn't exist? Well, uh, I didn't say that. Well, it cost me a hundred guineas. Tis better than losing your immortal soul. Well, you'll excuse me. I think I'm wanted in the kitchen. Constance, I think we've been had. <laughs> oh, we can afford it. And whether or not we spend an afternoon with the dead, it's something we'll both have to talk about for the rest of our lives. A 300-year-old man, a shade from the past, a leprechaun with a glitter in his eye, or a master storyteller who waited for the right moment and the right audience to keep his coffers full of gold. What difference? William Donovan and his daughter will never know. Or for that matter, you and I. I'll be back shortly. interesting that the title most think best suits era or Erin or Ireland is the Emerald Isle. Of course, it refers to the incredible green of the grass that grows there. But the cognomen was first applied in a poem written by a Dr. Drennan in the 18th century. It seems fitting to close today's tale with a quote from it. Nor one feeling of vengeance presume to defile the cause or the men of the Emerald Isle. Our cast included Russell Horton, Patricia Elliott, Cork Benson, Ian Martin, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. 
Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. this sort of advertisement in the real estate section of the newspaper or their personal columns of a magazine, young Austrian couple, no children, no pets, would like to exchange their gemütlich alpine chalet for New York apartment two to three months. Please write, etc., etc., etc. If you had read that, would you be tempted to try it? Don't. It could work out nicely, but uh, then again... What is it? I don't know, Moira. I think something flew into the room. Something? What? A bird. Uh, like a huge gray owl. We shouldn't have left the window open. I'm glad we did. It flew right out. Again. Our mystery drama was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Don Scardino and Jennifer Harmon. I'll be back shortly with Act One. The advertisement I began to read to you was the actual one that Alec and Maura Grant answered. Maura was interested because Alec was exhausted from overwork and she felt he needed a long vacation. Alec, because they had recently been married and so far had been denied a honeymoon. Outside of these two small concerns, they had nothing in the world to worry them. They were blissfully happy. The gods were good to them. How fortunate. Except it was Byron who said, Whom the gods love, die young. Professor Grant... You don't have to be formal. It's just me. Oh, who's me? Your wife. Oh, that is. Darling, <laughs> the most marvelous thing just happened. It came. Oh, that's nice. What came? A letter from Frau Gottschalk in Austria. She's charming. There's a picture of her and her husband, and they look like dear people, and the house is a dream, and they want it. Well, they want to exchange, only they don't own a car. But couldn't we just rent one there and... Hey, honey, slow down, will you? Oh, when are you coming home? I'm just finishing up. I had to empty the drawers and get all this junk out of poor Murray's way. Well, you're only going to be away from the university for a year. It's still your office. Not while I'm on sabbatical leave. But it's all done. I should be home within the hour. Oh, hurry, darling. I'm just bursting with all the news about Austria. <laughs> I'm Dr. Alec Grant, and my sabbatical leave began at the beginning of the summer. I hold a full chair in philosophy at Gotham University, and my intention was to spend my sabbatical year finishing a book. When Murray Sprague got in a bind and asked me to take over a summer course he was teaching in comparative theology, I would have turned him down, except that it was he who was covering my courses while I was on leave. It was a stroke of luck that I said I would. First, because during the course, I learned more than I wanted to know about demonology, but mainly because I met Moira and we got married. There's only one hitch, Alec, provided you think the house sounds right. Moira, it sounds too good to be true. I mean, right on its own lake, isolated, but only ten miles by road from Wintersbad, <laughs> ski trails everywhere, and enough peace and quiet for me to finish my book. So, what's the hitch? We won't be alone. Uh, I knew it was too good to be true. <laughs> what are we stuck with? An ancient dachshund? <laughs> oh, no. Just a housekeeper. But we don't have to pay for her. That's bad? I think it's good. What's she like? Uh, she's sort of an old family retainer, but Gretel says she cooks like an angel and disappears right after dinner every night, and you never hear from her till you're ready for breakfast in the morning. Uh, Gretel? 
That's Frau Gottschalk's name. Her husband is Hans. Oh, oh isn't it too much? Hansel and Gretel in this divine gingerbread house waiting for yeah, us. Plus a built-in witch. Oh, now that's unfair to Frau Zopper. Gretel says she's a dear old thing and will take care of us like we were her own children. Well, I don't need anyone to take care of me but you. Oh, and you know how totally I want to possess you, surround you, make you all my own. Well, you don't have to try. You got me. So we are off for the Austrian Tyrol? Well, aren't there arrangements to be made? How do you know they'll like this old dump of ours? Uh, I mean, mine. That's all settled. I've described it and sent pictures. When do they plan to arrive? A week from Saturday, the morning of the day we leave. Uh-huh. We'll have a whole day to show them everything and help them get settled. Well, I hope they don't miss their plane. Oh, stop trying to put the hex on all this, Alex. Anyway, your child bride was smart enough to cover that. Mm-hmm. How? Well, if by any chance things get crossed up and they don't arrive before we leave, Betty Sprague has the keys and she'll settle them in. Ah, uh, and they know about that? Of course. I mean, you've heard from them since you wrote them? Natch, worry wart. Uh, I don't mean to sound that way. It's just that, well, why didn't we just get them on the phone and work out all the last-minute details? Oh, well, that's the one thing I didn't mention. They don't have a phone. They don't? Well, who needs it? We can shut out the rest of the world. Oh, isn't it heaven? Well, as long as I share it with you. <laughs> The idea of being that isolated was heaven to me. I couldn't put my finger on what niggling little thought kept sputtering in my brain like a loose electrical connection. And in the face of Moira's enthusiasm and shining expectation of our projected trip, I didn't have the heart to allow anything to spoil it. I never dreamed my random hunch would turn out to be true. Hello? Yes, this is Mrs. Grant. Is that the Gottschalks? Shh, what? A cablegram from Frankfurt, Germany? Uh, right. Uh, no, please, uh, read it to me. Have uh, you got a pencil, darling? Mm, right here. Uh, that's correct. Just read the message. Mm. Missed connections here. We arrive New York a day late. Sorry we will miss you, but please not to delay your departure. Frau Zauber expects you. We will contact your Mrs. Sprague, and all will be well. Auf Wiedersehen, Hans and Gretel Gottschalk. Uh, yes, thank you, operator, I have it. Uh, no, no, a copy will not be necessary. They missed the plane? Or maybe you ought to take up fortune-telling. I'm sorry, darling. Oh, I, I didn't mean to bite at you. I, I'm just disappointed. I would have liked to have met them. Well, do you want to cancel our flight? And... Are you kidding? That's a special excursion deal that saves us a fortune. Besides, we have to pick up our car in Munich. We don't want anything to go wrong with that. Okay. And we'll let Betty Sprague handle our German cousins. Austrian. Oh, my apologies to the Grand Duke or whoever. I think it's the Chancellor. Anyway, we're going on a honeymoon in Austria, darling. And we're going to love every minute of it. It's so easy to be prophetic in hindsight. But some chill tremor, even then, closed around my shoulders like a shawl. I shrugged it off because Moira was sizzling with delighted anticipation. The plane flight across the Atlantic was uneventful, except for Moira's constant happy chatter about the new life we were headed for. By the time we got to Munich, she had me decked out in rose-colored glasses, too. And all my doubts had evaporated. We picked up the car at Munich in the early morning, and by shortly after lunch, we found ourselves arriving at the end of our journey. Oh, it's all so green and so beautiful. It's like driving on the floor of a still green lake. It's breathtakingly lovely. An enchanted forest. Oh, but doesn't it ever end? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Up ahead. See? Oh, that's the lake. And the trees are starting to thin. Oh, there it is, Alec. Oh, it 
is. It is a, a gingerbread cottage. Well, it's a bit larger than a cottage, but it's a real Hansel and Gretel house, all right. Uh, uh with a witch waiting for us, broom in hand. Oh, stop it, Alec. <laughs> she looks like a dear little old lady. Welcome in Schluss, my house. Ich bin Frau Zauber. Uh, wir sind Herr und Frau Grant, aber wir haben keine deutsche Sprache. Oh, ach so, it is no matter. <laughs> I have English pretty good. Have you come with a nice trip? Oh, yes. The countryside is gorgeous. Oh, Fran Munich, you are arriving? Yes, we flew in this morning and drove straight here. Oh, I have been waiting, though. With the broom, I sweep the doorstep again and again so you will see the house at its best. But you must be tired. Come and see, bitter. I show you your house of dreams. We entered the chalet, our shadows streaming before us from the sun at our backs. Something revived that vague, uneasy feeling I had forgotten during our journey. But the tour of the house was too fascinating to allow me to dwell on it. I might never have thought of it again. If it hadn't been for what happened that night. Uh, uh what's this? Alec! Hey, what, what is the... it, darling? Uh, nothing. Uh, we shouldn't have left the window so wide open. I think something flew in here. Something? What? Oh, uh, a bird. A, a sort of gray owl. Ah! Oh, don't worry. It, it, it flew right out again. Where are you going? I just want to have a look-see. Sounds like a storm brewing. I think I ought to close the windows. Oh, yes. It's gotten cold. Oh, hurry back to bed. Come on, darling. Close them. Huh? Oh, yes. Right. Oh, oh. Here I come. Oh, you have cold feet. Yeah. Warm heart. Oh, don't I know it. Oh, Alec. I love it here. The house is a dream and... I've never been so happy. I love you. Good night. And I love you. Good night. She was back to sleep in a second, like a child. I wasn't so lucky. Was it only a wind-driven puff of gray cloud I had just seen crossing the moon? Or could it have been what it seemed to be? A monstrous ghost gray bat. I put it out of my mind. <laughs> what nonsense. And then I remembered what it was I had forgotten when we entered this dream house. Three of us. The sun behind us. Our shadows dancing before us. But it didn't seem to me there were three shadows. Only two. This doesn't appear the pleasant little story it started out to be, does it? Of course, Alec has been working very hard, and he seems prey to strange premonitions, perhaps even delusions. Maybe with morning they will all have passed away, except I wouldn't count on it. Ancient legend has it that those who became proficient in the black arts were chased by the devil himself through subterranean halls. If he caught only their shadow, they became first-rate magicians or witches, but lost their shadows forever. The question here so far is twofold. Is there a shadow missing at all? And if there is, whose is it? Mora? Frau Zauber? Or... Alec himself. Well, it's the following day. Let's see if that question is resolved. Uh, would you like already some more coffee, Herr Grant? Oh, uh, no. No, thanks. Frau Grant? No, no. But it was wonderful, Frau Zauber. So was breakfast. And dinner last night was... was superb. Dankeschön. It makes me very happy you like it. So... 
I clear away everything. Thank you so much, Frau Zauber, for making us feel so much at home. Zauber, it is your home while you are here. I go make you a picnic lunch. Uh, don't worry. The mist will burn off. And it will still be a beautiful day. Oh, isn't she an angel? Yes. Uh, what's this about a picnic lunch, Mark? Well, it was Frau Zauber's idea. She thought we might like to spend the day exploring. She's told me about a wonderful spot which will give us a view of the whole lake. Oh, doesn't it sound like fun? I don't know. What's the matter, darling? I was just wondering about the Gottschalks. I didn't realize how much I'd miss a phone. I would like to have run down to Wintersbad and given them a ring to see if everything was all right. Darling, you're forgetting the time difference. It's still the middle of last night at home. Oh, that's right. Uh, excuse me, please. Oh, I didn't hear you, Frau Zauber. Uh, you were talking. I didn't want to interrupt. I, I have here the picnic, all in the basket. Y you want it now? Oh, well, not quite yet. I, I want to get dressed. I won't be long, Alec. Oh, Frau Zauberg, you're so kind. You're making us very happy. But of course I must. You are very... I don't know how to say... Precious to me. Frau Zauber, do you have any bats around here? Bats? Uh, Fledermaus. Oh, that's Fledermaus. Oh, nine, nine, no bats. <laughs> Nothing like that in this place. Why do you ask? Well, we were disturbed last night. We had the window wide open, and I woke up thinking a bird was in the room. When I went to close the window, I saw something like a great gray bat flying across the moon. Oh, and the Liebchen? She saw this too? Oh, no. Fortunately, Moira was asleep. I didn't tell her what I thought I saw. I, I didn't want to upset her. Oh, very wise, mein Herr. This holiday means so much to her. You must not disturb her. Oh, uh, yourself? Here I am. Ready to go, Alec? Ready, willing, and champing at the bit. Then let's get the picnic started. It was everything a picnic ought to be. We ate in a meadow floating above the Emerald Lake. The food was sublime, and walking home over the pine needles, we were both floating on a cloud. Mm -hmm. Oh, what a day this has been. <laughs> I think you're a little high, my pet. I am. On clear air and the scent of pine and the quiet, oh, the lovely quiet. And a bottle of sparkling Rhine wine. Oh, I only finished it because you were being such a teetotaler. It was making me sleepy. My arm was about her waist, her head on my shoulder. I was tired myself and full of sun and fresh pine-scented wind and peace as heavy as a drug. We floated down the hills back to the chalet to find Frau Zauber waiting for us, fussing over us like children. Ah, you are both so tired. Oh, I am a foolish old woman to send you so far on your first day. Oh, I'm fine. I, I'm just... Oh, so sleepy. I've got to have a nap before dinner. I go up right away and turn down the bed. Uh, you will join her also, Herr Grant? No, I'm, I'm not that sleepy. I'll see more upstairs. Uh, perhaps you'll make a cup of coffee for me? Uh, yeah, but oh, you, you don't have to come up, Alec. Well, I want to see you tucked in. I'll be right down, Frau Zauber. <laughs> Thanks for the coffee, Frau Zauber. Uh, Max sneaked. I needed it. Oh, oh I'm quite sleepy myself. Uh, you should be resting with the little one. Nope. This is a good chance to make a quick trip to town and make that phone call. Uh, why don't you wait till tomorrow? Uh, it's only ten miles, 15, 16 kilometers to Wintersbad. I'll be back within the hour. Oh, I think maybe you should not drive. You look very tired. I'd like to set my mind at rest. You just keep your eye on... Oh, was his lost man here? Something wrong? Oh, no, not a thing in the world. Just a flat tire. Wait a minute. Both front tires are flat. I'll be damned. Oh, is it something bad? It's not good, Frau Zauber. Until those tires are fixed, 
One I could handle, but two. Is there a mechanic near here? In Winterspad, yeah. Well, that's great. How do I get in touch with him without a phone? Oh, Fritz comes with the milk. I could tell him to let the garage know. When's that? Tomorrow morning? Ah, uh, nine. Tomorrow's Thursday. He'll be here again on, on Friday. Oh, no. Uh, pardon. Uh, not even Friday. That's all Saints Day. It's a holiday. It will not be until Saturday. I guess that fixes that. Without wheels, I'll just have to use Shank's mirror. Excuse me? Walk. Oh, 15 kilometers? <laughs> well, not tonight, anyway. I guess my phone call to the Gottschalks can keep. Ooh. Maybe I'll join my wife in that nap. But supper? Why don't you leave us some sandwiches? Yeah. Yeah, I will make a try. And some wine. And the coffee all ready to brew. Uh, will there be anything else? No. If I want you, where will you be? I sleep uh, in the cellar. It would be too difficult for you to find me. Well, it doesn't matter. We both probably will sleep until morning. I went to bed with the sun still high on the horizon, never having felt more tired in my life. Moira was dead to the world, and as soon as I pulled the covers over me, so was I. No! 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 What is it? Moira, what is it? I thought... I, I thought... Something was was biting my neck. What? Let me see. No, no, it it was just a dream. Nothing. Oh, Alec, I'm so tired. I've got to sleep. Just sleep. It's all right with you here. With you here. She was asleep again. I turned the light on. But it didn't disturb her. I examined her carefully, and on the right side of her throat, just under the jawline, I saw two marks, side by side, as though they might have been made by a hypodermic. In a sudden panic, I rolled out of bed and shut the windows fast. I came back to Moira. She was breathing as evenly as I was gasping with fright. I went through the house calling for Frau Zauber. I found the door to the cellar and went down into a rabbit warren of halls and compartments with the damp earth under them smelling of decay. All were closed, frozen shut with rusted locks save one, which gave easily as I thrust against it. I stumbled through, clawing in the dark, down a long, twisting passage, dank and odorous, till suddenly instinct stopped me short. I took out my lighter, thumbing the wheel, and gasped at what the small flicker of its flame revealed. I was on the edge of a vast cave covered with bats. Bats everywhere, hanging upside down, gazing at me inscrutably, accusingly. The most horrible of all was a huge worm gray one hanging by the hooks on its wing elbows, its unwinking upside down eyes driving a dreadful hate through me like nails pinning me against the wall. Then as I raised my lighter, with a sudden powerful swing, it somersaulted upright and spreading its enormous wings, it launched itself at me with a banshee wail. thing I remembered was waking out of utter blackness to find myself lying on the bed with Moira shaking me gently. Alec? Alec? Uh, what? Uh, yes? What are you doing lying outside the bedclothes? I... I must have fallen asleep. Without getting into bed? Well, I was up because of... of whatever bit you. I, I wanted to close the windows and... Bit me? What do you mean? Well, don't you remember? You woke up suddenly, and you thought there was something in the room, and... Alec, darling, I I haven't been awake since I went to bed. Oh, no, Moira. 
You, well, just let me take a look at where... Oh, what is it? They're gone. The bite marks are gone. Oh, Alec, my darling, what's wrong? There never were any bite marks. Nothing bit me. Oh, you must have had a bad dream. Moira, let's get dressed and get out of this place. Now. I can't leave now. I'm just beginning to relax. I have to sleep. You can't, Moira. You've been asleep for over 14 hours. It's morning. The sun is up. I must sleep. Why? What is it, darling? Oh, I have to be ready. Ready? For what? Ready for... For the moment when... For the moment when... Mm. Moira. Moira. You've got to wake up. Oh, heaven help me. What am I going to do? I've got to have a doctor. And I can't leave her alone. A terrible dilemma for Alec. What strange sickness is drawing the life from his wife's body? He must find help for her. On the other hand... Dark and terrible is the memory of that awful cavern, peopled by the obscene and monstrous bats. Or were they only a figment of his imagination? Does he need a doctor as desperately as his wife? I shall return shortly with Act 3. Laboratory tests prove Digel tops, plain antacids. First, we cut the yellow top off a Digel tablet. Then tested the remaining white portion and proved, with its top layer removed, Digel consumes as much heartburn-producing acid as Tums or Rolaids. What's more, of the three, only Digel, with the yellow top, has the fast, gas-calming action of Simethicone. Conclusion. When you want more than plain relief, Digel tops plain antacids. Occasional use only as directed. Best Western has friendly places to stay wherever you go. And a full-color road atlas and travel guide to help you get there. Turn into the Best Western near you and pick up your free copy of the Best Western Road Atlas and Travel Guide today. Then let us make your reservations for you. Every day, people face all sorts of tests. Driver's tests, tests at school, and every day, tests on life. Oh, Mr. Cadwell, you're next. Ah, oh, Mr. Cadwell, uh, please take a seat. Thanks. Are you ready for your test on life? Uh, I guess so. Well, don't worry. It's only for practice. This time, that is. First question. If your son broke your favorite fishing rod, would you, A, be understanding, or B, yell at him? Uh, was it really my favorite fishing rod? Oh, <laughs> Mr. Uh, would you stab someone in the back to get a promotion? Uh, how big a promotion? Uh, I mean, I'm... Oh, uh, come, come, Mr. Cadwell. Well, I... Gee, I don't know. Well, you can find the answers at your local house of worship. That's where you and your family can learn about handling the everyday problems we all face. Religion in American life, Mr. Cadwell. We need it. A message from Religion in American Life, the Ad Council, and this station. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks, and uh, see you later. You can count on it. If there's anything that makes my blood run cold, it's a bat. Oh, somewhere there may be a bat lover's society who wish to protect the dear little furry things with their two canine teeth as sharp as hypodermic needles? Not me, nor Alec Grant. But which was the greater danger? Mora's strange and unaccustomed lassitude or those horrendous bats which might live only in his imagination? Only he could make the choice. <laughs> Listen to Moira's heart. It was steady, far steadier than my own. Her pulse was strong and normal. She breathed easily. But she was in a profound sleep that was dangerously close to coma. I had to get to a doctor. It's Gutchen Merkin, Herr Grant. Did you sleep well? No, I didn't, Frau Zauber. Oh, but why? 
I thought you told me there were no bats in this part of the country. Yeah? Why do you think there are? Because I believe one bit my wife last night. Oh, poor Liebchen. I came down to the cellar after my wife was bitten, looking for you. I called, but you didn't hear. Oh, I am the very sound sleeper. Yes, I couldn't find your room, but what I did find was one door that could be opened. What do you think I found behind that door, Frau Zauber? Oh, uh, I, I have the trouble with the English. I, I don't... I found a long corridor, and at the end of it, a cave full of enormous bats. Bats, Frau Zauber. Herr Grant, I think you are having Ina Bossetram, a, a, a nightmare. But there's nothing like that in the cellar. I tell you... I saw it. But then come. You saw me. There it is. That's the door. Oh, but that's the door to my room. No, I show you. I couldn't believe my eyes. Beyond the door was not the twisting shadowed corridor of the night, but a bright, neat bedroom. The walls covered with pictures, the bed neatly made and covered by a handmade counterpane, a, the furniture, a comfortable armchair, an inlaid chest of drawers, a huge and magnificent armoire. Herr Grant, you look so shocked. I am. Oh, you should have a doctor. You say there is one in Winterspot? Yeah, the Herr Dr. König. But how can you get to him? Well, I can walk. Oh, no, so far. Fifteen kilometers. It should take me less than three hours. I will not let you go. Why not? You trust the rheumatism in my old bones. We are to have a storm. When the snow comes, driving with the wind, you could lose your way. I'll have to take my chances. With any luck, I'll get there before it breaks. <laughs> to the main road were a nightmare of slipping, sliding stone under my feet. And above, the sky was becoming ominously black as the temperature dropped. As I reached the main road, I had a piece of luck. A farmer with a load of feed hay in a cart drawn by a small donkey was passing. Hey! I mean, uh... Achtung! Bitte! Was willen Sie? Uh, do you speak English? Uh... Sprechen Sie English? Nein. Sprechen Sie Deutsch? Oh, no. Uh, I want to go to Wintersbad. Wintersbad? Ja. Ich uh, gehe mit eins. In Wintersbad? Ja. Ja, kommen Sie. Dankeschön. Uh, ich uh, möchte einen Doktor, uh, Dr. König. Oh, ja, ja, Herr Dr. König. Zurück. Wir müssen gehen. I climbed aboard among the sweet-smelling hay. I was shivering and glad to pull its warmth around me. The farmer let me off at the doctor's house. The doctor was out on a house call, but his wife let me in to wait for him. She was also kind enough to let me make a phone call on my credit card. Hello? Betty. Betty Sprague? Alex? Yes. For heaven's sake. Where are you? In Austria? Yes. Oh, isn't this lucky? I've been racking my brains trying to get in touch with you. Oh, why? Well, those people, your tenants, you know the Gottschalks? Mm-hmm. Well, I've been on pins and needles, Alex. They haven't arrived yet. I don't mean to worry you, but... Well, that's all right, Betty. Uh, matter of fact, that's the reason I called. I had a hunch maybe they wouldn't. Is something wrong, Alex? What can I do? Uh, nothing, Betty. Uh, I'll have to handle it from this end. You don't sound like yourself. Are you sick? I don't know. Well, well, is Moira all right? I have to hang up now, Betty. You'll be seeing us very soon. Uh, tomorrow, if I can arrange it. Alec, you're scaring me. What is it? What's wrong? I was scaring myself because once again I was blacking out. That's the way the doctor found me when he returned. And I don't know what garbled story I blurted out. 
it was only after I found myself gulping some scalding black coffee that I gathered my wits enough to return to normal. Very well. That is better. The eyes begin to focus now. You know me? I, uh, yes, but I, I am Dr. Franz König. You are in my consulting room. Have I told you why I am here? Oh, you have told me a great deal. You came to me under the influence of drugs, Mr. Grant. Some form of hallucinogen plus deep sedation. And you have told me a most exceptional story. My wife, Moira. You've got to come and see her, Doctor. I'm afraid. Yeah, I too am afraid for her. That is why if you feel well enough now, I suggest we get into my automobile and drive quickly before the storm breaks to bring your wife away from that evil house. What do you mean? I'll try to explain that to you as we drive. <laughs> You mean that Frau Zauber has been systematically drugging us? If what you tell me about your wife is true, who else? But why? First of all, because she is not Frau Zauber. Well, who is she then? I cannot give you the whole answer to that. Uh, oh, I can tell you that her real name is Gretel Gottschalk. But her husband? The Hans has been dead for the last 20 years. I wrote his death certificate myself. But the Gottschalks were young people, my age, uh, younger. Two generations ago, yeah. How old do you think Gretel is now? Gretel? Oh, you mean the woman I know as Frau Zauber? Yeah. I don't know. Uh, nearly 80, I would think. You would be wrong. By the records of my grandfather, who was also a doctor, she was born in 1871. A hundred and nine? But why would she pretend to be younger? Why all this masquerade about dragging us over here and pretending to exchange homes? Because she does not want to die. Gretel, or the woman you call Frau Sauber, has been shunned for the last 20 years. People are afraid of her. They believe, at the very least, that she is a witch. At the very least? What else? A vampire? There is a legend here that witches possess human bodies. And having lived out the term of the human they invade, must find a new one to violate. And she wants to invade my wife's body and steal it for her own. I say the real danger is that she believes she can. Then for pity's sake, let's get there. I'm driving as fast as I can in this weather. I... Uh, what is it? The motor. It... Uh, I, I... I can't believe it. We're not out of gas. We can't be. If we get stuck in this blizzard, we'll be buried in an hour. I don't see how it is possible. But we are out of petrol. Well, now what do we do? No one will be traveling this road on a night like tonight. <laughs> we must walk. What, back to Wintersburg? It's too far. If we are to save your wife, we go on to the Gottschalk house. The wind has built up, driving the snow before it into our faces, blinding us. It was an endless journey to the chalet, and by the time we reached it, we were exhausted. Inside the house, there was light, but there was nothing else. No Frau Zauber, or whoever she was, but more important, no Moira. Moira! Moira! Yeah, you wouldn't find her by calling for her. We must do the finding. How? We can start by looking for the witch. Uh, where's her room? Have you the flashlight, Herr Grant? It's almost burnt out. But wait a minute, there's a light. Ah, here. Yeah. As you described it, it's the night before you thought this door led to the tunnel and the cave of bats? Yes. This armoire... 
Right opposite the door. Uh, let's see. Uh, just a clothes closet. The back is solid. But wait. There is a mark on the floor. See? From the casters on the legs. It must be hinged to swing open. Yeah. There is a hinge on this side. That means there must be some sort of a catch or a lock on my side. Yes, I have it. It's opening. And right behind it is the passage I went down that leads to... Wait. Listen. So there are bats. Yes. And that proves she's a witch. And also you may be right. A vampire. She's got Moira. Come on. I tore recklessly down the twisting, torturous passageway. The doctor followed more slowly. As I ran, I could hear words chanted in Frau Zauber's cracked old voice. Words that chilled my blood. Oh, thou are my own king and emperor of the northern parts. I call people and exorcise thee to lend me all your awesome power to enter this young nation that I may live my new life cycle as a witch of the inner circle. I had reached the entrance to the cavern. On a slab of stone, like a rough altar, Moira lay, unmoving. Behind her, a step higher, that ghost gray bat was poised. The words I had heard issuing from its mouth. And behind it, obscenely, a crucifix turned upside down. I fear your presence. I fear your power. What is it? Erkan? A filthy, oh, pagan God, rite, huh? Magic. All the forces of evil and the legions of hell. But the moment what do we do? We call on him and ask him to lend us his strength. In your name, I will be reborn. As I drink her blood, I will be done. No! Stop! You are to let him go. He is mine! Mine for all! As she bared her fangs and bent to sink them in Moira's throat, I went berserk. Seizing the torch from the shaken doctor's hand, I shone it directly in her face. As she recoiled from the light, I lunged and drove the heavy oaken alpenstock with its steel-tipped end through the loathsome furry body, driving it back to pin it to that obscene inverted crucifix. I took Moira up in my arms, rushing through the mist, gasping for breath dodging flames which were beginning to sprout from the earth. I reached the safety of the passageway none too soon. For suddenly, behind us in the cave, the floor exploded with a roar of flame and hissing steam. Doctor, is Moira all right? Yeah, she is fine. Oh, she was very heavily drugged, more so than you. But she is young and will shake them off. What? What happened last night, Doctor? Herr Grant, this whole countryside around here sits on a subterranean lake of boiling sulfur springs. It happens now and then... There was an explosion. Too much pressure. It blew off like a volcano. Did you see everything I saw? Oh, the light was poor. And my eyes are not what they were. The mist of steam created strange illusions. That cavern is gone forever. Buried under tons of earth and stone... You need fear nothing anymore. You are free of her forever. There's nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. As Hamlet remarked to Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, Are there such things as witches and vampires? I can only answer with another quote. We are what we believe. I'm holding a remarkable 35-millimeter camera. 
You probably don't know the name of it unless you've been to Japan. In Japan, where everyone has an eye for cameras, people have been looking into this name for over 40 years. What's behind it? Technology so advanced, we're about to introduce a camera powered by the sun and an SLR lens that focuses by itself. The name? Ricoh. R-I-C-O-H. You can see one at any fine camera store. Ricoh. It's a name worth looking into. Morning seems to start out better. You seem to go much better. Theater presents. Welcome to my mansion of mystery. Big houses are such an expense these days, what with rising costs and higher taxes. Big, lovely old homes are a problem to keep up. It's a pity, too. We're about to visit one such lovely home, known for 160 years as the Logan Place, currently inhabited by Mrs. Stell Logan and her sister Cora, the last of the Logan line. At the moment... Mrs. Stell Logan finds herself in a difficult position. There's nothing you can do, Miss Logan. You need $10,000, which you do not have and cannot borrow. What I can do for you is see that your interests are protected. My interests lie entirely in this house. That's what I want to protect. Well, you have my sympathy, but things have gone too far. I'll believe that, Mr. Henley, when the sheriff puts me bodily onto the street. Our mystery drama, The Cantankerous Ghost, was written especially for Radio Mystery Theatre by Bob Joran and stars Marion Seldes. I'll return shortly with Act One. As I said earlier, large Victorian houses are such an expense these days. No one knows that better than Estelle Logan. Now in her 70s, she is the last of the proud Logan family rattling around in the 160-year-old homestead with her sister, Cora. She has tried to keep up appearances, but it daily becomes a losing battle. The cold, hard fact is being presented to her at the moment by an attorney she's engaged to help her. I'm afraid you have no choice, Miss Logan. The taxes are too far in arrears. You can't get another mortgage on the place. Then I have to lose the house? I wish there was something I could do. If I had the money, I'd lend it to you myself. But things will only get worse. Borrowing now only puts off the inevitable. I promised my father on his deathbed I'd keep this house until my last breath. Circumstances make some promises impossible to keep. (sighs) I did it all wrong. I've called for help too late. You realize some money from the sale of the house after the taxes have been satisfied? You and your sister can get a small apartment. I've sold everything of any value to keep this house going. All my jewelry, antiques, (laughs) even most of the furniture, as you can see. Then surely you can see the futility of trying to go on. I have survived. I will survive this crisis. I intend to stay right here. But I've already... I know what you've already told me, that the house will be sold for taxes. I was aware of that before I engaged you. I expected more for my money than something I already know. I thought you could do something to prevent it, to, to, to help me. You have my complete sympathy, Miss Logan. But things have gone too far. I will believe that, Mr. Henley. When the sheriff puts me bodily onto the sidewalk. What did the young man want, Estelle? I told you, Cora. He's the attorney I hired to try to save the house. He didn't want anything, except his fee, I suppose. Oh, Papa wouldn't like that. You know how Papa was about lawyers. He'd be furious if he knew you were hiring lawyers. We are going to lose the house. Lose the house? 
Well, that's impossible. It belongs to us. It's always belonged to us. My papa made sure we'd I always have I told that lawyer I'd fight. But I don't know, Cora. I think he knows what he's talking about. Lose the house? I can't believe it. Is that why that strange man comes and looks at it all the time? What strange man? Well, he's rather nice looking. Well dressed and I'm sure well bred. When did he come to look at the house? I saw him day before yesterday and again this morning. Today he had a young woman with him. What did they do? Tell me. Oh, goodness, there's still no need to snap at me. I know you're upset. Please, but please, Cora, tell me about this man. The first time he walked up and down the sidewalk, looking and making notes in a little book. From the bank? An appraiser. I knew it. And this morning, with the young woman, well, they walked around the backyard, nodding their heads. As though they approved. But why didn't you send them off? They've got no right to trespass. This is still our home. Why didn't you chase them? Well, they weren't causing any harm, really. I didn't think it would upset you so much. Oh, everything's upsetting me at the moment, Cora. I'm sorry I was cross. Well, we have to face it, dear. We're in trouble. Well, you know more about it than I do, dear. But as for losing the house, oh, that's ridiculous. Papa would never allow it. There's nothing our dear Papa can do about it. I wish to heaven I knew what I could do. Would you like some more tea, dear? No, thank you, Cora. You should have eaten more than you did, Estelle. You've been looking a little peaked lately. Oh, Cora, please. Oh, I'll, I'll get it, Estelle. Now you stay here. See who it is first. No one's come to the front door in years. What? It's that man again. The one I told you who was... Let me get it, Cora. I'll send him packing before he knows what hit him. The nerve coming right to the door. Vulture! I beg your pardon, are you? Scavenger! Get away from here. I know you've been sneaking around. My sister saw you. Now just go away and get out. This house is mine. It's always been mine. It always will be mine. So just forget about it. I gather you're the owner of the house. I am. And if you think you're going to get it for taxes, you're sadly mistaken. Now just leave and don't come back or I'll call the police. Hey, wait a minute, lady. You don't even know what I'm here for. Will you let me explain? I'm surprised you'd want to take advantage of us like this. So surprised, in fact, that... Yes. Yes, you can explain. I'd like to hear your explanation. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, can I come in? No, that's going too far. Okay, okay. Look, I'm interested in your house. It's just what I want. Lots of eaves and gables, tall windows, gloomy and run-down looking. Well, that's hardly a compliment. No, no, your house is perfect. Yes, well, it's not for sale. I, I don't want to buy it. You don't want to buy it? No. But then, what interests you? I thought you said... No, it's the ideal house, and I've been looking at dozens of them the past few weeks. I, I want to rent it for a movie I'm directing. A, a horror movie. We'll pay you $2,500 a day. Uh, thank you for showing me around, Miss Logan. <laughs> oh, boy. The interiors are perfect. Well... Do we sit down, Mr. Blake. Will you join us for tea? Yeah, I'll take a cup, thanks. Cora? Right away, dear. Now, uh, Mr. Blake, you did say $2,500 a day. Mm-hmm. Uh, plus payment for any damage we might do. We're fully insured. Damages? What kind of damages? Now, Papa wouldn't like... No, 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 nothing serious. But, well, in setting up our equipment, we might... Scar the floor, break a wall fixture, we'll cover the cost of all repairs. But when, uh, when would you want to start? Uh, tomorrow, if that's all right with you. Tomorrow? I'll add a thousand dollar bonus for the inconvenience. And how many days do you think this is going to take? Well, I hope we can wrap it up in about ten days. But if we do go longer, I hope you'll be patient with us. Oh, Mr. Blake, I assure you, we'll be the very soul of patience. We'll shoot the staircase scene first. Myra comes up the stairs, sees the light under the door. The door starts to open and she faints. Where is Myra? Uh, makeup. Uh, hey, Rudy, get Myra. We're ready to shoot. I want to get all the straight scenes out of the way first. 
When the special effects men get going, it's going to take some time. And at 2500 a day, I want to move as fast as we can. Ready when you are, Rex. Uh, you know the scene. It's uh, all pantomime. Mm-hmm. Up the stairs and faint when the door starts to open, right? Right. Uh, you ready up there on the second floor? Ready. Okay. Roll them, Eddie. I don't understand it, Rex. That white clouds there in the background and all the uh, all the dailies. Well, what about the stuff we shot yesterday afternoon? <sighs> same thing. Everything we shot is bad? Yeah, I can't figure it out. Now, I'm using the same equipment I used last week in the sailing scene. Camera's okay. Film's fresh. I, I checked everything. Oh, look at it there. It skips around right behind Myra. Look. Like the film was fogged in different spots. Yeah. Yeah, that's the puzzle. If the film was fog, one whole side would be milky. Now, this thing flits around like a... like a ghost. Now, check your equipment again. Now, we're back to square one with this stuff. Is something wrong, Mr. Blake? You look distressed. Uh, we have to reshoot everything we did for the past two days. Uh, equipment trouble. Oh, what a shame. Yeah, the film fogged. In every scene, there was a, a white mist in the background. Oh, well, I don't know anything about these things. I'm so sorry you're having trouble. Yeah, the big trouble is finding out what's wrong. I have the best cameraman in the business on this picture. And it's, it hasn't happened before? No, not like this. Uh, we're ready for the dining room scene, Rex. Uh, everything checked out? Yeah, yeah, I ran some tests this morning. Camera's perfect, film's fresh. Uh, I'm using the same stock now that I use for the tests. Yeah, nothing can go wrong. Don't count on it. Well, I'd better get out of your way. Let you work. Okay, places, everybody. Look, uh, Eddie, I want a good effect as Myra lights the candles. I, I want to see the reflection of the flame in her eyes. Oh, you'll get it. You'll get it. And, okay, Myra, now take your time. Be very deliberate as you light each candle. And work in close, will you, honey? Just the way you did yesterday. Now, I want you hovering over the candle up. Right. Okay. Roll them. Action! Oh, darn. Sorry. The flame went out. Cut! Uh, hey, Rooney, check those doors. There's a draft in here. Okay. I didn't feel any breeze. The candle just won't light. Well, try it again. We won't roll. Uh, there it goes again. Now, try one of the other candles. Where the devil did they get those things? Here, here give me those matches. Uh, be my guest. Wasting time for a silly candle. Well, you're not doing any better than I was. Uh, they just go out. Uh, all right, uh, take a break, everyone, until we get new candles. Oh, Mr. Blake, I have some candles upstairs if you'd like to try them. They're brand new and they look just like the ones you're using. It would save us time. Thanks, Miss Logan. Okay, let's see if we can do better with these. Isn't that peculiar? There, there isn't any wind, and it just goes out. These candles are doing the same thing. Now, this is ridiculous. Oh, we can't get a simple candle to light in this house. Look, Eddie, set up for the staircase scene again while we buy up every candle in town. Poor Mr. Blake. He's certainly having a hard time, Cora. I'll be awfully glad when these people leave. All the shouting and confusion... I can't get any rest at all. Neither can I. We'll drive the blackguards out. Esther, what? Who? Who said that? Look, look, Esther, in the rocking chair. A white mist. What? I'm, I'm going to say a white mist, just like Mr. Blake described on his film. Whatever is plaguing Rex Blake's filming in the old Logan place seems to be making itself known in one form or another. Perhaps now we'll find out just what that white mist is and why the candles won't light. And also, what other ghostly things lie in store for the Logan mansion and the film Rex Blake is trying to make when I return shortly with Act Two. <laughs> homes for a movie setting is common practice among filmmakers. 
There's no doubt the family life is disrupted for a time as technicians drag lighting cables all over the place and cameras loom in every corner. Estelle Logan welcomes it, however, because it means enough money to pay her back taxes. But it seems there's another resident of the house who objects. A white mist, just like Mr. Blake described on his film. Now, just what's going on here? That's what I want to know. Exactly who or what are you? I am Clayton Logan, original owner and builder of this house, which of late seems to have turned into a circus. Clayton Logan? Great-grandfather's ghost? Yeah, the same. I have been slumbering peacefully for 110 years until that crowd of ninnies started tearing up the place. Now, what is going on? But, I, but, but you, you, you can't be here. And why not? I believe I've already informed you that I am the original owner and builder. I don't believe in ghosts, much less converse with them. Well, that, my dear, is your misfortune. I'm sorry I died before you were born. Now, tell me, what is all this nonsense in the house? Well, I rented the house to a film company to make a movie. I, I should think that would be obvious. Uh, well, what is a movie? Oh, it was you. The mist that turned up on the film. You're talking gibberish. And you kept the candles from lighting. Oh, yes, the candles. <laughs> I was merely curious and uh, leaned a little too close. It uh, gave me, needless to say, great satisfaction to watch that young man's discomfort when they kept going out. <laughs> the one with the beard. The director, Mr. Blake. Uh, we shall have no more of that around here. Now, you tell them to leave. They are paying me $2,500 a day to use this house. Abuse the house, you mean? Now, they pay for any damage. And besides, I need the money. What for? I'll lose the house for taxes if I don't get this money. No oh, nonsense. Lose the Logan place? Impossible. But you don't know what expenses are like these days. You've been dozing for uh, how many years? A hundred and ten. Well, then why haven't we seen or heard from you before? Well, I haven't been disturbed before. These uh, uh, movies, whatever they are, <laughs> they have me completely unnerved. I shall have to do everything in my power to get them out. But they'll be leaving in about uh, ten days or so. Just be patient. They'll leave. Uh, uh, and besides, there's not much you can do about it. Uh, being a ghost... Oh, you are a spunky one. <laughs> Logan always rises to the challenge. You are my kind of person, my dear. A formidable adversary. I like that. Well, there are things to attend to. You're... You're disappearing. Temporarily, my dear. Temporarily. Hmm? Oh. oh, good heavens. Oh. oh, I forgot all about you, Cora. Oh. What happened? Oh. I must have fainted. Oh. What was it? Uh, it was great-grandfather Clayton. Oh, you, you spoke with it? Uh, him? I did. Oh. It was Clayton Logan's ghost. Oh. And he's furious about that movie company being here. You mean there's a real live ghost in this house? Well, that's a strange way to describe a ghost, but yes, Cora, there is. We can't stay here with a ghost. We most certainly will stay here. And not a word to the movie people. I'm afraid they're in for more trouble, but I don't want to lose them. We won't be shooting tomorrow, Miss Logan. We're setting up for some special effects. Oh, that sounds interesting. You know, I've never asked you just what this movie is about. Well, it's a horror film based on the book Dream House. It was a big bestseller last year. Oh, well, I never read those things, but I do remember ads for that in the paper. Mm, oh, it's a good story. About a young couple who buy an old house. Their dream house. 
And the house has a, well, a personality of its own. They plan some renovation, and the house actually helps them. <laughs> In what way? Well, they plan to add a window on one wall of the living room. They mark exactly where they'll install it, and the next day, there it is. Like magic, and other things like that. But where's the horror? Ah, well, that's the last part of the movie. After the couple get the house just the way they want it, they decide to sell it for a profit and move away. <laughs> well, the house doesn't like that. Oh, oh, I see. And gradually, the house makes them prisoners until the climax, when the house collapses into rubble with them trapped inside. Well, good heavens, you're not going to collapse our house. <laughs> no, no, of course not. We'll do that scene in the studio with special effects. You see, right now, we're setting up for a scene where the wife starts up the stairs, and suddenly, the stairs just level out, and she slides all the way to the bottom. The house's revenge, of course. Gracious. Well, the men install spring action risers on each step. Then, with a flip of the switch, they all pop up and turn the staircase into a slide. Now, it, it won't damage your stairs at all. But what happens to the poor actress? Well, she's well padded under her clothes. And besides, Myra's a trooper. She'll do anything. Well, I gotta run. See you tomorrow, Mrs. Lovett. Yes. Goodbye. The tricks they can do in the movies. Oh, there you are, Cora. I was just looking for you. Where is he now? Oh, Mr. Blake just left. Oh, no, no, not him. The ghost. Great-grandfather. I have no idea. I haven't heard from him since yesterday. To think he's been here all the time, looking over our shoulders, as it were. He said he was sleeping. Well, I am not going to get any sleep with him prowling around this house and those people cluttering up the place downstairs. I'm going over and stay with Maud Wilkins till this is all over. I see they're all still here. Oh. Oh, I wish you wouldn't appear so suddenly. Oh, <gasps> perhaps you'd like me to knock. Well, you could give me some kind of a warning. You know, you've scared Cora away altogether. She's gone to stay with a friend. Well, I'm glad I'm affecting someone. You and that man in the beard are as thick as thieves. You pay no attention to my wishes. Great-grandfather Clayton, I told you before. I need the money this film is bringing me. And besides, I find it rather interesting. Well, I don't at all like that contraption they put on the stairs. Now, I built those stairs with my own two hands. And a little help from your grandfather. Nothing in the house is being harmed, except your rest. You can certainly do without a little of that for a while. You've already been sleeping for 110 years. Well, I see you are undeterred, Estelle. Now, in our first visit, I admitted I liked your spirit. But... From one spirit to another, I intend to get them out. Now, from what you told me of this movie-making, it's a play. Well, <laughs> I know just how to go about it. I hope you don't mind my watching all the time, Mr. Blake. Oh, not at all, Miss Logan. Uh, we're shooting the staircase scene this morning. Well, I don't envy that poor actress sliding down the stairs. Uh, as you said yesterday, she is a trooper. Uh, Rex... Rex, uh, we're ready when you are, but uh, they just can't seem to find Myra. The script girl's been all over the place looking for her. Well, could she have gone into the village? No, 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 not Myra. She never leaves the set during the call. She didn't say anything to anyone about going somewhere? No, no. She always checks with Madeline. Well, we can't shoot the scene without the leading lady. We'll just have to wait until she shows up. Uh, you say it's not like Myra to leave the set? Yeah, that's right, Miss Logan. Uh, she has the patience of a saint. She is always on call. And she did arrive this morning. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. She rode in from the motel with Madeline and me. Mm, well, I do hope she turns up soon. Oh, uh, excuse me. Uh, I have something to do. <laughs> What have you done with Myra? Great-grandfather Clayton, I know you can hear me. Well, of course I can. I was just waiting. For what? You asked me not to startle you by appearing so suddenly. <laughs> I was giving you time to get ready. You've done something with that actress, haven't you? She is perfectly comfortable and totally safe. Where is she? I, uh... <clears throat> I invited her to my quarters. Your quarters? 
great-grandfather, if you've done something to harm that woman, we could be in terrible trouble. Oh, no, no, no. I have not harmed her. She's a beautiful woman. I have simply relieved the play of its leading lady. And uh, they all now have to pack up and leave. Now, perhaps you'll be good enough to tell them that. Hmm? You have got to tell me where she is. Where are your quarters? Ah, I won't give that away. There are more secret stairs and hidden hallways in this house than you realize. <laughs> oh, she's sleeping peacefully in my quarters and will continue to do so until that crowd of marauders leaves. She's sleeping? Yeah, uh, bewitched by my magnetism. <laughs> I was able to hypnotize that uh, <clears throat> lovely young thing and put her to sleep. And she'll continue to sleep till I choose to wake her. Please, great-grandfather Clayton, wake up that actress and release her. Not until I am satisfied that those people will pack up and go. Oh, you're being impossibly selfish. I told you I needed the money they're paying me to save the house. If I can't pay the taxes, Cora and I will be thrown out. <laughs> You'll not be thrown out of this house. It is impossible. It is not impossible. <laughs> I just think you'd want to help us. <laughs> Instead of hurting us, your own flesh and blood. Oh, ye God. <laughs> not tears. I, I thought you were above that. Well, you're callous and you're unfeeling and you're incredibly stupid. <laughs> callous, perhaps, and even ruthless. That's how I amass my fortune. But certainly not stupid. Then why won't you see it my way? Uh, oh, uh, oh, very well, my dear. You, yes, you do have a point. I foreclose enough mortgages in my time to know that it does happen. But never to a Logan. Then you'll release Myra. Uh, she'll return safe, sound, and enormously refreshed. And you won't do anything more to interfere with the picture? Well, what, what, what word of honor. Although I rather think I was helping you by trying to upset them. How? Well, <laughs> the more delays they run into, the longer it takes. The more money for you since they're paying you by the day, I do believe. Oh, great-grandfather Clayton, I'm surprised at you. Well, I couldn't face that nice Mr. Blake knowing I was cheating him, and it would be cheating. Now, see, he doesn't know about me. I can pull a few tricks. It will really surprise him. Well, much as I need the extra money it might bring, I, I, uh, no, no, I cannot be a party to such an arrangement. Yes, well, have it your way, my dear. Ah, I shall not interfere any longer. I'll put up with this band of uh, gypsies for your sake. you been? Waiting to film the staircase scene. What is holding you up? You haven't been drinking this early. <laughs> what are you talking about? I've been waiting on the back porch. I've been out there since... Wait a minute. I do remember a slight buzzing in my head. I felt a little dizzy, but that's all I remember. Did... Did I go somewhere? Well, only you can tell us, sweetheart, but... <laughs> It doesn't matter. We're pulling out of this place. Oh, Miss Longdale, you're back. I wish I knew what was going on here. Yeah, well, so do I. Miss Logan, I'm sorry, but we're leaving. There are, are too many crazy things going on in this house. Oh, but, Mr. Blake... No, no, we, I... we can't afford any more delays. I'll just have to find another place. And take my advice, Miss Logan. You get out yourself. You're living in a haunted house. <laughs> No truer words were ever spoken. But then, all hauntings aren't gruesome. I rather think great-grandfather Clayton is a delightful, if rather crusty character. But he was wrong. Delays won't add to Estelle's income from the rental of the house. The delays, just as she feared, are driving the movie people out. And eventually, Estelle and Cora, too, when they can't pay their taxes. We'll learn what happens when I return shortly with Act Three. I 
think it would be fun to live in a haunted house, never knowing what to expect from the spectral inhabitant. The ghost of Estelle Logan's great-grandfather came up with some unexpected results from his capers. And now Estelle faces the loss of income, which would have saved her house. She has just been informed of the movie director's reason for leaving. You're living in a haunted house. I know. You know? Well, why didn't you tell us that when you rented us the place? I didn't know it then. You see... Miss Logan... Please, please wait. I, I, I don't want you to go on. I, I know where Miss Longdale has been for the past two hours. You do? I know you'll find this hard to believe, but the ghost of my great-grandfather hypnotized her and took her to his quarters. What? Your what took Myra where? To his quarters. He has been trying to drive you away from the house. He hates all this confusion. Uh, Miss Logan, I can't say it hasn't been fun, but we'll be gone tomorrow. I'll have a check for you for the days we've been here. But I want you to stay, really. Great-grandfather promised not to interfere anymore. That's very nice of him, but I think we'll just look for another place. Now, are you satisfied? They are determined to leave. I hope you enjoy the new owners when this house is sold for taxes. Now, now, just a minute, Estelle. Don't abandon hope so easily. They are packing up and leaving tomorrow. Well, I think we might persuade them to stay and finish their business. Well, I can't, and I don't see how you can. Oh, come, come, my dear. Another demonstration of your lack of faith in the power of the spirit world. You mean you'll talk to them? Well, I wouldn't go as far as that. But I have a notion I can pull a few tricks to keep them here. Oh, Mr. Blake. Uh, hi, Miss Logan. I suppose your mind's made up. I'm sorry, Miss Logan. I can't work in this house anymore. I mean, Myra's on the verge of a nervous breakdown. I, I had to send her back to the city. Oh, how horrible. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. If she uh... believes you, she was kidnapped by a ghost. If she believes me... She had a blackout. Either way, it's disturbing, to say the least. Uh, hey, uh, Rex. Uh, Rex, we got a real problem. Well, what's the matter? Can't get the van open. Oh, come on, Eddie. Don't bother me with things like that. I got enough trouble with the picture. Well, I, I just thought you ought to know if you want us to clear out our gear today, you'd better send for another van. <sighs> a simple problem with a lock. It's the driver's problem, not mine. Okay. Uh, all right. All right. I'll come take a look. But I don't know what more I can do. Now what? Hmm? What's the matter? Oh, the, the, this front door doesn't open. What'd you do? Lock it behind you? No, no, I left it wide open when I came in. Well, it's never stuck before. Yeah, well, I'll go around and try it from the outside. Oh, the sooner I get away from this madhouse, the better. Hey, hey, Rex, you won't believe this, but the back door won't open either. Oh, dear. Th th then go through the window. Look, I may go through the window, but my camera and gear won't make it. Miss Logan, surely there's a way of opening the doors to your house. Well, there always has been. That's very reassuring. But right now, we seem to be completely locked in. Short of breaking down the doors, what do you suggest? I don't know. Oh, Eddie, hmm? have the guys outside push the back door in. We'll pay you for the damage, Miss Logan. Okay, okay, but I have my doubts. I'm sorry to use such drastic measures, but we got to get out of here. The last couple of days have put me way behind schedule. Oh. oh, I'm so sorry that it's turned out this way. What's the matter with them? Grown men can't open a simple back door. Ain't no use, Rex. Nah, won't budge. <laughs> Why, they can't even break it in. This is ridiculous. Give me your wrench, the heavy one. Look, how are you going to open a door with a wrench, huh? Like this. <laughs> it, bounced, it bounced right off the window pane. Oh, that the glass isn't even cracked. I don't believe this. I do not believe this. We're prisoners in this house of horrors. What the, what the devil was that? Uh, it, 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 it came from the living room. I, holy jump. What is it? <gasps> the front door. Where is it? It's nothing but a blank wall. The door is... It's gone. Eddie, get on the phone. Get some help here fast. Hey, 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 hey. Oh, wait, wait a minute, Rex. We are looking at this thing all wrong. What do you mean? Hey, Miss 
Logan, your, uh, your, your great-great-grandfather, I mean this, this ghost... Uh, Come on, Eddie. Well, I mean, uh, could he... Uh, well, I mean, is it possible he's doing this? I believe he is. You see, you see, when I convinced him I needed the money that you were going to pay me and I begged him to stop trying to drive you away, he said he'd get you to stay. You're saying seriously that the ghost of your great-great-grandfather is locking the doors and keeping windows from breaking and, and making doors disappear? He built this house with his own two hands. I guess he can do anything he wants to. Rex, Rex, don't you see what a gold mine we've got? A house with a real live ghost. That's a funny way to put it. But maybe you're right. And he's doing what our special effects guys have been working on for weeks. Now, if we can get him to cooperate... There is no telling what effects we could get for the final scene when the house walls the couple in. How do you negotiate with a ghost? Hey, Miss Logan, will he help? I'll ask. So they were impressed, eh? Completely. How did you ever make the door disappear. Well, when I built this house, I installed a few trick walls. I told you there are passageways you've never dreamed of. Locking the doors, keeping the glass from breaking, well, it was purely supernatural. <laughs> well, everything's back to normal now. Will you help them with the effects? Uh, I don't have any other choice, considering the spot I put you in. Uh, uh, what exactly do they want me to do? Well, you'll have to ask them. Oh, no, no, no. I draw the line of communication with these mortals. Now, uh, you can be my, uh, my agent. Seeing that I have now been drawn into the theatrical profession. Rex? We've stumbled into the house of the century. Yeah, we still don't know how much cooperation we're going to get. You know, maybe he won't do anything at all. Because I, I, I wonder if Miss Logan can persuade him to, to appear in the film. Oh, nobody's going to believe this. <laughs> <laughs> no, just say it's more of Rex Blake's film wizardry. Mr. Blake, my great-grandfather has agreed to help. He wants to know what you want him to do. Oh, uh, well, uh, can we see him? I mean, does he materialize? He said he'd prefer not to communicate directly. Well, that's going to make things a little difficult. No, no, he's hearing what you're saying now. He always does. If, if you just say, rattle the shutters or, or make a window disappear, I'm sure he'd do it. His name is Clayton. Uh-huh. <clears throat> uh, Clayton? <laughs> Clayton, can you hear me? Uh, just for a little experiment. How about making the stairs turn into a slide? That's uh, the one effect we're working on. Well, that, that's better than Roy's contraption. Uh, at the end of the film, the whole house shakes as it starts closing the people in. Uh, uh, the doors and the windows all disappear. Uh, okay, okay, you can do it. My goodness! Oh, oh. Uh, thanks, uh, Clayton. <laughs> we'll be back. I'm going to round up my cast and crew. It, it'll take a day or two, and we'll be back to start filming. And will this help you get back on schedule? Absolutely. We may even finish ahead of schedule. Oh, come on, Eddie. Yeah. Uh, see you, Miss Logan. Day after tomorrow. Goodbye. You're right, Eddie. This is the house of the century. <laughs> it'll make you a million dollars. You'll be rolling in dough for years. <laughs> it looks like it. Oh, the twenty-five hundred a day we're paying old lady Logan is the best investment I ever made. Ah, uh -huh, those scoundrels! I don't see what you're so upset about. They are going to make a fortune from this venture for years to come. They said it. And all you're getting is a paltry $2,500 a day. But that was their agreement. And they had the nerve to ask me to appear. Well, <laughs> I am going to appear all right, but not in their movie. Estelle, I was a hard bargainer in my day, and I dare say I haven't lost my touch. Bargain? Certainly. If they're going to make millions thanks to our house and my efforts, 
then you're going to share in it for years to come. I want to talk to them. Have them here at 8 a.m. sharp tomorrow. Oh, it's more than I'd hoped for, having him appear. I was going to ask him if he'd play a part. No, I don't think that's what he had in mind. Indeed, I don't. Is that him? Yes. He'll materialize in a second. I have some things to take up with you, sir. A real, live ghost. I learned that you stand to reap quite a handsome profit from our efforts here. Well... Profits, yes, that's business. Uh, excess profits, I call it. Zillions for years to come, if I heard correctly. Uh, that's quite a return on your investment. Uh, before agreeing to any assistance on my part, you will agree to a far better share of the profits for Miss Logan. Well, we can talk, sure. Estelle, buy yourself a good lawyer. Get the best deal you can. And when he tells me he is satisfied with the contract, I'll offer my fullest cooperation. I'll call Mr. Henley right away. Hey, wait a minute. I didn't say we were going to... Billions of dollars. Well, maybe we can deal. Well, my dear, I think you and Cora are well taken care of for the rest of your natural lives. Now, after I finish this business, I... I think I'll go on over. I've earned it. Go over? Yes, to the other side. To the spirit world. It's becoming increasingly grim for our spirits to hang on with living human beings. The whole world is going crazy. You know something, Clayton? I'm going to miss you. Places, everyone! Oh, Mr. Logan... <laughs> Clayton, sir, are you ready for the final destruction scene? Uh, if I must. Okay. Myra, on the stairs. Roll them, Eddie. Action! were guaranteed a good many more years of existence. It was great-grandfather Logan's help that saved them. And, of course, the great stroke of luck that brought the movie people to the house in the first place. I'll have another thought on ghosts in the house when I return shortly. Who invited Susan to lunch? Little did he know that she was a victim of Raven House paperback mysteries. <laughs> I finally knew Albert was definitely allergic to bee sting. Uh-huh. But I was still surprised to find out that he planted the killer wasp in Albert's car. Well, I don't understand. Why were you so surprised? Well, I thought it was an accident. Oh. So I told the police. Well, wait a minute. You what? I told the police. You told the, the police? Why'd you do that? Well, I had to report the accident. Report an accident? In a book? <laughs> Ravenhouse publishes new mysteries every month. Which one will claim you as its victim? If you're clever enough, you'll find Ravenhouse mysteries wherever paperbacks are sold. the cantankerous ghost turned out to be not so cantankerous after all. That's the way with a lot of humans, I know. Give them a challenge, ask their best, and they usually rise to the occasion and lose their petty self-indulgence. If you have to deal with a difficult person, try it sometime. Ask their advice and help, sincerely, and you'll get sincerity in return. Our cast included Marion Seldes, E.B. Juster, Lloyd Batista, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Raven House Paperback Mysteries. This is Tammy Grimes, inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. 
It's fun. It's enjoyable. It's a family affair, and it's called... It's Magic. It's Magic opens at the Palace Theater February 9th through February 14th. And will be hosted by popular television star Bob Ron. No matter what your age, from 5 to 105, it's probably the most enjoyable family show you'll see in 1982. Magic and illusions performed by magicians from all over the world. Tickets are on sale right now at the Palace Theater box office or call the Palace Theater box office at 469-0017 and charge your tickets on Visa or MasterCard. It's Magic opens February 9th through February 14th with matinees on Saturday and Sunday and all proceeds from opening night will go to benefit Children's Hospital. It's Magic. Magic and illusions from all over the world coming to the Palace February 9th through February 14th. It's a family affair. World's greatest illusionists include Shimada, Crimean, Diana, Dick Zimmerman, and Patrick and Maya. The music of your life is on 1230 WCOL in Columbus, 25 degrees downtown. It's 11 o'clock. CBS News, a hostage siege at a Memphis hospital is over. The gunman dead, shot by police. Three hostages are safe. I'm David Jackson reporting on the CBS radio network. Jean-Claude Goulet, a 40-year-old welder from Louisiana, took the hostages yesterday at St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital, where his son died of leukemia. Ever since yesterday afternoon, he'd kept police at bay with a handgun. The captives, his son's doctor and nurse, and a hospital psychologist. Just a bit over an hour ago, it all ended. We get the story from Dave Gilton of Memphis affiliate WREC. The Memphis Police Department Tactical Unit has been patient for the last two days. Grimes. When death and murder become an everyday occurrence, it is generally labeled war. When brother kills brother on the battlefield, it is the most pyrrhic of victories. Nobody wins, everyone loses. And it is in such times that cowards and heroes abound. We will meet both today, and knaves and cheats and some American history we're not too proud of. Willie, get me out of here. I can't face that man. He betrayed 1,500 of us. His orders killed us. You've got to face him, Calvin. What are you running away from? Here you accuse the general of a despicable act, of sacrificing 1,500 of our own men without a thought. Cal, you hold the rank of major in the Union Army. Talk to your former commanding officer. Tell him to his face what you think of him and why. Your ghost has come back from Andersonville and orders you to speak up. Our drama, The Ghost of Andersonville, was adapted from an actual account of the Civil War. Especially for the Mystery Theater by James Agate Jr., and stars Tony Roberts. I'll be back shortly with Act One. It is the last year of the Civil War. The Confederacy is about to collapse. Re-elected Abraham Lincoln is loved and hated. And Washington bigwigs are looking towards who will be the next president. They are looking to someone from the army, perhaps a general. For that they need heroes. Not always easy to come by. General Cutler, have you heard the latest? Can't say I have, my boy. But you men with the Secret Service, you seem to know all the Washington scuttlebutt. I was in Bill Wood's office. We were getting our assignments. Uh, so many for counterfeit detection, so many detailed to protect Lincoln and Stanton and so on. And then Wood said, they tell me Cutler's the man. I'm the man for what? The party is picking you to follow Lincoln. 
That's the thinking. The thinking of nominating me when Lincoln's term runs out? Well, that's the talk. Well, what makes them think Lincoln won't ask for a third term? Well, he might. Then again, he might not. Well, who would I be running against? Grant. Grant? Oh, I wouldn't stand much of a chance. He's got command of all the Union armies. General, I think the people would prefer a cutler in the White House and a Grant in the barracks. Nicely said, Forrest. But do the people even know who I am? Word will get around. You've already earned your stars, sir. No one has forgotten Fredericksburg or your gallant attack on Chattanooga, sir. Well, that was some time ago. And that you are the acknowledged hero of the prisoner exchange plan. It's not only who wins the war and pray the Lord Grant will defeat the rebels, but it's who looks after our boys. Kim, if you put it that way, I'd say I might have a chance. I hope when Bill Wood was making these Secret Service assignments, he intended to keep you at my side. You have given me excellent protection since I came out of the hospital, and it appears you have a political mind as well. I'd like to know I can count on you. An honor, General Cutler. I hope to continue to serve you. Timothy, I think I'll ride down to Burnside and surprise Mrs. Cutler with the news. Benjamin, that is the most exciting thing I have ever heard. You should be very proud. Well, I am a little pleased. However... We're a considerable distance from the White House. If the election were held tomorrow, I'm afraid most voters would say, Benjamin Cutler who? I shall have to drum up some ideas to bring me to the attention of the public. What about that prisoner of war who's leading Richmond for Washington? What about him? Isn't he the last prisoner of war to be returned to us from Andersonville? Yes, but I don't see... Doesn't what... it occur to you that this could be a story that would make all of America sit up and take notice? I don't quite see how. If we arrange to have all the newspapers here the day the prisoner arrives... Well, now, now do you see? You mean I welcome him here at Burnside? Benjamin, it is you who have organized the exchange of prisoners. Those rebels we hold here for our brave Union men in Andersonville. Finally, the last prisoner returns home. If you welcome that man, bring him into our home, you become a symbol of the kind of leadership we all look to. Mary, I like that. I like that. <laughs> well, I'd better get cracking on the idea. I'll talk it over with Tim Forrest. Oh, I'm glad he's still assigned to you. He's so faithful. And quite clever. He's just the one to make the high-level arrangements with Stanton. Stanton? The Secretary of War. He can fix it up to have the man welcomed here in our own home. I wonder if he could get the army band to play on the lawn. Oh, I can just see it. Major, uh, what's his name? Calvin Russell. Major Russell arrives on the noon train. He's probably accompanied by Red Cross nurses. Is he married? Oh, no, no, he's not. Oh, good. You and I are at the station. We whisk him in our carriage here to Burnside. The band strikes up the star-spangled banner. Reporters from newspapers all over the world are here. Oh, Benjamin, can't you just see it? You must make a marvelous welcoming speech. You might even have some photographs taken. Oh, it's going to be so exciting. The event of the century. <laughs> Please, folks, all you reporters, please don't crowd the observation platform of the train. Kim, when's he coming out? The train's been here for ten minutes. Where is he? General, you know the Major's lame. I don't know which car he's in. It'll take him a little time to get out here. I mean, there's such a thing as a schedule. Here we've got a carriage waiting and an army of reporters and photographers hanging around at home on the lawn. That Calvin Russell was always unreliable. Oh, I didn't know you knew the Major personally. He was in my outfit, got captured in the Chattanooga raid and shipped off to Andersonville. Oh, Forrest, send word back into the coach. I want the Major out here in three minutes, not one second more. Yes, sir. I'm not 
going out there. Major Russell, everyone has come a very long way to welcome you home. You are taking this ceremony all the wrong way. Am I? Now, what about your friends? You must have friends out there in the station. Some of my friends drowned in the Mississippi. Those who didn't swam with me to shore and were shot as they swam. The rest, the few who escaped, died in the prison at Andersonville. Nurse Wilson, today I'm alone. I have no friends left. Well, I guess I was wrong, Major. I thought you agreed to be greeted by General Cutler because you wanted to honor all the men who died during the war and wanted to speak for them. But I guess I was mistaken. Well, I... Maybe I hadn't thought of that. Now, there's going to be a reception. Secretary of War Stanton himself is supposed to be there. They'll want you to speak. Do you suppose I could meet President Lincoln? Of course you can, and you will, I'm sure. General Cutler has it all arranged. Cutler, that... That what? Never mind. Is he still out there? I'm sure he is. He arranged all this for you, Major. Nurse Wilson, you go out to the observation platform and you tell whoever's in charge that if Cutler will go away, I'll come out. I don't want to be in the same state as that man. Uh, go, Go see who that is with you. I don't want anyone to come into this compartment. I'll duck into the lavatory. Go on. Yes. Oh, nurse. I'm Tim Forrest, Secret Service. General Cutler asked me when the Major would be making an appearance. Now, we're a little late and a little tight on the schedule. Is he all right? Oh, yes, he's fine. Uh, Tell everyone he'll be out directly. Oh, thank you, nurse. I heard all of that. Why didn't you tell him? Go on, you go on out there and tell him what I told you. Cutler leaves... Russell arrives. Won't you change your mind? I don't wish to have anything to do with the general. He can stay if he wants to, but I'll not see him. Hand me my crutch, please. I'll be waiting right here when you come back. Major, they won't understand. No one has any idea that That's exactly it. No one has any idea what kind of a man he is. But I know, and the dead know... I haven't been in a hell on earth all these months to be welcomed by a man who doesn't deserve his stars. I hate him. I saw him from the window, alive and fat. Well, I'll do what I can. I cannot tell them what you want me to. I'll have to think of something else. General, some of us have been waiting since six this morning. Do you know for a fact that the Major is on the train? Yes, of course I know it for a fact. The man could be ill. Anything. Uh, General Cutler, may I talk to you? Forrest, this is ridiculous. Fifteen minutes we've been waiting. What is it? Is Russell sick? Why the delay? I look like an idiot standing up here on the observation platform all by myself trying to answer reporters. Uh, There appears to be a slight problem. So what is it? His nurse is on the way out and she wants to tell you herself. What is all the mystery? General Cutler here. I'd like a word with him. What is it, nurse? Where's the major? I'm General Cutler. Is he coming out soon? I'm afraid not. Uh, The major sent his regrets, but he is... uh... A little shy, I'm afraid. Shy? All we want him to do is come out here, shake my hand, and we take a few pictures. I make a speech, and we whisk him off to my farm. General, what happened was, as soon as the train pulled into the platform, he... Well, he started getting very nervous. You do understand, he's been a prisoner for well over two years. Almost everyone he knew died in prison. What's your name? Nurse Wilson. Nurse Wilson, you go back to him on the double. Tell the Major we honor him and wait for him to make an appearance. Tell him I personally am waiting for him. It won't make any difference, General. No difference? Does he know I'm here? Yes, he's been watching you from the window. You mean he can see me now? He just said to send his regrets... But right now, he doesn't feel like leaving the train. General, may I see what I can do? Please give me a moment. Nurse Wilson, if you'd lead the way, 
I'll have a talk with the Major. He's coming out! Here he comes! General Cutler, allow me to place the Major by your side. Calvin Russell. <laughs> good to see you. So good, my old buddy. I have to make a speech first. Uh, Forrest, uh, will you make an introduction, please? <laughs> Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, gentlemen of the press, guests, General Benjamin Cutler would like to say a few words to welcome Major Calvin Russell, the last of the Union prisoners to be released from Andersonville. <coughs> Major Russell, gentlemen of the Fourth Estate, citizens of this great country, from Pennsylvania Avenue... To the length and breadth of this vast, great country, our hearts go out to the men who so gallantly fought and gave their lives so that this nation under God... That is why we are honored to welcome from the bottom of our grateful hearts this hero of heroes, Major Kelvin Russell. May we have a picture of you, General Cutler, uh, shaking hands with the Major? Excuse me, uh, Nurse Wilson. Will you take me back to my compartment, please? But the picture! Uh, what is this? Forrest! Forrest, do something! He turned his back on me and walked out! Forrest, do something! a very auspicious beginning to a ceremony which General Cutler hoped would solidify his political career. What is it that makes Major Russell turn away from his old commander in the field? At this point, one can only guess it is of such magnitude that the former prisoner of war risks a reprimand or even a court-martial. I shall return shortly with Act Two. Washington at the end of the Civil War. General Benjamin Cutler seeks a political opportunity which might make his name better known. To further that desire, he has arranged for the last prisoner of war to be released from the infamous Andersonville prison and arrive for a ceremonial welcome. Only the Major isn't buying. He will not cooperate. Have they left the railroad station yet, Nurse Wilson? They are leaving now. Major, what are you going to do? Sit here in the compartment until the whole party is gone? The only person I don't wish to lay eyes on is Cutler. When he goes, I'll come out. But there is a reception planned at his house. The Secret Service agent told me the Secretary of War plans to be there. Now, you're not going to insult him, are you? Mm -hmm. You think there's something wrong with me, don't you? One doesn't have to be very clever to realize something happened between you two during the war and that you haven't forgiven him. No, I haven't. Major Russell, the general has left. May I say a word to you? Shall I leave? No, of course not. Come in, Forrest. I guess uh, I owe you an explanation. You don't owe it to me. Well, I don't know Cutler or anything either. What are we going to do now? Mrs. Cutler is at their home and everything is laid on. A message will be read to you from President Lincoln. Even the Marine Band is there. I don't mind all that. It's Cutler himself. Well, then you're in luck. The general had to return to the capital. Everything ran so late, he won't be going with you to his farm. Well, I'll go to the reception. I'll meet his wife, sure. Anything, so long as I don't have to shake his hand or talk to him. 
Major, it's all in your honor. Everyone who is here today honors you. I'm sorry my husband had to go back to Washington, but he has a great deal to attend to. We uh, saw each other on the platform of the last car of the train. I wonder if I could speak to you for a moment. Oh, certainly, Timothy. Uh, Major, will you excuse us? I shall be right back and give you a first-hand tour of our little farm. Don't let any of the reporters intimidate you. Well, that's all right, Mrs. Cutler. I, I won't. Mrs. Cutler, we have a problem with the Major. I didn't have time to explain to you why we arrived from the railroad station so late, but he refused to come out on the observation platform for the general's welcome. Refused? He finally did. It took a lot of persuading. There's been some experience the Major and the General shared at Chattanooga, and the Major still holds some kind of a grudge. Could you, Mrs. Cutler, somehow get the Major to agree to talk to the reporters, at least to one of them? Well, of course he will. I'll make him. After all, the whole purpose of having him arrive here in the first place is so that we could generate some publicity to help the General's political image. Now, if we could only get the Major to acknowledge his indebtedness and all of those freed from Andersonville, indebted to the general. Well, you can imagine how the public would react. You are talking to the one person who could not agree with you more, Timothy. Well, here we are back. Mr. Forrest, I think that's a wonderful idea, and I suggest you pick up whoever you think will do the best job and have them down by the lily pond. I'll do that. Thank you very much. Now, yeah, Major, did my husband tell you of his infatuation with growing water lilies? No, ma'am. No, we never got round to talking about that. Yeah, he's mad for them. You wouldn't think so, a big burly soldier like him. And now we shall tour Burnside. We named our farm after the Major General himself. Oh. Well, he'd be pleased, ma'am. Yes, over a thousand acres of good farming land. Well, he'd like that. I want to show you the lily pond. It's uh, quite a little distance down this path. Uh, you don't mind that? Uh, walking with the cane, I mean. Mrs. Cutler, with this cane, I've walked to Hades and back. And I intend to keep on walking. I would like to see all the sights on the General's farm. You just show me the way. I'll follow. <laughs> There it is. Ma, isn't that the most beautiful lily pond you ever saw? They're not all water lilies, you know. That one's a floating heart. And all around the edge, those big leaves, elephant ears. And there's a water hyacinth. Uh, Mrs. Cutler, uh, may I introduce myself? Wilbur May of the New York Weekly News. Well, how do you do? Uh, Tim Forrest said the uh, major might be ready to be interviewed. I think so. I hope you agree, Major Russell. You know, there are 150 reporters from up north covering the war, and for me to get first crack at interviewing Calvin is a great piece of luck. Right, Cal? You and the Major know one another? Well, Calvin and I are cousins. We're uh, real proud of you at home, Cal. Well, that's splendid. I think I can safely leave you two alone. Oh, uh, there's only one thing I'll ask of you, Mr. May, and that is... I'd like your readers to know it was General Benjamin Cutler who was responsible for getting so many of our boys out of Andersonville. Uh, certainly. I hope it all goes well. Well, uh, how do you feel, Cal? Did you hear what she said about Cussed Cutler getting our men out of Andersonville? Uh-huh. Mm. If it weren't for him, there wouldn't have been so many Union boys in Andersonville. Oh, is that so? Well, this is some celebration I got going for you. No, it don't fool me, Willie. Cutler never did anything for anyone but himself. Huh. If it, if it hadn't have been for Cutler, we'd never have been in that prison. We were betrayed. That's the real story. Betrayed by who? Will you print it if I tell you? <laughs> now, come on. What a question to ask. An exclusive with a top-ranking former prisoner of war? Why wouldn't I? Now, for one thing, it knocks the stuffing out of your big Washington hero. General Cutler? Hmm. Take a load off your feet, Willie, and thank the Lord you got the use of both of them. 
You know I have to go into a hospital for a wooden leg? Yeah, I'm very sorry about that. Were you tortured at Andersonville? Yes, but that's not how I lost my leg. I'll tell you how. Where do you want me to begin? Well, Cal, it was your war. You tell it. It was November, back in 63. Longstreet had pushed us with our backs to Chattanooga. Bragg did nothing. He just sat there, thinking he could starve out the rebels. We were upriver. And uh, then Cutler got the bright idea to build rafts and float the troops past the enemy and gain a foothold on the southern bank. Williams, how many rafts are ready now? Only enough for about 500 troops, sir. Why are they so slow? I've got to move 2,500 men before dawn. The men are doing the best they can, sir. Russell, Colonel Russell. Has anyone seen Major Russell? General Cutler, yes, sir. What is it, General? Williams tells me the rafts won't be finished before tomorrow night. So we wait. I'm sure Williams could supply enough rafts tonight for 1,000 troops. What are you thinking? Well, we send two contingents. One tonight of 1,000 men, and one tomorrow of 1,500. If the 1,000 men get through tonight, the Johnny Rebs on Lookout Mountain aren't going to be caught napping tomorrow night. <laughs> Up there on Lookout Mountain. <sighs> Tomorrow, that'll be your responsibility, Cal. With the 1,500 men? I have every confidence you'll make it. Floating downstream, armed with just our rifles. They'll be waiting for us, and they'll cut us into small pieces. Major, it's an order. And that's just what the rebels did. We never got as far as the southern bank. Of the 1,500 with me on the chained rafts, a 1,000 were blown out of the water. 500 were shot as they tried to swim to shore, and the rest of us were rounded up and taken to Andersonville. It was in that action that my leg got shut up. Well, that's never been told. Well, there's only one man to blame, Will, and that's Cutler. He was responsible. When you're locked up and you see 500 men dying of scurvy, no food worth eating, mush for days, weeks, months... I understood it was pretty fierce. You don't know the half of it, Will. My men, the best men in the world, dead and dying all around me. Because one man gives an order against all common logic and common sense, he orders 1,500 floating sitting ducks to their death. Yeah, I... I can't tell you how horrified and sorry I am. Sending men down to Mississippi like that in two groups may have been a tactical error. It happens in war, Cal. But it shouldn't. I told him not to. We had one chance to make it, not two. Sure, the first rafts got through, but the next night they were waiting for us. But do you hold Cutler responsible for conditions in Andersonville? I do. For those who died there because of him, you bet I do. And he has the nerve, the gall, to ask me to be his standard bearer for his political career. I almost exploded when I heard that. All right. I'll write it, Cal. Is there any more you'd like to add? Just more of the same, Willie. Betrayal and hell. I don't like to interrupt you, gentlemen, but I've wonderful news. Uh, Mrs. Cutler, uh... The Major has given me all I need. The General has returned. He's here. Isn't that marvelous? Mr. Forrest is just bringing him down. I'm going up the path to meet them. Willie, get me out of here. What am I going to do? You are going to face him, Calvin. What are you running away from? Here you are, accusing the General of a despicable act, of sacrificing needlessly 1,500 of our own men without a thought. Only you are telling me. Cal. You're a major in the Union Army. Talk to the general. Tell him to his face what you think of him and why. Your ghost has come back from Andersonville and orders you to speak up. Here I am again, Major. (laughs) 
Sorry I had to get off to the capital of our great nation, but business before pleasure any time. Uh, Benjamin, this is Mr. Wilbur May. He's with the New York Weekly News. Oh, an excellent newspaper. I'd be glad to make a statement. Uh, no, Benjamin, not now. You two men will feel more at ease if I take Mr. May off with me. Uh, please, sir, do come along. All right. We'll leave you both alone. Mr. May, may I take your arm? Really? I'll talk to you later. Calvin, I'm sorry. The way it turned out. Deeply sorry. You scum. You never once admitted you gave that order that killed so many of us. Admitted it? How? How? Publicly. I knew you didn't. I had a nurse who came down especially from Washington. She didn't know a thing about Chattanooga, said no one did. It was unforgivable. I've never forgiven myself either, Calvin. But that was two years ago. Why bring it up now? I see them all floating down the Mississippi that night. Fifteen hundred of us. And the gunfire and the screaming... Have you ever heard hundreds of men screaming in agony at the same time? Hundreds diving and falling into the water. Hundreds more gasping and drowning. The river red with their blood. All dead. All but a handful. And myself ending up to die by inches in Andersonville. Because cursed Cutler railroaded us to that death. Don't tell me you had no way of knowing. You were the general. I was only a major. I warned you what would happen. Calvin, you're getting yourself all het up. Did you honestly think I would come out of a rebel prison to praise you so that you could hold some political office? Suppose you got elected. What would you do under fire to the American people? Sell them down the river to die? What do you want me to do? I'm sorry. I told you how sorry I was. I have nightmares about it still. But life must go on. Why must it go on, Ben? Why must it go on for you? What are, what are you going to do with that gun? Not for you, life won't go on. Join the others who died in the river and in prison. <laughs> is fired. Its sound echoes not only across the general's farm near Washington, but across the entire country. The bullet misses its mark. It grazes but does not wound the general. But there is a gaping wound in his reputation, which will never heal. I shall return shortly with Act Three. It's not easy to arrest a war hero for attempted murder, and General Cutler won't permit it. In the scuffle, he pockets the Major's gun and quickly retires to his room. Secret Service agent Timothy Forrest tries to spread the story that what happened was an accident, a service revolver discharging unintentionally. But fear is in the air, and the night is churned by thunder, lightning, and rain. Then... It is morning. Is that you, Forrest? Uh, Tim Forrest? Wilbur. Oh, I'm not too pleased to see you. Have you seen the general? He grabbed that gun of Cal Russell so fast and disappeared, I, I haven't had a chance to get his side of the story. What they said to each other, how it happened, you know. Oh, I told you, it went off accidentally. Tim, I didn't believe that. Have you seen General Cutler? Well, Mrs. Cutler said he may be walking the ground. He isn't. I've searched every inch of the place, up at five to do it. I want to get to the general before every other reporter in the country shows up. Now, you know where he is. That's your job. Are you sure he's not out there? A thousand acres? He'll show up. Tim, I've got a press deadline. Why don't we try his room, just, just in case? Well, I suppose he could have returned and gone upstairs a back way so he wouldn't be seen. Hiding from the press. <laughs> All right, I'll follow you. Uh, no, 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 I can find it alone. Uh, no, you don't. If you interview the general... I am going to be there.
General? General Cutler? You think he went back to bed? General Cutler, are you in there? Well, try the door. It's unlocked. Hey, let's go in. Well, there he is, with his back to us, sitting at his desk. General, I'm sorry to disturb you. I hope you don't mind my barging in like this, but Wilbur May here wanted to get a statement. Good Lord. He's fainted. He fell forward. Forrest. What's the matter? Oh, it's his blood. Look on the desk. He's, oh. he's been shot. He just keeled over. Oh, Lord in heaven. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll get no, someone. No, no, it's too late. He's dead. The general's dead. How can that be? He's been dead a couple of hours. Sitting like that with a bullet hole in his head. Uh. Leaning back in his armchair and then falling onto his desk. Forrest, uh... Forrest, I, I have to write this. All of it. Those powder burns on his temple. He's been shot at close range. Very close. Mm, someone he knew. Someone he let come right up to him. Tim, maybe it wasn't murder. Maybe it was suicide. A, a shame, you know? What the major accused him of. No, no, no. It couldn't have been suicide. Well, what are you really looking for? For the two missing things that might... Might, I said, make me think suicide. But they're not here. Two things are missing? But do you see a farewell note? Any note? A word to his wife? A written explanation why he killed himself? And the other missing item, even more important. If the general shot himself, where's the gun? You're right. Where's the gun? It was murder... And the murderer took it with him. I'll bet a year's wages when they examine the bullet, they'll find it was fired from the Major's gun. What are you going to do about Cal Russell? What can I do but place him under arrest? He's the prime suspect. I don't look forward to the next two steps. Oh? What's that? Placing the Major under arrest, and then finding Mrs. Cutler and breaking the terrible news to her. But I didn't kill him. Major, you'll have to do more than merely say so. A great many witnesses saw you take the shot at him. Yes, that was yesterday. I know that I must have been out of my mind to do it. I know that. To hate a man is one thing, but to be a judge, jury, and executioner is another. Besides, uh, you say there's no gun. Yes, that's a consideration at this moment. But whoever shot the general could have thrown the gun in any of a hundred places. But it will be found. And make no mistake about that. Hasn't it occurred to the Secret Service, Mr. Forrest, that since I was sleeping way off in the servant's wing, if during the night I'd hobbled with my crutch all the way to the general's room, and I still don't know where that is... Isn't it likely in all that time from my room to his and back someone would have seen me? Someone probably did. But right now they're not coming forward. Maybe they hated the general also. And you did their job for them. Uh, on one foot and one crutch. You believe that? I believe a man of your will, who can survive death and imprisonment, can do almost anything he wants to, Major. So my word means nothing to you. What are you going to do? I've sent for some irons for your hands and feet. You're going to put irons on one crutch and my one good foot? You knew he was dead before I saw you, Mrs. Cutler. My maid came and told me, Timothy. You're a very brave woman. You become very acquainted with death when you're married to a soldier. Let's keep walking, Timothy. Mrs. Cutler... Are you sure you feel like walking the grounds just now? I feel if I don't keep moving, I shall die. All of us in Washington love the general. He'll be missed. Yes, all of us. We'll miss him. I'm going to get to the bottom of this, I promise you. It's the last thing I do. I can't tell you how desperate I feel over this tragedy. When I was assigned to the general, 
It was such an honor. The department trusted me to protect him. Timothy, don't blame yourself. Now, who else is there to blame? What has Major Russell said? Uh, he denies everything. Says he was asleep. Isn't that possible? How can he prove it, Mrs. Cutler? What angers me as much as shames me is the story the Major gave as reason for his hatred for your husband. The more I go over it in my mind, sending rafts with 1,500 men, knowing the rebels must be lying in wait, the more I realize it's a wicked, wicked lie. No, Timothy. It wasn't. Calvin Russell's story of what happened was not a lie. It was the truth? Yes. Every word. Mr. Forrest, how long am I going to be kept under restraint? I've sent for the Attorney General. He'll decide. Did you grant me my request? Yes, I did. Oh, that must be her. Come in, Mrs. Cutler. What? What have you done to him? He's in irons, Mrs. Cutler. Oh, no, that is horrible. It's horrible. Timothy, you must undo those irons immediately. I'm sorry, but I cannot. I must wait for the Attorney General and the Prosecutor of the Military Court. We are treating him worse than the Southerners did in Andersonville. No one was hobbled like this. I can't bear it. I won't have it. I'm truly sorry, Mrs. Cutler, but the Major is the only suspect we have at the moment. I can't have a human being treated this way. Major... I'm going to take steps this very moment so that these terrible things are removed and you are set free. Well, how do you aim to do that? I'm going to show you who killed my husband. You know that? I have known it since the night he died. It's there, Timothy. There at the bottom of Benjamin's lily pond. If you take a stick and move some of those water lilies, I'm sure you'll see it. What will I see? The gun that killed him. You saw the murderer throw it down there? I threw the gun into the pond. Yes, it's so. That night, in spite of the thunder, I... I heard the shot. I ran to his room. He had killed himself. On the desk was a note. It's down there also. I threw it into the pond. What did it say? That he knew he gave the wrong command. And since that day, he had been haunted by every death of every man. He couldn't live any longer with the shame of it. And asked me to forgive him. What could I do? I wanted so even in death, to protect Benjamin. It never occurred to me the Major might be accused of his death, so I took what Ben had written and pulled the pistol from his hand and threw them down there in the lily pond. So now, will you remove the irons from that brave man? Before, this slightly tarnished piece of Americana is a tale of the brave and the mistakes and tragedies that followed. Here at the Mystery Theater, we have condensed many of the events as well as changed the names of the actual participants. Otherwise, it is what it is. A rather battered and torn page of American history. I shall return shortly. If you've been reading about wise money management in your favorite publications, you've undoubtedly heard about Dreyfus Liquid Assets, one of the world's largest money market funds, and about the big yields you can get on your money right now. 
Start with as little as $2,500. Make added investments as low as $100. With Dreyfus Liquid Assets, your money is yours whenever you need it. Phone for it. Have it sent to your bank or write a redemption check for cash or to pay your larger bills. You keep right on earning that high yield compounded daily until your check clears. No penalties on interest. No sales charge. No charge for the checks. It's so simple, sensible, convenient. But find out for yourself. Call toll-free 800-228-5000 for free information and a prospectus, including management fee, charges, and expenses. Read the prospectus carefully before investing or sending money. Discover how Dreyfus Liquid Assets can help you get the lion's share of today's high money market rates. 800-228-5000. Toll-free 800-228-5000. Socrates said it so very much better than anything I could devise. So permit me to speak his words. The long, unmeasured pulse of time moves everything. There is nothing hidden that it cannot bring to light. Nothing unknown that may not become known. The history of the great events of this world is little more than the history of crimes. Our cast included Tony Roberts, Kid Lay, Bob Caliban, and Terry Keane. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Queen Belloc, you know what I had not had the nerve to say to me? Henry, calm yourself. Oh, to put it mildly, Le Majesté, huh? <laughs> I made that woman, and I can break her. I was forced to marry her. You would have me believe that? Yes, yes, her sorcery bewitched me, but it's all over. Over and done with. It's because of young Jane Seymour, isn't it? Well, might be. She's a charming creature. I won't be punished if I marry her, I can assure you of that. Your Majesty, who has punished you? Who would dare? Ah, for a wise man, you talk like a fool. A man is denied a son. Is that not the Lord's displeasure and anger? Well, I shall marry a third. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the terrifying world of your own imagination. I would like to offer a few observations on the vagaries of the animal called man. Take the popular saying, seeing is believing. What idiot first said that? And how many idiots have repeated it since? Do you believe in love? Tell me the color of it. Do you believe in truth, goodness, mercy? What shapes do they come in? No, my friends. Seeing is not believing. Only believing is believing. And we'll prove it to you in the story that follows. The longer we're away from this earth, Alice, the less we rely on our senses. The senses, in a manner of speaking, start to fade little by little. They tell me this is quite normal. Actually, they tell me I'm a bit ahead of the game to be able to enjoy as much as I do. Charles, when you say they, they tell you this and they tell you that, you mean... 
I mean them, of course. All those. The ones up there? It isn't up there, Alice. And it isn't down there either. Well, where is it? It's simply there. Meaning, not here. I thought you knew that. Are there a lot of them? Of course there are a lot of them. What would you expect? Our mystery drama, The Ghost at the Gate, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Beatrice Strait. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. With how much ease believe we what we wish. An English playwright named Dryden wrote that in the year 1679... Brilliant man, Mr. Dryden. But wait. Listen to this. Men freely believe that which they desire. Someone else seems to have had the same idea. And he wasn't a 17th century English playwright. He was a Roman emperor named Julius Caesar. Proving once again that no man in any age has a monopoly on wisdom. Now... Let's get on with our story. Come in, Dorothea. Your chocolate, Mrs. Emery. Oh, good. Uh, shall I light the fire in the fireplace? Yes, please. I think it's chilly enough for... Oh, Dorothea. Ma'am? You forgot the other cup again. I did. I told you to always bring two cups. Oh, it seems so silly. I'll decide what's silly. When it's just you to drink it. I've explained that to you, Dorothy, and more than once. I like to drink two cups of chocolate before retiring. And I don't like that icky sediment in the bottom of the cup. Uh, I'll try, Mrs. Emery. Um, now, if that's all... Or, or do you want me to go downstairs and fetch up another cup? Oh, no, no. Go to bed. Oh. Good night, Mrs. Emery. Good night, Dorothea. All right now, darling. Chocolate's all poured. Fire's lighted. Charles, everything's ready. Now, come on, darling, or the chocolate will get cold. Don't want any chocolate. Oh, Charles, you love chocolate. You always love chocolate. Tastes like mud. But it's very good chocolate. You know what good chocolate Dorothea makes. Now, come on, Charles, don't make me wait. You want me? Want you? Oh, Charles, how can you ever ask such a thing? Why, I go through the whole day thinking of you. All afternoon at the community chest, I think about you. My darling, it's... It's torture for me listening to those other women whose husbands are... are with them in their conventional way. I want to scream at them, but I have my Charles, you silly females. Every night he comes to my bedroom and he, he's tall and handsome and brilliant and romantic and adorable and manly and and we sit and talk together and it's... All right, Alice. That's enough. There you are. Oh, Charles. Missed me? Oh, darling, the days are so terrible. I can't think of anything but this moment when we're together. But you know that, my dear. I tell you every single night. I need to hear it, Alice. We who have more or less left this world can't come back unless we are wanted by someone who is still here. Wanted a lot. Otherwise, we can't make the trip, as it were. We can't even purchase a ticket, so to speak, unless we have a destination that is vibrant with love and need and desire. But I love you and I need you. I desire you. You should know that, Charles. Well, it doesn't hurt to hear it. Here's your chocolate. Try it. I don't want it. Oh, Charles. The longer we're away from this earth, Alice, the less we rely on our senses. The senses, in a manner of speaking, start to... to fade. Mashed potatoes begin to taste like cold cream. Coffee tastes like iodine. And this chocolate tastes like mud. 
they tell me this is quite normal. Charles, when you say they, they tell you this and they tell you that, you mean... I mean them, of course. All those. The ones up there? It isn't up there, Alice. And it isn't down there, either. Well, where is it? It's simply there. Meaning not here. Heaven, I thought you knew that. Are there a lot of... of them? Of course there are a lot of them. It's all so vast, so endless, and so damnably peaceful. I know what it is to be lonely, Charles. This big house, I couldn't bear to move out of it after you weren't here all the time, because I couldn't leave the place where you and I had spent so many happy years together. Why don't you ask someone to move in with you? Move in? Why, I, I never thought. Such a large house. You could have separate quarters. You wouldn't be forever bumping into each other. But who would want to move in? Who would I want to move in? Oh, some old good friend. Well, like who, Charles? Oh, someone like Connie, maybe. Connie Lawrence. Connie Lawrence? Well, I've certainly known her long enough. We were roommates at school. What do you think she'd want to? She'll jump at the chance, would be my guess. She still lives in that tiny one-room apartment. I, I know she's saving for her retirement. And with the pay school teachers get in this town. Charles, I'll call her tomorrow. She gets home from school at three. <laughs> Your breakfast, Mrs. Emery. Thank you. Um, you don't want two cups in the morning, do you? Oh, no. Mm. <laughs> no. Coffee doesn't leave that icky stuff the way chocolate does. Actually, I think I won't have chocolate at night anymore, Dorothea. I feel like trying something else. But two cups, just the same. Don't forget. Yes, ma'am. Do don't go just yet, Dorothy. I want to talk to you about something. Sit down, won't you? Uh oh, y yes, ma'am. Dorothea, do you find the work too hard in this big house? No, ma'am. Well, we used to have a houseman and an upstairs maid and a cook. Oh, I have no complaints, Mrs. Emery, if you don't. Oh, I don't. This is the only job I've ever had. I've worked here for 22 years. I was so fond of both you and, and Mr. Emery right from the start, and I still am of you. And well, goodness knows I practically worship this house. It's so beautiful. I love taking care of it, and I love living in it. Do you still have that little room on the third floor in the back? Oh, I love that little room, Mrs. Emery. I can look out and see the garden. I was thinking, why couldn't we give you all the other rooms as well? The rooms the other servants used to have. All of them? Well, why couldn't we knock out the partition between your room and what used to be the cook's room? I'd have... I'd have two windows. And make one of the other rooms into a really big dressing room. Oh. And maybe put in some kind of a kitchen for you with a hot plate and a refrigerator. Oh, Mrs. Emery, I never thought I... I never imagined in my wildest dreams. No, no. <laughs> it's all settled. Oh. I'm going to stay right here in bed all morning and make plans. I don't know... How to thank you, Mrs. Emery. <laughs> Don't try. It's my pleasure. I just hope I deserve all of oh, Before I forget, Dorothea. Forget? Yes. Last night, while I was drinking your lovely chocolate, an idea came to me. You and I are, are rattling around in this big house. Oh, we certainly are. And I was wondering, well, how would it be if we invited Miss Lawrence to stay with us? Miss Constance Lawrence? Do you remember her? Isn't she the one who teaches school? Used to come to dinner once in a while. And after she'd help Mr. Emery with the double cross stick? <laughs> That's Connie. Oh. I thought we could open up the two big rooms on this floor in the back. In that way, she and I would have separate quarters and not be, you know, bumping into each other all the time. Of course, I, I imagine she'd expect to take care of her own room. Oh, I wouldn't mind. Let's do more rooms. You wouldn't mind cooking for her? Oh, what's one more person to cook for? Nothing. Oh. Well, then, it's all settled. My 
goodness. The house will be kind of lively again. Almost like before. Not quite, of course, but... Well, you know what I mean. I know what you mean, Dorothea. <laughs> it will be uh, more lively. Will you? Then I'll scratch your head for you. Oh, dear. You're just going to have to wait. I'm sorry, Goldie. Hello? Connie, this is Alice Emery. Alice, how are you? Long time no see. <laughs> well, I don't get out a great deal. Maybe we can have dinner some evening. Would you like to come here? Well, I, I thought you might like to come here. Well, if you'd rather... Heaven knows your dinners are better than mine. Connie, I want you to come here for good. I mean to live. To live? To live with you? Why not? We've known each other practically all our lives. And I've got this huge house. I've got Dorothea to look after us. You could have your own quarters overlooking the garden. We live quite independently since I'm in the front. And you're at school till three. And by the time you get home, I'll be at the community chest. We'll just meet for dinner. Maybe have a little nip together first. Oh, Connie, say you will. Oh, Alice, I don't know. I, I've lived here for so long. That tiny little place. High time you got out of it. But I'm used to it. And then there's Goldie. You know, my canary. Bring Goldie with you. We'll find a nice sunny window. Alice, it, it's all very tempting, but... I don't know. Think about having two big rooms and vegetables out of the garden and being waited on. And Connie, think of the money you'll say. Well, yes, but all the same. You've just got to say yes, Connie. Take the afternoon to think about it and call me back. I will, Alice. I'll call you soon. Fine. Bye. Bye, Alice. <coughs> oh, dear. It all sounds so... Luxurious. Two rooms and fresh vegetables. And somewhere to cook for me. But I can't leave this little place. I can't give up my afternoons. Why, I couldn't live without my afternoons. I, I know this place is small and dark and furniture is dingy and the bathroom is old-fashioned. But we've never minded, have we, dearest? Have we? It's a very small place, Connie. But if I move into Alice's house, I might lose you forever. You might never come to visit me again, and all my lovely afternoons would be really over. You're not to worry, Connie. You mean we can go on as we always have? Only we'll have more room. Well, if you say so. Trust me, Connie. Oh, I do trust you, Charlie. Haven't I always trusted you? All these years? His flesh may be weak, but the spirit of Charles, or Charlie, is very, very willing. Also, very inventive. And very persuasive. Ah, oh, well... There's nothing like the love of a good woman. Unless it's the love of two good women. We'll come back in a bit for Act Two. Now we come back to our story. We seem to have uncovered a triangle here. Connie, Alice, and Charles. Or Charlie as Connie calls him. And the apex of the triangle is naturally, uh, if you will pardon my chauvinism, the man. Listen now to the second act of The Ghost at the Gate. What a lovely dinner that was, Alice. <laughs> was it, Connie? It was the wine that made everything taste so good. Whatever gave you the idea of bringing home a bottle of wine? Alice! 
It's the first anniversary of me moving in here. Don't you realize? I've been here a month. Well, for heaven's sake. Why, it seems like a week. Or it seems like you've always lived here. I don't know which. It has worked out, hasn't it? Has it ever worked out? I was so afraid it wouldn't. You know what? It's meeting just for dinner that's done it. Leading separate lives except for dinner. Connie, let's have wine every night. This wine. What kind is it? I can't quite make out what the label says. Oh, it's in French. Oh, so never mind. It's got a picture of a house on it. If it's French, it's a chateau. I didn't know that. You're very clever, Alice. <laughs> Save the label, and I'll order a case of it. Must be really nice to have money. I've always found it to be nice. I guess money is about the nicest thing in the world. Money isn't. Love is. Oh, yes. First comes love. Friends come second. Then money. How about friends who have money? <laughs> oh, Connie, you're very witty tonight. So are you, Alice. <laughs> witty and profound. <laughs> Seriously, though, Connie, you have been happy here, haven't you? Oh, Alice, my beautiful room, the marvelous food. Having Dorothy to make my bed and clean up, it's heavenly. <laughs> You're stuck with me. Oh, I am so glad, Connie. You can't imagine how glad. Is there any more of that wine? More than half a bottle. Oh, good. Let's... Mrs. Emery. What? Oh, Dorothea. What is it? It's after nine o'clock, Mrs. Emery. You don't say. I was wondering, should I bring your clear consomme upstairs to you? What clear consomme? Well, Mrs. Emery, we talked about it last night. Remember when you decided to give up the chocolate and then we tried apple juice and prune juice and lemonade and last night you said clear consomme because it has a nice aroma? Well, I did say that, didn't I? Uh-huh. What time did you say it was? Quarter past nine. <gasps> my goodness. What's the matter, Alice? Past time. Past my bedtime. You want the consomme? Oh, to heck with the consomme. I'll take the wine. You don't mind, do you, Connie? Why, no, Alice. Oh, let me have your glass, too, all right? Sure, Alice. I've got my glass, Connie. Forgive me for eating and running. Alice, it's your house. <laughs> I simply didn't realize the time. A quarter past nine. Ever. She'd better not drink any more of that wine. She's not used to it. Neither am I. Only tonight we were celebrating my being here a month. Mm -hmm. Why did you want two glasses, Dorothea? Oh, she always wants two. Two cups, two bowls, two glasses. One of her little ways. But tonight she took my glass. Do you suppose she wants me to join her? I wouldn't know, Miss Lawrence. Maybe. Maybe she's always expected me to join her after dinner. Only she didn't want to suggest it. When I moved in here, we agreed that we'd lead absolutely independent lives, not get in each other's way. We've been very careful about that. Going to our separate rooms after dinner. <laughs> Maybe all this time she was hoping I'd stop by her room on my way to my room. And I never noticed Doris there. That must be it. I wouldn't really know. I never guessed. Oh, how self-centered. How insensitive. I'll never forgive myself. I'm going up there right now and apologize. Can I clear the table now? Do whatever you like. She's got to forgive me. That's all there is to it. Dear, sweet, generous Alice, she'll understand. No, I didn't mean to hurt her feelings. Alice, <laughs> may I come in? Come on, darling, have some wine. Alice? Connie and I had it for dinner. We just loved it. Try it, Charles. Charles? Not at all bad. Nice bouquet. Charlie! Charlie! Where did you come from, Connie? You never told me. How could you, Charlie? Charlie? Just give me a moment and I'll explain everything. But I need a moment to think. Then I'll explain. What did you think of Charlie's explanation? I've heard it all before. How he needs lots of love to make the trip from there to here. He always needed a lot of love, even when he was just here. Well, he got a lot. Did he really spend all those afternoons with you? I mean, before he left here and went there? Five afternoons a week. Alice, 
Do you hate me? I should. I know, but do you? I guess I do when it comes right down to it. I'll move out. I'll move back to my one room. But I don't want you to move out. Oh, we were having such a good time. Remember how we were laughing and carrying on at dinner? I haven't laughed like that in years and years. Could have been the wine. There's half a bottle left. Should we? Let's. You don't think we'll turn into a couple of alcoholics, do you? Not on half a bottle of wine. Like what wine? <laughs> well, here's to... To what? Here's to Charles. To Charlie. I feel as if I've just buried him. Say goodbye forever. Did he really come to see you five afternoons a week, Connie? At three o'clock. You see, my school and his bank let out at the same time. It was practically inevitable. Charlie was a no-good man. He still is. Only now he's a... A, a, a no-good ghost. Oh, Alice. <laughs> There's enough wine left for a glass apiece. Fill her up. Hold out your glass. All that stuff about needing to be loved and wanted or he couldn't make the trip. Remember what we were saying at dinner, Connie, about love being the most important thing? I've always believed that. And friends being the second most important thing? Especially friends like you, Alice. And like you, Connie. I feel closer to you right now than I've ever felt to anybody. My mother, my father, my canary. We've been through a lot, Connie. Just in the last half hour. And yet we're still friends. Isn't that amazing? Truly remarkable. It must mean something. Something very profound. Like what? Like, well, like there are times in a person's life when love isn't the most important thing. Friends are. A friend. Yes. Stupid ghost. Silly, pompous ghost. You believe in ghosts? Certainly not. Neither do I. Never have. Except Charlie, of course. Why should Charlie be an exception? He is for you too, Alice. You know he is. Tell me something. Why do you believe in him? Because... Why? I want to. That's why I believe in him, too. Is that wrong? Not wrong, but you've got to stop, and I've got to stop. We can't have him visiting you in the back of the house from 3 to 6, and then coming to see me in the front of the house from 9 to 12. Now that we know, it wouldn't be nice. We couldn't be friends anymore. Oh, Alice. But if we don't believe in him, if we don't, or don't desire him, then he'll have to go back there and stay there. He won't be able to come here anymore. He can't make the trip. Connie, can you do it? Stop wanting him? Yes. Of course I can. Why, well, I'm having a wonderful time. I don't need him. Neither do I. We'll be better off without him. We'll be free, Connie. Liberated women. Let's drink to that. Right you are. Bottoms up. Ah, what courage lies in the bottom of a glass. Courage for the shy, the lonely, the frightened the frustrated, and for the two elderly ladies determined to forget a ghost. We'll return shortly with Act Three. Alice and Connie are bravely resolved to forget the man both had loved so long. But what of him? Poor, lonely, unloved ghost. Doomed to live on forever in the there. Banished forever from the here. What of him? Connie. Connie. Speak to me, Connie. That's my sweet Goldie. That's my lovely bird. Happy to see me, sweetheart? Connie, I know you're here. 
I'm here, Charlie, but you're not. I am so. I don't believe in you anymore. You do, too. And I don't love you or want you, so there. Connie, you are being very cruel. I expect I am. If you don't believe me, why are you talking to me? Don't try to confuse things, Charlie. Answer my question. Why are you talking to me if you don't believe in me? Goldie, tell that ghost to go away. How did it go today, Connie? Oh, he was around. I could hear him. What did he want? The usual. Be loved. Be wanted. I told him no more of that. You had a conversation with him? Not much of a one. You haven't stopped believing. Have you stopped, Alice? I think so. You haven't. If you'd stopped, you wouldn't say, I think so. You'd know. Oh, Connie, how can I know? Mrs. Emery? What is it, Dorothea? Do you want Cleo Consume in your room tonight or what? Nothing. Not anything? Not a thing. Oh, well, all right. Um, I had it all ready, but... Uh... That ought to show him, don't you think, Connie? It's Charles. It's Charles, Alice. What delicious surprise do you have for me tonight? Orange crush? Pomegranate juice? Not a blessed thing, Charles. Ah, you spoke. I didn't mean to. But you did. How beautiful to hear your voice. Uh, don't tell me that old malarkey, Charles. Malarkey? I never thought I'd hear my wife use a word like that. I'm not your wife. I'm your widow. And I'm using a lot of words I never used before. Alice, say you love me still. I can't make the trip unless you love me. I loved you for 35 years. Alice, I'm facing eternity. What's 35 years? Maybe not much there where you are. But it's a long time here. Now I'm going to turn off the light and go to sleep. I was talking to him before I could stop myself It was the same with me But he couldn't complete the trip because I wouldn't say I loved him Same here And I really don't think I do love him, Connie I think I just got into the habit Me too What does he want to hang around for? I can't imagine Must be so beautiful there where he is why should you want to come here? He says it's very peaceful there. Sounds heavenly. Not much like here, Alice. That's why he keeps coming back. He can't stand the peacefulness. He isn't having any fun. I bet you're right. No worries, no troubles, no arguments, no <laughs> problems. He can't stand it. That's the way he was when he was here. That's why he took up with me. Why else would you want to have a clandestine affair in the afternoon with a middle-aged school teacher when he had a wonderful wife like you? He was bored. He wanted a little excitement. He still wants it. Funny. I always thought people changed when they left this terrible world. I guess they don't. I hope I change. I'd hate to go on the same way for, for eternity. Being petty and jealous and suspicious. Oh, no. Well, how can it be so peaceful there if everyone's the same as they were here? Maybe. Maybe the others don't stay the same. Maybe they accept all that eternal peace and enjoy it. In the meantime, Connie, while we're still here, we have a problem that must be dealt with. Let's face it, neither of us has stopped believing in Charles completely. Alice, I don't know if I'll ever be able to stop completely. Maybe there'll always be some little corner of my mind that goes on believing that Charlie is here. It's the same with me. And as long as we both have that last little shred of belief, he will be here. Wandering around the house making bleating noises. But we won't answer it. We've got to be strong. Use firm measures. But what? Like... Like rejecting him utterly. How do we do that? I have two rooms in the front of the house. Two big rooms with a big bath between. Would you consider taking one of them? 
Well, I, I... That would be what I call rejecting him utterly. He'd never try to visit one of us if the other one was there. Could I bring Goldie? Of course you can bring Goldie. I'll get a canary, too, of the opposite sex. You'll hear some real singing then, all right. <laughs> Let's skip to this. Let's go upstairs now and look at the room, and you can decide what furniture you want to keep and which you want to get rid of. It's all terribly exciting. Oh, Alice, I don't want to be dead for a long time. There. The desk between the windows and the chair here. We'll take out the love seat. And that'll leave room for the bed. What do you think, Connie? I think it's perfect. Now, what color do you want the walls painted? Uh, blue. Blue? Really? <laughs> I'd have thought with your dark hair you'd have wanted pink or yellow. Blue is such a nice background for Goldie. I'll tell you a secret, Alice. My hair is dyed this color. Alice. Alice. Listen to him. He sounds miserable. I expect he is. You really dye your hair, Connie? Do it myself. Want me to? I'll show you how. I wonder why I ever let myself go gray. You'd look lovely. Sort of a pale ash blonde. Pale ash blonde. <laughs> I like the sound of that. Connie. Connie. Where are you, my darling? Poor old thing. Don't you give in. Oh, I won't. I won't. Be strong. Oh, I will. I swear. Connie. Now, you said blue for the walls. Now, what shade of blue? Aquamarine, turquoise, robin's egg? Turquoise. Good. And we'll put white crisscross curtains at the windows. With turquoise chinax. You're right. And we'll get a turquoise and white spread for the bed. Beautiful. Uh, could I possibly have a white rug? A white shag rug. Why not? Alice. Connie. Somebody. Do you mean to sit there and tell me you didn't even take one peek at your new room? I wanted to wait till you got home from community chairs. But well, right after dinner, we'll look at it together. What if the color is wrong? The painter showed me a sample. Pure turquoise. <laughs> we'll eat fast. I can't wait to see it. Dorothy had the bed moved in. Oh, Connie. I hope we'll get along as well as we've been getting along after you move in. We will. We will. And Charlie will go back there and settle down. He'll be much better off. He'll thank us. If I know Charles, he won't. <laughs> well, if you don't know him, I don't know who does. Unless it's you. You know, you're right there. <laughs> Connie, I had a thought. What if I went to the community chest in the morning instead of the afternoon? That way, when you get through school, we could do things like... Like go to the movies. Oh, Atlas, for fun! And you know what else? Weekends, we could take a train into the city and see a play. Or a concert. Or go to a museum. Oh, Alice! All those things I've been wanting to do, only I didn't want to do them alone. And you know what else? You mean there's more? Well, you have that two months off in the summer. We could go to Europe. Europe? I'll pay, of course. Now, don't argue. I'm your rich friend, so I'll pay. Alice, say it again. We're doing the right thing by Charlie, aren't we? Charles must stop being a ghost and settle down. And be happy. He will be happy, won't he? Charles will be happy there in whatever way they are happy there. Just as we will be happy here. I dare say the ways are different, but to each his own. Isn't that the expression? Oh, Alice, <laughs> you do have a way of making everything sound simple. It is simple. If you stare the facts in the face and don't waver... I hope we're not being selfish. We're being realistic, that's all. Sometimes realistic and selfish look like the same thing, but they're not. Finished your coffee? Uh-huh. <laughs> then guess what we're going to do? Go look at my new room. Yes, only wait a minute. Dorothea, I simply can't wait to see it. Yes, Mrs. Emery. You know that case of French wine I ordered? Did it come? The one with the picture of the chateau on the label. It came last week. 
Well, will you uncork a bottle and bring it upstairs to my suite? To our suite? Oh, Alice. And two glasses. Yes, Mrs. Emery. Connie, you and I are going to drink to a brand new life. Three new lives. Yours, mine, and his. Come along. <laughs> Good, the wine's arrived. Just set it down here, Dorothea. Yes, ma'am. Dorothea, Miss Lawrence and I have decided to go to Europe for two months this summer. Oh. So you'll have a good long vacation instead of your usual two weeks. Full salary, of course. You're free to go where you like or, or you can stay here. Oh, thank you, Mrs. Emery. Uh, I don't know where I'd go exactly. Well, suit yourself. Pour the wine, Connie. Will uh, that be all for this evening? That'll be all. Uh, then I'll say good night to you both. <laughs> good night. Sleep well, Dorothy. Thank you. Two whole months. They'll be gone two whole months. What do I do with myself? Dorothea? Where would I go? Dorothea? What would I do if I stayed here in an empty house? Dorothea, can't you hear me? I'd be all by myself. No, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't. If there were just somebody... There he is. There he is. If you'd only listen. Somebody like... Like him. There is me, Dorothea. Oh, Dorothea, hear me. But he's gone. Believe in me. Never to return. Love me. Want me. And I loved him so. Dorothea, listen. And I still do. Oh, I love him still. Dorothea, look at me. Why, Mr. Emery. I thought you'd never notice. Have you... Have you been here long? Not too long. I'm so surprised. I thought I'd never see you again. Ever. Well, now you do. It's like a miracle had been performed. A lot of good hard work is more like it. I've never forgotten you. Really? I... Well, I know it was just that one weekend when Mrs. Emery went to her 25th college reunion, but I've never forgotten. That, that was quite some time ago. I was younger then, of course. You haven't changed, Dorothy. Not an iota. Oh? Still fresh, plump, and, and adorable. Oh? You mean that? I've never met anything so much in my life. Or since. Dorothea, could you love me? Oh, but I, I do love you, Mr. Emery. You do? I've never loved anyone else. Not since that weekend. You came up to my room on the third floor, don't you remember? That tiny little room. Yes, I do remember. Oh, <laughs> Um, you're going to be around for a while? For a long while, Dorothea. Practically indefinitely. Will you be here this summer? This summer and this fall and all next winter and next year. For as long as you want me, Dorothea. Oh. Come on. Let's go up to the third floor. Mr. Emery, could I ask you something first. Anything, Dorothea. Anything. Uh, do you mind if I call you Chuck? Of course I don't mind. <laughs> then come on, Chuck. Follow me. I'm right behind you, darling. Right behind you. <laughs> Charles 
Charles continues his mad pursuit of life after death. And I, for one, wish him the best of luck. And the best of luck to Connie and Alice with their new hairdos and their new pants suits. Good luck to them all. Good luck to all of us. It's what we need the most. I'll be back shortly. I hope you enjoyed our little ghost story. It wasn't meant to be taken too seriously. His life isn't meant to be taken too seriously. Or, for that matter, death. Don't you agree? Our cast included Beatrice Strait, Paula Truman, Joan Loring, and John Barragrave. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. And now, Prometheus, O firebringer, give our friend a sign. A sign, O firebringer. A sign! The ledger on fire! Drop it, Johnson! Drop it! Fear not! Fear not! We are all safe. None of us has sensed this. I now call upon Prometheus for another sign. A sign directly for me. Watch now, Casey. Watch! The man's a sheet of flame. He he should be burned alive. But he'll emerge unharmed when the flames die down. It's a miracle, Casey. It's impressive. But I don't believe in miracles. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time... Pleasant dreams. The KIXI CBS Mystery Theater was brought to you in part by your friendly Tradewell store. I'm E.G. Marshall. Sit down. Anywhere you like. I have a small confession to make. I am crazy about ghosts. And I cannot for the life of me comprehend why anyone should be afraid of them. What, after all, what do ghosts do? They haunt, that's all. To haunt means to visit, to frequent. In short, to hang around. What's so scary about that? A hopeful lover hangs around a lot. If an inspiring lover or a wistful compatriot can hang around without inspiring fear, why not an anxious ghost? Is it... Is it really you, Paul? Yes, Melba. It is I. Paul. Don't cry, Melba. I can't... I can't help it. All right, dearest. Go ahead and cry. Paul. Paul, tell me something. What? Are you happy? Where... Where you are? I'm really sorry you asked me that, Melba. Our mystery drama, Ghost Talk, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Lenka Peterson and Elliot Reed. Yes, ghosts haunt places. 
Traditionally, they haunt large, decrepit mansions with long halls, extensive staircases, and musty attics. But these big old edifices have all disappeared from our landscape. And it is more than likely that the ghost of today has to restrict himself to one-bedroom apartments with bath, kitchenette, and dining area. Poor ghosts. Will he give up haunting altogether? Or will he do what we have done? Adjust. Melba, you have my number? Yes, Leonard. Both at home and at the office. If there's anything I can do, Melba, anything at all. I'll call you. Bless you, my dear. Oh, Paul. Where are you? Where? Oh. Irene. It's me. They've all gone. Leonard Whipple was the last to leave. I'm all alone. No, I'm not crying. I'm trying to be brave and calm and and remember everything you told me. Leonard said to call him if I needed anything, but what does that mean? I need my husband. I need Paul. (laughs) Oh, no, Irene, I couldn't go to the movies. No. I'll just sit here and... Think about Paul. All the beautiful memories. Twenty-two years of beautiful memories. You know, Irene, I keep thinking all the time of what you said to me after the funeral. You said, Paul will never be really dead as long as he's remembered. I keep saying that over and over. Paul isn't really dead as long as he's remembered. I want to thank you, Irene, for that beautiful thought. It means everything to me. Oh, Melba. Melba. How goes it, Paul? Hello. It's Bruce, isn't it? I'm new here. I haven't got everybody straight yet. (laughs) You never will. It doesn't matter. Yes, I am Bruce. Mind if I join you? I wish you would. You had a particularly beatific expression on your face just now as I was floating by. Uh, I was thinking of my wife. My wife, Melba. Why? Why? Well, actually, because she was thinking of me. Remembering our wedding day, I was touched. You're really very new here, aren't you? Oh, yes, very. At the start, everybody is either touched that they're remembered apprehensive that they won't be, or furious that they're not. Melba feels that no one is really dead as long as he's remembered. Is that what you want to be? Not really dead? It sounds nice. Well, it isn't. I don't know how you can say that. Because I happen to know, from bitter personal experience. My sainted mother remembered me every day of her life after I died, till the day she died and joined me here. Since her arrival, I'm happy to say, we've exchanged precisely six words. A while back, she had the grace to apologize. I'm sorry, son, I didn't understand. Those were the six words. Sorry for what? For remembering me. What was she supposed to do? Forget, for goodness sakes. I wouldn't expect her to forget immediately, of course. That would be unreasonable. But as soon as possible, put me out of her mind. My life on earth was over. I'm sure she meant well, your mother. After you're here a while, you'll realize that everybody doesn't mean well and quite often does a lot of harm. But your mother loved you. Then why not leave me alone to enjoy myself? Why wake up in the middle of the night to remember how handsome I looked the day I graduated from dental college? So inconsiderate. Why was it inconsiderate? Because, my dear fellow, if she kept it up long enough, I'd have to stop whatever I was doing and go visit her. Visit her? How could you do that? How? How? Well, the way it's always done. As a ghost, of course. Irene? It's me. Oh, all right, I guess. Leonard was here. We sent out for Chinese food. He left about an hour ago. 
Oh, I'm just sitting here and remembering. I got out the old picture album to show Leonard. <laughs> I don't think Leonard cares too much for travel. I wasn't sorry when he left. Looking at the snapshots and remembering the beautiful life I had with Paul, it seemed to bring him closer. Oh, I mean it, Irene. A couple of times, I, I felt as though he was right here in the room with me. Honestly. Bruce. Oh, Bruce. That you, Paul? I had a terrible time finding you. Well, now you have. I asked everybody where you were, and nobody knew, and then Salome said, oh, he's probably out strolling among the stars. That's his favorite pastime. But I had no idea how many stars there are. You still haven't any idea. Actually, neither have I, and I've been here heaven knows how long. So far, this is my favorite galaxy. But, of course, I haven't seen them all. Has anyone, do you think? Oh, I suppose he has. He must have seen everything. Since the beginning of time. And before that? Ah, uh, yes. What made you come looking for me? Something special? Bruce, I can't get a moment to myself on account of Melba. Your wife. You know what she did. She got out an old snapshot album and started looking over all the pictures we took on our vacations, birthdays, Christmases. Typical. They all do it. The worst part is she showed all these pictures to a friend of mine. Of hers. Ours. Leonard Whipple. He couldn't have cared less. She's really hanging on to you, isn't she? It's very nice of her and all that, but it's... It, it's terribly exciting for me being here. Everything's so completely different. Oh, 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 oh. There she goes again, hear her. Oh, Paul, dear. Dear Paul. Hear that? Vaguely. She just keeps after me and keeps after me. Well, what me. about this Leonard Whipple? Well, he's a very nice guy, but he's not going to hang around much longer if she makes him look at pictures of our honeymoon in the Grand Canyon. Hmm. You couldn't just ignore her, I suppose. Well, she's my wife, and I love her. I mean, she was my wife, and I did love her. But now, things are different. I'd say so. <gasps> well, for goodness sake, look there. If it isn't him... Him? You mean it? Really? Him? I haven't seen him in eons. I never have. Uh, sir? Sir, please? Hmm? No. Oh, yes, yes, it's Bruce. Yes. Am I right? Yes, sir. And this is Paul. He's new. I know. Hello, Paul. I... I'm really thrilled to meet you, sir. The galaxy is looking well, don't you think? I love this galaxy, sir. You set it out so neatly. Hmm. There's one star I've been concerned about. I think it's beginning to twinkle out. Uh, sir, as long as we were so fortunate as to run into you like this, could we have your advice about something? You know I dislike giving advice. It's for me, sir. I don't know what to do about my wife. Is she here? Oh, no. She's with the living. On Earth. Oh. And she's grieving. Well, that's to be expected. She'll stop after a while. She doesn't show any signs of stopping. I, I was wondering if I shouldn't, you know, appear to her. Bruce says it's a simple procedure. Well, you could do that, of course. I never thought very highly of that ghost business, so theatrical. Huh? But if it'll make her feel better? I suppose we do owe a measure of responsibility to the living. You think I could go back for a short visit? Well, you're free to do as you like. If I were to tell you what to do, you wouldn't be free anymore, would you? Well, if you just tell me what you think. No, I really can't do that. That would be tantamount to telling you what to do because of you know, me being who I am. You see, you think I have all the answers. Everybody thinks so. Well, I don't. There are countless things I haven't found answers to. <laughs> However... Like everyone else, I keep trying. And now, uh, I really have to go to see if that poor star is feeling any pain. You'll both excuse me? He wasn't much help. Well, that's his way. Oh, dear. Oh, there she goes again. Dear Paul. Bruce, I'm going to turn ghost and visitor. At least you've made a decision. How do I go about it? Well, there are no hard and fast rules. 
Actually, not many of us do it. It's, it's, it's considered kind of freaky. Freaky? Look how many of us there are and how few of them. If we all took to ghost walking, we'd have them outnumbered trillions to one. I don't care. I want to do it. I just need to know how. Well, you can do it in the old-fashioned way. Clanking chains, winds whistling through the trees, moon behind black clouds and all that. I don't think Melba would go for that. Well, then there's the crying, sobbing type of ghost. Inconsolable weeping. Since I don't feel particularly inconsolable... Well, then there's the ghost that flits through the halls, appearing and disappearing. Now you see it, now you don't. Now we don't have a hall, just a rather small foyer. Mm. Uh, can't I just appear in some simple, straightforward way? Just say, here I am, dear. You wouldn't want to start with one weird, uncanny shriek. Well, I wouldn't know how. Or a sardonic laugh? Well, what would I be laughing at? Oh, life, death, anything in between. Well, if you don't want to do any of those things, things which he calls theatrical, then just appear. That's more my style, I think. But wrap a bit of vapor around you. After all, they need something to identify you by. And don't stay too long. And above all, don't let it depress you. Why should it depress me? <laughs> You'll find out, my friend. You'll find out. It never occurred to me that a visitation by a ghost could be depressing. Take now that well-known ghost of Hamlet's father, speaking spookily from the battlements at Elsinore. Of course, he didn't sound happy. How could he when his own brother had just killed him and promptly married his widow? He sounded angry, yes. Vengeful, yes. But depressed, no. And certainly not depressing. I'll return shortly with Act Two. Our moribund hero, Paul, has decided to return to Earth as a ghost and haunt the three-room apartment where he once lived with his wife, Melba. He has simply draped what remains of him in a shred of celestial vapor... And now, as he gazes through the living room window of what used to be his own tenth-floor apartment, he can scarcely be distinguished from the melting moonlight that floods the room inside. Nothing's changed. She hasn't changed a thing. Let's take our coffee into the living room, Leonard. Good idea. I think I picked the wrong time. Bring in that plate of cookies, will you? Right. Not those same old oatmeal things. I've always been crazy about oatmeal cookies. They were Paul's favorites. Set them down there. Mm -hmm. Cream in your coffee? Sugar? Uh, black, please. No sugar. That's the way Paul took his. His after-dinner coffee in the morning. Cream and sugar, yes, but after dinner, nothing. Is that so? And milk in his tea. You don't say. That's the English way, you know. Milk and tea. I didn't know Paul was English. He wasn't. Oh, I see. Oh, way back, five, six generations, he was English, but... I, myself, was born in Wales. Is that so? Oh, well, that's near England. Richard Burton is Welsh, you know. For goodness sakes! Why, didn't you know that? The last movie Paul and I saw together had Richard Burton in it. I I wanted to show you something fascinating. Paul's World War II uniform. I've saved it all these years. Uh, no, I don't... Uh, not tonight. And his captain's bars. Some other time. I, I've really got to be moving on. Oh, if you really have to. Such a beautiful night. I think I'll walk home. Yes, a beautiful night. Oh, just look at the moonlight streaming through that window. Care to walk a ways with me in the moonlight? Oh, no, I don't think so, Leonard. I have a lot of things to do here. Yeah, well, if there's anything you need, you have my number. Yes. At home and at the office. Good night, Melba. Thanks for dinner. Thank you for bringing all that fried chicken. Oh, it, it was nothing, really. Good night. Good night, Leonard. Oh, Paul. Dear Paul. I need 
need you, Paul. Melba. Oh, I need you so. I'm right here. What was that? I said, I'm here. Paul? Yes. Me. Paul. But, but where? By the window, dear. I can't see you. I'll step inside. That'll be better. Oh, I see. I, I see something. You see me. I dare say I've changed somewhat. Paul. Can that be you? It is. I. Really you? Well, fairly really. Everything considered as real as I can get. Oh, I, I can't believe it. Believe it, Melba. Oh, Paul. How are you? Oh, never mind about me. How are you? Oh, I'm all right. Really? All right? Everything considered. Everything considered, I'm better than all right. Paul, tell me. Are you happy? Happy? I must know. Are you happy? I'm sorry you asked me that question. Why should you be sorry? Happy just isn't a word we use. Why not? Because it... It doesn't mean much once you've died. Oh, Paul, you're not saying you're unhappy. No, I'm not saying that. Then what are you saying? Look, Melba, I didn't really come here to talk about me. What about you? Well, naturally, I'm not happy. Why not? Without you? What about Leonard Whipple? Oh, him. What's the matter with Leonard? Well, nothing's the matter with him. He's just not you. Well, I'm not me either. Not the way I was before I... Oh, but I remember you the way you were. And as long as I remember... Melba, honey, I don't even remember me the way I was. You don't? Not very well. You remember me, don't you? Sort of. Sort of? Well... You were my wife. I'm still your wife. Not exactly. There will never be anyone for me but you. Never, I swear it. Please, Melba. We are man and wife forever, for eternity. And now that I know you can return to me, not in the flesh perhaps, but even like this. It's strange. It's weird, but it's enough for me. I can live on as your wife and on and on till I join you. Melba. You don't know what you're saying. Oh, I knew you could never really die as long as I remembered you. And you see, here you are, living on. Hello, Irene. Me. Guess what? You'll never guess. Paul was here. Yes. Yes, yes. Right here in this living room. All right, then he's a ghost, whatever. Well, he looked different. Yes, yeah, sort of steamy. Kind of like a, a street light on a foggy night. But I knew it was Paul, all right. His voice and the things he said and the way he called me Melba, dear. Well, it, he didn't say too much. I, I asked him, was he happy? Because naturally I wanted to know, but he wouldn't say. He wouldn't say he wasn't unhappy either. Isn't that weird? He wanted to know about me. Am I happy? <laughs> Isn't that sweet? And he asked about Leonard Whipple. Imagine him knowing I've been seeing Leonard off and on. Of course, I told him Leonard doesn't mean a thing to me, that there could never be anyone else for me. I said, Paul, we are man and wife for eternity. I said, you can never truly die, Paul, as long as I remember you. And then, you know what, Irene? There was this big, great, big noise, a, a crash, sort of. No, not like thunder, more like, like music, like a chord out of Beethoven or somebody. And all of a sudden, he was gone. But he'll be back. Like you said, no one is really dead as long as he's remembered. <laughs> Sir, oh, oh, sir, may I speak with you? Mm -hmm. No, oh, it's uh, Paul, isn't it? Uh, sir, uh, could I have just a moment of your time? I have all the time in the world. 
I have all the time there is. Well, I don't quite know how much time there is, but I do know I have all of it. Uh, does that star look all right to you? Well, I, I wouldn't know. I, I don't quite know how a star is supposed to look. Please, sir. May, oh, may I... yes, 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 of course. You want to talk to me. Uh, what about? I, I've been back to the earth. My wife kept calling me. You said we owed some responsibility to the living, did so I... Did I say that? Yes, sir, you did. Oh, I wonder if I was right about that. These earth trips can be very upsetting. Mine was. My wife wanted to know, am I happy? They're all so preoccupied with happiness, aren't they? I didn't know what to say to her. I, I couldn't answer her. This woman I'd been married to for half my life, I couldn't talk to her. It was as though we were living in two different worlds. Well? Oh. Oh, oh yes, I, I see what you mean. Still, shouldn't I have been able to answer her? Well, what could you have said? Well, that... That happy is a word that doesn't mean anything anymore. Happy is nothing without unhappy. The way pleasure is nothing without pain. The way health is nothing without illness. Euphoria is nothing without depression... Oh, you know what I mean, sir. I do know, yes. It's ridiculous to say I'm happy when I'm never unhappy. What I am is... What you are is... What? What I am is... Free. Yes. I'm free. I'm Paul, and I'm free. And I'm free to be Paul, no more, no less than me. Me, Paul. Sir, why couldn't I be free like that before? Oh, dear, I ask myself that same question all the time. The only answer is that I miscalculated somewhere. And I did give those people the power to think, to reason, to figure out the sensible way to do things. Oh, why don't they use what I gave them? Why leave everything up to me? Theirs isn't the only planet in the universe, you know. I do have other things to look after, but the way they call out to me, they, they want me to do everything. But it's, it's, it's not right. It really is not right. No, sir. I'm sorry, sir. Well, what's done is done. They'll just have to muddle through the best way they can. Uh, now, about your wife. Uh, Melba, is it? Yes, sir. Hmm. Tell you what, why don't you talk to Bruce about it? You two seem to get along so well. Yes, yes, talk to Bruce. Now, excuse me, will you? Um, I really do have to go take a look at that poor star. Mm -hmm. Bruce, he just wasn't any help at all. Now, you listen, Paul. Suppose you had invented the greatest machine imaginable. One that would do, uh, oh, practically anything you can think of. How would you like it if somebody came running to you every time a bolt got loose and asked you to tighten it? But, Bruce, Mel says she's going to go on remembering me forever. We'll be man and wife forever till she joins me here and then we'll still be man and wife. Maybe once she gets here, she'll change her mind. But she's only 42. She'll be remembering me for years and years and calling for me and I'll have to put on that vapor stuff and haunt the apartment... And, and, Bruce, it's so hard to carry on a conversation with her now. It didn't used to be, but now... Well, you, you couldn't just ignore her. I love her, Bruce. Do you? Well, I did. For a very long time, right up to the moment I died. My last words were, I love you, Melba. At least, that's what I meant to say. I know I had it in my mind to say that, but I'm not positive I ever got around to saying it. Anyway, I can't just... just brush her off. My, my. You do have a conscience, don't you? Well, I hope so. It's a very fine thing to have, of course, but sometimes... Look, there's only one thing you can do. What? Get married. G married? To, to... to Melba? No, not to Melba, you idiot. How could you marry Melba? She's there and you're here. Some marriage that would be. But then, who... Whom would I marry? Oh, heavens to Betsy, Paul. The place is full of women. Have you ever seen Helen? Helen who? 
Helen of Troy, they called her. Actually, I've never met her myself, but from what they tell me... Marriages are made in heaven, so it's been said. There are those who consider this a profoundly true observation, while others think it one of the silliest statements ever made. I myself have no opinion, at least none that I care to express here. But no one, so far as I know, has ever claimed that people actually get married in heaven. Melba was a wonderful wife to Paul. But as his widow, she leaves something to be desired. Two things. She won't stop desiring him, and she won't leave him alone. In his desperation, Paul has gone to his kindred spirit, Bruce, for help. The only advice Bruce could offer was for Paul to marry again. Not his earthly wife, Melba but one of the heavenly creatures who, like Paul, expect to live on forever in whatever place it is they live on forever in. You've definitely burned yourself out, little one. Mm, Too bad. Sir? Oh, sir. Now, look, Paul, this dear little star has burned itself out. Well, I knew it wouldn't be long. Uh, Sir... I did what you told me to. I talked to Bruce about my problem, and you know what he said? He said, get married. Get married? He says the only way to make Melba forget me is for me to get married to someone else. Someone here. Where else? What do you think of the idea? Why do you keep asking me what I think? Can't you ever think for yourself? Well, I just thought... No, no, you didn't. You came running to me like all the others. I'm getting tired of it. If you could give me a little advice... I gave you a little advice. I said, talk to Bruce. You talked to Bruce, and he told you what he thought you should do. Now, either do it or don't do it. Is it all right? Is the what all right? To get married. Here. Paul, the essence of this place is perfect freedom to do as you choose. It might work out, it might not. But that's true of everything, isn't it? It's certainly true of everything I do. Do many people get married here? Well, I don't know. I do know they don't come running to me to ask, is it all right? Bruce mentioned someone called Helen. Helen of Troy? Are you asking me to pick a wife for you? Now, what else do you want me to do? Tie your shoelaces? Help you with your arithmetic? Don't you people ever grow up? I'm sorry, sir. I don't care about your being sorry. That's too easy. I care about your achieving some measure of maturity. A bit of independence. A little simple sense. Is that asking too much? Tell me, is that really asking too much? Oh, sir, I... Sometimes I feel like giving up on the whole human race. You're not going to cry, are you, sir? Why not? Who has better reason to cry than I have? Nobody, I guess. Uh. (sighs) However, we must all carry on, mustn't we? Never give up. That's my motto. Because if I gave up... Uh, Don't say it, sir. Please, don't say it. No. No, I won't say it. I wouldn't be so cruel, no matter how provoked. Now, Paul, I really must go to tend to that poor little star who, believe me, needs my help more than you do. Irene? It's me. Oh, just sitting around. Leonard asked me to go to that new steak place with him, but I said no. I didn't feel like it, that's why. Don't be silly. I like Leonard. He's a very nice man, but... Well, there's a beautiful moon out tonight. and I thought maybe... Oh, for heaven's sakes, what's that? Well, there was a terrible clanking noise just now. It scared me to death. Well, oh, how could it be the radiator? The heat's not turned on yet. Is there a storm coming up or something? 
What is that, that whistling sound? Can't you hear it? Like a, like a terrible wind. Or maybe a hurricane. <laughs> what do you mean you don't hear anything? <gasps> what, there goes the moon. It must be a hurricane. I mean, the moonlight just stopped shining. How can it be shining where you are and not here? Oh, now it's shining here, too. <laughs> Irene, oh, are you there? Oh, are you crying about something? Oh, I thought you were. For no reason, I just thought I heard... Well, I heard somebody crying. More than crying, really sobbing. Oh, oh, oh my goodness! Something just ran through the room. I, how do I know what? It disappeared into the kitchen. <laughs> Rain, there's something here in the kitchen. It's, it's laughing, terrible laughing. It couldn't be Paul because. Because it couldn't be. Paul doesn't behave that way. He just comes to the window and says, Here I am, Melba, dear. It couldn't be Paul. Here I am, Melba, dear. <gasps> he just said it. Here I am, Melba, dear. Melba, I'm here. Irene, I'm going to hang up. I've got to find out if it's Paul. And if it is Paul, I've got to know why he's behaving so peculiarly. No, no, don't come over. You, you might scare him away. I mean, after all, I'm used to these things, and you're not. Bye, Irene. Hello, Melba. Paul, is it you? No, it's not Paul. <gasps> oh! Don't be frightened. I'm Bruce. Bruce? Who? I don't know any Bruce. I'm Paul's new friend. His best friend, actually. But why are you here? Why isn't Paul here? He couldn't make it tonight. Why not? Nothing's happened to him, has it? What could happen? Well, nothing, I suppose. Everything's already happened. Precisely. Well, then why isn't he here? I've thought about him and thought about him every single day and every time I woke up during the night. I've been over every moment of every day of every year we had together. That's just it. And I'm just about to start over at the beginning. Uh, I wouldn't do that if I were you. Why not? He's not really dead as long as I remember him. He's not really alive either, is he? Well, no, but... Melba, you're wearing him out with all this remembering. Wearing him out? Yeah, back and forth, back and forth. It's very tiring, Melba. You mean he'd rather just stay where he is? I think so. Oh, nobody wants to be dead and forgotten. Wait till it's your turn. I certainly don't want to be. Wait, you'll find out. Nobody wants to be dead and forgotten. That's because they haven't tried it yet. You mean... To tell me that Paul wants to be forgotten? By me? If you think you could manage it. Forget 22 beautiful years? Oh, I, I couldn't. I, I couldn't possibly. What about having 22 more beautiful years with somebody else? Like who? Well, I've heard nice things about a certain Leonard Whipple. Leonard Whipple? I've heard he's very devoted to you. But Leonard's not Paul. I mean, Leonard could never be Paul. But he could be Leonard, couldn't he? If you'd let him. Well, Paul is the only man for me. Always was, always will be, and that is that. Oh, Melba, Melba. Why do you say, oh, Melba, Melba, like that? Because you forced me to tell you something I really have no right to tell you. What? What is it? Hardly anybody knows about it. Just me. And Paul, of course. What is it? I shouldn't repeat it. No. My lips are sealed. It's too private. Does it concern Paul? Is it about Paul? You won't mention it to a living soul? I won't mention it to anybody. What is it? Paul. Paul is getting married again. Paul? Is getting married again? Yes. Who, too? I think her name is Helen. Is she pretty? I've never met her, but I hear she's very pretty. <sighs> Young? I believe so. Oh, how could he? How could he? That's life, Melba. Life? Paul's not alive. No, but you are, Melba. Yes, I am. Make the most of it. That's my advice to you. 
thank you, Bruce, for telling me what you've told me. I really appreciate it. You're quite welcome. I don't suppose Paul would ever have told me himself. Oh, eventually he would have. Maybe. Maybe not. Well, if you see him, tell him I hope he's very happy with his Helen. I'll tell him. Nice to have met you, Melba. It's very nice to have met you, too, Bruce. I... Are you still sitting down or standing up? I can't quite tell. Does it really matter? Well, I'd just like to... I don't know, shake your hand or something. <laughs> Not necessary. Not necessary at all. I... I could see you to the door. No. Let's just part this way. A fond adieu to you, Melba. A fond... Oh. He's gone. He just disappeared. Well. That's the way with ghosts. Oh. Who needs ghosts, anyway? With all their comings and goings. And the way they talk. Who can understand them? Hello? Irene? Irene, you are absolutely not going to believe what I'm about to tell you. You simply will not believe it. Bruce. Bruce, where have you been? I've been looking all over for you. Even Salome didn't know where you were. Where were you? I went to see your wife. Melba? What for? To tell her you were getting married. Bruce, you had no right to do that. Here, we do as we choose. He told you that. How did she take it? Shocked, of course. Hurt. What you'd expect. You told me you were going to tell her. I knew you wouldn't let me. I wouldn't have. For one very good reason. It's not true. What's not true? That I'm getting married. You changed your mind? Not exactly. I asked Helen. Yes? She said absolutely not. She says she's not the marrying type. But you didn't stop right there, did you? There are others. I asked Catherine. Uh, uh, I can't pronounce her last name. She used to be an empress in Russia. She laughed, fit to kill. And so did Amy and Louise and Marie. Even Salome laughed at me. Are you upset? Well, nobody likes to be laughed at. Yes, I'm upset. But on the other hand, I'm relieved, too. Bruce, I really don't want to get married. I never thought you did. Everything's so nice here, so free and sort of uninhibited. So peaceful. Leonard, it's Melba. You don't mind my calling you at your office, do you? Oh, that's good. How was the new steak place? You didn't go? On account of me, you didn't go? Well, I must say, Leonard... Oh, I, I spent the evening doing various things. Things that really needed to be done. Like, I got all Paul's clothes together and packed them in boxes. Tomorrow, I'll send them to some deserving charity. <laughs> Listen, Leonard, I was thinking... As long as you didn't go to that steak place, why don't you come over here tonight and I'll cook you the best steak you ever tasted. And hash brown potatoes. Would you like that? Oh, good. Well, come early and we'll have a martini first. Well, good for Melba. Good for Leonard. And good for Bruce. And for Paul, too. Good for everybody who faces up to a problem and solves it the best way possible. The solution may not be a perfect one. Solutions seldom are. But at the very least, they are an attempt to use the sense we were born with. And that's all God asks of any of us. I'll be back shortly. You do realize, don't you, that the story I've just brought you was all pure fantasy. I don't know any more than you do what happens to us once we have resigned this terrestrial life, and you know as little as I do. Unless, of course, you are a ghost. Oh, if you are, I wish you'd get in touch with me. I have gobs and gobs of things I'm dying to ask you, like, uh, like, uh, well, for one thing... 
Are you happy? Our cast included Lenka Peterson, Elliot Reed, Robert Dryden, and Gordon Gould. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... I'm E.G. Marshall. From ancient days to the present, mankind has believed in ghosts. Some claim to have seen them, heard them, and even touched them. There never was any question about the terror of such an experience, real or imaginary. Even today, we read in our newspapers about apparitions and spirit messages which have no reasonable explanation. It was such an experience at a lonely inn in Maine that terrified a man of exact science named Professor George Weymouth. You saw what there? A hundred yards offshore. An inverted funnel of water like a shroud, a winding sheet, the garment of the dead. Oh, come now, Colonel Pingree, a shroud? Just the wind whipping a wave crest into an inverted cone. You look as if you'd seen an apparition. Don't tell me you believe in that kind of thing. You said your name was... Weymouth. Weymouth? Yes. That could explain it. Our mystery drama... The Five Ghostly Indians was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Roy Windsor and stars Robert Dryden and Court Benson. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and Sinoff, the Sinus Medicines. I'll be back shortly with Act One. As we approach our country's bicentennial, we think proudly of 1776 and our independence. But what about the first people to live in America, the Indians? Long before we became independent, we had taken away their independence. Someone wrote, the Pilgrim Fathers landed on the shores of America and fell upon their knees. Then they fell upon the Aborigines. An Englishman exploring the coast of Maine in the year 1605 captured and killed five Indians, and the bad relationship began. His name was George Weymouth, and this is the story of what happened to his present-day namesake. arrived at White Pines. Uh, my name's Pingrate. Colonel Caleb Pingrate. How do you do, Colonel? George Weymouth. And you don't mind me butting in this way? If you do, say so, and I'll finish my walk up the beach. Oh, certainly not. I was just about to walk back to the inn. It's growing dark, and I'm chilled. Ah, <laughs> oh, that's a cold-looking ocean. Ooh, forbidding. Well, Come along. We'll have a cup of tea in front of the fire in the lodge. That sounds inviting. Oh, uh, look here. Just before you hailed me, look what I found. This is an Indian arrowhead among the rocks. Well, that's unusual. It is a design on it. Here, let me rub off more of the moss. It's heavily encrusted. Must have been here for hundreds of years. Good. Drums. I beg your pardon? Drums. Indian drums. Hear them? Drums. What are you talking about? I don't hear anything. Uh, here. Any idea what this design means, Colonel? Huh. Well, they're gone. They're gone. 
What? You didn't hear the Indian drums? No. When you rubbed the arrowhead, I distinctly heard drums. When you handed it to me, the drums stopped. Yes, well, let's not worry about them. Yeah, take a look at that design, Colonel. Hmm. A diamond figure enclosing another diamond figure. Oh, that is very unusual. It means medicine man. Why unusual? Because a tribe's medicine man hardly ever went into battle. He was called a shaman and had great authority because of his special guardian functions. That's why he became known to us as a medicine man. Well, you've made a remarkable discovery. Here you are. It's quite beautiful, isn't it? Good heavens. Well, what is it? Quite. The drums. And look. Look out there, about a hundred yards offshore. See it? See what? I see white caps as far as I can see, nothing more. And drums? You're hearing things, girl. Look there, follow where I'm pointing. See that inverted funnel of water? It's like a shroud. Don't you see it? I really don't. May I have the arrowhead? Yes, of course. Well, the drums have stopped. And that funnel of water is gone. <laughs> You're a romantic, Colonel. Yes. Do you know what I'd do with that arrowhead if I were you? I'd throw it in the ocean. I certainly won't do that. You said it was unusual. My young daughter will treasure it as a wonderful souvenir. You're not pulling my leg, are you, Colonel? I assure you, I am not. What did you say your name was? Weymouth? Yes. George Weymouth. I'm an assistant professor of zoology. Weymouth? Yes, yes, yes. That could explain it. Explain what? Do you know anything about the history of your surname? No, not too much. There have been Weymouths here since the Revolutionary War... General Tad Weymouth. The name goes further back than that, Professor. I think I'd better tell you about it. Now, just put that nonsense out of your mind, Boggs. What nonsense? I saw them, and I heard the drums. Yeah. I'll mention it to Colonel Pingree. Maybe he can explain it. Oh, you're two of a kind, you and that old daydreamer. Don't know how you stand listening to his same old stories over and over again. You'd think he had the second sight. Well, some folks do, Meg. Uh-huh. And well, then ask him when he comes in from his walk where the Faradays are. Should have been here by now. It's after six. Well, got lost, most likely. It's easy to make the wrong turn off at Bath and end up at Booth Bay Harbor. Well, I gave her very careful instructions. Seemed a nice young woman. They're staying a week. Well, we can use the money. Summer wasn't so bad, Fox. And after they leave, there'll be just us and the cats. Yeah. I'll miss Colonel Pingree. <laughs> Don't see why. With that second sight the two of you got, you can keep tabs on each other all winter. Drums. Uh, I tell you, Meg, as sure as I'm standing here, I heard them. And I saw what I saw. Five Indian braves dancing around a boiling pot and dipping their arrows into it. Yeah, that's what I saw on that side road coming back to Phippsburg from Poppin Beach. The drums were rolling and there they were, right in the middle of the road, heads down and dancing in a circle. Oh, lucky you didn't run them over. Well, I'd best be getting to the kitchen. The colonel and that professor ought to be back soon from the beach. Uh, maybe you'd better build up the fire and offer them some tea when they come in. Uh, what's that professor's name? Weymouth? Why? Hmm. Weymouth. Seems to me Oh, I... Boggs, now oh, what? Never mind. I'll speak to the colonel. Well, you keep your ears open for the telephone. If the Faradays did get lost, they'll be calling in. It's almost dark now. And it's hard to find the place. 
Ah, ah, ah. Oh, oh, it feels good in here, girl. <clears throat> well, the fall will feel better. I won't change my shoes. My sneakers got wet. Hmm. Or shall I order hot tea? Oh, uh, yes, thank you. I'd like a cup good and hot. Uh, uh, evening, Boggs. Evening, Colonel. Ah, that's a grand fire. Yeah, uh, yeah. Mag thought you might like a cup of hot tea. Yeah, your good wife is absolutely right. Two cups. Professor Weymouth would like some, too. Sure thing. Uh, sit down. I'd like to ask you a question, Boggs. Sure. I got one for you, too. Oh? Well, let me have yours first. You know the side road from Poppin Beach back to Phippsburg, about four miles away? Yes. And I told Mag about what I saw, but there's no talking to her. She just laughs at me and declares I might be a, a little loose in the top story. <laughs> well, I know that your good wife feels the same way about me. Oh, she means no offense, Colonel. No, of course not, of course not. I understand that. Well, after I picked up the lobsters and the clams in Poppin Beach, I drove the old truck back toward Phippsburg. Mm -hmm. Now, about a mile from where I turned off to the White Pines, I heard drums, Indian drums. And I saw, clear as I'm seeing you, five Indians dancing round a boiling pot and dipping their arrows into the stuff, whatever it was. You see. Well, what do you make of that? <clears throat> well, I heard Indian drums too, Bugs. I knew I was right. Where'd you hear him, Colonel? On the beach, about half an hour ago. But I saw something else. About a hundred yards offshore, I saw an inverted water spout. Looked like a limp sheet held up by two fingers. A headless ghost. What did it do? Well, when Weymouth handed me the arrowhead, the drum stopped and the dancing ghost vanished. Arrowhead? Weymouth found an arrowhead among the rocks down by the beach. An arrowhead amongst the rocks? Well, it must have been there for centuries. More than three. I'd say it dates from around 1605. Now, how the deuce do you know that? Weymouth. You're from an old Down Easter family. Does the name mean anything to you? Yeah, but just barely. Well, I've been thinking about it ever since Weymouth picked up that arrowhead. It had belonged to a medicine man because it had a design on it, a figure of a diamond within a diamond, probably from the Hetchman tribe. Back in 1605... An Englishman named George Weymouth explored the coast of Maine. For no reason I've ever been able to learn, he brutally murdered five Indians. The chief of the tribe attacked Weymouth's sloop, killed several of his soldiers, and then they were overwhelmed. Yep, it comes back to me now. Yeah. The English killed the medicine man, wrapped him in a sheet, and dropped him into the ocean. Now he's returned. He's returned, and he's called up those five murdered Indians to witness his revenge. You told Professor Weymouth about the curse? I intend to. But he's a professor of zoology, a man of science. He'd laugh at me. Uh, how long is he staying with you? Till the end of the week. Two more days. Hmm. I'll have to tell him to leave tonight. Uh, let me handle him. If he'll give me the medicine man's arrowhead, he won't be threatened, and neither will White Pines. Evening, Colonel. Here's the... Oh, there he is. Here comes the professor. Evening, Professor. Hot tea. Just what I need, Miss Boggs. I got chilled down there at the beach. Evening, Mr. Boggs. Evening. Thanks for the talk, Colonel. Oh, hey. you two been yarning about those Indian drums and them five dancing Indian oh, braids. Oh, they're, they're, they're real enough, Meg. Now, don't tell me, Colonel, that you still think you heard drums and saw an apparition offshore? Uh, your name is, is Weymouth. Over 300 years ago, your ancestor, George Weymouth, cruelly murdered five Indian braves and killed the medicine man of their tribe and buried him at sea. If when you picked up that arrowhead, 
You triggered the guardian spirits of those Indians, and they have been awakened. Indeed. To what purpose? Revenge, Professor Weymouth. <laughs> I don't believe it, Colonel. With all due respect to folklore. I didn't expect you to believe it. If Colonel Pingree and the innkeeper Boggs swear that they heard those celestial Indian drums and saw those apparitions, why should we disbelieve them? They are otherwise normal men. Psychic phenomena is not nonsense. Despite the disbelief of Professor Weymouth, whose name links him with a brutal crime committed over 300 years ago. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. It might be that some down easters have retained imaginations more lively than our own because our 23rd state, Maine, has a rugged climate and its people never forget it. In the sparsely settled wilderness, it would be easier to see ghosts of Indians from long ago in the forests, in front of a blazing hearth. Professor Weymouth might scoff at folklore, and so does Mag, the innkeeper's wife, but not Boggs, the innkeeper. He and Colonel Pingree know what they heard and saw. Boggs? What was that hmm? talk about an arrowhead? Weymouth found it. That's when the trouble began. Oh, Indian drums, dancing Indians, a ghost on the water. Oh, you and the Colonel, you're some pair. Seven o'clock, still no Faraday's? Yeah, lost, probably. Well, you'd think they'd telephone. Well, I'll serve the Colonel and Professor Weymouth and put the other steamers and lobsters in the icebox. I think I'll go outside and look around a little. Now, you be very careful. Don't want some Indian to scalp you. <laughs> Couldn't run White Pines alone. Now, one of these days, Mag, you'll believe. I'll be back in half an hour or so. Keep an eye out for the Faradays. Yep, yep, yep. We well, can eat any time Mag is ready to serve, Boggs. Coming right up, Colonel. Good. Oh, you look concerned, my friend. Nope. Just annoyed. Young couple named Faraday was supposed to arrive at six. I haven't heard a word from him. Well, it's easy enough to get lost on these back roads. Yeah, I'm going out to look around. We just got that one light out front and they could drive right by. Uh, had any luck, Colonel? I'm still not convinced, Boggs. The arrowhead is mine. I'm reluctant to give it up. It means trouble, Professor. Uh, so you say. But I'm a man of science. Folklore is charming, but I don't believe in it. We know that myths were created to explain certain practices and beliefs. But when reason is applied, they disintegrate. As much as I'd like to believe your story about the Indian drums and the apparition on the sea, I can't. Well, then, Professor, I'll have uh, No, no, Boggs, not so fast. Take your stroll and leave this to me. But I... I don't know, please. And I'll say good night to both of you. Good night. Oh, I offended him. I'm sorry. No, don't worry about it, Weymouth. Hopefully you'll be away from here without incident in a few days. Hopefully? I can understand a simple innkeeper being superstitious, but I can't understand it about you, Colonel. An educated man, well-spoken. Well, all I wish you'd accept is that Boggs and I are certain that the Arrowhead is dangerous to you. It's in your own interest to send it to York to be placed with the other Indian relics. Well, perhaps. Come up to my room and we'll take a look at it. Agreed. You're making a wise decision, Weymouth. Maybe we'd better turn around, Ben. I'm sure I took the right road out of Bath. We drove through Winnegans and Arasick. We should have telephoned from Arasick to tell them we'd be late. Well, let's keep going. 
According to the map, Phippsburg ought to be, well, only a few miles from here. You'd never know it. It's like being in a wilderness. I haven't seen a sign for miles. And it's pitch black. <laughs> Scared? Well, it is kind of spooky. Well, there's nothing here to harm you. Let's drive on. If we get to Phippsburg, we'll telephone White Pines. Maybe they'll hold dinner for us. It's after 7, Ben. We ought to be there by 7.30. <sighs> Unless we're on the way to Booth Bay Harbor. I have the arrowhead in my bureau drawer. I'll... Regret giving it up, Colonel? Well, you'll regret it more if you keep it. Ah, here it is. Deadly looking, isn't it? But quite beautiful. Uh, well, good heavens. What's that? A regular gale. And the sky is clear and the water calm. And there's fog all over the windows. Oh, look down that accursed arrowhead and stand back, we must. Look out. It smashed out one of the windows. We must come here. Look! Look racing toward the beach. I... I can't believe it. Did you see it? Yes. Yes. A white sheet flying over the ground. And twirling as it goes. Now it's at the shore. It's going out to sea. Pingree, what is it? Did you see it? Did you see it, Colonel? Hey, the wind is broken. What happened? Did it try to get in? Weymouth had the arrowhead in his hand when a tremendous gale arose. Then fog covered the window. I saw the fog. Yes. When I yelled, look out. But it weren't fog. It was that medicine man who come out of the sea. Well, that's what I saw from the shore late this afternoon, Boggs. What about you, Professor Weymouth? I, uh... I saw it, too. You believe now? I... Don't know what to believe. But you saw it with your own eyes, Weymouth. You saw the apparition, the ghost of that Indian medicine man, who was killed and buried at sea hundreds of years ago. Now are you going to give the arrowhead to the colonel? I admit what I saw, but I still can't believe it. My training and my mind refuse to accept the idea of an avenging ghost. What I saw... Might have been an illusion. Ah. That busted window ain't no illusion, Professor. Well, that might be explained in some way other than the fantastic notion that a ghost, which is weightless, could have broken that window. Now, what's all the excitement about? Box. The window. The ghost of the Indian medicine man paid Professor Weymouth a visit. What? Now, that's just crazy. You mean something that weighs less than a sheet of cheesecloth broke that window? And ask him. Professor? I don't honestly know, Mrs. Boggs. Mm -hmm. Now you were honest enough and you admitted seeing it, Weymouth. That's true. I did see something like a shroud, a winding sheet, trying to break through the window. A great wind preceded its appearance. Then the wind died down and the thing twirling like a top, flew back to the beach and out to sea. And you saw it? Well, it may have been an illusion, but yes, yes, I did see something. I'll pay for the window, of course, and I... I think I'll check out tomorrow, if you don't mind. Professor, you mean you're scared? Say I'm prudent. It was that ancestor of yours, George Weymouth. He was cruel to those Indians, and they want to avenge themselves against the person who bears that name. I'll give you the arrowhead in the morning, Colonel, and head back home. About ten more minutes, Fran. I'm glad we telephoned. She was so nice, Mrs. Boggs. She'll have the steamers ready and then the lobster. Perfect. I could eat for hours. Ben. Ben, slow down. Ben, stop. What? What is it? You sound terrified. Look up there ahead. You see them? Huh? Don't you see them? Who, who's them? You, you mean you don't see them? I don't even know what you're talking about, Fran. The Indians. What? Indians! Five of them! They're dancing around a big pot! And listen, 
Drums. Indian drums. Hey, come on. You're pulling my leg. Indians dancing around a pot. I don't see a thing as far as the headlights carry. You all right, Fran? Of course I'm all right. You mean you really can't see them? They're dipping their arrows into the pot as they dance around it. Hey, Toledo, you must have flipped. I assure you, honey, there's nothing in the road. Nothing. There is. There is. I tell you, I see them. Hunger can make a person see things sometimes. I'm hungry, but I'm not starving to death. Darn it, Ben, I see them. Are you telling me I've come off the spool? Well, what do you want me to do? Shoo them away? I don't know what we should do. Well, I do. You close your eyes. I'm driving on. Indians or no Indians, I want to get to White Pines. Faraday's ought to be along any minute. Yep. Now, what's fretting you? Weymouth. Won't listen to reason. I'm glad he's leaving in the morning. If he wasn't, I'd tell him to get. Just because he won't do what you and the colonel want him to? There's a curse on the man. An old Indian curse. What if that thing had gotten into the room and killed him? We'd never have another guest here, summer or fall. Oh, now, get that sour expression off your face. It's almost 7.30. You stay here at the desk and wait for the Faradays. And be pleasant. I'm about ready to serve them steamers. Oh, that's them, Boggs. Hmm. Evening. Hello there, uh, Mr. Boggs. Yep. Glad you made it. Evening, ma'am. Good evening. Have trouble with the road? Well, no, the directions were fine. We just weren't sure we were on the right one. But it, it worked out. What a fine inn you have here, Mr. Box. Oh, it's lovely. Look at that lodge room, Ben, with logs blazing away in the fireplace. Fran, why don't we go in and have a drink in front of the fire? I can bring in our bags later. Never mind the bags. I'll fetch them. If you'll give me your keys, I'll pack your car off the road. My wife will get you a drink, and you can have dinner any time. Steamers and lobster. Hope you like them. Perfect. <laughs> Nothing better. All over your scare, darling? Oh, Ben. Something go wrong on the way down? Well, it's, it's too silly to mention, Mr. Boggs. Oh. Well, I'm not a pride man myself. My wife saw five Indians dancing around a pot and dipping arrows into it. Hunger pains, I told her. Did you know? Silly, wasn't it? Depends. You better sign the register. And I'll have her come out and fix you some drinks. Better go down to dinner, Weymouth. Right. It's after 7.30. Hmm. Still got your appetite? Oh, yes, yes. I'm recovered now. Hmm. Quite an experience for you to tell about back home. A phenomenon. I can't quite yet encompass what happened. Well, accept it. Give me the arrowhead and tell your story on a wintry night to that little girl of yours. Of course, it's not a story, not fiction, because it really happened. It was strange. I know what I heard and saw, but there must be a rational explanation for what happened. Including the breaking of the window? Even including that. It must have been some freak kind of pressure. I have nothing to fear from mere ectoplasm. Well, maybe you don't have anything more to fear... But don't count on it. Professor Weymouth, even as you and I, is a rational man. He accepts only what he can touch or see. His mind rejects the possibility of ghosts. But is there anyone who doesn't know of a haunted house? Haunted by what? A specter? Yes, indeed, Professor Weymouth. For all your education, you cannot prove they don't exist. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. The White Pines Inn is located a few miles from Phippsburg on the rocky coast of Maine. 
coast is beautiful, but forbidding. As the British found out during the Revolutionary War, when 6,000 men of Maine fought them determinedly, Maine remembers those days of hardship and remembers her even earlier history. The first settlement in 1620 on the Saco River, the Abnaki and Etchemin Indians of the Algonquian family. And who is to say that the spirits of those dead do not still inhabit those huge forests of white pine, fir, spruce, and birch? Excellent dinner, Meg. Excellent. Oh, thank you, Colonel. Oh, very good. Best steamers and lobster I ever had. Sure. Not to forget the Indian pudding. <laughs> well, that's real enough. Nothing ghostly about that, Professor Weymouth. You want coffee here or in the lodge room? Well, let's have it in front of the fireplace, Meg, if you please. And introduce yourselves to that nice young couple they're finishing up. Name's Faraday. Yeah, I'll do that. Faraday seem as content as we are. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. I'm uh, Ben Faraday. This is my wife, Fran. How do you do? I'm George Weymouth, and this is Colonel Caleb Pingree. Oh, pleased to meet you, sir. Ben. Colonel, will you join us? Well, thank you. <laughs> I'm glad you arrived. Boggs and his wife had begun to worry about you. Did you lose your way? <laughs> well, we thought we had, but we were on the right road all along. And then the sun dropped out of sight, and it was so dark, I just crept along. Oh, we had an unexpected adventure. Then they wouldn't be interested. Well, certainly we would, Mrs. Faraday. Up here, anything unusual is welcome. It gives us something to talk about. Just seeing new faces is a treat. Especially yours, Mrs. Faraday. Why, thank you. Uh, where are you from, by the way? Uh, Lewiston. You? Uh, Brunswick. I teach zoology. The colonel here just enjoys life. Uh, I suspect he's got a chest of old gold in his attic. And he's a mine of folklore about the Indians who used to inhabit these forests. <laughs> well, that's not quite true about the chest of gold. But Indian legends are my hobby. And we've just experienced another one. What? Well, it's true enough. Even Professor Weymouth has to admit what he saw. You saw something, Professor? I think so. When? Late this afternoon. Well, why are you looking so startled? Mrs. Faraday? Excuse me? You, uh, experienced an Indian legend? Four cups, cream, sugar. I'll leave the pot. No, no, thank you, Mag. Are you all right, young lady? You're kind of peaked. Oh, Indian legend. So that's it, Colonel. Got another listener to those Indian legends of yours. No, oh, my dear Meg, I, I've now, said Now, don't let the Colonel pull your leg, Mr. Faraday. He and my husband, Boggs, sees things where they ain't. If they ought to give me the creeps listening to the two of them. Say what they want to. There's no such thing as ghosts. What about the broken window, Meg? Well, that's just a freak swirl of wind. Mm. And the twirling shroud that scudded out to sea. Well, I didn't see it. Now, I'll thank you not to go scaring these young folks. You are not going to believe this, Mrs. Boggs. Go on, Fran, tell them. Well, not far from here, when I thought we were lost, Ben stopped the car. And the headlights cut a tunnel of light far down the road. And, and then I saw them. The people see things when they're hungry. Oh, maybe I was imagining things, but I'd swear I really saw them. Five Indians dancing around a pot of or cauldron and dipping their arrows into it. You have no doubt about what you saw, Mrs. Faraday? I saw them as plain as I see you. Well, Professor... I was inclined to disbelieve you and Boggs, Colonel, but this story of Mrs. Faraday's cannot be discounted. You saw the Indians. Did you hear drums? Yes, distinctly. What? What's this all about? I... Revenge. Revenge, Mr. Faraday. What? Re revenge for what? You'd better tell them, Pingree. Uh, you'll excuse me. I need some fresh air. I'll see you later, Colonel. He looks terribly worried, Ben. Yeah. Because he's the intended victim of an Indian's revenge. <laughs> Box? 
come in here with me. I was going to turn down the Professor Weymouth's bed when... Well, look. The pillar's been rung in half. Chairs overturned. It's that thing from the ocean. I know you don't believe in such things, Mag. Well, I don't want to. But this... Either the professor went crazy or... Well, how do you account for all this damage? First to the window. Now the room wrecked. And the pillow twisted in two. Like wringing a person's neck until he was dead. The Indian medicine man. Somehow he got back in here and thought he had Weymouth by the neck when what he had was the pillar. A powerful wrench. The pillar's twisted in half, feathers all over. I'm telling him to leave White Pines tonight. You think we'd better call the police in Phippsburg? Oh, they don't believe in apparitions any more than you do, Mag. Well, I'm not so sure now that I don't. Because I've never seen anything like this. Where is the professor? When the colonel began to tell the Faradays the story... The professor went out for some fresh air. And I'll find him and tell him to pack up and leave. Oh, Mr. Box. I'd like to have a word with you, Professor. Enjoy your stroll, Weymouth. I just stood outside and breathed deeply and looked at the sky. Mag went upstairs to turn down your bed. The room was a shambles. Chairs overturned, bed all rumpled, and a pillar rung in half. What? I haven't been near the room since dinner time. The ghost of that Indian medicine man's been there. If you'd been stretched out on that bed, you'd be dead. That pillar was twisted in two, feathers all over the place. Good Lord. I'm sorry to have to say this, Professor, but I want you to pack and leave. Tonight. I don't blame you. I'll pay for all the damage. I'm deeply sorry. Bring me the arrowhead, Weymouth. That's the source of your trouble. Until you've disposed of the medicine man's arrowhead, you won't have peace. And you may, in fact, die. Have your doubts about specters, but give me that fatal arrowhead. I'm convinced, Colonel... I'll be right back. And even Mag's convinced now, Colonel. <laughs> I'd imagine so. The professor's a doomed man. Not if he gets rid of the arrowhead. Think the Faradays have gotten scared off? No, no. They went to bed about a half an hour ago. Mrs. Faraday has the sight, Boggs, like you and me. When I told her what happened, she believed me. Even her husband began to be convinced. Well, they'll stay. But you're quite right in telling Weymouth to leave. Tonight. Fran, stop fussing and come to bed. I'm not fussing. I'm just thinking about what the colonel told us about George Weymouth and how he murdered those five Indians way back in 1600-something. Yeah, but it's just crazy to think that some old medicine man is out to murder the professor. He didn't kill those Indians. Why is he to blame? Just because he has the same name, that's all. You believe that? Yes, I... Ben. Oh, my goodness. What is it? Look out there. On the water, see it? Yeah. Something's rising from the water offshore. It's a water spout. No, no, it's not. It's upside down. It, it looks like a sheet, and, and it's turning round and round. And it's floating this way towards shore. W what is it? It's that thing the colonel told us he saw. The ghost of the medicine man who was buried at sea. It, it, it's coming towards the end. Ben, I'm afraid. I'll, I'll get by. No, don't leave me, Ben. Look, it's on the shore, and it's coming up the hill. coming toward us. No. No, it's heading for the rooms to our right. That's where Professor Weymouth is staying. It's after him, Ben. Ah! It broke the window. The whole place is shaking. Come, come on, friend. Let's get out of here. Help! Help, Colonel Kinsley! Help! Help me! The thing's got him, Ben. Colonel, Mr. Boggs. Open the door, Boggs. We have only seconds. Don't go in there, Ben. I have to. Help me, someone! Good Lord, it's at his throat. Pull it away from his throat. I, I picked up the arrow. 
no head to bring it down. Yes, it's, it's dragging me toward the window. Now, no, lad, it's twisting round his throat. No, hold him round the middle of here. He'll be dragged through the window. Meg, Meg, find that arrow head and throw it out the window. Hold the arrow. Hold out the window. Throw it, Meg. He's. He's fainted. Here's some water. Notice? The wind's died down. And the thing that had him by the throat, it's in a heap on the floor. Uh, Canvas. Look. When I touched it just now, it crumpled in my hand. It's like dust. (coughs) Oh, my. My throat. Oh, thank you. Heard you. You had a close call, Weymouth. You're lucky to be alive. Thank God all of you were close by, or it would have killed me. I, I'm i very grateful. Can you tell us what happened? I can. I was looking out the window when I saw the apparition come out of the sea and drift this way. Then a great wind came up, and the thing kind of embraced the house... It was when the window broke that the professor began to cry out. It floated in like a a small upside-down cyclone. I tried to stay out of its way, but it began to wrap itself around me. It was horrible. What in heaven's name was it? What could it be? You know, Amos... It was the ghost of the Indian medicine men come back to avenge the murder of those five Indian braves. It was your forebear who killed them, and the spirit of the medicine man has never forgotten. When you picked up that arrowhead, you aroused his spirit. Only by giving up that arrowhead could you break the fatal connection. Well, where... Where is the arrowhead now? I threw it out the window, Professor. Oh. And something else. When it hit the rocks below, there was a burst of flame. And then nothing. I... I believe it. I believe all of it, Colonel. The five ghostly Indians. They did exist. Hmm. Lucky for you, Weymouth, that you've lived to tell the story. The dread of the supernatural goes back to earliest man. As he roamed the earth, he was encompassed by many terrors. There was the terrible dark with its countless dangers. Legends about second sight are endless. To this day, the avenging specter of the Indian medicine man lives as fact in the mind of Professor Weymouth. I'll be back shortly. The fascination of terror is as ancient as the human race. It is stronger than our intellect, stronger even than our fears. It goes to the core of our very being. The brutal, unnecessary killing of five Indians in 1605 by George Weymouth laid a curse on those who bore his surname. Perhaps there is a kind of real justice after all. Crimes of long ago, unavenged, can be avenged. Our cast included Robert Dryden, Court Benson, Guy Sorrell, Anne Petoniak, Suzanne Grossman, and Jay Gregory. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Why did you allow her to leave so early? You and I have to talk. Well, whatever we say would be beyond her. Yes, if she's group three. Turn? How could Turn be an inspector? I suspect Turn because she's too perfect, too absolutely group three. Well, suppose she is an inspector. What have you and I ever said to each other that's reportable? 
I am head of repair. You are admiral of the fleet. And we are about to be disenfranchised. Why? Corral cannot qualify for group one. He will fail the examination. But you took him to repair yourself. He was judged in perfect balance. Oh, yes. Because he was examined by a single practitioner. And I was present. Do you think he's out of balance? Oh, I know it. He's one of those. I refuse to believe that. You refuse to accept it. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. G. Marshall. It was Oscar Wilde who wrote, in a surprisingly gentle and almost naive tone, Death must be so beautiful to lie and listen to silence, to have no yesterday and no tomorrow, to forget time, to forgive life, to stay at peace. The trouble is, not all the dead will stay quietly asleep. That's why we have ghost stories. Frightened to death? More than that. Uh, asphyxiated. Uh, smothered. I, I don't know how to describe it. During the war, I had a friend who was in a building that was bombed. The force of the blast drove him against the wall, and he looked like that. I, I do not know the exact word in English, but flattened and spread wide. Our mystery drama, The Ghostly Private Eye, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Lap. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Whenever the argument about the oldest of professions arises, along with the prostitute, the actor, the moneylender, and others, certainly we must include that of the private eye. Sometimes honorable beyond belief as in the case of Cain and Abel when Jehovah himself solved the murder. Many more times, not the most prized member of society, still a figure to be reckoned with. Of all the modern ones, no one is more special than the parapsychologist, the man who deals in the explanation of that vast middle world of clairvoyance, extrasensory perception, and psychic phenomena. The explainer of the inexplicable. Such a man as the singular Mr. Flaxman Lowe. Hello. Uh, Mr. Flaxman Lowe? Yes, the same. Uh, this is George Blackburton. Uh, you, you know, we've seen each other casually at the club. Oh, yes, of course, Sir George. Uh, I, uh, I feel like the devil bothering you like this, but you were pointed out to me as someone who, well, was more or less an expert in the... Occult and supernatural? Well, I have made a good deal of investigation, yes, but... Uh... I'm in desperate need of help. Could you come right down to my place in Surrey? We, we have something that even my wife can't cope with. Uh, something? Uh, perhaps it's an old curse. I, I don't know, but there is a thing that is trying to crowd us out of the house that you can actually taste and smell. Disgusting and terrifying. I need help. Well, I, uh, I don't know about immediately. I'm expecting a guest from France whom I must pick up shortly. Oh, by all means, bring him with you. Let him be our guest, too, for the weekend. If you don't help us, I'm afraid I'll go stark staring mad. Oh, very well. I think it might be arranged. Monsieur Lowe, I recognize you from your photograph. Oh, my dear boy, you must be Professor Jean Thierry. I am. Well, you look young enough to be my son. And with such a formidable 
academic background. As I come to meet you, I am a child at the feet of the master. Oh, 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 oh now <laughs> you make me feel like the all-wise spirit. Well, are you not the king of ghost killers, the master of the spirit world? Oh, scarcely. I'm a child in the wilderness of the afterworld. And at the moment, an embarrassed host. Oh, why? Well, uh... What would you say if instead of taking you home to my comfortable fire, as I'd planned to, I whisked you off instead into the depths of Kent for a weekend at a haunted house far beyond your belief and which even stretches mine? What would I say? <laughs> what am I here for? Well, so we stay right here in the station and catch the next train for Yand Manor House. We had corresponded for years, the Dr. Flexman and I, and the quality of his mind was such that I had been most eager to meet him, to argue vis-a-vis our contrasting belief on the matter of life after death. So what matter that our first conversation was on a train headed for this house with a strange name, Yand Manor House. Uh, this house that you have been asked to investigate, it has a ghost? Oh, most definitely, yes. Is it uh, an especially convincing ghost? Well, I think you'll find that it is. Ah, then you are promising me an exceptional adventure. One not without a great deal of danger. Well, I can't judge that, though, without trying, can I? Well, that's the nature of contact with the world beyond. Ah, but first you must prove it to me. I simply do not believe in ghosts. Or spirit manifestation, occult phenomena, whatever is the rubbish bin into which most people throw any belief they cannot understand. Mm. Now, this rubbish heap is what I spend my life investigating. Mm, chacun a son goût, no. to each his own. And yet, are we all so sure and secure about what we think we know? I realize that you're aware, but I've had some considerable success searching through the trash that most people discount. Well, what can I answer? That I rebel against the whole idea? After all, I have no experience in these matters, except vicariously through studying and reading. Very well. And now you're about to have some first-hand direct experience, which I hope you will not come to regret. We went straight to Yand Manor House. Certainly on my part, totally unaware of the terror that was to face us and of a gaping world of swirling doubt, bottomless, and as insecure as that dreadful dream of falling from incalculable heights to impossible depths, a dream beyond belief that was to haunt me the rest of my days. We were met at the train by Sir George and quickly transferred to a large and luxurious landau with a magnificent pair of horses. I had been prepared for something quite magnificent when we approached Yand Manor House, but actually it was not so impressive compared to the property that surrounded it. A square brick house, notable only for a strangely out-of-character building at the end of the garden that was unmistakably... A mausoleum. But our hosts I found quite charming. Your rooms are comfortable, I hope, Mr. Lowe, Professor Thierry. Oh, I find mine even better than that. Cozy. Oh, yes, mine too. I feel quite at home. And you need have no worries. I've swept them myself. Mm. Uh, what Cynthia means is that she has, uh, well, not literally swept them for dust, but uh, for any sign or evidence of... Uh, supernatural occupation or presence. I assure you, they're quite clean. In fact, I've combed the whole house and there's not a jot of evidence that any spirit forces or spectral emanations exist. Save for, of course, the den. I'm a psychic, too, you know, Mr. Lowe. Oh, well, you flatter me, Lady Blackburton. I don't consider myself one, only an investigator of psychic phenomena. You do not believe in the spirit world? Ah, that's a different matter. I think you will find, madame, that he is a true believer. I am the, uh, how do you say, the uh, fly in the ointment. Well, monsieur, before you leave Yand House, I can promise we will have made a true believer of you. Well, you sound almost as though you enjoyed this ghost which uh, so concerns your husband. Oh, no. No, this is something malignant. Destructive. It must be exorcised. I tried to reach it through spiritualism, but without success. I only hope that with your help, perhaps we can. Hmm. 
Or may I ask when we're to see the room? Uh, we're waiting only for my nephew who'll be joining us for dinner. We will be fried, the Pentateuch, the perfect number for seance. One reason why we were delighted when you asked if you could bring a guest, Dr. Lowe. I only hope, madame, that I will not be a limiting factor. We ask only for your cooperation. I feel quite sure we'll end up by winning your belief. Ah, that'll be Charles now. Uh, don't you think, my dear, it might be a good idea for us all to go straight into dinner? I think perhaps it would. Gentlemen, will you join me? There had been a curious little family byplay between Sir George and his wife, which was soon explained to me after I met Charles Bonnet. He was a large, heavy young man with an athletic build. I can't say I found him an attractive personality, but what was most noticeable about him was that he was already on his way to another evening, which could only lead to a hangover in the morning. And so on, Cynthia, we have to have another table-tapping session. Charles! I won't have you talk to your aunt that way. Well, good Lord, Uncle George. Has she really got you believing in all this twaddle? The strange things that happen in that room can't be taken lightly. He doesn't really take them lightly at all, George. The bravado is just to cover up his own fear. Rubbish, Auntie. Some wind blowing down the chimney, rustling the ivy and swinging something loose against a window, or the creaks and groans of this drafty old house. <laughs> Nonsense. Our... Are you seriously interested in all this balderdash, Dr. Lowe? Well, yes, yes. After all, I have made it my life work. If a court were to expose frauds and to show a faker. Uh, in part, yes, that is a byproduct. Now, you're not going to tell me you actually believe in bits of ectoplasm bumbling about droning and clanking chains. Hmm. May I quote you from Hamlet? There are more things under heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamed oh, of. Oh, Lord, I'm in a nest of nuts. <laughs> no, not quite. You have uh, another skeptic at the table. Ah, Professor Thierry, huh? Yes, you see, we're a good balance. Two for, two against, and Sir George somewhere in the middle. Well, I'm not so sure anymore, Flaxman. Not after the last experience. The one that sent me scurrying to you for help. Now, my information about the room, we're about to... Uh, uh, what's the best word? Shall we uh, settle for uh, invade? Was uh, still sketchy. <laughs> Naturally, Doctor Lowe. It has to be all the things you can't question, only interpret. The wind blowing, a shutter clacking. You know, it's so easy if you can't see anything face to face. Yes, sir, if you'll excuse me, uh, Charles, I think there have been other manifestations. Am I wrong? Far from it. Hearing and seeing are not the only senses. One can actually feel the presence. Oh, it's all in the mind. It's a lot more than that, damn it. I tell you, one can smell it. Smell it? The fetid odor of death, the grave and decay. It's not only smell, but taste. It runs true to form. After a certain hour, none of us will be able to remain in the room. Why? Because, my dear nephew, we shall be crowded out. But why would this, uh, this presence, or whatever it is, want to, uh, uh, your strange phrase, uh, crowd anyone out? It's an experience one can't describe, that one has to live, Professor Thierry. As if, somewhere in one's daily life, one closed one's eyes for a second and suddenly realized he was standing at the verge of a gaping hole that plunged into such terrifying darkness and eternal damnation that the bile of terror rises in the throat and threatens to suffocate you. There's an enemy in that room at such times who presses against you so massively that you feel as if you're being trampled under a multitude, helpless against a torrent. A stifling, a, a force that you must move from or be smothered to death. It, oh, forgive me. This is not exactly after dinner conversation, but it is a reality in George's and my life that we must face or run from if we can. We've decided to face it. Will you chance it with us? We have...
I've gotten ourselves involved in something this time around, haven't we? I don't know where each of you stands on the power of the spirit world, extension after death, or belief in ghosts, but I do hope you'll stay to do a little more research with me and Mr. Lowe on the nature of it, the possibility of it, and exactly what effects it can have on us. I shall return shortly with Act Two. Think about it. Five people sit in the shadow of the great carved chimney piece which rises above the mantel to the high ceiling. About a dark table of fumed oak, they hold hands. Four of them watch Cynthia go into trance and wait for the manifestations from beyond. The room is dark and brooding enough to raise Satan himself. The lamps smoke and cloud the atmosphere as if the air pressure is heavy beyond nature. But nothing happens. Whoever you are, wherever you are, we are trying to reach you. Can you not answer? Answer. No. Not tonight. Tonight I can't do it, George. There are forces against me. I don't know what it is. Break the circle. Bring up the lights. I will, Cynthia, my dear. And uh, rest. Relax. (gasps) Cynthia, you extend yourself too much. I'm all right, George, dear. But I must, uh... I must rest now. We may not have raised any wandering spirits inside, but we seem to have created some outside. If you'll excuse me, I think I'd best see Cynthia up to bed. Please give my apologies to our guest. Hush, Cynthia. Don't worry about... I worry about what I must... Did you ride over, Charles? Oh, yes, sir. I don't want you to go back in the storm like this. You must stay. Any one of the rooms in the West Wing, they're all made up. Now, don't you worry about me. But I do. Very well, Auntie. I promise. Uh, come along, Cynthia. Uh, uh, Charles, since I'll not be down again tonight, will you see to our guest needs? I also promise to be an excellent host, Uncle George. Good night. Good night, Lady Blackburn. Sir George. Good night. Well, gentlemen, what should it be? Whiskey? Gin? Brandy? Uh, no, no, no. For me, nothing. Well, it was a long journey from Paris. Noon strip has finished the job. I am exhausted. Oh, I don't think I want any either. I might be off. I'll just go up to bed. Ah, yes, bed. Sleep. Those I welcome. But, um, I'm not going upstairs. Well, you're not going to ride home in weather like this. No, 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 Mr. Lowe. I'm going to spend the night, uh, right here. You mean in this room? <laughs> That's right. Either I will sleep the sleep of the unrighteous, or if I'm wrong and my aunt's right, I'll have some company. Now, I mean to put an end to all this nonsense about ghosts and ghouls. Then I shall uh, sit up with you. Oh, perish the thought, Mr. Lowe. With your reputation, I'm sure any self-respecting member of the other world would give you a wide berth. <laughs> Well, are you still sure you won't join me in a brandy? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Very well. Mr. Walmay, may I ask you to be serious for a moment? Do we ask me? I don't think you should take your aunt's warning lightly. Even though there's been no physical evidence tonight, apparently some malignant and dangerous force considers this room its province. Then if it does, I intend to disabuse it of the idea. More than that, I'd warn it off my turf. You see, this house will be mine one day, very soon, if my aunt and uncle decide to return to traveling. And I want to eat whoever or whatever it might be, and I'll mark you, I don't believe it exists. I want it to know that when I take over, there'll only be room for one of us. And no amount of discussion would persuade this headstrong young man to change his mind. Personally, I couldn't help agreeing with his point of view. The idea of anything supernatural daring to intrude in this temple of the normal and the everyday seemed ludicrous. So, 
Flaxman and I went upstairs. John, yes. I am concerned <laughs> about me. Actually, I must admit my concern was more for that young man downstairs. <laughs> I should not worry about him. One more drink and the wine will put him straight to sleep. Well, I'm not worried about anything that may threaten him uh, in this world. I left my practical French friend and went to my own room. The storm was still whistling and moaning about the Ant Manor House, but it was a perfectly natural phenomenon, and there was certainly no cause for alarm. I must have been sleeping lightly for a grandfather clock striking the three-quarter hour somewhere in the house woke me up. I glanced at my watch and saw that it was a quarter to midnight. I shrugged into my robe and slippers and stole downstairs. The house was silent, save for the moan of the wind and the steady drum of the rain outside. The door to the den was closed, and I opened it, filled with a nameless apprehension. I could have saved myself my uneasiness. Stretched out comfortably on the couch, a still unemptied glass in his hand lay Charles Gourmet, snoring contentedly and looking to my middle-aged envy, the picture of health in spite of all his drinking. I removed the glass and set it aside. For a moment I considered getting him out of there. But he was so soundly in his cups and such a heavy young man, the effort was beyond me. Besides, I was getting cold. So I stoked up the fire and left him to my eternal regret, as it turned out. Dr. Lowe. Uh, Dr. Lowe. Yes, yes, yes. Just a moment. Be right there. Oh, come in. The door is open. I'm sorry to disturb you so early in the morning. No, no, no. It's quite all right. What time is it? The sun isn't even up, I'm afraid. Oh, High 30. But something dreadful has occurred. Forgive my almost whispering, but... I don't want Cynthia to know yet. All right, what is it? It's... It's Charles... Uh, hello, forgive me. I thought I heard an urgent knocking. Do I intrude? <laughs> Quite all right, Professor. Everyone must know sooner or later. My nephew Charles is... Is dead. What? Oh, I can't move it. What? How? How? That's the terrifying thing. I want you to come and see for yourself. And answer me that question. followed Dr. Lowe and Sir George downstairs to that terrible room. Except that the fire had burned out. It looked much as it did when we all had left the night before. Except for Charles Volney. If I can refer to the caricature of him that we saw. He was braced in the corner between the window recess and where the chimney jutted out as if he had tried to escape and been glued there by some giant force that literally crushed him. His face was suffused with blood, his eyes starting from his head. He was quite dead. He must have been dead for several hours. What do you think, Dr. Lowe? Frightened to death? No, no. No, more than that. He was uh, smothered, asphyxiated. I don't quite know how to describe it. Uh, pressed. Pressed to death almost. Yes, once during the war I had a friend in, in a building that was bombed. He was not injured directly. Only the force of the blast within a confined space drove him against the wall and somehow flattened him. Uh, he was spread wide. Good Lord. It's not natural. No. No, my friend Sir George, it is, uh, I'm afraid, supernatural. Yes, he should have listened to your wife, and I should have listened to my own misgivings. Uh, alas, I feel at fault there. No, 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 John. I came down last night again, just before midnight. He'd passed out on the couch, and I couldn't move him. It's no one's fault but mine. I should never have come back to this accursed house. And I'll call Mr. Bunbury... He's our local superintendent of police. Sure, I, 
I saved you for the last, Mr. Lowe, knowing your reputation and all. I don't know whether that's a plus or a minus. Oh, now, sir, plus, of course. And not that I understand some of your investigations, but you stand very high at Scotland Yard. Very high. Thank you. Now, I've checked out the servants, and they can all alibi each other for one reason or another. On the other hand, I can't seriously imagine a suspect among all of you in the main house here, even admitting that Sir George, and particularly his lady, are a bit of a rum go, both of them, oh, but particularly her. Are you, uh, are you referring to her belief in spiritualism, Superintendent? Hey, that'd be it, sir. And then, a uh, couple of things Sir George told me. Oh, may I ask what? Oh, my intention is to tell you. That's why I brought it up. First off, he said he came down here by candlelight and found the deceased. Mm. But that before he did, passing the mantel place, the candle went out. Just as something like, well, in his own words, something spectral brushed across my cheek and I saw in front of my face two barred eyes looking at me. Uh. Barred eyes. Now, what does that mean? Oh, that's exactly what I asked, sir. And, and he replied, eyes that looked at me as though through the bars of a cage. And then I was conscious of a strange flat taste in my mouth and the odor of damp and decay. And I lit the candle and saw poor Charles. Now, what do you make of that, sir? Well... You've seen the corpse. What do you make of it, Superintendent? Oh, I don't, sir. That's why I'm asking you. Uh, uh, you don't believe in ghosts, I take it. Well, I haven't. Sure. Uh, oh, I know you've been in on many investigations, however, where it seemed to be something like that, only, you know, wasn't. Well, can you think of any other explanation for this death? Meaning that you think it was something... Uh, Supernatural? Well, I don't see any other explanation for the moment. Oh, I wouldn't think that would quite satisfy my superiors. I mean, it's quite clear the chap couldn't have killed himself, you see. So someone else has to be guilty. And I hope for everyone's sake we can find out just who. It was sheer inadvertence that I happened to be in the solarium right off the porch where this interview took place. Or was it? Because as soon as it was over and the sergeant had left, um, Flaxman came out to join me. But I am still in the dark. Well, as I or we may very well find ourselves tonight. Aha, uh -huh. where? In the room where Charles died. I intend to spend a night there as he did. Um, do you want to share my vigil against the total powers of darkness? <laughs> And as Professor Thierry regards his brilliant but strange friend and intellectual enemy, remembering the horrible death he has seen one man suffer, but pondering the challenge of ultimate proof on a basic principle, I must leave them, and you, till I return with Act Three. Wonder. It has been a long and difficult day at Yand Manor House. The comings and goings, police, photographers, inevitably the newspapers. Finally, the undertaker and the removal of what is left of Charles Volney's terrestrial presence. Sir George and his wife have naturally been totally involved in this. And it is not until evening that their guests, who have tactfully tried to stay out from underfoot have been able to exchange more than a few words with either of them. Now, Mrs. Blackburton has at last been able to find a moment alone with Flaxman Lowe, walking in the garden. It's all my fault, you see. No, no, I don't see. I was the one who talked George into coming back to Yan Manor after all these years. Oh, Lady Blackburton has a bench right here. Would you like to sit down? Oh, beside the mausoleum? Why not? It's strangely appropriate. Why? What is this building? Well, that's part of it all. Yen Manor has been in George's family since a sort of granduncle willed it to his grandfather with a specific reservation. And that was? That in perpetuity, 
till the last of the Black Burton heirs, Yand House must remain in the family's hands. And that if the family didn't occupy it, it couldn't be rented. Well, now, I doubt if that would hold up in any legal court. Possibly not, but beyond that, there was the curse. The curse? That anyone who broke the promise or the letter of it would die a horrible death. Oh, I see. And, uh, Sir George, believe this. George is such a decent man, Dr. Lowe. It wouldn't have had to go that far. He would have just lived up to a family promise as his father and he had in their own way and kept Gand House without living in it. But you see, I was the one who forced the issue. You decided that as long as you were back in England, it was silly not to live in a house you already owned. Yes. Plus, by now, my... My dedication to spiritualism, my new venture into the occult. Mm -hmm. So I'm the author and the instrument of this tragedy. I feel as if I'd actually murdered my nephew, Charles. Well, now, Lady Blackbird, and I don't understand that. Because having forced George to return here against his will, he'd rebelled. He didn't like all these supernatural manifestations. And it was only at my insistence, at my plea, that he brought you down here. If they couldn't be stopped or explained, he determined to sell the property and destroy this mausoleum. As soon as it was legally possible. And uh, may I ask who rests here? That uncle of George's grandfather who started this whole thing. His body is actually in that tomb? Yes, Locked in a strange lead casket. A lead casket? This uncle was a strange man with an inordinate fear of death. Oh. It said that he predicted his own death and arranged to have a doctor in attendance. And he died very suddenly and unexpectedly. I see. Uh, Lady Blackburton, you're asking for my help, aren't you? I have no right to, but... Yes. I feel that my hobbies have inadvertently led my husband and his family into a terrible peril. The only one I know who might save them is you. I see. Then may I have your husband's and your permission to spend tonight in the den as your nephew did last night? I don't want to risk your life. Well, I won't deny it may be risk, but... uh, First of all, I know what I'm doing, which your nephew did not. And second... I shall not be alone. And so it was we came to that fateful night. My friend Flaxman Lowe and I entered that fearful room, closed the door behind us, and settled down to challenge whatever malevolent spirit he thought still occupied it. I was still skeptical and remaining to be convinced. This is the account of that evening. It was very different from the night before. No wind was stirring. It had been a beautiful sunset. There was no need for a fire. And for some time, after long discussion, Jean, Thierry, and I were sitting quietly. All of a sudden, he rose. Uh, I'm thirsty. Would you like a drink? Uh, no, no. Thank you, Jean. I want to have all my senses alert. I meant only plain water. No, thank you. Oh, what an abominable taste. What, the water? No, I haven't touched it yet. It it is as if some horrible fly has flown into my mouth. It is Mm. disgusting. Yes, yes, like like a fungus growth. Yes, repulsive like that. Yeah, I ask only because I feel the same. Well, I think you're about to be convinced. Uh, You don't mean that... Why did you put out the lamp? I didn't. Uh, light the candle beside you on the table. Very well. Tonnerre, uh, uh, give me your matches, Dr. Lowe. Mine now, damn. Uh, where are you? I'm here. Oh, it is as dark as Egypt. Uh, I am coming, I'm coming. Uh, uh, it is so hard to get along. Hard to get along? Yes, I, I am unable to move. Ah. I am suffocating. Where are you? I am here by the door. I... Ah! The air in the room had become palpable to the touch. Heavy, clotted, repulsive, with the sensation of smothering cold human flesh. I fought against it, gasping for breath. The clammy flesh crowded.
floating in from the air, smothering me like some fat, nauseating humanoid jellyfish. And then, across my cheek, there was a stinging, reeking pain. With my last strength, I fled the terror. There was a crash of glass, a wild rush of air, and I knew no more. When I came to, I saw the dawn was breaking to the east, and I was lying on the lawn of Yand Manor House. Above me was a shattered lattice window swinging in the wind, and clutched in my hand was something dark in color, slender and twisted. It might have been the skin of an adder, a piece of bark rolling itself up like a parchment scroll or the desiccated claw of some unimaginable beast from hell. I hurried into the house, barely conscious of the smarting pain in my left cheek, fearful only for my friend Jean. I found him unconscious just outside the door to that baleful room, but thank God, alive. Uh, 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 Excellent. Yes, just take it easy, Jean. Uh, All right, now, can you stand? Are you all right? Yes. I think so. All right. You have a bruise on your forehead. Are you dizzy? No, no, not not anymore. What happened to you? I I don't know. I, I was literally... Crowded out of the room by that infernal thing. What was it? With its damp, swelling flesh, I was buried in that stifling pulp. It pushed and swelled against me, driving me away from you in the dark to the door. I called out, but I could hear no answer. What was that ghastly presence? Well, I think I can answer that now. It was what killed the young man, no? Yes, the very same. And I hope I can convince the inspector of that. Well, you have made a convert of me. Why not him? Well, we shall see. First of all, Sir George, the uh, spectral hand that seemed to brush across your face as you told Superintendent Bumbry. Yes? Uh, you, were, you were by the uh, fireplace at the time, passing the ornamental foremantle that rises above it. Yes. Uh, you see all those figures carved there, in particular the griffin, and uh, hanging from the sharp point of its beak? These? Human hairs. Yes, human hairs, black. Now, whose would you say they were? Both Professor Thierry and myself are gray. You're light-haired and your nephew was fair. Sir George is sandy. Now, who else frequents this room? No one. Except the maid, who is also graying. But these are a woman's hair. Why? Why? Because they're long? Well, yes. Uh Uh-huh. And this? Uh, What is that? Uh, Could I see? Sure. Hmm. A long, thin object, half brown, half yellow, and... Twisted like the blade of a corkscrew. I have no idea. Well, suppose I suggest it's a human nail, which time and neglect is allowed to grow to superhuman proportions. Oh, dear, it would have to be 12 inches long. Nobody but an ancient Chinese Mandarin could grow such a monstrosity. Or a corpse who refused to die. I don't quite get that last. Uh, Mr. Superintendent... Let me project something. This uh, uncle who left Yan Manor House to your grandfather, Sir George. Was he dark and her suit? Was he a recluse? Did he build a mausoleum in the garden? And did he have an inordinate fear of death? Yes, to all counts. And is it not true that both you and the nephew who might have been your heir were ready to take all steps to get rid of this mausoleum and or Yan Manor House, particularly your nephew? I suppose so. Then, Superintendent, I can categorically tell you that your murderer lies in the casket in that mausoleum and the murderer of anyone who tries to oust him from this property as long as he shall live. Are you suggesting that a man dead over a century is still in some sense alive? Unless it sustains injury itself. The brain is the last to die. In fact, it's the only measure of finite death. Now open the coffin... And you'll see what I mean. It was complicated, of course, with all the necessary red tape. But on a certain day, the coffin, which took ten men to move out into the sunlight and sealed as tight as a drum, was opened. (laughs) 
Perhaps. Perhaps, Lady Black Britain. But you see, the urge, the dream, the thirst for immortality persists. His own special coffin sealed airtight. So confining that when his soul stirred beyond his finite body, he must have had an illimitable desire to expand and choke out anyone who stood in his way. But after a hundred years, the flesh, the form, still skin undisturbed. Except for the hair and the nails and the eyelashes. Look at the length of them. All of them must have kept growing since he was locked in the coffin. Are you suggesting this man was or is still alive? In a sense, yes, Superintendent. You see, he seems to have mastered some ancient formula whereby the body is saved from complete disintegration. And you can see that evidence before you. So that closes your case for you, Mr. Superintendent. Now you know how young Mr. Volney met his death. And what about us, Dr. Lowe? Oh, I think you'll have little reason for fear being haunted anymore. You see, in the sunlight, the body already is beginning to disintegrate. By the end of the day, there'll be nothing left but a fleshless skeleton. How can I thank you for what you've accomplished? I don't thank me. It's fate. And the proper relationship of things. God and the world have a way of reestablishing those. And have I convinced you, Professor, that at least there is something beyond your pragmatic values? My dear Dr. Lowe, you have convinced me that you will add another branch to our sciences. But I must admit, you establish your facts too well for my total peace of mind. The remarkable Flaxman Lowe, parapsychic private eye, has been and continues to be a dominating figure in the field of parapsychology and in unraveling its mysteries, or at least illuminating them. If this is a field which interests you, perhaps I shall bring you other cases in the future. of that ominous and ancient ancestor have long been transferred to a normal burying place and the mausoleum torn down. Sir George and his wife stay on at Yand Manor House. Cynthia Blackburton has long since given up spiritualism and assorted interests in favor of feminism. Of course, since she is still in the 19th century, you might not recognize it for what it is today. But her spirit lingers on through the women's suffragette movement. Through memories of Emma Goldman and her sister standard bearers, who were the progenitors of women's lib. Our cast included Larry Haynes, Paul Hecht, Betty Winkler, Guy Sorrell, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Well, I've come to the conclusion that he, this man, can only learn by example. That's why I want you as my ranch boss. As executioner. What? If anyone... If anyone won't toe the line as your representative, I force him to draw down on me. And when he does... No! No, I don't want the reality, only the threat, the pressure, the leverage. I don't want any killing. No... No one ever really does. They just want their way. The killing is a kind of terrible accident that just happens. Only with me, it's no accident. You bought yourself just what you want, Colonel Braden. I feel mighty sure I did, King Tucker. Can't help myself. My cross to bear. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. The 
CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Two thousand years before Christ... Antef, the Egyptian king of the 11th dynasty, had this inscribed upon his tomb. There is none who comes back from the dead, that he may tell their state, that he may tell their needs. It is not given to man to take his property with him, nor is there one who departs who ever comes back again. Today, almost 4,000 years later, we have reason to believe this is not so. People do come back from the dead. Rebecca, what does the ghost look like? He's about oh, six feet tall, has a beard, green pants, olive green, and he holds in his hand a long knife. How old would you say he is? Uh, about 30. Anything peculiar about his clothing? Uh, I'd say they were, well, what people wore in the 40s. Uh, my dad had pleated pants like his. So it's possible your ghost passed over 30 years ago. Passed over? Died. You see, spirits never grow older. They remain exactly the age they were when they left this world and entered theirs. Our mystery drama, The Ghost with a Knife, based on a psychic case history reported by Bryce Bond, was dramatized especially for the Mystery Theater by James Agate Jr. and stars Arnold Moss and Patricia Elliott. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule. I'll be back shortly with Act One. talking with friends and someone asks, do you believe in ghosts? For the most part, the non-believers are those to whom extrasensory experiences have never happened. But there are very many in this world to whom the spirits of another world are very real and active and cry to be heard. One of those who hears them and deals with them is Bryce Bond, a well-known psychic scientist and investigator of the supernatural and super normal. Let me get down to cases. One in particular. About a week before December the 16th, 1974, I received a call from the president of the Foundation for Parasensory Investigation who told me that a policeman from Mineola, Long Island, called to say that a Mr. and Mrs. Green, a young couple he knew, asked him to come over to their house and investigate a ghost. I set up a date with a couple and asked David Enters, a medium, a psychic, and also a photographer, to come along with me. Oh, oh, oh come in, come in. You are a... Uh... Uh, Bryce Bond, and this is David Enters. How do you do? Uh, you can leave your overcoats here. I'll uh, hang on to my camera, if you don't mind. You're going to take pictures of our ghost, Mr. Anders? If I can. Uh, I didn't know one could. Uh, oh, uh, uh, this is my husband, Leo. How do you do? Our boy Tommy is upstairs. Uh, he's asleep, I hope. I see you've got a camera. I've always thought those pictures of spooks and ghosts were fakes. You know, superimposed shots, that kind of thing. Have you seen this ghost, Mr. Green? I most certainly have. Well, then perhaps so can my camera. I use infrared film. Wherever heat is generated in outline or even in considerable detail, it will register on the film. Oh, I had no idea. Um, <clears throat> may we start? Mr. Green, Mrs. Green, I'll begin by asking you your first names. Rebecca. Rebecca. And your husband is Leo, and your boy is... Tommy. Uh, Tommy. Well, now, I'm Bryce, and this is David. If we're to help you, we should all try to be as relaxed and informal and friendly as we can. Now, this, uh, this apparition you experience, we want you to regard him or her... It's a man. Well, he's to be regarded as a friend. 
We don't want to antagonize or frighten them. We're the ones who are being frightened. He isn't really a very friendly spirit. He looks horrible. Rebecca, can you tell us when you first saw him? Yes. When I first... It, it all started Becky, when... may I? My wife is really very upset about this. You see, she's home most of the time. And I'm at work. So she's been under a much greater strain. I think I can be calmer. There it is. Those are the footsteps. Well, we've sort of become used to our ghost walking up from the cellar. He's been doing that for months now. Leo, I can tell them. Uh, Tommy was the first to see the ghost. Well, Tommy, my son. He, he came down one morning. He, he's only four. And he said, Mommy, who's that man in my room? He said, I, I woke up in the middle of the night and he was standing there. Oh, we didn't know what to make of it at first. I said to Becky, I think Tommy's having a nightmare. But it kept happening, night after night. That's him, coming up the cellar stairs. Then he opens the cellar door. He's doing it now, in the kitchen. Well, maybe he's showing off because you've got guests. Oh, no, he does that every evening. But most of the time, you don't see him. He doesn't, uh, what do you call it? Materialize. No, no, he doesn't. He just walks around invisible. And I don't like the idea of leaving my wife and son in a house with a strange guy. He's six foot tall. Will you excuse me? I'd like to go into the kitchen and have a look down those cellar stairs. I'll be right back. So he goes up and down the cellar stairs. That's right. Through the cellar, into the boiler room. Always follows a pattern. I think he's trying to attract our attention to something. We get the feeling he wants us to follow him down there. And do you follow him? Yes, we have many times. But there isn't anything special down there, so... It doesn't make any sense. Cellar door was open. Went down a couple of steps, but I couldn't see a thing. Took some shots, but uh, I don't have much hope. There's nothing down there but the usual stuff people have in their basements. And the oil burner. Actually, two oil burners. We put in a new one last spring. Just left the old, useless, rusty one where it was. Leo, how long have you lived here? Mm, Since right after last Christmas. Almost a year. It was December 29th. Last year. The house was built in 1929, so the old oil burner didn't owe us anything. Anyway, all this started this past October. For weeks, we only heard noises. And then, as I told you, Tommy started to see the ghost in his room at night. And about a month ago, November, so did we. Well, I'm sorry we didn't know about this manifestation sooner. So am I. But Becky and I, we didn't know what to do. You know, people kid you. And remember Joe Forster, our friendly patrolman. Mm-hmm. What made you decide to tell a policeman? It's one thing just to hear noises. It's another thing to see a man six feet tall. But last Monday, I was alone here with Tommy. And he came at us with the knife. I've done many years of investigative work into the parasensory, but this was the first time I'd heard of a supernatural entity holding a knife. I gave the Greens a complete rundown of who David and I were, the extent of the work of the Foundation, and said that we were quite prepared to help them immediately. You mean right now, this evening? As much as we can. Agreed? I should say so. Oh, yes. Rebecca, let's start by going upstairs to... Tommy's room. That's where he first saw the apparition? Yes, uh, but I wouldn't like to wake him. It's not necessary. And Leo, will you take David down to the cellar so that he can have a look around? It's from the cellar the ghost always comes, yes? And that's right. We think he must live down there. Um, just up these stairs, Mr. Uh... Uh, Bryce. Uh, Bryce. Uh, here at the landing, uh, that's our bedroom, Leo's and mine on the right. And Tommy's is on the left. Only Tommy has seen him inside his room. I first saw him here, outside Tommy's door. We're standing right where you're standing. What does he look like? Uh, He's about six feet tall, has a beard, dark hair, a maroon-colored shirt, um, green pants, olive green. And then, uh, now... He carries this big knife. Rebecca, how old would you say the ghost is? Not old. Uh, about 30. Mm-hmm. Is there anything peculiar about his clothing? Peculiar? You mean like uh, bloodstains? Oh, no, no. 
No, no, I mean, is it is it modern or is it old-fashioned? Sort of modern, but, but not really what you're wearing today. It's sort of like what people were wearing well, 20, 30 years ago. I see. So it's possible the ghost passed over in the 1940s. Passed over? Died. Oh. Do they appear to us in the same clothes they wore when they died? Well, of course. The same clothes and the same age. Spirits never grow older as we do. They remain exactly the age they were when they left this world and entered theirs. Well, now, can we take a peek into Tommy's bedroom? I'll open the door very quietly. I don't want to wake him. Hmm? Now, where was the ghost standing when Tommy saw him? Mostly at the foot of his bed. Most of the times. Right by that window. Oh, and, and that's another thing. Wait a sec. I, I want to show you something. I don't know if this... Would, would you take a look at this plant? Oh, well, what is it? Or should I say, what was it? African violets. Could have used a little water. That's just the point. This morning, this plant was healthy and alive. I got it at the store. It's at least a tenth of... Well, I don't know how many plants or all kinds we've put in Tommy's room. And he loves growing things. We watch them, water them, but they all die. Overnight, they shrivel up. H have you seen enough? Yes, I have. How does Tommy react to the ghost? Well, you know, he's very little. But still... He isn't scared. But he's only four. That's awfully young to understand fear. I... I'll tell you something I've noticed, Bryce. Whenever I go into Tommy's room, I feel good there. Can you explain that a little better? Well, well in the rest of the house, I... I feel uneasy, almost like alarmed. But in Tommy's bedroom, it, it's really more... peaceful. I've had the funny idea that maybe the ghost is protecting my baby, and that's why it feels good in there. Oh, there you are. Well, we explored the cellar. How's everything upstairs, Bryce? It's very interesting, David. As I said before, this ghost follows a pattern. No question about that. You you, you saw nothing in the basement. Nothing visible, but uh, I think, Bryce, we should consider that the old oil burner may have something to do with the ghost. Mm, that had occurred to me, too, David. But what? Well, a number of possibilities, Leo. Somebody may be buried under the concrete. In our cellar? Buried? How horrible. There's no point speculating how this wandering spirit died. Our job is to try to discover why he's here. You know, I find it warm in here. It would give us a better working atmosphere if you could please lower the heat. Just just turn it down a couple of degrees. Oh, Leo, we forgot to tell them. Yes, we did. You see, Bryce, he turns up the heat. He? You mean... Yes, that? we forgot to tell you about that. We're no different from anybody else. We've been trying to conserve heat every night. We push the thermostat down to about 60 or 65. Did either of you turn the thermostat down tonight? Yes, I did. I remember distinctly doing it, but just before you two arrived. Now, come have a look at the thermostat. 90. Look at that. Oh, let me get a shot. Yep, 90 degrees. That's what he usually pushes it up to. You know, we've gotten up in the middle of the night roasting. Come down... 90 degrees. We haven't been able to figure out what he's trying to do to us. Uh, Leo, uh, move to one side, please, so I can focus. Yeah, sorry. At least now we know he's come up from the cellar and was right here at this spot. This evening. Before, when I heard him walking back down the cellar stairs, I was afraid he'd left us. When strangers enter a house, generally a spirit will not manifest itself. Unless you make a real effort to be friendly. Bryce, can I say something? I mean, about the way I feel... Well, by all means. Uh, I have a funny... No, it's not funny. It's really a, a very strange sense of dread. I never felt it quite so strong. Ah! Betty, what is it? Oh, don't you feel it? Don't you feel anything? You mean that cold wave of air? Oh, sure, I feel it. I'll just cover the whole room. See if anything registers on the infrared. Oh, we haven't done something awful, have we? I mean, by asking you here. It's, it's very cold right in front of me. Like someone's looking right into my face. I don't think I can stand this much longer, oh, Leo. We must all be calm. And accept the fact that at this very moment, our mysterious friend is in this room. 
that he's moving about. Rebecca and Leo Green are real people. This event really occurred in their Tudor-style home on Locust Avenue, Mineola, Long Island, on the 16th of December, 1974. Bryce Bond and David Enters are witness to this fact. I'll return shortly with Act Two. The lives of a young suburban couple and their two-year-old son are suddenly turned topsy-turvy when their home is invaded by an apparition who appears to live in their cellar and wanders about their house day and night. To live in a house with a spectral stranger is unnerving enough. But when the ghost carries a long, dangerous-looking knife, it can be terrifying. Why is he here? Can he be made to leave? Bryce Bond, the parasensory scientist, picks up the account. We sat in the Green's living room aware of the rustle of cold air moving around us. The vibrations I picked up made it quite clear that the ghost was in that room at that very moment. Will you folks excuse me a moment? I'm going to have to reload my camera and I've got my film in my coat. I'd like to turn the lights down a little more. Must we? I suppose I just turn out the overhead lights and leave this one next to the sofa. What about the candles on the mantelpiece? Oh, no, no, no. Be those burning. That's, that's all right. I'm almost afraid to look at the candles. I know that when the flames move, he's there. Rebecca, what was the last time you actually saw him? Last night. You had a good close look at him, hmm? How far away was he? He was standing right there, by the mantelpiece. Leo had gone to bed. I, I was emptying the ashtrays over here. Mm-hmm. Now, when you saw the apparition last night, did he appear just as physical as I do now? Or did you see through him? He was as clear as you are. In fact, it's <laughs> crazy, but I'd rather really see him than have him be invisible. And when he went, he didn't fade away, or did he? I don't know. I went into the kitchen with the ashtray and dumped it in the garbage. And when I came back into the living room, he was gone. Did he have a knife in his hand last night, Rebecca? I don't know. I don't know. It's just getting too much. I told you, Leo, we've got to move. I don't want to stay in this house any longer. I don't. Oh, honey. I don't. I don't. Come on. That's no way to talk. I think if you can hold on to yourselves for a little bit longer, we may be able to get the ghost to move. There's another side to this. It may not all be as heavy as you think. A lot of apparitions love to play tricks. In the fall... We were having trouble with the new oil burner, and I was on the phone with the oil burner man, and he said, would I go down and look at some gauge or something? I I went down the cellar steps, and I fell. It was as exactly as if somebody had tripped me. And then it happened again another time. Well, that's funny. I didn't notice any loose steps when I was down there earlier. Did you, Leo? I haven't been down to the cellar tonight. Well, sure you have. You brought me down. I, I took some pictures. Tonight? <laughs> of course. You're, you're kidding me. Oh, I absolutely don't remember. Has this happened before in this house? Somebody's actually gone down to the basement and not remembered? Oh, Leo. I went upstairs to Tommy's room with Bryce, and you took David into the cellar. I did? You don't remember? No, I don't. I did not go down to the cellar tonight. Oh, good Lord. Rebecca and Leo were working themselves up into quite a state, getting increasingly agitated. I knew the vibrations they were creating were negative and would make it almost impossible to communicate with a haunting spirit. I don't know if it's your imagination or mine. This happens to us every single night. Becky and I accusing each other of too much imagination. We even stopped having coffee with our dinner. Rebecca, how good is your imagination? Good as anybody else's, I guess. All right. But I'm going to ask you to use it constructively. Now, this is what I want you to do, Rebecca. It's a psychic technique we use if a person is bothered by a poltergeist or an astral form who's tied to the earth, as is your ghost with a knife. 
Now, I ask the rest of you to remain quite silent. Rebecca, I want you to imagine yourself in a ball of white light. Close your eyes. It won't hurt me. On the contrary. This white light, sometimes we call it the God light. Because no evil force can penetrate it. Is the man an evil force? At this point, we don't know. He has a knife. I know that, Rebecca. But holding a knife doesn't necessarily mean he's a man with evil intent. His face. It's not a nice face. But just in case there is danger, superimpose yourself with, or let's say, contain yourself in a globe of white light. A large globe? Do you feel anything? Do you see anything? I have my eyes closed. I know that. But in your mind's eye, you should begin to actually see the white light. It's the light of protection, Rebecca. It's the light of love. I see it. The white light. I'm inside it. I see it. All right, David, it's time now. What's David going to do? More pictures? No, David is also a medium. We didn't want to tell you that in the beginning of our session because sometimes people can't appreciate the sensitivity of a medium and they're somewhat disbelieving. But I think now you're both beginning to believe that we can help you. David, sit back. Be comfortable. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Bryce. Your presence is getting fainter. What's David doing? He's dropping into a trance. Yes. Yes. I see him. I see the man. He's tall. Very tall. David's standing up. His face. His face. That's the face of the ghost. David is making his face look like the ghost's. He wants to speak. He wants to speak through Bryce. He wants to say something, Bryce. No harm. No harm. I mean no harm. Why do you say that, Bryce? Thank you, Bryce. He thanks you for letting him use your voice. The ghost had used my own larynx, my throat, to say the words, I mean no harm. This had never happened to me before. Usually it's the medium who speaks for the spirit. We then brought David out of his deep trance. Naturally, he remembered nothing of what had occurred since he's the conduit between the two worlds. I then proposed we examine every room in the Green's house for vibrations, starting at the top. All of us went up the narrow stairs to the attic. Bryce, would you take over now? I'm going to try for some more pictures. Sure. Uh, Rebecca, Leo, let's turn out that electric bulb hanging there. It's better if we're in darkness. Remember, when you can't see the ghost, he also is unable to see you. When his body is visible to you, so is yours to him. Oh! Oh, that startled me. It's only a thundershower. Rain in December? Please, please. Let no one speak. Spectral spirits, we have no thoughts for you but kindness and love. It is time now for you to leave the world of Earth and return to your world. Where there must be God's work for you to do. Do you hear me, spirits? Speak to us. Make us know why you are tied to this house. You have left behind your loved ones in your world to be here. Spirit. Spectral spirit. Why, why are you in this house? What, what, 
What, what, what, do you, what do you want to say? Oh, I feel the weight. Something, something was taking possession of me. My head became heavy. It was hard to breathe, to get my words out. The spirit was trying to come through and tell me something. At last it passed, and we left the attic. On the second floor, we checked every room. Little Tommy's, where he lay asleep, had the warmest vibrations. Leo and Rebecca's very cold and unusual vibrations. David took pictures everywhere. Bryce, uh, shall we do the exorcism now? I was just going to suggest that. Every room. Exorcism? Isn't that some kind of spooky religious thing for witches and devils and... Well, I don't know what. Leo, you've been seeing too many horror movies. We're not about to exercise a person, but the runes. But isn't that... Well, kind of sacrilegious? No, no, no. Not at all. Ours is very, very simple. We just try to communicate to see the prevailing entity, and sometimes we do. It appears in a misty form. How do you do it? We use the sign of the cross. I thought the cross was a symbol of what Jesus Christ was crucified on. Oh, heavens, no. That sign isn't the exclusive property of the church. The true cross is fire, air, water, earth. It predates Christianity by at least 65,000 years. I had no idea. The sign was used in those ancient days as a fire line to burn away negativity and to act as a, as a natural blessing. And that's the sign you're going to make now? Exactly as the ancient metaphysical priests did. It's not a religious cross at all. Can we watch? Well, dear Rebecca, you, you should watch. This is your house. This sign will bring peace to it. We blessed all the walls of every room with our perfect cross. David and I both making large hand movements up and down and from left to right. What do we do now? I think now, Leo, we've created a safer haven for the ghost, so... We'll have another try at communicating with it. Why? Why do you have to keep talking to that thing? That awful ghost with a horrible face and that knife. Why don't you just make him go away? We never did anything to anybody ever. Don't you see, Rebecca? If we can get it to tell us why it haunts you, the whole mystery will be solved. Now it's an it. Before it was a him. Is it real? Is it unreal? A thing or a prisoner? Oh, it's too much for me. Bryce, uh, may I explain? Please do, David. Look, uh, Rebecca, Leo, the spirit world is not a world where there is no life. Those spirits, like the ghost with the knife, they have just as much love and compassion as you and I. And that's why... They have love and compassion and act like he does? I'd say even more love. There's a reason for him being here. There is... I... I suppose I shouldn't be making such a fuss. Maybe... Maybe he is just trying to tell us something. Well, that's what I'm hoping, Rebecca. So, will you bear with David and with me? And that's 12 o'clock. Let's have a, another go at it. David? Leo? Rebecca? Will you give us a chance? We do know what we're doing. 12 o'clock. Rebecca, I'm going to ask you again to turn out the lights and just leave the candles burning. David doesn't need much light to find his way into the other world. Hard to believe, is it? This is not fiction. It's fact. The foundation for parasensory investigation indeed exists. Scientific psychic explorer Bryce Bond is a real person. And the events you are listening to happened. To what extent this couple and their child were freed from the haunting of the ghost with a knife, we shall find out when I return shortly with Act Three. When you enter a new world, you are a stranger. 
until you learn the language. Everything is foreign, unexpected, almost mysterious, until you know the ABCs. So it is also in the world of mathematics, space travel, medicine, and science. So it is in this strange world of psychic phenomena. At last, Rebecca and Leo Green are trying to understand the key to it, as well as the key words to free themselves from this astral visitor. Bryce Bond continues. I told them I felt we were getting close to the solution. The next step was for David again to enter a trance state. Trance state. Now what's that they wanted to know? I explained that through David, we'd be able to enter the mysterious land of the spirit side. I'm sorry I acted like that, Bryce. It was stupid of me, especially when I believe we're on the home stretch. I really do want to know. So do I, every step of the way. And you were telling us about trance state, Bryce. It's a state of being and non-being. For instance, when I do my healing, I drop down into a trance state, meaning myself, my ego, the Bryce Bond ego, leaves me. As David's is leaving him now. Why do you do that? Can we have silence, please? David is freeing himself so that he can channel all the energy from above. You see? Now watch him. He's shaking his head. And now he's nodding. Do you see? I mean no harm. I mean no harm. Neither do we, sir. Let me assure you, we wish you no harm. And we believe you wish us none. No. No harm. I want you to listen to me carefully, spirit. Here on Earth, it is now winter time, December. In a little more than a week, it'll be Christmas. Do you remember Christmas? Christmas. The time of goodwill to men and the time of peace? Christmas. The year is 1974. Understand? 1974. That's right. That is the year it is today. Now, can you tell me when it is you passed away, passed over? I am glad. I'm glad to talk to you. You have opened the gate for me to talk to you. I'm also glad. Do you remember what year it was you passed over? When? You say... Winter or summer. Like this time, snow and cold outside. Do you remember the year? Year, the year. The year you died. The year. I don't remember the numbers anymore. What do you remember? I can tell you how it was. I was very sick and I couldn't go out. I'd sit up in a chair all dressed and I'd listen to the radio a lot. There were little plays on the radio every day. Soap operas, they called them. I lived a whole year listening. They kept me alive. I didn't want to leave them. Nobody would let me out of my room. And I hadn't put it right. What hadn't you put right? I knew as I lay there, I hadn't fixed it right. It would go wrong. What is it that would go wrong? I want to. Is it something you want to tell Rebecca and Leo and Tommy? I love little children. What is it that's troubling you? Do you want to tell them something? You are warning them. Is that it? What harm? What harm? Rebecca and Leo and Tommy don't know who you are. But they love you. The strength of their love is wishing you to tell them. What harm? Spirit, somewhere here on Earth, you must have left behind some loved ones and they love you too. Can you hear me? Can you hear me still? The ghost has gone. 
Are you all right, David? Uh, yes. He was very strong, wasn't he? We almost found out why he comes here. Uh, it's something he's left undone. Uh, Thank you, David. Uh, won't our ghost come back? I hope so, but I don't know. I'd imagine that until his job is finished, he won't leave you. What job? What is it? What could he have yet to do? Oh, we'll close our eyes now. I shall speak for all of us. At this very moment, we are all going to the cellar door. Yes, yes. We want to go down the cellar stairs. I have that feeling, too. Yes. A sense of urgency. Now, now, we must go now. Yes, yes. Yes, we mustn't waste a moment. There was no question about it. It was a pull as strong as gravity. We all knew we had to go down to the basement. I led the way, and then, strangely enough, like Rebecca had done before me, I too tripped on the last step and almost fell. There he is. Over there. By the cellar window. Oh, yes. I hope I've got enough film left in the camera. He's coming this way. He's moving over to my workbench. Friend. Friend. What is the warning you have for us? Show us. Show us. He, he's doing something with his foot. Remember, dear friend, we wish to help you do what you have left undone. Then you can return to your world. Can you hear me? Can you understand me? Bryce, I don't want to take any more pictures. I have a strong sense of unity with him now. If I'm in a trans state, accept that and do whatever he says to do through me. Of course, David. The pictures are not important. Now I have exactly the same sense of haste, of something to be done quickly, quickly. Oh, there he goes. Into the oil burner room. <laughs> Gas leaks down here. What? Back. Danger. What leaks? I, I, I never smelled anything down here. Good Lord, yes. It is gas. Do something now. Now. Hurry before it's too late. Emergency service, island lighting. Yeah, this is Leo Green, 1447 Locust Avenue, Mineola. There's a gas leak in our basement. Will you send somebody over right away? Green, 1447 Locust, Mineola. Do you have your oil burner on right now? Uh, Becky, do we have the oil burner on right now? Of course we do. C can't you hear it? Yes, we do have it on right now. Do you have a red box marked emergency switch? Uh, just a moment. Do we have a red box, an emergency switch? Yes, at the head of the stairs. Yes, we do. Right at the head of the stairs. Well, will you go there now and switch it off? We'll have somebody around to your house very shortly. Quite true. The message relayed through David by the ghost. There was a gas leak. It had been seeping for quite some time. The power company told the Greens that had they not been alerted, in a matter of hours, their house on Locust Avenue might have gone sky high in an explosion. Everything was turned off and made safe by three in the morning. We were all sitting around in the kitchen, finally having some coffee. All those days and days and nights of not knowing. Oh, and now it's all over. <laughs> Did you take a look at Tommy? Yes, he hasn't stirred. He slept right through the whole thing. Funny, when I went up to check on him, I felt this very warm vibration, and I thought, I, I know. A ghost has come up to Tommy's room to say goodbye. Then, all of a sudden, the feeling just disappeared. Your little boy had a friend. I don't think you'll have any problems about keeping plants alive in his room anymore. Well, couldn't it have been the gas? Plants are sensitive to that. You think that's what it was, Rebecca? Oh, Leo. Sometimes I begin to really wonder about you. It was the ghost trying to warn us. Oh, come on, now. Can't there be a natural reason for something? I mean, everything can't be explained by the supernatural. But there was no gas leak anywhere near Tommy's room. You come on now. Uh... Look, friends, we have a report to write and some sleep to get. Thank you for the coffee. Oh, Bryce, you and David were real friends. <laughs> Been an experience I don't think either of us will ever forget. I'd say on the whole, we had a very peaceful reaction. 
Don't you agree, Bryce? Oh, yes, indeed. This this ghost with a knife, he was quite a peaceful entity. Not a negative entity in the slightest. Only negative briefly to frighten them into action. I hesitate to think where we'd be tomorrow if you two hadn't shown up. <laughs> Who knows? Possibly our friend the ghost would have still found some way to warn you. When I think of it, he did everything short of ripping the thermostat off the wall. And still we didn't get the message. Oh, nice fellow. You know, towards the end there, I sort of wished I could have gotten to know him better. You don't think you'll be back? I doubt it. Not even for a short visit? Well, good night all. Uh, where did you put our coats? Oh, I'll show you. Good night. And thank you, everybody. We'll let you know if my pictures show anything. I mean, David, didn't you feel that way? That you'd like to have known the ghost better? I would. Leo, who knows? If everything hadn't worked out, then maybe yes. You might have gotten to know him real well. You might have spent Christmas with your ghost in uh, his world. Today, at the Green's house in Long Island, there are no more mysterious footsteps. The thermostat stays where you put it. Plants grow. And on Thursdays, when Rebecca's Bridge Club meets, there are no strange men in the kitchen. But there is a larger meaning to the story you have just heard, which I'll tell you when I return shortly. step, a higher intelligence tried to communicate danger to an average couple living in an average town. You have heard how the parasensory investigators took the steps that freed the astral being so that it could return to its world and get on with its own life. What, in our language, our words, was this being? Was it the mind? Some scientists say so. For the mind of man never dies, only the body. And so it is entirely possible that life can exist on the spirit side. And perhaps one day, we shall all find out why and how. Our cast included Arnold Moss, Patricia Elliott, Bob Caliban, and Gordon Gould. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. A preview of our next tale. What did she say, Sally? What did the butt the dame say? Listen. Charles Frederick would go to these wild, primitive places that were filled with all kinds of... Well, we would call them superstitions. Got every word down on tape. <laughs> hey, that tape recorder sure does a trick. Mm. Did you get the pictures? Oh, sure. Oh, you can't beat that little wristwatch camera. Okay. There's lots of work to do. I'll develop the pictures, and you start listening to the tape. Honey, this could be it. How much do you think is in it? Well, she's supposed to be worth four or five million. Oh, are we sure? She's a believer. Oh, yeah, I could tell by the way she talks. I checked her out. She goes for the message from the other world stuff. She's a live one. Mm, I could sense that. Well, we hook the fish. Let's bring her in. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Because we must, and not because we will. So the man wrote over a century ago. Are there things that we forget 
because we're better off not remembering them? Of course. Life is far more pleasant if we choose only to recall the happier moments. In fact, our very survival might depend on deliberately forgetting many things. I don't know what you're talking about. But you do. You do. You obviously have me confused with someone else. Do you think I could ever forget that face? I've never even been to Europe. Do you think I could ever forget that voice? What are you doing with that gun? I am your executioner. Our mystery drama, The Ghosts of Yesterday, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Victoria Dan and stars Terry Keene. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. America, the melting pot. For centuries, welcoming millions to both its shores. They come here seeking a new life. And soon, they become Americans. Accepted. Absorbed. Assimilated is the word part of the whole, a part of the American identity, and for those who wish to be lost in the anonymity that a huge free country allows. May I help you, sir? Oh, uh, just this magazine. Oh, and, uh, yes, a pack of royal filters. Royal filters, just a moment. Oh, that'll be 95 cents, sir. Uh, smallest thing I have is a 20 what? It's a little embarrassing. You don't mind, really, do you? Mm, no. Great. No. Why are you staring at me like that? Can't be. But it is you. Beg your pardon? I'd know that face anywhere. What are you talking about? And look at you. Thirty years later. Older, graying, well-cut suit. You've become quite the American. I'm afraid you're confusing me with someone else. Quite the American now, but it is you. Who? I swore I'd kill you. Now, hold on. Murderer? I swore to myself I'd kill you. old man, calm I'll, down. I'll kill you. Kill... Now, take it easy, will you? Kill you? No. 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 My heart. Not now. Not before I... Murderer! Hey. Are you all right? Old man? Uh, what'd you say your name was again? Uh, Warren. Harry Warren, uh, St. Louis. You say the old man just collapsed, right? That's right, Sergeant. And he didn't say anything? No, it happened just as I walked in. Oh, okay. Thanks, Mr. Warren. You mean that's it? Yeah. The doctor says the old man had a heart attack. Uh, some nights we get half a dozen of these. You know who I feel sorry for? The wives. The poor old wives. All right, sure. What? Uh, I don't know, Carolyn. It's up to the entire committee. Yes, I re... I know, I agree. Look, can we discuss this later? Good. I'll see you at one. Bye-bye. What was that all about, Marge? You know Carolyn. Uh, uh, meet me for lunch downtown? I already promised to be at the meeting, Steve. Marge, you spend too much time on that membership committee. You're the one who wanted me to be active in the club. Uh, I know. I'm just beginning to wonder. About what? Well, darling, don't take this the wrong way, but... Well, it seems to me the entire membership thing is getting a bit ridiculous. How can you say that? Well, take that couple. Uh, you know, the doctor and his wife that the Petersons nominated last week... What was their name? Uh, uh, Vinelli, Vinetti? Uh, Vinataro. Uh, whatever. Why was their request for membership turned down? You know why, Steve. No, I don't. Steve, you know the club policy. Mm. I know 100% American, right? Why are you suddenly so concerned about my activities at the club? Well, it's just that in the past few months, of, I don't know how to put it, you, you've changed. What do you mean, changed? Now, forgive me for saying this, darling, but you've become a snob. Me? 
A snob? Okay, you can trace your ancestors back to the Mayflower, and my family goes back to the French and Indian War, and I'm proud of that fact. I know you are, too, but, uh... Well, don't you Steve. think... Steve? Yes, yes, I know. I'm doing it again, aren't I? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Fighting everybody else's battles but my own. Do you think I'm really a snob? Oh, no. if you are, then you're the most beautiful one I know. Yeah, that's no answer. Mm. I'm going to miss my train. <sighs> She's early again. All right, all right, I'm coming. Carolyn, I wish you would... Oh. Uh, who are you? Mrs. Stafford. Yes? Mrs. Marjorie Stafford. Um, what do you want? I would like perhaps a moment of your time. If you're selling anything, I, I don't... I sell nothing. I wish to talk. I'm sorry, but I happen to be busy. It is rather an urgent matter. Really, I don't have the time, if you'll excuse me. It is rather cold on these steps. Perhaps you would be courteous enough to let me inside. Perhaps you would prefer it if I called the police? The police. But this is a personal matter, Mrs. Stafford. It concerns a place called Hammondbeer. Hammondbeer? Yes. It is a small village in Western Europe. I... I never heard of it. Are you sure, Mrs. Stafford? Quite sure. But certainly you have heard of Hammondbeer. Why? Well, why should I? You were born there. Won't you come in? You, uh, you have a lovely home, Mrs. Stafford. Would you come to the point? My name is Coslow. Valerius Coslow. What is it you want? But surely you know what I want. Money? Money? You think I am some sort of person who, uh, what is the word, um, extorts money? No one knows where I really come from, Mr. Coslow. Not even my husband, and I would like to keep it that way. Are you ashamed? I don't see where that's any of your affair. Mr. Coslow, please, what do you want from me? I am surprised you did not recognize my name. Should I? In my country, or, or should I say our country, I do enjoy quite a reputation. What for? You might say I am a kind of detective. I am retained by the government, although I would gladly work without fee. What do you do, Mr. Coslow? For example, it has taken me many years, but I have finally found you. Why? Why have you been looking for me? It has been over 30 years since the war. You remember the war, Mrs. Stafford? No. I... I was very young at the time. Hmm. Uh, I would say eight, nine years old. Yes. It was a most difficult and tragic time. I, for example, worked with the resistance. I recall a particular incident when several American paratroopers had to be sheltered from the Nazis. Not very easy in occupied country, wouldn't you say? Why are you telling me this? The Americans were hidden in this town that was staunchly loyal to the resistance. Eventually they escaped. But you know the rest of the story, don't you? Please, Mr. Coslow. The ending was not quite so happy for the inhabitants of the town. The military commander in that area, a rather vicious SS officer, Captain Dietrich, discovered what had occurred and ordered suitable retribution. The entire town, all of its inhabitants, destroyed. That is all except for one little girl, one little girl with long gold braids who managed to hide in a cellar. Why are you telling me this? The little girl was you. No. You're wrong. I need your help, Mrs. Stafford. You are the only person left alive who can positively identify him. Identify who? Captain Hans Dietrich. Dietrich? Hmm. After the way he disappeared, we have reason to believe he emigrated to the United States with a falsified passport. Dietrich is here? In America? All our contact could confirm was that Dietrich had purchased an interest in a corporation called Northern Plastics. Is that all you know? 
They believe he is using the name of Warren. Warren? Oh, yes. Like you, Mrs. Stafford, he has become totally Americanized. I believe that's the way the expression goes. Now, what we need from you is a positive identification. You mean a look at a picture? Not exactly. We want to extradite him for trial, but your testimony is crucial. You want me to testify in court? I realize the past is painful, Mrs. Stafford. No, but I won't do it. Do you realize how important this is to us, to our country? Your country, Mr. Coslow. So, that is how it is. Mr. Coslow, you don't know how it is. What I was before I came here is nobody's business. If I were to testify, everybody would know. Is that so important to you? Yes. The past is past, Mr. Coslow. I live for the present. I am talking about justice, Mrs. Stafford. Justice. Please, I'd like you to leave. Very well. But I will be back when you have changed your mind. I won't change my mind. Please, I beg you. Think about what you are doing. We have nothing more to discuss. I see, I, I see. Let me just remind you of one thing. The past, I agree, is past. But don't let it fool you. It has mysterious ways of catching up with all of us. Not with me, Mr. Coslow. Not with me. Forgive and forget. That's the motto that the great humanitarians would have us all live by. However, most people usually choose one or the other. There are those things that we would prefer to forgive, but never forget. But more painful, more destructive must be the events our minds choose to forget, but our hearts refuse to forgive. I'll be back shortly for that, too. To look at her, you wouldn't think that Marjorie Stafford was anything other than what she appeared to be. An attractive, 40-ish, Midwestern matron who can trace her antecedents back to the Plymouth Rock. It now develops, however, that she has hidden from everyone a devastating past. The sole survivor of a wartime tragedy, she fled to America and created this fictional family tree for herself. A fabric which threatens to become unraveled if she cannot control her conscience. Honey, honey, uh, honey, what, what? what's the matter? Uh, oh, Steve. You're, you're having another nightmare. Oh, uh, I'm all right. Marge, hey, Marge, what's the matter? Nothing, I didn't, nothing. It's, it's me, isn't it? No, darling, no, of course not. Really, I... I know I haven't been home as much as I should, Jeez, but... believe me, it's not you. It, it's just... Just what? I... That horror movie I saw a few nights ago when you were out of town, I just can't get it out of my mind. Okay, Marge. Turn off the light, won't you, honey? Marge. Listen, I, I just... I want you to know I'm your husband. You can talk to me if there's something bothering you. Marge? Did you hear me? Marge? Just a minute. Oh. Yes, Mrs. Stefan. Please, Mr. Coslow. Why have you come back? I already told you I won't be a witness for your government. I won't testify in public. You think I am hounding you, don't you? Understand me, Mr. Coslow. I... I appreciate what you feel, but... I have a life here, a new life. I can't jeopardize it. I see. 
You think that to tell the truth about the past would make a lie of the present. Mr. Coslow, is that all you do with your time? Hunt down ghosts of yesterday? Someone has to remember. Why? There were people. How can you forget them? Your own family, your mother, your father. Don't you owe them something? I have no family. I will be staying at the Carlton Hotel, Mrs. Stafford. I will be there until I receive your call. I don't intend to call you. The ghosts of yesterday have circled your eyes and tortured your sleep. I will be seeing you soon. No. No, I have no family. But you did have a family once. Yes. You had a family until Hans Dietrich destroyed... No, I don't want to talk about it. You owe your family justice. Justice. Mama. Mama, I had to forget. I had to... Justice. Bring Dietrich to justice. Papa. Papa, you understand, don't you? I had to forget. No. They do not understand. You have forsaken me. I haven't. I haven't. Mama. Papa. Believe me. You owe them justice. 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 No. No, don't make me remember. Don't. Marge, uh, I want to talk to you. In a minute, honey. I don't want to burn the eggs. Look, I don't care about the eggs. I'm worried about you. It happened again last night, didn't it? What happened? You had another nightmare. Oh, Steve, are you going to start that again? No, honey, it's nothing to be ashamed about. I, I think I know what you're going through. You do? It happened to me when I turned 40. It, it can be a very upsetting time for a person I know. Oh, and that's what you think is... Well, am I wrong? Is it something else, Marge? No. <laughs> no. You're absolutely right, darling. That's just what it is. Well, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll go out to dinner tonight. What do you say? All right. Hello? Marge, you'll never guess what happened this morning. Steve, what is it? It's fantastic, honey. I think I got the account. What account? Now, look, I, I know I promised you about dinner, but do you mind if we meet you at the restaurant? We? My client. I want you to meet him. Oh, well, sure. <laughs> Love you, honey. Love you. Over here, Marge. Honey, I, I, I want you to meet Harry Warren. Harry, uh, this is my wife, Marge. Warren? Pleasure to meet you, Marge. Harry is executive vice president of Northern Plastics. Oh, and Northern Plastics? Yeah, say, uh, what about uh, cocktails before we order dinner? Marge, uh, your usual? I'm sorry, what? Uh, vodka Collins, darling? Yes, that's fine. Harry? Oh, anything for me, Steve. Anything? Sure. Oh, I'll tell you what. What I really would like right now would be a nice tall glass of beer. Domestic or imported? Well, any is fine with me, Marge. Though there is really one that is supposed to be the best in the world. You can't get it in this part of the country. Oh? It's imported from the Rhine Valley. A stream with the clearest, purest water in the world. It's called... Hofstein? Yes. Well, isn't this delightful? I thought no one else ever heard of it. Few people have. <laughs> and then the girl said, but Mr. Warren, we canceled your reservation a week ago. <laughs> oh, that's great, Harry. Uh, say, Marge, remember what happened the time we took the trip to Wisconsin? What? Uh, it was a tiny resort, and the innkeeper couldn't speak a word of English. Really? <laughs> can you believe it, Harry? Some people can live in this country for years and never learn the language. All this poor guy could speak was... Uh, German. <laughs> can you imagine? In the heart of America? It's hard to believe. Uh, do you speak German, Mr. Warren? <laughs> I mean, uh, Harry? No, not a word, Marge. Why do you ask? Uh, it's just that you seem like the type of person who, uh... Who what? <laughs> who might. <laughs> Isn't that silly? 
Clarkton Hotel? Uh, yes, do you have a guest registered there by the name of Coslow? Valerius Coslow? Yes, please. Mr. Coslow, I'd like to talk to you, not over the phone. Can we meet somewhere? All right. glad that you finally decided to see me, Mrs. Stafford. I had to speak with you. So I assumed. I met Harry Warren last night. Yes, I know. You know? But of course. Do you believe it was such an incredible coincidence, Mrs. Stafford? But how could... How is not important. Tell me. Did you recognize him? Yes. Yeah. Warren is Hans Dietrich. You are positive? Yes, I'm quite positive. Excellent, Mrs. Stafford. I must admit to you, this is a satisfaction which I... I seldom experience in my line of endeavor. What happens now? My government contacts your government, and we go through some brief formalities which will enable me to extradite Dietrich for trial. And what about me? Your testimony, of course, is essential to the case against him. Mr. Coslow, I thought you understood me when I said I that I... I assumed you had changed your mind. Without you, there is no case against Dietrich. I already told you, Mr. Coslow, I'm perfectly willing to confirm Warren's identity in private. But I refuse to become the object of worldwide publicity. But we need you. Do you have any idea what it would do to me? To the life I have here? Why should it do anything? Because... People here in this town, they care about who a person is, where they come from. Do they? Look, I, I really don't want to discuss it. I have identified the man for you, and that's all I'm going to do. Mrs. Stafford, that is what your mind tells you. But what does your heart tell you? Oh, why did you have to come here? Why did you have to dig this thing up again? It was dead and buried. Was it? Of course. You never thought about it until a week ago when I rang your doorbell? You expect me to believe that, Mrs. Stafford? I don't want to talk about it anymore. I've got to be going. Mrs. Stafford. Maria. What did you call me? Maria. Or have you also buried your real name? I won't do it, Mr. Coslow. I won't go back. One way or other, you will go back. No. But you will, Maria. Don't call me that. Don't you want to see Dietrich brought to justice? Yes. But certainly he can hang without me. Hang, did you say? Well, that's still the official method of execution in your country, isn't it? <laughs> they do not have a death penalty any longer, Mrs. Stafford. What? Having survived the violence and barbarism of the last war, our, uh, our people realize the senselessness of killing. Dietrich was a murderer. Murder must not be permitted to perpetuate itself. To demand an eye for an eye would place us on the same level as those who would destroy us. This is unbelievable. You're asking me to bear my soul to the entire world in return for what? Justice, Mrs. Stafford. Justice? A man cold-bloodedly sends hundreds of people to their death, and where's the justice? He will spend the rest of his days in prison. Prison? I've seen the new prisons, Mr. Coslow. A nice, comfortable bed, hot meals, the latest books to read, perhaps a tennis court, too. Please. And please. that's what you call justice, huh? Well, I don't want to hear any more platitudes about what great humanitarians we've all become. You listen to me. There is nothing wrong with an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. It's as old as the Bible. And if it's endured for thousands of years, there's a reason for it. There are other weapons against evil besides killing. Why did you have to bring that man into my life again? Why have you resurrected an old nightmare? There is only one way to end the nightmare. You're right. But not the way you think. No, Mrs. Stafford. You must not. I must not what? I know what you are thinking. And what am I thinking? You. You intend to see Dietrich dead. Do I? I recognize the look in your eyes. 
It is a look I once had in my own. I don't know what you're talking about. You are thinking that Dietrich must be made to give an eye for an eye. And shouldn't he be? He must be killed, isn't that right? Yes. Yes. It doesn't mean anything unless he pays. Pays in the only just way. No, Mrs. Stafford. He must die. Even if... Even if what? Even if you have to kill him yourself, Mrs. Stafford? Well, what kind of an assumption is that to make? As if one could actually picture Marjorie Stafford killing anyone. Nevertheless, she has just admitted that it is a deed she would like to see done. And you know what they say. If you want something done, you're better off doing it yourself. But that is something we leave for act. What force is it that drives people to murder? Oh, there have always been those who kill for no logical reason at all. There always will be. But what of those seemingly gentle, good-natured souls who suddenly with calmness, with calculated coolness, perform an act of violence? It's said that all of us are capable of such an act, for we all have a certain limit to which we can be pushed. A man can only be driven so far. A woman, too, for that matter. Mr. Coslow, that's ridiculous. Is it? I hate Dietrich. I want to see him dead. But to even contemplate killing him myself, that's ridiculous. You will testify for the prosecution, then? No. I haven't changed my mind. I warn you, Mrs. Stafford. Some way or other, you are deciding on your own method of justice for Dietrich. I only hope you make the right choice. Mr. Coslow. No. This time, I am the one who leaves first. There is nothing else for me to say now. Wait. You would not listen to anything I could say right now. Please, Mr. Coslow. Goodbye, Maria. Oh, no, no, no more for me, honey. I, I couldn't need another thing. Anyhow, I don't want to be late for my golf date. Oh, I didn't know you were going to the club this morning. Mm, yes, Terry Warren to play the... Oh, well, clumsy of me. Over here, uh, let me help you clean no, that no, up. No, 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 it's all right. So, uh, you're uh, playing golf with Harry Warren. Mm, in fact, I'd better get going. Steve, I suppose you really want to sew up his account. Oh, well, this isn't business, son. I really like the guy. Warren? You like him? Well, you have to admit, he's a pretty likable fellow. Oh, by the way, I uh, agreed to put his name up for membership this spring. In the country club? What, what do you really know about him? Oh, Marge, you know just as well as I do. He's just the type of person they want there. Wealthy, cultured, sociable. What's not to like about him? What if I were to tell you that... That what? Well, that Harry Warren isn't who you believe he is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> who is he, then? But he's actually a, a former SS officer. Captain Hans Dietrich. <laughs> Marge, uh, Harry Warren, an ex-Nazi? Yes. <laughs> Honey, now, listen, I, I really don't think you should kid like that. I'm not. I mean, you really think it's in good taste? Steve, uh, I'm trying to tell you... That... Uh, by the way, I, I hope you don't mind. I, I took the liberty of inviting him over for dinner tomorrow night. Uh, why don't you make that wonderful chili of yours? He's coming here for dinner? Honey, I, uh... I get the feeling you don't particularly like Harry. I don't. I can't understand why. You just wait till you get to know him better. Know him better? Sure. You and I will be seeing a lot of him. Thank you for this dinner, Marge. It was absolutely delicious. <laughs> Isn't she a great cook? You are a lucky man, Steve. <laughs> well, actually, Harry, my husband is very easy to please at the kitchen table after four years of army food. <laughs> Anything beats those K rations. <laughs> <laughs> what did you do during the war, Harry? Oh, I uh, was in the army. Really? 
Were you overseas? Uh, uh, honey, I'm sure Harry doesn't want to talk about the war right now, do you, Harry? Actually, I do find it a bit depressing. I guess it's because at heart I'm really a peace-loving man. Marge, you were deliberately rude at dinner. Oh, Steve, come on. You're making a mountain out of a mole. Harry was a guest in our house. I... I think you could have acted a little more gracious. Name one ungracious thing I said. No, it isn't anything you said. It was just the way you... Well, you were giving him looks this evening that could have given anyone frostbite. Really? Really. I I can't tell you how embarrassed I well, am. I am sure that he didn't notice anything. Maybe not, but I did. Now, what have you got against the poor guy? Steve, could we just drop the whole thing? This just isn't like you, Marge, for... Goodness sake, what did Harry Warren ever do to you? Clapton Hotel? Uh, I'd like to speak with Mr. Valerius Coslow, please. Thank you. Hello? Uh, well, uh, when will he be back? What? Well, uh, he, he couldn't have checked out. Are you sure he... I see. All right. Honey, uh, who is on the phone? Oh, uh, I was just talking to Carolyn. Steve, I've been thinking. Let's let's go away, just the two of us. Oh, sounds great. We'll do it next weekend. Why not now? This weekend. Oh, I can't, honey. I've got to be in Denver for that audit. You're flying to Denver? You mm. just came back? Well, what can I do? My hands are tied. Spangler Continental decides that this is the time to declare bankruptcy. Steve, take me with you. Well, to Denver? What on earth for? I just don't want to be here alone. Well, but I can't take you. I wouldn't have any time to see you when Please. I'm Please. Well, honey, look, I know it hasn't been easy for you with me away so much, but... But I promise, when I get back, I'm going to take the entire week off. We can go anywhere you like. Now, how about it? But I, I, well, I... Wow, would you look at the time? I'm going to miss my plane. Well, I must say, Marge, I was more than a little surprised when I got your phone call. Oh? Why was that? Well, I was under the impression that uh, you didn't particularly care for me. Well, Harry, I'm really sorry if I gave you that impression. Frankly, I'm confused. Why? Are you asking to see me with uh, Steve out of town, you know? Well, now, what's so confusing about it? You are a very attractive man, Harry. <laughs> Marge... And I can tell you aren't exactly indifferent to me. It's just that I never thought, I mean, the way you act... Harry, let me tell you something. You have no idea what it's like being married to Steve. Now, he's a sweet person, and I'm quite fond of him. But I mean, he's never home. Are you telling me that you... But there... Yeah, plenty of times. I mean, what am I supposed to do? Sit home and darn stocking? I don't know what to say. Now, you thought I didn't like you. Don't you see, that's the way I always have to play it when Steve's around to set him off the track. It's just that I can't believe that... I mean, you don't look like the type woman... Are you saying that you didn't feel it, too? Feel what? What do they call it? Um, kind of vibration? Uh, chemistry? Of course I felt it. I felt it from the first time we met in that restaurant. What are you doing tomorrow night? I had no plans. Would you want to see me? Yes, I would. Where? It, um... It can't be anywhere in town. You know, people would talk. Somewhere out of the way, where nobody would recognize. Marge, I know a place. It's the cabin of an old friend of mine. He's out of the country now, but he gave me the key. Oh? And believe me, it is so isolated, no one would ever see us. No one would ever suspect. Oh, good. I can follow you up there in my car. I still can't get over this. Harry, just one thing... I promise you won't mention this to anybody. Of course I won't. And, uh, you're sure it doesn't really bother you? Being Steve's friend and everything? Well, Steve is my friend, but you know what they say. All's fair in love and war. Yes, that is what they say. <laughs> Mr. 
Why, this is quite a little cabin in the woods. Your friend must be very well off. Hmm? Very. Certainly is isolated. Your friend must like privacy. <laughs> he does indeed. Oh, is, is that a terrace over there? Yes. Would you like to take a look at the view? Let's go out on the terrace. Wow. That's quite a drop, isn't it? Forty feet at least. Hey, I didn't realize how chilly it's gotten. Let's go back inside. No, let's stay out just a little longer. Oh, you say it's 40 feet from here to the rocks. Fall well, like that would kill a person, wouldn't it? <laughs> Most probably. Marge, let's go inside. Not yet. Marge, what the devil? It's Steve's gun. He keeps one in the house. Why are you pointing it at me? I want you to stand near the rail. Marge, what's this all about? Do you really think I would ever be unfaithful to my husband? Marge, give me that gun. Don't come any closer or I swear I'll use it. I don't understand. Is this some kind of joke? A joke? <laughs> no, this is most certainly not a joke. Well, then we... Don't move. I mean it. Marge, what's going on? What have I ever done? Is that what you were going to say? Harry Warren hasn't done anything. On the other hand, Captain Hans Dietrich has. Who? Don't look so surprised. I know who you really are. What are you talking about? In some ways, we have a lot in common. We're both survivors. You aren't making any sense. Both of us escaping the past... Clinging to new identities, working year after year to remove every vestige of the old life. Even down to losing our accents. You are not an American? I spent my early childhood in a village called Hammondbeer. Hammondbeer? Surely you remember it. During the war, we were occupied by the Germans. I was little, only eight but I can remember they were commanded by a very young officer. His eyes a cold gray. A man who never laughed. Never smiled. He was always posting pages of rules we were to follow. I think you've gone out of your mind. Let me finish. One day he was angry. I'd never seen any face so full of anger, rage. I was young. I didn't understand how things were. Something about helping soldiers, Americans. I was afraid of that face. The anger. So I hid in a doorway. I hid when the captain made everyone gather on the village square and made a long, hard speech about treason and how he must make an example of our town. Why are you telling me this? Because I want you to know... The reason you are to die. You think I'm Dietrich? I know you are Dietrich. You're making a mistake. I've never even been to Belgium. How would you know that Hammondbeer was in Belgium? Now, look, Mark. You can lie to the rest of the world, but you can't lie to me, Dietrich. <laughs> As if I could ever forget those eyes. And that voice. Your voice. Giving the final order. To level my village. Admit it. Admit who you are. I am Hans Dietrich. Captain SS. Military number 172-93481. I have brought you here, Captain Dietrich, for the purpose of administering justice. You have been found guilty of the murder of the village of Hammondbeer. Guilty. Of the murder of 271 people. My mother. My father. My two sisters. These things are necessary in times of war. Innocent people. Treason is punishable by death. I now sentence you to death. Get up on that ledge. Now. I see. You intend to make me jump. You yourself said the fall would kill... Didn't you? What is the matter, Mrs. Stafford? Your face. You 
don't even look afraid. I am not afraid. Aren't you going to beg me for your life? No. It is almost a relief to no longer deny who I truly am. I am Hans Dietrich. And I am proud to join my friends, my fallen comrades. Go ahead, shoot. Shoot! I am not afraid to die like a soldier. There is no greater glory than to die like a soldier. What are you waiting for? Shoot! No. No, it's what you want me to do, isn't it? It's the easy way out for you. It's merciful, quick, almost glorious for you. No. No, this isn't justice. You are afraid. No. I'm not afraid. Not anymore. I'm taking you back. Back to my old country. Back to justice. And she did. Captain Hans Dietrich is spending the rest of his life in prison, thanks to the testimony of Marge Stafford. Of course, Marge and her husband found it necessary to quit the country club, but somehow they have discovered it doesn't really matter. One thing that does matter, however, is that you stay with us until I return with some final words. Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote the words, One man's justice is another's injustice. One man's beauty, another's ugliness. One man's wisdom, another's folly. How true the thought. But also, it is true that ultimately, there is only one good and one evil. One right and one wrong. And if the human beings of this world finally ever come to realize that there is a universal ethic, mankind will have reached its golden age. Our cast included Terry Keene, Russell Horton, Leon Janney, and Mandel Kramer. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Radio Mystery Theater presents Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. What did the famous Frenchman say? Mirrors should reflect a little before throwing back images. Yes, and perhaps we should all reflect a little on questions before we start throwing back answers, especially on those deceptively simple questions which require such surprisingly complex answers, such as, is there really such a thing as a ghost? Well, sir, here we are. You and I. What? What do you want? At one time, I wanted love. I couldn't have it. Then I wanted justice, but I couldn't get it. Now, I want revenge. Revenge? 
But you've already had it. No. Revenge is nothing but an appetite. It must always be fed. Please don't kill me. I didn't do anything. But you're part of it. Part of the revenge. Our mystery drama, The Avenging Ghost of Kitty Morgan, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Mandel Kramer. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and ARM, Allergy Relief Medicine. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Be convinced of one thing. If you live long enough, you will learn the hard way never to bet your life on a sure thing. This is a story that takes place today, but... It began almost a hundred years ago near a little country village called Harrowwood in upstate New York. So for just a few moments, come back with me to a time in the 1880s. Here we are, Mr. Chesney. Yes, so I see. Be back around midnight as usual? No, Jim, I won't be staying tonight. You'd better wait. You ain't gonna have supper, Mr. Chesney? No. Jim, tonight's the night. Uh-oh. I expect there'll be some weeping and wailing. But I'll leave her a nice gift. That should help dry her tears. I, uh, I don't think you'll shake this one off so easy. It's never easy, Jim. Miss Kitty Morgan strikes me as a different kind of woman. Well, you take it from an old campaigner. They're all the same. I hope so. For your sake. This won't take more than five minutes. I'm sorry, Kitty. Sorry? What are you sorry about? You knew this thing between you and me. You knew it couldn't last. How could I know that? Tell me. What are you sorry about? You knew I was married. Just tell me why are you sorry? Uh, Kitty, I... Sorry that it's over? Sorry that you lied to me? I didn't lie to you. The terrible truth is you lied to yourself. Yes, that is a terrible truth. Is that why you're sorry? Oh, please, Kitty. Are you sorry that some countrywoman like me... You are not a countrywoman. Oh, yes, I am. My Lord Robert Chesney, builder of railroads, owner of factories. I am a countrywoman in a tiny town who caught your eye and with whom you amused yourself for a while. Is that why you're sorry? Kitty. Are you sorry that I, too, am human? That I could dare to dream, presume to hope? That perhaps love can change anything, everything. Kitty, I never said that I loved you. This is the way the world goes. There are the takers and the givers. And you belong to the first group. I to the second. Kitty, I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm about to do. But I want you to take this money. How is it possible for me not to misunderstand? Now listen to me, Kitty. To what? I've been deceived. Must I also be debased? This is for services rendered. You helped me plan Harrowwood. You give it the woman's touch. You endowed it with a certain grace. I thought I was doing it for me. I thought it would be my house. I only want to make this as easy and as pleasant as possible for both of us. It is my house, you know. I put so much of myself into it. You won't get me out of there, Robert. I'll be there forever. Well, there's enough money here for you to travel. New York, Paris, London, Vienna... I'll see to it you'll never want for money as long as you live. It's my house, Robert. No other woman will ever want to live there. Every other woman will feel like an intruder. Now, Kitty, there's a reality to the world. Let's salvage as much as we can. Good night, Robert. Does it have to end like this? Please, leave me, Robert. There's something I have to do. What's that noise? Mr. Chester! Wake up! All right, all right, all right I'm up. Come, come in. <coughs> what, what, what time is it? Six in the morning, Mr. Chesney. You know I sleep till seven. I knew that. Uh, what, what is it, Jim? I see something's wrong. Yes, sir. Out at the mansion. Well? Uh, Pete Coulson, the night watchman. Well, Jim, come on, get to the point. He, he was making his rounds. Yes? 
You know, in the library, you got them high, thick, solid, exposed oak beams. Jim. Well, hanging on a rope, suspended from one of them beams, was Miss Kitty Morgan. Hanging? Yes, sir. Hanging. She was dead, too. Kitty's dead? Yes, sir. The coroner's already pronounced her. Mr. Chesney? What is it, Jim? The note she wrote, uh, the suicide note, she wrote it to you. All right. What about it? Now that the inquest's over, uh, the coroner says you can have it. Here. Um, thank you, Jim. You uh, planning to take a train into the city? After a while. I'll have the carriage ready. Thank you, Jim. I'll call when I want you. Yes, sir. My dearest Robert, I told you I would never leave this house. And I never shall. Everything that was alive in me walked in here at sunrise this morning. And here it shall remain. Forever. In Harrowwood. Forever. Can I notice the name Harrowwood on this list of company properties? Yes, Mr. Chesney. What is Harrowwood? Oh, it's an estate in the Adirondack Mountains. Yes? Well, there's a mansion, a Victorian mansion, I believe. In the Adirondack? Yes, sir. You see, during the 70s and 80s, I believe many millionaires constructed these enormous places, including your own great-grandfather. He built Harrowwood. Well, why have I never heard of it? Because it was never used. What do you mean, never used? No one ever lived there. You mean it's been empty for a hundred years? To the best of my knowledge. Why? Well, you see, the place is haunted. Would you repeat that, please, Miss Borkin? Haunted. Now, what sort of nonsense is that? Now, I'm only telling you what I know. You know the place is haunted. But I've been told the place is haunted. No place can be haunted. There is no such thing as a haunted place. If you say so, Mr. Chesney. Look, here we are in the final quarter of the 20th century, and you tell me that a valuable piece of property is lying fallow, useless, simply because of some medieval superstition. Tell Powers to report in here at once. Then if the property cannot be utilized, why hasn't it been sold, Powers? For uh, the same reason, sir. What reason? The ghost. An estate that's worth one or two million dollars? Now, Powers, you and I know there is no such thing as a ghost. I'm not sure I can be included in that remark. Are you telling me you believe in ghosts? What's come over, everybody? Yes, Mr. Chesney. Miss Borkin, see if you can arrange a lunch date for me with Tom Bullen. Tell me, why have you bought me lunch, Joe? Well, Tom, I owe you a favor. Oh, now, Joe, I mean it. I think back over the years, we've been good friends. You've always done a great many things for me. What have I ever done for you? Oh, we shouldn't keep scoring these things. Well, I just found out that I own some property upstate. Yes. It could be developed and make a mint as a resort. Uh huh. Now, we're not into this kind of thing. On the other hand, you fellows are always looking for a hotel situation, aren't you? Sure. All right. Now, how about a thousand acres, Tom? With a 30 room mansion, a private lake, you could lay out a golf course, has access to the thruway. How's that sound so far? Mm -hmm. Not bad. You could have your own ski slopes, and you're generating income 12 months a year. Mm -hmm. How much? I'm going to let you steal it. Two million. What's the catch? Tom, when you deal with me, is there ever a catch? What's the name of this place? Harrowwood. No deal. Why, what's wrong? It's haunted. What did you say? It's haunted. You? You believe in that kind of stuff? Everybody knows it, Joe. A woman haunts that place. A woman who's been dead a hundred years. Oh, how can a dead woman haunt anything? Oh, it's possible, Mike. Great, great, great. Oh, add seven or eight more greats. Aunt. It's supposed to be haunting the Tower of London. Tom, are you serious? You mean you never heard of Anne Boleyn, the second wife of King Henry VIII? Come on, now let's get down to brass. She cut her head off. Didn't you know that? Yes, I know, I know. 
Well, my old man, to whom this kind of thing is important, traces our lineage back to Anne Boleyn's brother. Tom, can't we try to be serious? I am serious, Joe. As far as the existence of ghosts is concerned, I have an open mind, as befits a man of my ancestry. Are you going to pass up the buy of a lifetime? Let's face it, Joseph. What are you really trying to sell me? A haunted house. Has the whole world suddenly gone mad? How can sane, sensible people seriously entertain the idea of ghosts? Or is their sanity and civilization just a veneer? Well, now that I was aware of Harrowwood, I decided to check the matter out further with my Aunt Sylvia. Harrowwood? Oh, dear boy, shall, shall you have some tea? Well, Aunt Sylvia, we just had our tea about five minutes ago. Oh, did we? Yes. Now, about Harrowwood, Aunt Sylvia... I have no recollection of having drunk my tea. Oh, I assure you, we did, and we enjoyed oh, yet it. I can recall so clearly what happened when I was a little girl, almost 80 years ago. Do you recall Harrowwood? Oh, yes. Yes. Harrowwood. Your great-grandfather built it. But why have I never heard about it? Oh, are you sure we had tea... I guess the only thing I can do is go up there myself. Oh, no, you can't do that. Why not? Well, because something will happen to you. What? I, uh, uh, oh, first I'd better ring for tea. <laughs> we'll all be the better for a nice hot cup. And we'll have some of those sweet little cakes. What will happen to me up at Harrowwood? Oh, who said anything will happen to you up at Harrowwood? You did. Oh, would you rather have scones? Oh, why don't we have a little bit of everything? Oh, oh, now, now I remember. What do you remember? What will happen to you if you go up to Harrowwood? Yes? You'll be murdered. Murdered? Yes, murdered. Why? How? By whom? Oh, here comes Forrest. We'll talk about it later. First, we must have a cup of tea. Yes, we're going to have a cup and how appropriate is Mr. Fielding's remark on the subject? Love and scandal are the best sweeteners of tea. And as you might expect, on this show, we can very easily add a third. Murder. We'll stir this brew a bit when I return shortly with Act Two. The Gift of Prophecy. It pops up in the most peculiar places. Prophecy, the ability to read the future. But if you analyze it closely, it is based on an ability to understand the past. Outside of the Bible, as far as ordinary everyday people are concerned, the best prophets are usually children and elderly ladies, such as the one we have here. And Sylvia, why will I be murdered? Oh, my goodness. Whoever said you'll be murdered, Joseph? You did. Did I? Oh, what a horrible thought. Oh, why would it I ever... It has to do with going up to Harrowwood. Oh, oh, well, yes, uh, I, I remember now. Oh, and here's Forrest with our tea. Uh, set it down, please, Forrest. Thank you so much. Oh, see? She brought us little cakes and scones and nice buttered toast... And she didn't have to be told. And Sylvia... Uh, now you must let me pour. No, I really don't care for any more tea. Oh, nonsense. It's good for you. About Harrowwood. Well, your great-grandfather was murdered up there, you know. No, I didn't know. Oh, yes. You see, some silly girl committed suicide there. A local girl. Absolutely no breeding. And she also has the bad taste to haunt the place. What do you mean, Haunt. What does anybody mean by haunt? The thing is obvious. Your great-grandfather brought your great-grandmother up there, and this dead girl's ghost just drove her out of the house. I don't believe it. You don't believe it. It's true. Your great-grandfather said, No ghost, not even the ghost of Kitty Morgan, will drive me out of my own house. Oh, he was a great one for ringing declarations. But uh, So he stayed on. And one morning, he was found dead. Dead? The ghost had killed him. How? Oh, 
How do ghosts kill? They scare you to death. Oh, he, he could have had a heart attack or something of the sort. Oh, the man was as strong as a bull. Well, anyway, since then, everybody knows that it's death for any male descendant of Robert Chesney to enter that house. Everybody knows. What nonsense. Oh, I'm so glad you could visit your poor old aunt. Uh, why don't I ring for Forrest and have her bring us a nice hot cup of tea? Who was it that said the lunatics have taken over the asylum? Well, whoever he was, the man is a true prophet. Here I am, surrounded by people who suddenly seem to have taken leave of their senses. Ghosts. Well, the matter had to be cleared up once and for all. Yes, Mr. Chesney. Miss Borkin, find out from Powers who is looking after the property up at Harrowwood and make arrangements for me to go up there. You're going up there? Yes, Miss Borkin. But... But what? Is that wise? Wise? In view... Well, in view of the curse. What are you saying, Miss Borkin? Um, nothing. Nothing at all. Oh, you must be Mr. Chesney. Oh, uh, please come in. Miss Borkin phoned and said to expect you. Thank you. I'm Julie Miller. My dad is caretaker of the Harrowood Estate. He's out there now. I, I expect him home soon. Uh, may I offer you a drink? Julie Miller. She had the blondest hair, the brightest blue eyes, the fairest complexion that I had ever seen. She was like a sunburst. Everything about her shone and sparkled. Had I fallen in love with her at first sight? Ridiculous. There is no such thing as love at first sight. Just as there is no such thing as a ghost either. Miss Borkin said you'd be here several days. So Dad told her we'd put you up here. Oh, well, thank you, but that won't be necessary. I, I can stay at a motel. <laughs> but you can't. Why not? Because there isn't any. There's no motel? Or a hotel for 40 miles in either direction. I find that hard to believe. Well, it's true. You see, the folks here about sort of discourage that sort of thing. What sort of thing? Oh, how can I describe it? Mm, tourism. I don't understand. Tourism means money. Why should anybody be against that? Well, tourism also means people. Oh. Do you have anything against people, Miss Miller? No. Just against some of the things people bring. Yes? Mm, roads, traffic, fumes, stores and stands, shopping centers. Mm. Well, that's progress. <laughs> and who needs it? Civilization. And who needs civilization? Well, <laughs> Miss Miller, you can't be serious. Well, most of us would like to see the place remain unspoiled. I see. What do you see, Mr. Chesney? I see now why the estate is supposed to be haunted. It's a legend that you folks nourish very carefully to discourage the invasion of civilization. How clever of you to figure that out. And that's why the house is haunted. Oh, I would disagree. The house is haunted because Kitty Morgan will have her revenge on Robert Chesney. Now, just between you and me, Miss Miller, do you believe that? Of course. Kitty Morgan was my great aunt. Oh, you seem like such a sensible girl. How can you possibly swallow this nonsense? Oh, it goes down easily enough. And you, sir, should be careful not to describe the beliefs of others as nonsense. Do you really believe that Kitty Morgan... Excuse me, Kitty Morgan's ghost murdered Robert Chesney? Well, that's what the coroner's report said. The coroner's report said Kitty's ghost murdered my great-grandfather? It said death was due to causes unknown. A ghost is unknown. Can you deny that? There is Harrowood. Oh. Magnificent, isn't it? Yes. Dad has a crew that keeps the place up. It appears to be in very good shape. Are you sure you want to spend the night here? That was the reason I came. Well... Are you saying that I have something to fear? Well, I better not say anything. Why? Because it might set us off on a discussion where we would simply never agree. About ghosts? And other things. I have a 30-room mansion, Miss Miller. I understand it has heat, light, water. It's my home. No. No? It's Kitty Morgan's home. Oh, Miss Miller. All right. I see you really believe it. 
so I shall respect it. I wish you wouldn't go in there. But I must. Then I suppose this is goodbye. Or it's good night. Good night. The way you said that sounds as if you're sure you'll never see me again. You were warned. Warned? Oh, that has an ominous ring to it. There's nothing I can say or do to persuade you. I'll see you tomorrow morning, Miss Miller. You're not at all what I expected. No, oh, what'd you expect? Joseph Chesney. The rich, powerful Joseph Chesney. The man who'd be coming up here to ruin our lives. Why would I be ruining your life? Well, you'd be changing it. You'd turn us into one of those noisy, crowded, grimy resorts. All the peace and loveliness would be gone forever. Well, now. I thought you'd be a crabby, sour, grasping old man. Me? But you're not. I should hope so. You're young. You're nice looking. And you're, you're so easy going. Me? Yes, you. Mm-hmm. Well, you're nice looking too. <laughs> What are you doing up here? I like it up here. You know something? I think I'm beginning to like it up here, too. Well, then, don't do anything to change it. I'll see you in the morning. Please. Please be careful. She kissed me suddenly. Then she was gone. I walked up to the massive front door. I turned the handle. It swung open smoothly... And I was in the house. I found a switch, flooded the place with light. I was in a magnificent entryway. I could see what a house this was. I lighted my way from room to room. Each was a delight. How beautifully this Kitty Morgan had designed Harrowwood. I walked into the handsomely finished library. And I sank into an easy chair. So this is where Kitty Morgan had chosen to end her life. I looked up reflectively at the ceiling beams. From which one? I sat there thinking. Thinking for a long time. And then someone said... What a lovely, comfortable room. Yes. High windows. Not just for light. But to enjoy the view. Excellent arrangement. A library should be light and airy. I agree. It's best for the books. They can be ruined by mustiness and damp. Isn't that so? Yes, that... Wait a minute. Who... Who are you? Kitty Morgan. Who else should I be? Kitty Morgan? Well, you're... You're a... I am what you claim does not exist. I am a ghost. A ghost? Now, Mr. Joseph Chesney, what has become of all your theories and convictions and strongly stated opinions? Will you still say there is no such thing as a ghost? I'm dreaming. I. Well, I must be. But you know that you are wide awake. How can you be Kitty Morgan? I was born, Kitty Morgan. Oh, it can't be real. It can't be. But here you are. Here I am. Oh, this must be some trick. I know whose part. What do you want? At one time, I wanted love. I couldn't have it. Then I wanted justice. I couldn't get it. Now, I want revenge. Revenge? I discovered that revenge is nothing but an appetite must always be fed. It wasn't enough to kill Robert Chesney. You killed Robert Chesney? And so I swore that I would kill every Chesney who came in here. You want to kill me? You look so much like him. The same face. The same voice. The same smile that can be so warm and so cold. Do you have the same heart? I don't know what you mean. Yes. I should kill you. But I won't. Well, thank you. Don't be sarcastic, young man. I could do it. Quite easily. You think I'm a woman and so I can be overpowered. But I'm not a woman. I'm a ghost. My strength, my power, 
is not of this world. I think I understand why you would want to kill me. But why have you changed your mind? Why? Yes. Why? Well, young Mr. Chesney, I believe I have other plans for you. We think of ghosts as floating, ethereal, disembodied, things that merely drift along. But a ghost is a reasoning, calculating, plan-making entity? This indeed must be something new in the chronicles of ghosthood, ghostdom. I shall return shortly with ectoplasm for Act Three. Life is real, said the poet, and from that it must follow that death is also real. We know that death is the end of life, but is death also the end of existence? Tricky questions? Perplexing propositions? Maybe we even have to question basic definitions. What is life? What is death? What is existence? You say you have plans for me, Miss Morgan. Uh, you are Miss Morgan. That is, it is correct to address a ghost by the name that she had in... in... Yes. Entirely correct. Well, may I ask, what are those plans? I'm tired. Can a ghost be tired? Oh, yes. You have no idea how tired. And Robert, your great-grandfather Robert, his soul, wherever it is, must be tired, too. How do you know? I know. Robert and I, we're... we're one. How can you say that? It's true. He married the woman who became your great-grandmother, but he never loved her. He only loved me. Well, if he loved you, then why... Why didn't he leave her for me? Yes. He was too cowardly. Oh, no. That's the one thing you cannot say about my great-grandfather. He was afraid of nothing. You're wrong. He was afraid of many things. But it doesn't matter now. It can end happily. Robert and I can find fulfillment through those who came after us. I don't understand. Through you and Julie Miller. I still don't understand. You're Robert's great-grandson. I am Julie's great-aunt. We shall live again through you. Through us? Through your love. What love? You love her, Joe. Don't deny it. And she loves you. Well, how can that be? That's what Robert and I also asked ourselves that night so long ago. A hundred years ago. What are you saying about Julie and me? And that's how it shall end. The terrible past shall end with the beginning of a wonderful future. Good night, Joseph. Good night. I know now you sleep and dream of Julie. Dream of her, Joseph. Dream of her soft beauty. Dream of your happiness. Joe. Julie? Come in. Dad went up to the mansion. Yes, I know. I saw him. I knew you'd be by. I made you some breakfast. A three-minute egg. <laughs> Three minutes, no more, no less. How did you know? Oh, I know a great many things, instinctively. Well, Julie, uh, as you can see, I spent the night at Harrowwood. And nothing happened? Well, I wouldn't say that. You wouldn't? A great many things happened. Yes? I fell in love. With whom? The ghost of Kitty Morgan? No. With the great-grandniece of Kitty Morgan. Oh. Yes. I do love you, Julie. I know. I know. How do you know? Because I love you. Julie. And you see, when you love someone, really love someone, it's part of a chord. It's never a single note. They also love you. You never heard of unrequited love? You can only love if you're loved. The other thing, well, that's a state of mind. You'd have a quarrel with most of the writers of romances. Mm. Do I have a quarrel with you? With me? No, darling, never. That's good. We must never quarrel. Are you happy, Julie? This 
this is more than being happy. No, I wish it would never end. Why should it end? Love is forever, isn't it? You know, you sound... We sound like one of those romantic novels that you buy at newsstands. <laughs> Do you read those books? Oh, sometimes. When you're waiting around in the airport for hours, you read just about anything and everything. Why should you be stuck at airports? Why should you even be at airports? Because I have to travel. Why? <laughs> to make money. Oh, don't you already have enough money? Well, you have to protect what you have. Mm. If you look at that deep blue in the sky, and the whiteness of the clouds, and the reflection in the still waters of the lake, and you listen to the birds, you realize how inconsequential all talk of money is. Mm. Well. Admit it. Go ahead. Admit it. <laughs> Come over here, and I'll admit it. So the days passed. One just seemed to flow into another. Everything was so wonderful. It was like a garden of Eden. I had never met another girl. I should say another woman like Julie. I was happy. Content. But this wasn't the world. The real world. The real world rang the telephone one morning. Mr. Chesney. I've been trying to reach you. What's up, Miss Borkin? It has to do with financing for that transnational deal. Well, I thought we had that all lined up. What seems to be the problem? Tom Bullen isn't too happy. Oh, what's bothering Mr. Bullen? Oh, he's on his way up there. He'll tell you in person. Mm. Anything else, Miss Borkin? No, sir. I should think that would be enough. May I pour anyone some more coffee? No, I'll have half a cup. I'm, uh... I'm fine, thanks. Well, I can see you gentlemen have important business to discuss, and I have shopping to do, so I'm sure you'll excuse me. See you later, darling. That's what's bothering me, Joe. What do you mean? Julie. I don't think that's any of your business, Tom. Tell me, Joe, does she know you're married? Well, if you want the truth, she never asked me. Oh, Joseph, Joseph. The fact still remains that it isn't any of your business. That's where you're wrong. My personal life oh, come is not... off it, Joe. A little affair here and there, an occasional infidelity now and then is one thing, but this particular situation has gotten out of hand. I still say it's none of your business. Aside from being cruel, yes, cruel is the only word to describe it, to a lovely young woman. Look, she's my age. She's mature. She knows the risks she runs. What a way to put it. And the bottom line is still it is none of your business. I'm glad you mentioned the bottom line, Joe. That's why I'm here. Do you know the bottom line for the transnational deal? I'm afraid I don't follow you. It's a tremendous deal. It could be worth close to a hundred million if we get it rolling. We've got it rolling. What's the problem? I'm putting up one-third of the startup money. You're putting up a third. And the other third is supposed to come from Marcella's father. What do you mean, supposed to? I have his word. What does a word mean to a man like you is the way her father's starting to think. After all, you stood before a minister and gave your word to be true to his daughter. Do you mean the old guy wants to back out? What we're getting back in town are reports, rumors, allegations, you name it, of an extremely hot and heavy romance between you and a girl up here. Tom, it's, it, it, it's just... Just what? It's just one of those things. No, it isn't, Joe. I look at that girl's face, I watch her as she sits there and listens to you. Joe, she's in love. That's just one of those things, too. I'll tell you something else, Joe. I've watched your face when you look at her. You're in love, too. Oh, are you crazy, Tom? Let me tell you this. If you're in love with her, marry her. What? Divorce Marcella and marry her. Divorce Marcella? It's all over between the two of you, and everyone knows it. Be truthful with yourself. I can't afford to divorce Marcella. Why not? Because her father doesn't believe in divorce. What do you care about what he believes? Tom, I'm in hock. I owe him more than I'm worth. Joe. A Chesney fortune? How could... How could I blow it? Easy. Bad advice here, bad investments there, bad luck someplace else. It can happen. I don't give a damn about transnational. Tell the old guy off and marry Julie. And live on what? At least you'll live. Tom, listen. You've only got one life. You'll never meet another woman like Julie. You're right. 
You're absolutely right. Good for you, Joe. Uh, don't you want to answer that? Hello. I'm sorry to bother you, Mr. Chesney. Well, what is it, Miss Borkin? Your father-in-law wants to see you at lunch tomorrow. Oh. Well, uh... I'm to tell you this. Off the record, Mr. Chesney. Tell me what? Well, my spies in his office have let me know that he won't do anything drastic. Drastic? What are you talking about? Oh, excuse me. I'm talking about what we talk about all the time. After every one of your escapades, you always want me to talk to my friend, your father-in-law's secretary, and and assess the damage. Yes. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm sorry, Miss Borkin. Well, he, uh, he'll want assurances. But she says you've managed to weather the storm. Uh, you have to be back in town tomorrow. Yes. Thank you, Miss Borkin. I'll do better than that. I'll be back in town by tonight. What are you talking about? I'm leaving. When? Now. This minute. Aren't you going to say anything to Julie? No. No! I have nothing to say. It was fun. It was... Look, it was fun while it lasted. Now it's all over. You're just going to sneak out of her life. Well, you could put it that way. But at least... At least what? Have a confrontation, a scene... Do you mind if I don't drive you back in my car? I have my own. You're no good, Joe. I never said I was. All I had to do was go back to the mansion and get my clothes. I was all packed. I looked at the place in the bright sunshine. How could anyone think there could be a ghost here? When suddenly, everything seemed to grow dark. Robert Chesney. He's dead. We're all dead. Not me. I'm alive. No. You're dead. Everything that was alive in you died when you decided to leave Julie. You're dead. I don't believe you. Believe her. Who are you? I'm Robert Chesney. And you died the way I died. You should have never come back. To this house. I'm not dead. I'm not. I didn't know I was dead at first. My wife had the money. That's why I was afraid to leave her. That's what killed me. I want to get out of here. It's too late. Please. Poor Robert. Poor Joseph. Poor Kitty. Poor Julie. Let me out of here. Where would you go? Crawling to your father-in-law, just as I did. Admit it. Admit it. Yes. You're better off dead. Just as I was. Yes. Yes. Don't fight it, Joseph. Don't fight it. I... I don't believe it. No one knows why. It must have been the ghost. The ghost of Kitty Morgan. Why didn't he listen to me? She killed him. Why? Because she must have had a reason. Do you believe that? Do you really believe that? Yes. You mean you actually believe that there is a ghost of Kitty Morgan, just as I do? Yes. I believe it. Oh, 
you're a very kind, understanding, and sympathetic person, Tom. He certainly is. And so, what are we to make of our ghost story? Was it all in the mind? Did Joseph Chesney die of remorse? Perhaps of frustration because he was unable to do what he really wanted? Could lively Julie have taken a hand in it? Or is there actually an avenging ghost of Kitty Morgan? I shall return with a partial answer shortly. Your ghost will walk said the poet. And so, what are we to expect? It is said that we give up the ghost at that moment when the mortal essence leaves the body. Yes, we give up, but the ghost remains. It holds on to memories and desires, and it roams the earth. And who is to say that at a certain time, when we're in a certain place and feeling a certain mood, we cannot see and hear the ghosts of what we once were, long ago, in another world. Our cast included Mandel Kramer, E.V. Juster, Bryna Rayburn, and Sam Gray. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. A preview of our next tale. Jimmy, why did you have to go and meet my little brother before you did me? What's that supposed to mean? Don't tell me when I move close to you, you don't respond. Don't tell me you don't recognize that you should have been my woman from the start. I think you must be out of your mind. I am about you. But I am your brother's wife. That's what you really want to be. You know it is. Now, you just get your hands I off of me. I can't you otherwise. The moment I saw you, I said, that's my woman. I want to wait for you. Don't believe that. It doesn't matter what I believe or what you believe. It's what is. I am your brother's wife, and I want you to let me go. I'll never let you go, Jenny. As long as you're here, you're going to have to make your choice between my brother and me. I've already made my choice. Have you, Jenny? Have you really? You must be playing crazy. I love your brother. And every breathing moment he's alive, I always will. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Committee's proceedings tonight, we've had to adjust our program schedule. Coming up next on KRLD, the CBS Mystery Theater. Then around 11.30 tonight, The World Tomorrow. At midnight, you can hear the sixth and concluding episode of the Monday night serial Earth at Bay. And now, the CBS Mystery Theater. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... G. Marshall. The doors of the mind can be opened into corridors of unlimited possibilities, where time and place have a way of melding into strange and provocative patterns. Most ghost stories take place in the dark of night, or when shadows are long, and the moon is crossed by clouds. But we're about to meet a ghost at high noon on a blistering hot day without a shadow in the sky. In the course of our story, the two women 
who are embarked upon a fateful journey find respite from the merciless sun when they are drawn toward a barn from which comes a very human sound. So dank and musty. What a place for a baby. The sound comes from... from there. No. No, the sound comes from over here. We're here. The sound is right here. Yes. And this is a crib. But, but Marion, I know. I know there's no baby in it. mystery drama Ghost at High Noon was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elizabeth Pennell and stars Celeste Holm. It is sponsored in part by New Sugar-Free Diet 7-Up and Contact, the 12-hour allergy capsule. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Buick introduces a new concept for you to consider in light of today's concern about miles per gallon. Range. Range is what you get when you multiply the mileage your car gets per gallon by the number of gallons your car's gas tank holds. Range is what you need to get you there and back, especially if you plan to travel even just a little. Range is one of the things that help make the Buick Apollo such a special small car. A small car with range. It comes from coupling the Apollo's economical six-cylinder engine with a standard 21-gallon gas tank. It holds a lot, but it doesn't use a lot. Holds a lot of people, too. There's room for six in Buick Comfort. And the ride is Buick, too. In fact, the only place the Apollo may deviate from your conception of a Buick is in its low price. Look into the Apollo. It's what you'd expect a Buick to be, and a lot more than you'd expect a small car to be. Apollo. It's the Buick of small cars. on Oscar Mayer Wieners should be too. On the grill, at the beach, on a picnic, at the pool, on the boat, in the backyard, in the sun, in the moonlight, anywhere the fun is. They're quick and easy to cook and a real pleasure to eat. Oscar Mayer Wieners, America's number one. Make sure you've got plenty and get them on. Oh, I wish I were an Oscar Mayer Wieners. Oscar Mayer. That is what I story begins on a long, straight ribbon of highway in an arid section of the western United States. Marion Jeffries and Janet Marston are longtime friends who are returning home mm -hmm. after having driven Marion's son to a summer camp. What a lonely stretch of road. I don't like it. Oh, come on, Marion. No road is lonely at 10 o'clock in the morning. This one is. George was right when he said we should make this part of the trip either very early or late at night. Well, neither of us ever gets up at dawn. <laughs> and I don't think two women should travel the highways after dark. Oh, I don't mind driving at night. Well, then why didn't you say so yesterday? That motel we stayed in was certainly no prize. Well, not so bad. Anything to get away from Homer for a few days. Mm, not from my point of view. Well, you can travel anywhere you want to at any time. Sometimes I do it only to keep from being bored. Nonsense. You don't know what being bored is like. I... I wanted to make this trip last longer. Really, Janet, it's an adventure for me. Well, I've enjoyed it, too. It's given us a chance to catch up. But I must say, this stretch of highway is deadly dull. Well, I wouldn't mind if it weren't so beastly hot. There's not a car in sight. Marion, I have an uncomfortable feeling that there are things ahead of us on the road. Oh, I'm glad you're not driving. But don't you see those wavy lines? 
shapes rising up, coming closer, and then fading away. Sure, heat haze. And over there, look. Look. Nothing but bare, dry land and sagebrush. I swear I see buffalo. An Indian. Oh, this terrible August heat has gone to your head. But I admit I'll be glad when we get to the next... Uh, uh Uh-oh. What's the matter? We're losing speed. The the accelerator isn't working. Oh, please, let's not have a breakdown way out here. Motor's dead. But we're miles and miles from anywhere. I know. Well, let's do something. We can't just sit here. Just running the battery down. Then we'll be in a worse mess. Are you absolutely sure we have gas? Well, of course I am. Look at the gauge. And you remember when we got it. I'll, I'll look under the hood. Isn't that what you're supposed to do? Well, if you know what you're looking for. Good Lord, feel that blast of hot air. You better get back in while I check the manual. It's here, somewhere in the glove compartment. Marion, it must be 110 out here. Ouch! What's the matter? The hood. It's so hot I can't touch it. Well, get back in the car while the air conditioning lasts. We just better let the motor cool off. Cool off? In this blazing sun? Hurry, close the door. So now what do we do? I feel so helpless not knowing about what makes a car run or stop running. George always says, oh, skip it. I'm going to study this manual and see what happens when a motor's overheated. Maybe if I put on these gloves. Gloves in this weather? Well, then I could open the hood and look for a a loose wire or something. stay here. We'll think of something. I'm thinking very hard. No barn, no tree. Marion, what if we really are... Take it easy, Uh, Janet. I said this trip was an adventure, so let's make the most of it. Then I suggest that we get out and start walking. Absolutely not. The best thing we can do is sit quietly here in the car. That's not my idea of an adventure. Someone's bound to come along. Janet? What? Look. Look over there. Is your window closed tight? Make sure. It's a dust storm heading straight for us. That's not a storm. It's it's someone coming. But there's no road out there. Nevertheless, someone is coming. Well, they must be choking with dust. It's almost too thick to see us. We'll flag them. We'll flag them down. I'll get out and wave this scarf. Only, well, fantastic. It's it's horses. Janet. Janet, this is unbelievable. Look at what they're pulling. It's a mirage. It must be a mirage. No, no, they're real. Marion, you said I was suffering from heat Not this time. You do see what I see, don't you? A covered wagon. And a man who looks at least 150 years old. Hey! Hey! Uh, Morning, ladies. Good morning. Who who are you? I'm usually called Old Tyler, but my name is George. (laughs) That's my husband's name. I do not have the pleasure of knowing your husband, Miss Jeffries. How do you know me? I have come to take you and Miss Marston to the village. He knows my name, too. Of course, I know your names. And now, if you will both come... You will fix the car for us, won't you? Oh, I have no idea whatsoever how you propel these remarkable new conveyances. But you knew we were here. You... You must have come to help us. Oh, yes. I am here to be of service. Come along, ladies. Mirado is expecting you. Mirado? Mirado is the town beyond the hill. What hill? Over that way. Well, it's perfectly flat. You'll see the hill when we get to it. But a hill can't... Please, ladies, step into my wagon. But we don't want to step into your wagon. Uh, We would like to be on our way. This is your way. I don't think you understand. We're going in this direction, straight ahead. Unless there's somewhere we can wait until help arrives. I have to get home. I mean, my husband's expecting me. Mr. Jeffries does not know what day this is. Well, we know what day it is, and both of us have to get back. We live quite a ways from here, but perhaps if I could call my husband... Oh, he would never hear you if you called from here, Miss Jeffries. Marion, I think this man is... 
Not quite right in the head. We don't want to bother you, Mr. Oldtimer. But what we really want is just to be on our way in my automobile. Ladies, your automobile will never take you to where we're going. But we're not going anywhere with you. Mr. Oldtimer, I think it would be best if you'd be good enough to go back to your town and ask a mechanic. A mechanic? You know, a a garage man. Someone who can fix an automobile. Why, no one in Mirado knows anything about automobiles. Marion, what are we going to do? I don't know. But if there is a town, as he says, I can't believe it. My orders are to take you to Mirado. What do you mean, your orders? Why, you have come to help us just as I'm here to help you. Well, then help us, will you please? Aye, that's better. Come along. You cannot sit here in the sun. Well, he's right, Marion. And I'm getting terribly thirsty. At least we could get some water and and find a telephone. A telephone? Don't tell me your town is that primitive. I've never been privileged to see a telephone. But you will send someone for help. I will take you to Murado. That is all I can do. Wagon. It's not nearly as uncomfortable as I thought it would be. That's your idea. At least the countryside is changing. It sort of lulls you. Why, look, Marion, there is a hill, and we're climbing. But the horses seem so tired and old. I mean, you think we're going to make it? We're almost there, down in the valley. That's Murado. Incredible. And Janet, look. There are houses. Houses. That means there must be water. We have a fine village pump. And people, and people who can help us. But this this town is not on the map. I've studied the map very carefully. It shows nothing. Look down there, Miss Marston. See for yourself. Not very big, is it? But you must have a restaurant. We have a tavern and a church and a jail. What's the population? Well, that depends. Get along there, Jezebel. The street, Janet. Janet, where are the people? It looks... It looks deserted. No one round at this time of day. Why, Janet, it's a ghost town. Yes, you could call it that. But surely you don't live here alone. Oh, no, indeed. Now, will you please take us... Oh, no, oh! If you'll step down, ladies, you can get yourselves a drink at the town pump. I can hardly wait. Oh, this rusty old cup. But I'm thirsty enough to drink from anything. Mmm, I'd like to put my head under it. Feels wonderful on hands and arms, but it tastes... So, ugh, so brackish. Hasn't been used in a long time. Now, where can we go for help? I will show you the points of interest. No sightseeing right now, please. But thank you. Do you have a, a telegraph office? Oh, no, indeed, Miss Jeffries. Scouts used to take our messages, although there is now no reason to send a message. No reason? Tell us right now how to find someone who will go to the next town. Ladies, you are going to stay in Murado. Well, I suppose we're going to have to for an hour or two. You have come home, Miss Jeffrey. Oh, stop making jokes, Mr. Oldtimer. Murado's a place where people stay forever. Stay? In this deserted place? We'll soon see about that. Let's go to the mayor or to the police chief or someone, anyone in charge. You won't find them now. Not a soul till a stroke of noon. Why not? Someone must live in these houses. Where are the people? Asleep, Miss Marston. They're sound asleep. That store over there. Surely inside we'll find someone. No one there yet, Miss Jeffries. Well, I'm going to look anyway. Will you come with me, Marion? Yes, but it's all so quiet and eerie not a sound. Boy, oh, you'll hear sound, all right. In the barn, cross road, out in that field. What sort of sound? Find out for yourself. <laughs> You're not being very helpful. I don't like this place. 
Mr. Oldtimer, you have some explaining to do. You said we were expected. You are, dear ladies, you are. Who are you? How did you know our names? It was destined that you were the ones to be chosen this time. What are you talking about, please, Mr. Oldtimer? Chosen for what? On the hottest day of the year, when the heat haze spreads across the desert, Mirado comes back to life and claims two people from the modern world. There may be no new thing under the sun, but a frightening prospect confronts Marion and Janet if Mirado really has a living past. It is possible that George is merely a foolish old man touched in the head by too much heat. But on the eerie streets of a ghost town, you never know what sinister forces may be at work. The two distraught ladies seem to be getting further away from help with each passing moment. We'll return to them and the old-timer shortly with Act Two. Oh, somebody's been drinking my sugar-free diet. Oh, actually, I saved a little. Oh, a bear! Hiya, Goldie. What's brewing? That's Miss Goldilocks to you. Oh, come on, kid. You mean you don't remember me? The cottage, the three chairs, the porridge? Baby bear! In the fur. Been a long time, Goldie. But baby bear... Please call me B.B. You drank all the sugar-free diet 7-Up, and I have to conduct another diet drink taste test today. Well, yeah, I saw the sign on the door, a professional taste tester, huh? But how can I conduct my taste test now? Why bother? I try those other diet drinks, too. You'll notice there's still plenty of them around. Why not ask me? Well, okay, B.B. Tell me, why did you drink all the sugar-free diet 7-Up? I like the taste. Light, fresh, natural, sugar-free diet 7-Up is definitely... Definitely unbearably delicious. Mm -hmm. What do you tell a husband who comes home and says, I just don't know about a vacation this year? <laughs> well, you tell him about Ramada Inn's family plan, where your kids 18 and under share your room free. And you tell him about the toll free Ramada Inn's reservation number, 800 228 2828. At least that's what I tell him. At Ramada Inn. KRLD, Dallas. Stranded on a lonely stretch of road when their car broke down, Marion Jeffries and Janet Marston have been taken to the strange ghost town of Mirado. In vain, they have tried to persuade their ancient escort to help them get back to civilization. But he has an unsettling way of insisting that they have come home to Mirado and that here they will stay. Their panic is growing with each new turn of events. Aside from the old man, there is no sign of life on the narrow streets. And so you see, dear ladies... We are happy to welcome you. We? You keep saying we. Where are the others? Later, Miss Marston. You'll meet them later. We really can't stay very long. Miss Jeffries, I'll show you to your quarters. My quarters? Truly, we are not planning to be here long. Come with me, both of you. We need you, Miss Jeffries, in the tavern here. Come, we'll go inside. Oh, I don't want to go in there. Oh, nothing to be afraid of. Come along. Janet, the pewter plate. Look. Look. And the glassware. Oh, my, I'd like to take these home. Maybe we are in luck after all. Marion, I didn't touch it. Honestly, I didn't. I just put my hand toward that goblet, and and it shattered. I... Follow me, ladies. 
kitchen here is equipped in the best possible way. Why, it's covered with dust. That wood stove hasn't been touched for years. I think you will find that it will soon be ready for use. But who's going to use it? It's not for you, Miss Marston. We have other plans. But we understand that Miss Jeffries is a very good cook. What are you talking about? This stove is for you, Miss Jeffries. <laughs> well, Marion, your reputation has really gotten around. Me? Cook on that? Oh, I believe you'll get used to it. Well, who, pray tell, is there to cook for? You'll meet them all at high noon. Marion, we have to get out of here. Oh, yes, Miss Marston. I'll show you to the place we have for you. For me? I'm leaving. We're both leaving. We have real need of a school teacher. And what makes you think that I know anything about teaching school? We know a great many things about both of you. But I haven't taught school We for... know that you like teaching school. And this is a fine opportunity... Stop it! I won't listen to any more. You said... Janet! That... Janet, I hear something. A voice from the barn. A voice? Oh, please make it a human voice. I'll be back at high noon, ladies. The bell on the church steeple will strike the hour. And then, at one o'clock, it will all be over. Janet, I'm terrified. He's a man, man. Listen. Oh, I hear it. Hurry. There's someone in that barn. It's a welcome sound with a crying baby. There must be a woman nearby. Help me. Help me to open the door. Stop. Well, we've got to open it. I think it's starting to... This door hasn't been opened in years. How could... Pull harder. Oh, there. So dank and musty. What a place for a baby. The sound comes from over there. No, no, the sound comes from over here. Right here. The sound is right here, in the corner. Look, look in the corner. I don't see anything. It's so dark. It's a crib. Oh, what a lovely hand carved crib. You're right. This is a crib. But Marion... I know. I know. There's no baby in it. Marion, tell me you hear what I hear. A baby crying right here in this crib. But there is no baby. Are we losing our minds? Oh, Janet, be sensible. We both hear it. Well, there must be an explanation. Oh, I can't stand it. This spooky barn. Let's get out. Well, we can't walk out on a crying baby. You look on that side, I'll go over here. But Marion, I'm frightened. I always was afraid of the dark. Janet, Janet, we've got to keep our heads. That baby must be here somewhere. It's weird. There's no sense to any of this. Now, come on. There must be something about the acoustics of this old barn. You... Crying is stopped. Oh, Marion, I'm scared to death. Listen to that bell. Six, seven, eight. The old man kept telling about something happening at twelve o'clock. Let's get back to town. I tell you, I'm afraid. Well, you're the one who doesn't like the dark. We can't stay in here. But the baby that was crying. But there's no crying now. There must be a reason. Come on, we've got to find out. Look, Marion, out on the road to town, people. Thank heaven. Those two men in the field. Let's go talk to them. Oh, oh. They, they aren't moving. They look like statues. Well, that painting. Yes. It's the Angela. And that girl who's running. Only she isn't running. She's standing still. Twelve. Twelve must be the magic number. That girl is moving now, and she's coming this way. Little girl? Little girl? Can you tell her stop? Please stop. We want to ask you. A... She didn't hear us. 
she didn't even see us. Well, those two men. Let's, let's talk to them. Sir, would you tell us, please? Please, we don't want you to stop your work, but we do need your help. I mean, can, where is it? No use. They can't see us or hear us. This is impossible. They're here. Janet, you do see what I see, don't you? A man with a spade and a man with a hoe. Exactly. So I'm going to find out the way they're behaving. This can't be true. It can't be real. Nonsense. They're... They're ghosts. I don't believe in ghosts. Now, I'm going to make this man talk to me. Look out. You'll be hurt. That hoe is sharp. This man is real. His hoe is real. Marion, don't go any closer. I'm going to touch you. No. Marion, no. You can't grab his arm. Mister, mister, you have to listen to me. He stopped breathing. I'm not sure he ever was breathing. But he's standing there. His eyes. Look at his eyes. Let go of him. It can't be. It can't be. He's going right back to work again. What about the other man? No use. It would be the same thing. We can try. No. Marion, I can see the look in his eyes, too. He's... He's dead. Just like the other one. Let's get away from here. Tony, where can we go? Well, I'm coming around... I'm coming around to your point of view. We must be very calm and think this whole thing out very sensibly. Let's move as far as possible away from these robots. How about that hillside over there? Well, maybe if we sit down in the shade of a tree, we'll come to our senses. It's peaceful here. But, Janet, we can't stay here. I'm getting hungry. <laughs> Maybe that old man was right. What do you mean? Perhaps you do belong in the kitchen. A terrible thing to say. Oh, I'm only kidding, Marion. But you were the one who wanted adventure. Enough is enough. Today will last me for a lifetime. That's what I mean. You're talking very strangely. I feel strange. I felt strange all day. Ever since seeing those buffalo. What buffalo? Back on the road. When we were in the car. It all seems like such a long time ago. Oh, Janet. The heat... The heat haze. It, it's gotten to you again. Perhaps we're still back in that car. No, we're here. In Mirado. And that is the strangest part of all. I agree that Murado is a very unusual town. But now that it's 12 o'clock, if George was right, if we just go down to the center of things... Marion, do you really believe there is such a town as Murado? But, Janet, you can see it from here, just as clearly as I do. Listen. I've heard that sound before, when the old man came. No, but this is different. The way they're traveling, this must be young men. And they're heading down the main street. There, there must be someone who can help us. Ghosts. They're all of them ghosts. Janet, snap out of it. Come on. Come on. Where are we going? Back into town. I don't think I can stand any more of these ghostly people. But the horses, Janet. Maybe we can get some horses and ride away from this frightening place. I haven't been on a horse in a thousand years. Neither have I, but we can try. Oh, Janet, we can try. <laughs> They all look so dizzy. What did I tell you? Fiesta time is over. Everyone's awake now. They're far from awake, Marion. Blacksmith shop's over there. And that should be the place to find out about the horses. Hello, ladies. How are you getting along? It's the old timer. Thank goodness, Mr. Old Timer. George, please, please, we can talk to you. At your service, ladies. You'd better be of more service than you were the last time. Well, I know it was you who brought us here, but we... You see, we simply don't understand. It's all very simple, Miss Jeffries. You heard the clock strike yes. 12? Yes, we heard the clock, and we can see the people. I had my orders. Everything will work out within the hour. Good. Then you will take us back to civilization. Nothing of the sort. As I told you before, you're staying here. 
But we don't belong here. Those other people, they're... They're going. I've told you over and over again. You have been selected. But you said at 12 o'clock we would understand. And that everything would be all right. It is, dear ladies. It is. We need you, both of you, to go with the others. We'll pay you well, very well, for you to take us away from here. Anything you ask. I do only what I'm supposed to do for Mirado. There is no such place as Mirado. Right before your eyes, Miss Marston. As you said yourself, it's a very busy town. Oh, Janet, come on. We're going to the blacksmith's shop. I wouldn't dare touch one of those horses. Oh, they look gentle enough to me. That gray one, Bruce. I mean, are they real? Of course they're real. And that white-haired blacksmith. He's not like those other men. Look at those rosy cheeks. Most likely from all that heat. I must say the fire looks real enough. Excuse me. Um, please? Please stop for a moment. It's important. We... We want to hire two horses. No use talking to old Sam. He's deaf and dumb. They are all deaf and dumb, every one of them. Lady, lady, you spend enough time in here. There's someone waiting for you. Well, why didn't you say that before? You, you found someone who can help us? Come along. We're going back to the tavern. Well, that sign in front of the tavern is new. It wasn't there before. Hey, people have been working. Uh, right this way, ladies. Through the swinging door. And the door. It isn't rusty anymore. Someone's oiled the hinges. <laughs> the place is crowded. Joe! Joe! Welcome back, old-timer. Glad to see you. Did you bring her? Janet! Janet, he can talk. We found someone who can talk. <laughs> Well, things are looking up. Or are they? At least there seems to be one other living soul in Mirado. But why did Joe ask that question, did you bring her? Which one of the ladies does he mean? It doesn't sound as though he's going to help them get away. Marion and Janet may be in yet deeper trouble. And the mystery of this ghost town is far from solved. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. Give your hand to a friend. Give your heart to your love. To your love. But give your allergy to contact. Allergy is our business, too. We know pollen. And we know that any of the 12,000 quarts of air you breathe each day may contain enough pollen to make your eyes itch, make you sneeze, and drip. We also know an ingredient that helps block pollen's bad effects. It's the antihistamine most prescribed by allergy specialists. It's an ingredient in contact. Give your hand to a friend. Give your heart to your love. To your Tiny time pills in one contact keep this antihistamine working up to 12 full hours, all day, all night. Give your allergy to contact. Take contact only and need only as directed. It's a real hot day. I'm soaking up the sun, and suddenly I say antifreeze right out loud. My wife says, huh? And I say, haven't you heard that song? You can never buy press on too early. Do it now, do it now, don't you wait. You can never buy press on too early. You can only buy it too late. It's a fact. A 50-50 mix of Crestone 2 winter summer formula and water, about two gallons for most cars, fights boil over because it helps your cooling system handle heat better than water. Fresh boil over protection and fresh corrosion protection too because only Crestone 2 has a patented silicone silicate inhibitor system. Nothing beats it for corrosion protection. Summer, winter, spring, or fall, you can never buy Crestone 2 early. You can only buy it too late. Who can you trust? At 
at the stroke of noon, the little town of Mirado seemed to burst into life. The streets are crowded now as people come out of their houses and go about what looks like normal everyday business. And there are workmen in the fields. But something is wrong. If you or I should try to speak to these people, would they answer? Our two frightened travelers had no one to turn to except the old-timer. But at last, they have heard the sound of another human voice. A man named Joe. I asked your old-timer, did you bring her? I certainly did. She's right here. Marion, which one of us is he talking about? Mr. Uh, Mr. Joe, is that your name? Did you explain to her that there is a great deal to be done? I tried. He didn't explain anything, Mr. Joe. You tell us. Oh, no use talking to him at this stage. He can't hear you. But he answered you. Why can't he talk to me? Not one o'clock yet. You're still in the other world. I'll make him talk. Your name is Joe. You run this tavern, and we need help. Old timer, did you show her the kitchen? Marion, it's you he's talking about. We've got plenty of complaints today about the food. Look at all the customers. Yeah. Looks like a full house. Did you show her where everything is? Try to. But so far, she doesn't seem to quite understand. Oh, she will. You tell her we'll take real good care of her. Nobody ever any more popular around this town than the cook. What'd you say her name is? Miss Jeffries. Jeff. You stop talking about me like that and talk to me. You hear? Like I told you, Miss Jeffries, he cannot hear He's you. He's got to hear me. Now, please, please, Mr. Joe, you look like a sensible man. You can tell us what this is all about, please. Well, George, got to be going. Trouble in the kitchen. See here. He can't see you either, Miss Jeffries. Not yet. You tell that new cook she's very welcome. You're going to like working for Joe. He's a fine gentleman. Stop it! I can't stand anymore. Janet, that sad-faced woman in the corner. Let's ask her. No use. Her. I already tried. Just like the rest. That's Miss Crawford. Oh. Widow lady. You'll find her a very good friend when you get to know her. I want to know her right now, right this minute. You must be patient, dear lady. Not now. Uh, we're on our way to the schoolhouse. We're here, everybody. Get ready. Oh, Chandler. What a darling one-room schoolhouse. No one-room schoolhouse was ever darling. These children are charming. What do you think of them, Miss Marston? Well, they all look like normal, healthy children to me. Only I know they're not. Oh, I don't know from minute to minute what to believe anymore. You had better believe, Miss Marston. The children are doing this specially for you. They look as though they're singing. They are. And very nicely, too. Well, then why can't I hear them? Why? In time. You'll hear them when you are their teacher. But I'm not going to be their teacher. Miss Marston, our teacher is old, as you can see. All the children have learned songs and games. I didn't think anyone still used those little bells. What are they going to do now? I think it's time for arithmetic. Oh, what a bright-looking little girl. The one going up to the blackboard. <laughs> yeah. You see? Seven times nine... Seven times nine does not equal 56. That's just what I mean, Miss Marston. But that teacher is nodding her head. This is outrageous. It's just as I told you. We need someone like you around here. Why, I'm going up to that blackboard and put her straight. Oh, no, Miss Marston. You can't do that yet. But I'm going to. Don't do it, Miss Marston. Children, children, this number on the blackboard is wrong. Here's the way it goes. Oh, dear, this chalk... It, the chalk won't write on the blackboard. Don't worry, Miss Marston. Here, young lady, you take the chalk and I'll show you the right answer. They've gone back to that game. Here, now I want to show you something. It's no use, Miss Marston. None of them can see you. Well, then why did you bring me here? So you'd know what to do later on. You keep saying that. We've been looking for someone like you for a long time, Miss Marston. And you've come to us at last. 
You will be there, teacher. You must be joking. Everything is a ghastly, hideous joke. That will be enough, children. It's time for us all to go. Marion, I have a feeling that the stage is being set for some tremendous catastrophe. The hour is approaching, and I must get to my station. Oh, Timer, oh, Timer, please don't leave us. George, George, you're our only hope. It's one o'clock. Hurry, hurry, run to the town hall. Marion, listen, listen. I heard the clock strike one, but the people, they're all talking now, all of them, and they can see us. Look, look, they're beckoning to us. Let's catch up. It's dusty. The storm. The beginning of a terrible storm. Look, look over there. I told you. I told you. What did you tell me? This morning when I saw those buffalo and... And the Indians. The town hall. Hurry, hurry. a stinking piece of road. Come on. It's my favorite stretch of highway. <laughs> Glad it's not my Pete. Well, if you had the right car, you could do 200 miles an hour along here. Yeah, well, watch it, bud. A cop's supposed to set an example. Bet I can do 150. Shall we uh, try? No, no thanks. <laughs> you never make it in this thing. And we're supposed to be saving gas, remember? Ah, uh, this road's only fun when you drive as fast as you can. Especially on a day like today. You know, Sweeney, sometimes I just feel sorry for the poor slobs we haul in for speeding on stretches like this. Yeah, right along here's the best place to get them. You, you actually come out here on purpose just to give them speeding tickets? Mm-hmm. Sometimes, when I have nothing better to do. <laughs> hey, 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 slow down, will you? Why, why? There's something up there on the road. Heat haze. No, 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 no. Come on now, Sweeney, slow down, will you? Hey, I think you're right. It's a stalled car, that's for sure. Yeah, a rotten place to run out of gas. California plates. Nobody in it. Maybe they're sleeping. Well, we'll soon find out. Uh, this is supposed to be your day off. But I'm still on duty, so here goes. No, 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 I'm coming too. Man, feel that heat. Nobody in the car, Sweeney. Oh, they'd be crazy if they were. I got the license number. If it's unlocked, there should be a registration. Find anything? Yep. Belongs to a Mr. George Jeffries, Vallejo Street, San Francisco. You want me to get that down? Okay. But where's Mr. Jeffries? Wait a minute. Ladies' gloves in here. A scarf. <laughs> Guess he wasn't traveling alone. Yeah, it looks like women's luggage on the back seat, too. Say, you don't suppose it was some dame who got stuck way out here all by herself, do you? No. No, it's my hunch that there were at least two people in this car. Hmm. But whoever they are, they took the ignition key. Air conditioning. That wouldn't work if the motor conked out. Yeah. Well, which, which way do you think they'd go? Wouldn't be stupid enough to walk on such a hot day. We got a ride. But we didn't pass anybody coming this way. They must have gone straight ahead. Yeah. Could have been some time ago. But what do you think? Should we push the car off the road? Uh-uh. Car's in plain sight. No traffic. And Midway's only about ten miles. We'll find it there. Maybe I should stay here. Oh, you're off. Well, I mean, rock. just just in case, you Look, know. Sorry we don't have the patrol car. If we did, I checked with headquarters. I'll make my report, and if there's any trouble, you can come back with me. We'll bring the tow truck. Okay. I got it all down. Mm-hmm. Sedan, color blue. Yeah. Come on. Come on. Get in. Let's go. There's something in this book I want to check. What are you carrying that thing around with you for? Oh, I want a rookie. Well, I haven't worked this territory as long as you have. Maybe they'll assign me to a car out here. Oh, just ask me anything. I just want to make sure that there isn't some other town 
or farm or someplace where those people could have gone. Well, nothing but desert for miles in every direction. Well, let's just see. There's Baker, Razor. Hey, Sweeney, huh? listen to this, will you? Listen to what? Ever hear of a town called Mirado? Mirado? Well, it's not around here. Well, it's a coast town, or at least it was. Old trading post. Uh, maybe a hundred years ago. No, longer than that. Well, then who cares about it today? I do. You know, you're really something. Well, just a minute. Can I read it to you? Read it, read it. Since I got nothing better to do, go on, go on, read it. It says here that uh, in August of 1846, a band of bloodthirsty Indians swooped into the little town of Mirado and killed all but one of its inhabitants. All but one. The lone survivor was a baby boy who was found asleep in a crib in a barn. There is a legend that once a year, the residents of Mirado come back to haunt the place. Now, what do you think of that? <laughs> I think it's poppycock, made up for the tourist trade. Hey, look over there, that great big spiral of smoke. Oh, Johnson, you're a fool. That's a dust storm, and it's coming our way. Come on, step on it. If anyone else drove as fast as I'm about to, even you would arrest him for speeding. Some people believe in predestination, and almost everyone, at some time in life, comes across a ghost. Our traveling ladies may have met with an unfortunate accident, or perhaps they really were sojourners in time, who found a better, or at least a different, place to fit into the scheme of things. The ghosts of times past are all around us, and legends persist. The present is made up of the past, and a clock of one century tells time in another. I'll be back shortly. Ever had a tall, frosty glass of amplitude? Well, if your beer is Budweiser, you've had it often. Amplitude is a fancy word for the entire taste phenomenon, the total experience of flavor. Next time you take a healthy swallow of Bud, watch what happens. Think about the sensations you're experiencing. Notice how the flavor of Bud comes on nice and easy. Not too strong, not too quick, just right. Notice the clean, crisp togetherness of Bud's taste. Everything in perfect balance, with no single element jumping out at you. And there'll be no aftertaste either, no hanging on. And you'll be refreshed and ready for another glassful. Actually, butt drinkers have been experiencing amplitude for years, but they never phrase it that way. They just say, Budweiser, and that says it all. Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis. for the energy crisis this summer. It may keep you from driving along a deserted highway. Check your automobile and drive with care. There could be a ghost town waiting for you. Our cast included Celeste Holm, Francis Sternhagen, Nat Pullen, and Gilbert Mack. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Now... A preview of our next tale. I've got some clues. I have those tire marks. They made a mold five years ago. And I've got this. This little button made of bone. It was clutched in Grover's hand. Take a look at it. I looked. It was a little button. The sleeve button. From a corduroy jacket. One of... Well... One of the host of buttons that adorned that jacket. The jacket I had worn that night. I never even noticed the one that was missing. That jacket. I still have it. I don't wear it often. But I still have it. It's in one of my closets. What you're saying is, 
that if you can find the jacket it came from, you've got your killer. That's right. I've got it. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. children. What will their future be like? Your children's education will affect them for the rest of their lives. That's why planning a child's education is so important. As a parent, naturally, you want to provide the best. No decision regarding your child's education should be made until all the options have been examined. One of the many excellent forms of education available in America is the independent boarding school. Boarding schools offer a wide choice of courses, extracurricular activities, and scholarship opportunities. You owe it to yourself and your children to examine the options available in America's boarding schools. To find out about more than 80 nonprofit schools throughout the country, write for a free booklet to Boarding Schools, Baltimore, Maryland, 21202. A public service of the National Association of Independent Schools. And this station. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents. G. Marshall. The optimist proclaims that we live in the best of all possible worlds, and the pessimist fears that it's true. However, whether the world is good or bad, or even indifferent, at least there is unanimous agreement that this is the only world we have. Or is that agreement unanimous? Oh, yeah, Mrs. Taylor. She was a bitch. Karen, surely you don't believe. You can't believe in witches. Then why did the milk go sour? And why did the horses go lame? And why did the barn burn down? Answer that, Mrs. Taylor. Natural causes, Karen. So? Isn't the witch a living creature? Isn't the witch part of nature, too? <laughs> mystery drama, The White Ghost, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Ralph Bell and Ann Williams. It is sponsored in part by Carrier Air Conditioning and True Value Hardware Stores. I'll be back shortly with Act One. You want your house to be a home all year round. You can do it economically, no matter what the costs go, the more you need carrier heat pump air conditioning. It cools your home in summer, heats it in winter for up to half the cost of electric heat and less than most oil systems. So before you replace your old furnace or put in air conditioning, talk to your carrier dealer about heat pump air conditioning. He's the expert. So make summer a Today, more than ever, 
Isn't it great to know scouting is still going strong? Scouting's a lot of fun, and you get a lot out of it because you can um, camp, and you can work on merit badges, and you can work on skill. Still helping our kids grow up to become good Americans, to be prepared. You might even be able to work to Eagle Scout, and it helps you a lot when you grow up, and it's a lot of fun because you get to do lots of things. Yes, thanks to the United Way and people everywhere, Scouting is still teaching honesty, self-reliance, respect. All the ideals worth believing in, ideals worth supporting. Well, this way you get to camp out in the woods and you get to cook your own food and find out what it's like to just be out in the wilderness seeing how you can do. Get behind Scouting. Become a sustaining member. Call the Boy Scouts of America listed in your phone book and make a contribution. Let's keep Scouting going stronger than ever. Get him to join and then he can get another friend to join and pretty soon everyone will be in scouting. It was a gentleman named John Haywood who back in the Elizabethan era said, you can't have your cake and eat it. Well, he may have been a fine poet, a perceptive observer of human comedy, but he blew this one. Because the fact is, you can have your cake and eat it. You can have it both ways. You can even have it always. You can have whatever you want and whenever you want it. That is, provided you know how to go about it. A gentleman who obviously knows how to go about it is Mr. Donald Taylor. How lovely it is, Donald. Yes. That is beautiful music, Phyllis, darling. Not just the music, but, but everything. Everything? Oh, yes, everything. Does a woman have the right to be as happy as I am? <laughs> well, darling, that sounds like a question that might be probably posed on some soap opera program. <laughs> and I feel guilty. Oh, why? There's so many people I know who are miserable. Well, darling, that's not your fault. <laughs> I can't believe I'm so lucky. You're not lucky. You work very hard. I do? <laughs> At what? At being you. At being the most wonderful wife a man could ever dare to hope for. Oh, excuse me, dearest. Hello. Darling. Uh, yes. Oh, you're not alone. Uh, no. Have you told her yet? Uh, no, uh, Congressman. But you promised. You promised you'd work it out. Yes, well, of course. With uh, her. Uh, certainly. When? 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 Well, um, you know what it says in the Bible, Congressman. To all things, there's a season. Don, I must see you. Uh-huh. Uh, Congressman, can't it wait? Donald, if I don't see you tonight, I'll kill myself. Well, uh, that is a rather extreme position. I mean it, Donald. I'll kill myself. And before I do, I'll send a letter to all the newspapers telling them about us. Oh, I see. You'd better get over here. Well, uh, Congressman, I think this does call for a meeting. I'll be there within the hour. Is something wrong, dear? Oh, it's just that if you elect a fool, you can expect him to behave according to form. There's a... Uh, it's a little uh, political problem which requires my presence. Oh, shall you be out late? Yes, I'm afraid so. It'll be a long, boring evening, but the proposed legislation is of the utmost importance. I'm so proud of you, Donald, darling. My dear, I shall return just as soon as I possibly can. Well, I've stopped telling my friends about you. Oh, have you? They simply cannot believe that anyone could be so kind, so considerate, so gentle. Don't you ever call my home again. Don't you ever threaten. <laughs> and don't you ever forget it. Donald. What's come over you? You kill yourself and write a letter to the newspaper. Which paper would print it? Which paper is anxious to invite a libel suit? I wouldn't write a letter to any paper. I just said that because I... Because I'm... I'm so frightened and... Miserable. To 
Judy, we've come to the end. The end? Of what? The end of the affair. Of affair? Every affair has a beginning, and uh, whatever begins eventually ends. It's the law of nature. But I love you. And you love me. Oh, do I? You... Well, you said so. Darling, you said you were unhappy, desperately unhappy at home. You, you said you wanted to leave her and marry me. Were you lying to me? Yes. Donald. I paid generously for the privilege of telling you a lie. And you have quite a bit to show for it. The apartment, clothes, jewelry. Why do you think I agreed to the apartment? Why do you think I agreed to everything? I believed you. I believed you, Donald. Oh, now sit down, Trudy. I know you come from a small town, a very small town, but surely no one is that naive. I believed you. Now, look, I want to do something for you. I have a friend. He's quite wealthy. What? What? What are you saying, Tom? Well, wouldn't you like to make another connection? What? A gentleman who would certainly take the very best care of you. Don't you dare talk to me like that. I'm not that kind of a girl. Oh, my dear... You are. You are now. And you should be grateful to me for seeing to it that you will be highly successful. I was a good girl, a good girl. Uh, I guess nobody ever talks like that anymore. Oh, go ahead, laugh at me. Trudy, Jim Pendleton is absolutely wild over you. He saw us that night at the party. Small town girls like me. We come to the big city. We we think we're going to become somebody. You know, he said to me the next day, Don, who's that absolutely smashing girl you're with? And then with? this is what we become. Everything always works out for the best, Trudy. Now, look, why don't we have a... I huh? never thought it would ever... That it could ever happen to me. Jim Pennell is really a very lucky devil. He is? When I think of you and Jim, I know I'm going to be jealous. Well... Would Jim object to sharing me with you, Donald? <laughs> Jim is quite busy. <laughs> he does go out of town a great deal of that. And, uh, I guess what he doesn't know. <laughs> you know, you're really a wonderful girl, Trudy. Am I? Oh, yes. Of course, you are understandably upset. When I walked in here, I must admit that I was too, but... You're basically a level-headed girl, you know? That's why I was attracted to you in the first place. Good girl, you're behaving admirably. Now, come here. Sit down. Hmm? I've got a gift for you. Have you? I thought it'd be a kind of a going away gift, but uh, <laughs> looks like you're not really going away. That's a coincidence. I have a gift for you, too. Oh, really? Well, that's wonderful. Where is it? I've been keeping it in this drawer. Oh, yes? What is it? It's an ounce of lead. Trudy. Now, Trudy, you're crazy. Yes. I believe you. That should prove I was crazy. Now, Trudy, put down that revolver. A gift from me to you. Now, you can't get away with it. I this. don't want to get away with anything, Donald. After I kill you, I'll turn the gun on myself. Now, Trudy, listen to me. There's nothing you can tell me, Donald. Not anymore. Now, Trudy. I don't care anymore. Goodbye, darling. I, I, I can't be found here dead in your apartment. I'll write a note. I'll explain it. Goodbye, Donald. Okay. It doesn't fire. Why doesn't it fire? All, all right, give me that gun. Let go of me. You fool. Quit pulling that trigger. What? They might be alive now. Let go of the gun now. Why doesn't it fire? Let go. Let go. Let go. Uh, Cody. Cody. Oh, no. No. Good morning, darling. A delightful breakfast. English muffins and Mendelssohn. Pour you some coffee. Thank you. How was that? What time did you get home last night? Oh, very late. How'd the meeting go? The meeting? Oh, uh, well, problems. Have any trouble uh, with the congressman? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, is there uh, anything new in the paper? Yes. There's been a murder. Hmm. Unfortunately, that happens too often. We've become such a violent society. Uh, who was murdered? Oh, her name was Gertrude Nelson. Well, you should know who she is. Should I? 
At first, the name didn't mean anything to me either. Then as I read on, it said she worked at the Cloverdale Country Club. Well, that's our club. Yes. And it's Trudy. Trudy? Yes, Trudy. The stunning blonde-haired girl who was cashier in the coffee shop. Oh, Trudy. Someone broke into her apartment and shot her. Broke in? Yes. Well, there were signs of a struggle as if she'd put up a fight. And a rear window was broken. Her empty purse was on the floor. Evidently, some money and jewels were taken. Do the police have any leads? Oh, the paper doesn't say. Oh, poor girl. She was sweet. The one that did this thing. Does he realize he snuffed out a beautiful young life? Or has murder become so ordinary, so commonplace? Oh, now, darling, darling, it doesn't do to let your thoughts dwell on morbid matters. Besides, there's nothing anyone can do for her now. I'm sorry you're so upset. Oh, she was a poor girl trying to make something of herself. The world is so unfair. My darling, you have to accept the world for what it is. Oh, yes, I I suppose so. Well, I must get to the office. But uh, you haven't had breakfast? There's no time, dear. I'll uh, see you this evening. Is something wrong? Oh, what could be wrong? I don't know. It's just you seem so abrupt and so preoccupied. As if something's troubling you. Oh, dearest. I look at you, and I don't have a worry in the world. <laughs> Miss Powers, I have to concentrate on this report. I don't want to take any calls for the next half hour. Oh, didn't I just tell her? Oh, damn, it's a private line. Hello. Hello. Donald. Who? Who? Donald, darling. It's me. What is this? Me. Trudy. You're dead. I want you to know I'm very happy. Who is this? You would be happy here with me. Now, listen. With me. With me, Donald. Now, look look here. We would be so happy together here, Donald. It's a joke. It's a practical joke. But who... Who knew about Trudy and me? I was careful. No one, no one knew about us. If anyone knew, they'd they, 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 they tell the police. Wouldn't they? Well, the police haven't called on me. They would if they knew. So if it isn't a joke, but... Oh, no, it can't be. It can't be. The other thing either. It can't be, Trudy. It can. It can't. It is. It isn't. Life is filled with questions. True or false. Multiple choice. We're always being confronted and tested. Particularly if we're involved with murder. But on this show, in addition to questions, you also get answers. A few will be delivered when I return with Act Two. Right now, your True Value Hardware Store can show you two simple ways to save money. By spending money. Hi, Pat Summerall to explain how. First, go to your True Value Hardware store for Owens Corning Dust Stop Furnace Filters. Install one in your furnace or in summer in your central cooling system. Change it when the fiberglass filtering material gets dirty, about once a month. Your furnace or cooling system won't have to work so hard, so it'll use less fuel to provide the same amount of heat or cooling, so you'll save money. And second, go to your True Value Hardware store for General Electric Soft White Plus Light Bulbs in 75 and 100 watt sizes. They cost a little bit more, but they last twice as long as standard bulbs, so you'll save money again. Owens Corning Dust Stop Furnace Filters and GE Soft White Plus Light Bulbs are two simple ways to save money by spending money. Find them at your participating True Value Hardware store. And remember now, you can charge your purchases on Master Charge at many stores. God has spoken to man in dreams. Jehovah said in the Old Testament, Listen to my words. If a man be a prophet, 
I make myself known to him in visions. I speak to him in dreams. So, pay attention to your own dreams. They might well reveal flashes of the future, predictions and warnings of things to come. They may give you a glimpse of God's guidance to lead you back to the peace and security of his way. For your free booklet on dreams, write to the Foundation Church, 1147 First Avenue, New York, New York, 10021. That's the Foundation Church, 1147 First Avenue, New York, New York, 10021. So, Well, in a variety of statements, scores of poets and sages assure us that murder cannot be kept secret or hidden. Is that really true? How many murders remain unsolved? How many killers evade the law? Unfortunately, quite a few. Donald Taylor is doing a bit of soul searching. He didn't exactly kill Trudy. It was self-defense. They struggled for the gun. She actually killed herself. But can he afford to have even that much known? Of course not. Dear Phyllis, this letter will serve to introduce Karen Hagstrom. You know how you complain it's so difficult to find an adequate maid? Well, Karen worked for Bert's mother... A lovely woman, perhaps a bit superstitious, but we all can't be perfect. From here, it's on to Singapore and India. See you in six months. Love, Lolly. Sniff. Hmm. Well, Karen? Yeah, ma'am. I do need a maid. And if Mrs. Smith is so taken with you, I'm sure you must be wonderful. I hope you will be pleased with me, Mrs. Taylor. As you can see, I can't get around much. Oh, I will take good care of you, Mrs. Taylor. It's difficult to work for me. I have to be wheeled about constantly. I shouldn't say this, I suppose, but I do have difficulty in keeping servants. Oh, you look like a lovely lady. Lovely lady. I'm an old lady. Oh, no. Oh, it's so sunny. Let me wheel you to the terrace, and I will brush your hair. Oh, you seem to be a very nice person, Karen. Thank you. And Mrs. Smith is an excellent judge of character. And if you can start immediately. Darling, you look magnificent. I have a new maid. (laughs) Well, I hope you can keep this one. Oh, yes, she's a perfect gem. Lolly Smith recommended her. She's worked for Bert's mother. She's so kind, so gentle. Excuse me, dear. Hello. Hello. Donald, darling. Who? It's so wonderful here where I am. You'd love it. Who was that, darling? Uh, <clears throat> it's the wrong number. But you seem so upset. Well, actually, it, it wasn't a wrong number, dear. It's an obscene call. Oh, it's a dreadful world, Donald. Sometimes I don't feel so badly being out of... Oh, uh, Mr. Taylor. Yes, Karen. Oh, Karen, this is Mr. Taylor. Oh, pleased to know you, sir. How do you do? Uh, Will you want to wear the red sweater tomorrow? I'll wash it out. Oh, don't bother. Mrs. Prentice does the laundry. Oh, no, no. I'll do it myself. Uh, uh, Ring when you want me to put you to bed. I will, Karen. Thank you. Well, she seems capable enough. You know, as she stood here near the table in the candlelight, she seemed to remind me of someone. Oh, yes? Who? Oh, for just a moment. It was just the way the light reflected on her face. Oh, she reminded me of that poor girl. Which poor girl? The one who was murdered. Trudy. Well, how can you say that? Well, this one is at least uh, 10, perhaps 15 years older. Now, darling, for almost a month, ever since that poor girl was murdered, you, you keep bringing up her name. I, I can't help it. Well, why? You hardly knew her. I, I mean, it's a, it's a tragic thing. Oh, but she was so beautiful. 
Do you know what I said to myself the first time I saw her at the club? For no reason at all. I said, if our little Madeline had lived, she might have looked like that. Oh. I'm sorry. But it wasn't your fault. Phyllis, I... Don't, don't say anything, darling. You don't have to. Well, I think of the child dead and you in the wheelchair all these years. We must accept fate and make the best of our lives. Oh, we have, haven't we, darling? You've been the most wonderful husband. Oh, let one of the servants answer, dear. Oh, it's ringing on the private wire. Donald, darling. Mm-hmm. Was it the same? Yes. But, darling, who would know your private number? Let's let's put it to my mind. Help me. Darling, you, you can't afford that. I know. Perhaps I'd better get to my room. Oh, no, no, not again. Hello. Donald? Oh, hello, Jim. Uh, Don, about that order we placed with you. You know, I've been thinking about it, and you could do a lot better. Just mull it over and get to me in the morning, huh? Uh, regards to, uh, Phyllis. Yeah, uh, sure. Oh, uh, oh, just between us, pal. Ah, oh, what a shame about that Trudy. She sure was something, huh? You know? You're lucky nobody knew about you and her. That is, nobody except me. But I'm your pal. I'll keep my mouth shut. I know you will, Jim. Oh, and about the price. Now, I am positive you can do a little better if you really put your mind to it, huh? I pal. And I... What was that all about, dear? Uh, that was the, the, the obscene phone call. What are you saying? Wasn't that Jim Pendleton? Yes, dear. Donald, these past few days you've been so preoccupied. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I'll, uh, I'll have to look through some papers. Perhaps your uh, maid had better help you to bed. Hmm? Oh, yeah, Mrs. Taylor. She was a witch. Oh, now, Karen, surely you don't believe. You can't believe in witches. Then why did the milk turn sour? Why did the horses take sick and die? Why did the barn run down? Answer that, Mrs. Taylor. Natural causes. So, and a witch is part of nature, too. A witch is a living thing. Oh, this is so comfortable, Karen. Ah, I shall be back after midnight to help you turn around. And fix the bed. But, Karen, dear, you won't get very much rest. Oh, I am not here to rest, Mr. Taylor. I'm here to work. Mrs. Taylor? Yes, Karen? It's two o'clock in the morning. I came to see if you are awake. Oh, I am. Would, uh, would you open the window, please? It's stuffy in here. Oh, yeah, Mr. Taylor. What is it, Karen? Oh, it's a spooker. Karen? It's, it's just a ghost. A white ghost. Look. Look, it's coming. It's coming here. No. No. Oh, I am so sorry. I, I bothered everyone. Now, Karen, you know there's no such thing as a ghost. Now, where was this uh, ghost, Karen? She came from the woods near... Near the greenhouse and on the lawn. She? Oh, yeah. Yeah, she. The white ghost. Oh, she's always a woman. And this woman, she had long blonde hair. She's always a girl who's been murdered. And she comes back. Now, that's nonsense. Oh, no. But it is true. She always comes back to the house of the people who have loved her. To let them know she still loves them. But we don't know any girl who has been murdered. Yes, we do. But she was a stranger. I loved her. Now, look, it's time we all got to bed. Good night, Karen. I'll see the Mrs. Taylor. Yeah. Uh, go, good night. Poor girl. She made it seem so real. Could it be true? Could what be true? She's convinced she actually saw a white ghost. Darling, you do need your rest. Try to sleep. Hello? Jim. 
Jim, it's Don. Oh, Don. Hey, do you know what time it is? It's exactly 2.45. Yeah, well, that's a.m., buddy. A.m. I have to see you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. Uh, first thing in the morning. It's morning now. Look, it'll take at least an hour for me to get to your place or for you to get to mine. It's only a half hour if we meet halfway. Well, you sure you want to? Well, you want that price reduction, don't you? Uh, you're the doctor. All right, take the shore road and pull over near the interstate sign near exit four. Let's meet in exactly 30 minutes. John? Hello, Jim. Hey, well, what's all this about? Let's start at the beginning, Jimmy. A long time you've been trying to buy my company, haven't you? Don, it is 3.20 a.m. It would solve a lot of your raw material headaches, wouldn't it? Don, what are you driving at? But as chairman of the board, I've blocked the sale, right? Don, what? So how do you get me out, huh? By making me look bad. Forcing me to resign. Forcing you to... Or else putting me in the middle of a scandal. Scandal? Or even try to drive me out of my mind. I don't know what you're... I don't know what you're talking... You don't know what I'm talking about, huh? Well, you're the only one who knows about Trudy and me. You could tell the police about our relationship, huh? You are crazy. Am I? You're applying the pressure on all three fronts, aren't you? Don, I am not going to do any such thing. It was you who hired an actress to pose on the phone as Trudy. And tonight you even had her get into some flimsy thing and float across my lawn as the ghost of Trudy. Now, Jim, you and I know there are no ghosts. That dead girls cannot speak on the phone. Look, look, I've heard just about enough. Oh, yes? Well, that's all there is. And so now... Uh, uh, what, 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 what are you doing with that? What are you doing with that? Uh, what, what do people usually do with, uh, with a gun? Kill, huh? Oh, Donald, Donald, we're friends. Yes, we were. Until you saw a way to get ahead of me. Donald, please don't kill me. Well, Jim, I have no choice. You could always go to the police, and then the story gets out, and I'm through. Don, Don I swear to you, I'll, I'll never... I'm sorry, Jim, I'm sorry. You shouldn't have hired some girl. I, I didn't. I swear to you, Jim, I, I never... I said I was sorry. But you just can't kill another human being. Oh, yes, you can, Jim. You can even get used to it once you've been in on it. No! Don, please, I didn't do anything. I don't even know what you're... Talking. Good morning, Phyllis Darling. Morning, dear. I don't have any music playing this morning because I'm afraid it wouldn't be appropriate. I have very bad news for you. Jim Pendleton's been murdered. What? I heard it on the radio. Jim? Now, wait a minute. You, you can't mean Jim Pendleton. Poor Don. He was such a good friend. How? Where? Last night, on the shore highway, someone shot him. Oh, these killings, the senseless violence. Oh, Donald, it's dreadful. Oh, we... We played golf the other day. Fortunately, he wasn't married, so there's no family that would be deprived. Jim? Jim Pendleton? Why, he was one of the nicest human beings. <laughs> Hello. Hello, Donald. <gasps> Darling, I'm so lonesome without you. Please, come to me. No. Donald, darling, what is it? What is it? <laughs> What is it indeed? Or more properly, who is it? Trudy, we know, is dead. And if Jim isn't paying someone to impersonate her on the phone, or to behave as her shade, then with what are we dealing here? For this kind of answer, you have to be here for the third act, which I shall bring in just a few moments. To the man who bought the skyhawk, to the girl in the century, 
glad you like your Buicks, glad you set your spirit free. And to the family from Ohio, to the folks up in St. Paul, nice to see you join us, nice to see you all. Know that over 250,000 people have already bought 1976 Buicks. No. No, we didn't know that. You like your Buick, don't you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. A lot? Uh -huh. A lot, yeah. yeah. There's probably nothing you don't like about your Buick, right? Oh, I, I can't nope. think of a thing. Well, we could probably even say you love your Buick, right? Yeah, oh, yeah. We could say that I love my Buick. That's right. In fact, I'll bet you wouldn't trade that Buick for a million dollars. Oh, I wouldn't bet that. Oh, he bet it, didn't he? No. Okay, it's a bet. Here's the Buick. Where is the cashola? Let me see it. I don't think he's coming across. Nice to see you join us. Dedicated to the free spirit in just about everyone. Hello, I'm Dolly Parton. Have you ever watched a weaver at his trade? Shuttles weaving faster and faster on the loom, creating a design where none has been before. And come to think of it, life's pattern is woven in just the same way. Born of many different threads, meeting, merging, spinning out the small fabric of our existence, the March of Dimes is trying to create a better fabric of life, free from the tragedy of birth defects, a life which ensures every newborn the right to the most precious heritage of all, good health at birth. Medical service programs, scientific research, public education, all are part of the March of Dimes fight against this number one health problem for our nation's children. But a weaver, any weaver, needs help along the way. And birth defects are forever, unless you help. Help weave a tomorrow full of bright promise for our next generation. A tomorrow without handicaps at birth. Please, give to the March of Dimes. Thank you. Intelligent men do not believe in ghosts, especially in broad daylight, when all's well with the world. Yet there comes a time at night when no one is too sure, especially if it's a trying time, a time filled with fears and guilt. Then the veneer of a few thousand years of civilization is stripped away. Then... We are all back there, in the caves, shuddering at shadows. Yeah, Mrs. Taylor, the place is haunted. Haunted? Yeah, from the old country. The old people say the white ghost is the unmarried young girl that dies. Oh, come, Carrie. Yeah, and she dies for love. Well, the only young girl we knew who died recently was poor Trudy Nelson. And she didn't die for love. She was murdered. This is her ghost. And she did die for love. Uh, <clears throat> Karen, uh, could you bring in some fresh coffee, please? Uh, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, I'll have yeah. some too, Karen. Uh, no, uh, no, not until dinner. That's what your doctor said. Phyllis, darling, how can you listen to all that nonsense? Well, it isn't nonsense if she believes it. Well, don't you find it upsetting? Well, why should I? I think it's rather charming. Besides, she's such a wonderful maid. Well, how could I do without her? So gentle, so understanding. How can I ever thank Lolly Smith for recommending her? Uh, hello. Donald. Oh, no. Donald, come with me. Come with me. Now, listen. Why do you avoid me? I come to the house to see you, and you avoid me. No. Donald. Uh. All right, dear. Those obscene phone calls. You should report it to the police, now, shouldn't you? There's nothing anyone can do. Oh, Don, you're not well. Oh, I wish this maid of yours wasn't so superstitious. It's, it's, it's kind of getting to me. What is? Oh, this, this ghost she sees. It. You know, that girl has been on our minds ever since... Why? I wonder why. Uh, uh, Mr. Taylor, uh, uh, someone to see you. Oh, yes? Who is it, Karen? Well, he said he was a policeman. Police? Yeah. Well, why would... Well, I did, uh, probably has to do with Jim Pendleton's death. But why would the police come here? Well, why? Because we were close friends. That's why. That was a stupid question. Oh, darling. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I, I understand. 
Where is the police officer, Karen? I put him in the library. Thank you, Karen. Uh, you were Mr. Pendleton's best friend, Mr. Taylor? I uh, no. We were friends. Mm -hmm. Did he have any enemies you knew of? Well, what do you mean by enemies? Well, people who felt he injured them. People who may have hated him enough to kill him. Well, the truth is, Lieutenant, I didn't really know him very well. We belonged to the same club. We played golf together. Mm -hmm. My company sold raw materials to his company. I see. But although we were cordial, spent some time together, it, uh... Well, it was... Uh, well, now that I think of it, it was all on the surface. So, you see, I, I couldn't tell you very much. Well, you both belong to the uh, Cloverdale Country Club. Yes, that's right. And you knew a Miss Trudy Nelson. Well, yes, she was the uh, cashier in the coffee shop. Yes, she was murdered a month ago. I know that. Both Miss Nelson and Mr. Pendleton were killed by bullets fired from the same gun. Oh? Well, how, uh... How is that possible? Well, it's a fact. What it means or how it fits in, we don't know yet. Uh, how well did you know Trudy Nelson, Mr. Taylor? How well? Mm -hmm. Well, I was aware of her as the uh, cashier at our club. She was extremely attractive. Well, that's about all. Did you ever see Miss Nelson uh, away from the club? Meaning what? I think the question is clear. Well, so is my answer. No. Hmm. Now, Miss Nelson has a sister. She came in recently from the Midwest. She said that Trudy used to call her on the phone every week and chat about the people she met here. And she mentioned you. Me? Yes, yeah. The sister said that Trudy had told her that uh, you and she were having an affair. Now, that's a lie. She, uh... Really had no evidence to support it, so we weren't going to embarrass you. I just thought I'd let you know what her sister said. Where is her sister? Hmm? Oh, probably gone back home. She looked like a big farm girl. Well, if you should think of anything that might be helpful to us, please get in touch with me. Yes, I certainly will. Hmm. Hello. Darling, you're in danger. The police, they know something. What? What could the police know? The gun. Why did you use the same gun? Oh, poor Donald, you were not made to kill. You were made to love. Come with me. Join me. Join me. Hello. Hello. I'm going mad. I've got to stop this. I can't let myself go. I can't. Karen? Karen? Yeah? Yeah? What is it, Mrs. Taylor? Do you hear something? Hear so... No, Mrs. Taylor. I, uh... What time is it? It's four o'clock in the morning. I, uh... I was asleep and uh, I heard the telephone ring. Yeah? In, uh, in Mr. Taylor's room... I couldn't go back to sleep, and then I I heard footsteps. Oh, there, outside. Or oh, it might have been your husband walking. Oh, no, no, the steps were too light. It was a woman's walk. Are you sure? I saw her. You saw her? It was the ghost. Ah, oh, the white ghost. But how could you see her? But. Well, if I lean all the way over, I can look out the window. Oh, and there she was, by, by the greenhouse. I thought I heard voices in here. Phyllis, what are you doing now? Oh, yes, I, I heard the phone ring in your bedroom. Who, who could have been calling so late? Oh, there was nothing, dear. There's nothing at all. But, Donald... I'm sorry it woke you. I'm glad it woke me, because I saw her. You saw who? Trudy. Trudy? ghost of Trudy, the white ghost. The white ghost with the golden hair. That's impossible. The same ghost Karen saw out there. Oh, Don, tell her we understand. But, Phyllis, I... Darling, I'd go out there if I could. You must do this for me. Oh, why? Why? Because, because I feel that if one of us told her we understand, she'd be able to rest. Finally. 
Phyllis, do you realize what you... Do it for me, Donald, for me. But it's mad. It's real. Donald, darling, it's real. I saw her. I saw the white ghost with my own eyes. Well, I can't... Uh, Are you afraid? Why? And what's to fear? She was a fine young girl. How could she harm you? But, Phyllis, I... Karen. Yeah, ma'am. Karen, will you go outside with Mr. Taylor and, and help him find the white ghost? Oh, oh, oh please, no, no, please, no, no, I me, couldn't. Karen. Besides, I... look, look, there's nothing to fear. She was such a lovely girl. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I, I will go. Karen, you've been around the other side of the greenhouse? Yeah, Mr. Taylor. Did you see anything? I... I don't know, Mr. Taylor. Oh, what do you have there? It's a gun. A gun? Well, what you saw, what my wife saw, was most likely a prowler. Oh, a gun is of no use against a ghost. Well, where is your ghost, Karen? I don't know. Ghosts do not come and go when we ask them to. They do as they like. Oh, I, I had better go back inside to the missus. Good night, Mr. Taylor. Good night. Ah. Oh. Another thing to do is not to lose my head. Whatever is happening can be explained. Can be explained rationally. Explained somehow. What? What's that? Oh, no, it's nothing. It's nothing. It's nothing. It's nothing out there. And, and everything's all right. Donald. <laughs> Who are you? Trudy. You're Trudy. Oh, no. Donald, come with me. Escape with me. Escape? The police officer, he suspects. Why else would he ask about you and me? Oh, I'm dreaming. No. No, you must come with me. Where? It's a lovely place. We'll be so happy. I... I... I can't leave my wife. She hasn't been your wife in 20 years. You've been pretending for 20 years. Come with me. Live with me. You know how wonderful it is with me, don't you? Yes. You want to come with me. That's why you brought the gun, isn't it? I... 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 Trudy... Trudy... I didn't mean to kill you. It's just that sometimes I, I do things I can't control. I, I know. I didn't mean to kill you. I didn't but mean you it. didn't I didn't... kill me. People who love each other never die. You and I, we will live forever. Now, look in my eyes and raise the gun slowly to your head. Don't look at the gun. Just look into my eyes. You won't feel anything. Just look into my eyes. Look. Look. And... Yes. Oh, yes, thank you, Lolly. Well, you knew how sensitive Donald was, how things disturbed him. I suppose he just... Well, Jim Pendleton, Don adored him, had, had been murdered. Oh, and uh, I want to thank you so much for Karen. Although I couldn't keep her, she was so unnerved by Don's death. Said it was the white ghost that did it. She left... She was such a wonderful maid. Well, well, you know, Karen Hagstrom, who worked for Bert's mother. What? You don't know Karen Hagstrom? But, Mother, you gave me a, a letter of recommendation. You didn't. Oh, I simply can't believe it. You never heard of the woman in your life. So, there 
where you are. How do you want it? We are dealing with Trudy's ghost. Or Jim Pendleton did hire someone to pretend, and maybe no one told her to quit, so she just kept pretending. The police lieutenant said Trudy had a sister. Was that Karen Hagstrom? Well, that's what a properly told ghost story is supposed to do. Raise more questions than it answers. I may have more in just a few moments. Tell me again. Okay. The Internal Revenue Service has over 80 free publications to help answer all those taxing questions you have on your mind. Uh Uh-huh. What if I'm a flagpole sitter whose pole was attacked by termites? All right. Flagpole, termites. It's publications 547 and 584. Uh, An ant left me an elephant under 12 years of age for me to care for. Mm -hmm. Adolescent elephant, uh, 501. Uh. People throw money when my 98-year-old uncle lifts weights at the beach. Is that income? Mm Mm-hmm. 554 and 525. Wow. Does the IRS have an answer for everything? Well, just about. There are over 80 free publications for the asking at any IRS district office. You can write for them by using the order blank on your 1040 tax package. Yep, over 80 tax answering publications. Free from the IRS. says there's no such thing as a perfect crime. If you analyze our story, you'll see we have no fewer than three, which shows how prodigal we can be. The death of Trudy Nelson? The case is closed. The murder of Jim Pendleton? The case is closed. And how did Donald Taylor die? Was it suicide? Who knows? That case is closed. But we have plenty of open cases for you right here seven times each week. Our cast included Ralph Bell, Ann Williams, Joan Shea, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Door's locked. Oh, I I got a pass key. There you are. You can go right in. Thank you. And when he comes, I'll tell him you're in here. You know, what's this? Keys on the floor. Why, they're your keys, aren't they? Says KK on the holder. Well, they are my keys, but how did they get here? I, I thought I had them in my purse. That's why I had to ring for you. I couldn't find them. Well, no matter. Now you just make yourself Ray. comfortable and... Ah. Ray! Oh, my darling! Oh, what is it? What? Oh! What's the matter with him? He's been shot. Call a doctor, please. Hurry. It may be too late for a doctor. Oh, he looks dead. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. The fantasy world of a child... All diagonal squiggles of shimmering color 
The effervescence of cascading balloons, mint candy sticks and sugar trees, gingerbread houses, and yellow brick roads. Or something dark and terrifying, because the logic of a young mind has no moral strictures yet to shape it. That's what this story is all about. Which is which? Yes, Mr. Charles. I heard you. I knew you wouldn't leave me. Mr. Charles? What does the child mean, Ellen? It's the name she's taken to call on her grandfather. Oh, Lord, take us. She's talking to the corpse. Of course I won't cry anymore now. I promise, Mr. Charles. Yes? I understand. What? Oh, I see. Well, then. Goodbye for now, Mr. Charles. Nice shot. Child, what are you doing in here? Talking to the dead? Our mystery drama, The Providential Ghost, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Beatrice Strait. It is sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule, and True Value Hardware Stores. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Silver Birch Hill is the kind of exclusive community you will find within a comfortable limousine ride of any large American city. Very private people who want to be hermetically sealed in a private world. Huge estates, accumulated wealth, frozen attitudes about life that go back generations. Great for the people who like to think they're the only people, but not so wonderful for little girls of ten, full of curiosity and excitement about life. Like Felicity Depew Miller, who may never know how lucky she is that she has Ellen Gardner in her life. And, of course, that lovable old recalcitrant grandfather of hers whom she calls Mr. Charles. What's he saying, Mr. Charles? <laughs> I should think he's saying, thank you for the peanuts. And isn't it a lovely day since you came along, Felicity? There you go again. Don't call me that. <laughs> it's your name. And I hate it. It's a nice name. It means happiness, joy, good luck. Just the same, I hate it. Well, you don't like me to call you Grandpa, or like that. Well, Grandpa and Grandfather makes me sound old and creaky and falling apart. Which you're not. And Felicity makes me feel the same way, which I'm not. <laughs> so you promise to call me Fleischer. Uh, yes, I, I'm your Mr. Charles. Right on. Hmm? That's the thing they say now. Right on. Oh, what's it mean exactly? I don't know. But if you say it, it means you're not no Pope, like Aunt Sissy or Aunt Jane. <laughs> well, I don't know how I ever fathered them, but there they are. All right, Lysha. That's it. Mm. <laughs> See, even the elephant agrees. <laughs> well, animals are smarter and, and nicer than people, especially elephants. Right on, Mr. Charles. Yeah, well, you, you made your point. But why Charles when my name is Henry? That's only one of your names. I saw all the others in the big family Bible. Oh, good Lord. Forget those. Still, why Charles? Because Mr. Charles is my panda. Oh, yes, yes, of course. See, Mr. Charles is my very favorite person in all the world. So, that's why when we didn't want to say Grandpa for those other things... I decided you were my real Mr. Charles. Uh, I'm very flattered. <laughs> what should we do next? Hmm? You want foam candy or, or ice cream? You know what I really want, that, <laughs> Mr. Charles? No, what? I don't really want to go home. Because it isn't like a, a home now. Uh, it's a big, gloomy old barn. I've got to admit that, but still. I liked it enough when Mom and Pop... But, but after they, they... They went away. There was just you. Well, now there are your aunts. I hate my aunts. I hate them. Well, dear me. <clears throat> I don't know I altogether blame you, but... 
<laughs> you do have Ellen and me. I know. And I love you both. It's just I... You what, dear? I, I just don't want to go back to Lakeview House. But that's your home. Not since Mom and Pop. Aunt Sissy and Aunt Jane say I have to stay right away. That isn't how it was. They died. They were drowned. <laughs> come, 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 Nasha. There's no thing about that. Hmm? We're out for a nice day at the zoo. Mr. Charles, what's wrong? Nothing, little one. Not a thing. But, but you look all white and, and sort of papery. Oh, that won't do at all. I'll just take a, a magic pill. <laughs> Uh, you'll see. I'll look all ready again. I'm scared, Mr. Charles. Oh, whatever for? If you ever went away like Pop and Pop, I, I don't know what I'd do to be safe. Safe? Just you and Ellen. That's all that keeps me safe. And if you weren't here, maybe Ellen wouldn't. Wouldn't what? Wouldn't be here. So you see, you just can't leave me. Uh, I promise you, I never will. Elliot. Keep quiet, Henry. No, I'm on your damn diet. No booze, no cigarettes, nothing but pap to eat. I can't dilate my arteries just to please you. And call me Charles. Charles? What for? It's the only name that means anything to me. It's what my granddaughter wants to call me. And I like it. Okay, Charles, if you want it. Uh, how long... How long can I live? Uh, how the devil can I answer a silly question like that? I can't die, Elliot. It's... It's Lysha. Lysha? My granddaughter. Oh, Libby's child, Felicity. It's a whole new deal. I'm Charles and she's Lysha. Huh? Whatever you say, uh, Charles. Uh, I'm going to ask that question again. How long? Okay. The general condition you're in right now, you ought to be in a hospital. You could have another heart attack any day. And the next one's pretty sure to be the last. Well? Well, I have to last long enough to make sure Lysha grows up safe. What are you so worried about Lysha for? She has your housekeeper and your other daughters to bring her up. Oh, Ellen is fine, fine. But Sissy and Jane are something else again. Well, what's the matter with them? They're fine, church-going women who, would, who have forgotten, if they ever knew, how to be a child. They're sour as buttermilk. You're too hard on them. Well, yeah, maybe. But in turn, I find them too hard on Lysha. If she were left alone with them... Well, as I say, I'll... I'll just have to make sure she isn't. Oh, it really is too bad, Sissy. Missing lunch. And now the tea is getting cold. Well, why don't we just pour, Jane? I think we will. Where do you suppose he is? I don't know. But didn't he have an appointment with Dr. Farnsworth? Well, that was before lunch. Oh, you don't suppose... Oh, nonsense. If anything had happened, of course, we would have been notified by now. Well... Just the same, he isn't well. Oh, this isn't his physical health I'm beginning to be concerned about. I, I think he's held out surprisingly well after the last attack. Oh, it certainly has surprised me. I thought he'd be gone within a month after Libby. Oh, don't. Don't remind me about her. That's all over and done with, sister. <laughs> she was my sister. And mine. Now, let's put Libby out of our mind. She's gone forever. Our concern now is with Father. What worries me is that he's slipping in his mind. Papa? Yes. All those silly things like changing Felicity's name and allowing her to call him by the name of one of her animals, Mr. Charles, indeed. Well, you know how he is about her. <laughs> yes, indeed. The child can wind him about her little finger, just like her mother. Well, Ellen spoils her, too. Yes. Believe me, when Father dies, she will be the next one to go. Felicity needs a firm hand and plenty of control, which I intend to see that she gets, for everyone's sake. Oh, do you intend to see gets what, Jane? Father, I didn't hear you come in. Well, I'm like the fog. I creep in on little cat feet. The, 
You feel all right? Oh, don't look at me as though I'd flip my wig. A modern expression which means gone out of my mind. Oh, maybe you'd like a little tea, Papa. Oh, Lord, no. Maybe I'll have a drink instead. Now, you know you're not supposed to drink. Mm. Or have any fun at all, eh, Jane? Well, you know my philosophy. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we may die. <laughs> at least I can be merry anyway. Where's Lasha? She's been sent to her room and told to go to bed without supper. Why? Now, you know how often I've spoken to her about tracking mud into the house. Well, she did it again today, and when I scolded her, she was unruly and impolite. And she said it didn't matter what I said, that Mr. Charles was the only one who mattered, and he wouldn't punish her. She really is very rebellious, Papa. Well, you can hardly blame her when she gets so little understanding from either of you. I knew it. Taking her part immediately. It's just like Libby all over again. I'm ready to be your up. I don't want to hear any more. I'm going upstairs to Lysha. I suppose you're going to countermand my orders. She has to get a little love from somebody in the family. Lysha need protection, really? Is what she says true of two strict old ladies, or does she fantasize them as witches? A simple enough situation, perhaps, but as you will see, far from it, as the fuse of Mr. Charles' life burns down to the powder keg of buried emotion. I shall return shortly with Act Two. has been left temporarily to the comforting arms of Ellen, the housekeeper. Mr. Charles sits momentarily exhausted in his great armchair while the pain of the angina recedes from his left arm to a still dull ache in his chest. Another nitroglycerin tablet eases it enough for him to make a phone call for Dr. Farnsworth and now a second call to his lawyer, Mr. Courtley. Arthur, Henry Poindexter. I'm sorry if I'm interrupting your dinner, but this is an emergency. Well, don't ask. Just listen. Did you prepare that codicil for my will? Good. Well, I want you to get it over here to me as fast as you can. I said just listen, damn it. Bring someone, Cora or your secretary, I don't care, as a witness. No, no, no. Dr. Farnsworth will be here and he can be the other. For obvious reasons, not my daughter's or Ellen. Yes, yes, I'm, I'm waiting to make sure of that right now. Uh, pl- please come. It, it, it's an emergency. Uh, just a minute. Uh, who is it? It's Ellen, Mr. Poindexter. Uh, that's Ellen now, Arthur. I'll, I'll see you in a, in a hurry. Come in, Ellen. Uh, close the door and, and come in and sit beside me. Oh, Mr. Poindexter, are you all right? No, Ellen, I'm afraid I'm not. Oh. No, 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 no. The doctor's on his way. Let him see what he can do for this heart of mine. I need you to set my mind at rest. Anything I can do, sir, you know that. First, how is Lysha? 
she's asleep or I wouldn't have left her. I, I got her calmed down some. Mostly it was sheer emotional exhaustion. She's high strung. Like her mother. Well, it, it's that mind of hers. <laughs> you know, it gives me a start sometimes how grown up she is for ten years old. Um, I want you to do something for me. If it's in my power. I want you to be Reich's legal guardian. She's my sole heir. Oh, but what would I have to do? Be responsible for Lysha till she's of age or, or till she gets married. You mean almost like like I was her mother? I mean, I hope exactly like. But what about Miss Jane and Miss Sissy? Oh, they, they'll be well provided for. And they can always make their home here. Yeah, I want to, Mr. Poindexter, but sure, I don't know what Dennis would have to say. Eh? Yeah. Dennis? Oh, he's my... my intended life. Oh. oh, we've been going together ever since... well, for, for about a year now. We're going to be married in a couple of years when he retires from the force. The force? Oh, he's with the police. Plain clothes. Oh, you might remember him when he was here in connection with... Oh. When, when Miss Libby and Mr. George had their accident. Uh. Uh, Sergeant Dennis Mullaney. Uh, yes, I think I do. Well, why can't you be married, Helen? Maybe you could take Lysha to live with you. There'd be plenty of money. Oh, it isn't that. It's... Uh, that'll be the doctor or my lawyer. One or the other had better get here soon. I'll go and get the door. No, no. Let someone else. Helen, I, I have nowhere else to turn. I'm going to name you anyway. No. Mr. Charles, oh, Granddaddy, Mr. Charles. Oh, no, no, no. Now, little one, you know I promised you Mr. Charles would always be around. Oh, you have that paper ebook again. My father's right inside, Dr. Pontius. I have well, no idea. Thank you, Miss Poindexter. Uh, hello, Ellen, Lysha, Henry. Uh, now, I want all the rest of you out of here, pronto. No, no, don't take him away. Oh, come along, dear. Let the doctor help him. Don't leave me alone. Now, Lysha, that's quite enough. If you leave me alone with them, they'll kill me, Mr. Charles. Miss Felicity. <sighs> Looks as though I may have another patient. Uh, but you first, Henry. <laughs> no, don't worry, Elliot. I won't be leaving this veil of tears yet. Oh, not until I've signed my will. Anyway... Thank you all for coming to pay your respects. The funeral will be tomorrow morning, 11 o'clock, at St. Andrew's Cathedral. Oh, thank heavens. I hope that's the last of them, Helen. Oh, Mr. Poindexter had, had so many friends. Yes. My father was somebody. But what are you doing downstairs? Why aren't you up with Miss Felicity? Well, I, I was looking for her. I, I was out of the room a moment and she disappeared on now me. Now, look, you were told to stay with her. Mr. Courtley is waiting in the library for the reading of the will. Go and ask Miss Sissy to come down there and then find Felicity and see she stays put. Yes, ma'am. I'll take care of it. And I'll take care of you, Ellen. Just as soon as the funeral is over, out you go. Good afternoon, Mr. Courtley. Miss Poitexter. My sister will be right down, and we can get this ridiculous formality over with. I think under the circumstances that Miss Gardner and Lysha should be here, too. Who? Well, I mean Felicity and Ellen. Under what circumstances? They are both uh, principals. Ellen? My father made her a legatee. Not precisely, but she must be here. I don't understand, but, but I see no reason for a child of tend to be involved. Well, since Felicity is a minor and her interests will be represented, uh, perhaps we can dispense with her. From your attitude, perhaps you'd like to dispense with me and my sister also. I think at least one of you should be here. Absolutely inexcusable. I can't believe what I've heard. To be left practically unwelcome guests in our own house. 
at the whim of our former housekeeper. You know, as far as I'm concerned, you're more than welcome. Oh, thank you for your generosity. But will we be received with joyful open arms by our niece? Oh, sure you will, ma'am. Now, you give me the chance. I'll bring her around. <laughs> You can't be seriously considering fostering this madness, accepting the terms of this will. He must have been out of his mind. I assure you he was not. In no sense. I have affidavits from Dr. Farnsworth and two psychiatrists your father insisted on having examined him uh, the day before this will was signed and witnessed. You mean there's nothing I can do about this? In my legal and personal opinion, not a thing. That's something which we shall see about. Well, Ellen... It looks as though you're going to have a rocky time. If there's any way I can help you. Oh, I'll manage. And I'll have to talk to you later, Mr. Courtley. Right at the moment, if you'll excuse me. It's Lysha I'm worried about. I, I don't know where she's got to, and she's that upset I've got to find her. I'll walk out with you. You know, this is a tremendous responsibility that's been thrust on you. I think if you have a lawyer or some friend that's close, perhaps you ought to talk it over I with... will, but wait a minute. Yes, Mr. Charles. I hear you. I knew you wouldn't leave me. Mr. Charles. It's what she's taken to call on her grandfather. Oh, the Lord take us. She's even talking to the corpse. Of course I won't cry anymore. Now I... I promise. Yes. I understand. What? Oh, I see. Well... Goodbye for now. Lysha. Child, what are you doing in here? Just talking to Mr. Charles. Oh, now, come away, dear. This is no place for a little girl. It's all right. I don't have to cry anymore now. What do you mean, now? I mean, now that I know Mr. Charles hasn't really gone away. He just talked to me and told me I shouldn't be afraid. Would you excuse me, please? I have to go upstairs to my room and think about all the things he told me. Is that child all right? I don't know. The three people she loved most in the world taken away from her in less than a year. I'm not wise enough to know what that might do to the mind of a child, especially one as sensitive as her. What is it, Dennis? You're not eating your dinner. Oh, I'm sorry. It's just... There's so much on my mind. Well, I thought we were after settling that. I mean, you being guardian and all. I told you, it's all right with me. I know, Denny. It's sweet you were about it, too. Isn't that worrying me for the moment? Well, what then, sweetie? Well, I, I don't even know if I should be away from her tonight. Well, sure, it's your regular day off, isn't oh, it? Oh, yes, but... I don't know if I should have left Lysha alone. Yes, Mr. Charles. I understand. No, I'm not scared. I'll do just what you tell me. Yes? I know just where to get it. And do what? Oh, sure, that's easy. But what about Auntie Jane? Okay, just like you say. One thing at a time. Goodbye, Mr. Charles. I love you, too. That nice cup of chocolate I promised you before you went to bed. Thank you, Aunt Sissy. Did you bring one for yourself, too? Oh, yes. We can have a little party. There, now that's yours. And I'll put mine on the table beside it. I don't really like chocolate all that much. Oh, now you have to drink it. Could you get Mr. Charles for me? Mr. Charles? Oh, oh, I didn't mean Grandfather. He's passed on now. I mean the other Mr. Charles. I left him in the bathroom. Oh, oh, of course, dear. Your big woolly panda. I'll get him right away. Only he's not. I'm talking to you, Mr. Charles. 
I'm real, Mr. Charles. I'm doing what you said now. There we are. Mr. Charles in person. You suppose he'd like some nice hot chocolate, too? He doesn't like it much either. Oh, well then, let's just show him how good it is. Hey, you drink it all down, dear. I, I made it specially for you. You drink all yours, and I'll drink all mine. It's a deal. Well, Sissy, did you have your chocolate with Felicity? Yes. How does it go? Well, I can't believe it. It's no problem at all. I'm so relieved. Oh, yes. I'm glad Ellen's night out gave us the chance. Maybe we're getting somewhere with Felicity after all. Wouldn't that be nice? It would solve everything. Ellen! Ellen, for God's sake, Ellen! Yes, yes, well, what is it, Miss Jane? It's Sissy, it's my sister. Call Dr. Bonsworth. At six in the morning. I don't care if it's the middle of the night. Get him here, get the hospital, get someone. I think she's dead. <laughs> Now, what is going on at Lakeview House? What hallucinations can a child of ten have? How real and sharp can they be? How terrible might their power of suggestion be? If Mr. Charles is a real ghost, or only a figment of the imagination, could a child be responsible for someone's death? I'll return shortly with Act Three. bedroom, Sissy Poindexter lies dead. Lysha has been mercifully packed off to school as usual to protect her, however briefly, from this new shock. And among the unexpected visitors at the house are Sergeant Dennis Mullane and, of course, Dr. Farnsworth. Well, Doctor? No question, Miss Jane, as to the cause of death. Cardiac failure. But that's impossible. It's been a long time since I examined either of you. I think perhaps I should do an autopsy, if you'll give me permission. No. Why not? I will not have the body of my sister desecrated. It might help to know why she had cardiac failure. How? Will it bring her back? No. No, let well enough alone, Dr. Farnsworth. This family has a curse on it. Leave us to handle it in our own way. Now, uh, why do you suppose she's all that vehement about it? Who are you? Oh, I'm sorry, Sergeant Dennis Mullane, you remember we met on the sad occasion of the drowning of Miss Poindexter's young sister, little Elijah's mother, and her father, and that Ellen and me are engaged to be married. Mm, of course, yes. What are you doing here today? Well, like I say, Ellen and I are engaged, so naturally I had a particular interest. And then again, are you hinting at anything? I don't know. Why should you want an autopsy? I can give you the same answer. I don't know, for sure. Are you going to issue a death certificate without one? I reckon. No real reason why I shouldn't. Could you hold it off till tomorrow? I don't know if I want to. Why should I? Well, let's be frank, Doctor. For whatever our own reasons, we both think there's more here than meets the eye. I need a little time to trace a couple of things. I'm going to sign the death certificate. Heart failure. It happens, even as early as 50. You got any more to say? Yeah. Let it go till tomorrow. You can sign it then. There's nothing to lose. But you're not like yourself at all, Denny. I, I don't know why you have to ask all these questions. Sure, it's only to protect us all. So what about that bottle? Well, it was only a prescription the doctor gave to be filled for Mr. Poindexter. Was it digitalis? Or something like that. Uh, just before he died, he'd gotten a whole new bottle of pills? Yes, I, I picked them up myself. Mm, and after he died, wasn't the bottle still there? Of course. When I cleaned up his room, I put it in the drawer by the bed. Is it there now? I suppose. Well, it's not. It's here. You took it from the drawer. I did not. I found it in the pocket of Miss Cicely Poindexter's dressing gown. What 
What did we do in there? Well, now, that's what I asked myself. Since it's empty. Did you know that digitalis in an overdose is a fatal poison for anyone? Heart case or no? No. And didn't you tell me that Miss Sissy and the little girl had chocolate together last night? Didn't she tell you that? Yes. The pills would dissolve very easily in a hot drink. And they'd have no taste. Not in chocolate, anyway. Sweet Mary herself, what are you trying to say? That Lysha might have had something to do with it? A childless hen? I, I'll not believe such a thing of my little Lysha. Well, I don't want to either, Ellen. If Miss Sissy didn't die of natural causes. And before any of us can be really happy and free again, we're going to have to pin down just how she did die. Well, what are you going to do? I'm going to go right out on a limb the way I should have a year ago. I'm going to get enough equipment to drag the lake. Yes, Mr. Charles. I understand. No, I'm not worried. I guess if it hadn't been Aunt Sissy, it might have been me. But who should I tell? Okie Smokey. I'll just hang tight till you get back to me. Oh, there you are, Felicity, dear. I was looking for you. What for? Why, Ellen has to drive in and do some shopping, and she thought perhaps you'd like to ride with her. That's funny. What is, dear? Ellen just told me she was going to have a bit of a lie-down. A what? A lie-down. That's what she says when she means a nap. Oh, well, she's changed her mind. She's down in the car in the small garage. She was just starting it up, and I was telling her some last-minute things, and all of a sudden, she thought you might like to go along. Oh, I would. Well, then, let's go down to her. I have something else to arrange. Is it just to pull this farm? Oh, no. You'll be going further than that. Quite a long way, in fact. I don't care. I don't care if we never get back. Such a nice thing to say, Felicity. And you know something? What? Neither do I. She shouldn't let the car run with the garage door closed. At school, in safety first, they told us it's dangerous. There's a gas that could kill a person. Why? The things they teach you at school nowadays. But they're perfectly correct, Felicity. It's exactly what it's going to do. You push me! You say my name! Don't worry. Soon it won't hurt at all. Nothing will hurt you anymore, Felicity. Going somewhere, Ellen? Oh, Miss Poindexter. Well, yes, I, I just wanted to see if Lysha was all right. Well, you won't have to worry about Felicity or Lysha, as you call her, anymore. What do you mean? I, I'd better go to her. I know. It's too soon. <gasps> That's a pistol. That's just what it is. And pointed at you, Ellen. Oh, what for? Oh, don't be alarmed. As long as you do, as you're told. You see, you're not mistress of this house. No matter what the will said, I am. So back up. Into the room. And sit down. I, I don't understand. And while we're waiting, I'll try to make it all quite clear. Ma make what clear? What we're waiting for, of course. Miss Jane, you really... Shh. Quite still. And don't think I'll be afraid to shoot. I have before, you know. When I killed Felicity's mother, Libby, with this gun. And her weakling of a husband. Oh, killed them? But, but they were drowned in an accident. Yes, that's what everyone thought. Just as I told Sissy we could make them think. You remember that day, don't you? Oh, I'll never forget it. I was away with Lysha at dancing school when we heard... Quite right. Father was in bed with his first heart attack. And I just found out about his will. Oh, it didn't surprise me that Libby was to get almost everything. She was always the favorite. From the time she was a baby, Libby was the center of everything. Libby always came for... Oh, Miss Jane, don't do this to yourself. Don't... Shut up. Now, you listen to me if no one else will. And it came to the point. <laughs> I couldn't stand it anymore. It was all so easy. <laughs> two shots. George and Libby even had the sails up. Two shots. Two shots was all I needed. It was to help stay off. And the wind was blowing offshore, away from the house. I locked them in the cabin. I lashed the tiller and shoved them off. There was a nice quartering wind to carry them on a reach straight out to the middle of the lake where they sank 
without a trace. Because before I shoved them off, I'd taken care to remove the bilge drain plug. Her gunners were awash within a quarter of a mile, and she went down like a stone to bury Bolton and them under 30 feet of mud and silt on the bottom of the lake. <laughs> a perfect murder. Oh, dear Lord. But it was all for nothing. <laughs> Felicity just took Libby's place in father's love. So, when the will cut us out again, she had to go. You tried to to do away with... Yes. Oh, it should have been so simple. All the rest of father's pills and a cup of chocolate. Oh, but I should never have allowed Sissy to handle it. She's always bungled everything clumsy, little fool. She must have mixed up the cups. And... And it wasn't a heart attack. You... Where's Lysa now? Well, what have you done to her? I haven't done anything. Carbon monoxide will do that for me. I, I don't understand. She's locked in your little garage. The connecting door to the house needs a key. The overhead door is far too heavy for her to lift. And the car is running. Oh, mother of God, don't look so stricken, Ellen. A very gentle way to die. Come on, you old door. I can't. I can't open it. Oh, Mr. Charles, where are you when I need you? Now, 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 don't get panicky, Elisha. You know I'm always around. It came awfully hard to breathe. And I feel so sleepy. We'll soon fix that. The way we did before. You mean when I switched the chocolate cup? Something like that. Now, think. You remember the day we came back from the zoo and I forgot my house keys so we couldn't get through the garage door to the house? Yes. Oh, yes. The extra key under the doorknob. That's right. Take that and open the door, and then be sure to close it tight behind you. I will, Mr. Charles. You're going to hide till Aunt Jane comes down here. And as soon as she does, you go let Ellen out of her bedroom, and the two of you take my car and run for your lives. <laughs> Lysha? Shh. How did you escape? With the key. Mr. Charles told me where to find it. And he said we should take his car and run. Oh, that's just what we're going to do. Your Aunt Jane is a raven lunatic, and she has a pistol into the bargain. Felicity. Felicity. <laughs> if she could hear me. But where is she? Not in this corner. Under the car. No. She couldn't have escaped. What's that? Who shut the door? Got to get the key. Open the door. No! Oh, it isn't there. Open, 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 open the overhead door. He's on bunch. What's the matter? Someone, someone's holding it outside. Do the gun. Take it. I can't see. No! The shadow. No, no, no. Help me. Help me. No one to help you now. You brought it on yourself. 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 Poetic justice? Certainly. Probably there was no other way Jane Poindexter could have been brought to book. There was small chance of Libby and the boat ever being found, and what proof 
was there that the Digitalis had ever been in the cocoa cup since Sissy was careful to wash them both out. As for the rest, it would only have been Ellen's word against Jane, which leaves only a couple of questions that I'll try to answer when I return. What happens to you at ten can color your life. But a child also has amazing recuperative powers and the capacity to forget. Growing up as Dennis and Ellen's child, for they adopted her as soon as they were married, there were too many sunny days in Lysha's life for any dark corners to remain. One thing she never did forget, and that was her beloved Mr. Charles. As for Mr. Charles... Was he only an echo of the common sense he had taught his granddaughter? Or was he a real and most providential ghost? Our cast included Beatrice Strait, Hetty Galen, Bryna Rayburn, Court Benson, and Gilbert Mack. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Now, a preview of our next tale. I would have to make an investment. Would it be a wise investment? Yes, I think so. Why don't you do it? I can't. I don't have the money. Paul, is it a lot of money? Well, it is to me. I don't have it. Darling, we will have lunch together tomorrow. How much money? Ten thousand dollars. Ten thousand? Well, it's a it's for an initial start up expense. Paul, I have ten thousand dollars. Oh, no, I wouldn't touch your money. My money? Paul, there's nothing I own that that isn't yours. But I couldn't... You're not used to sharing with another person either. But I could lose this money. Take me out for breakfast and we'll go to the bank. But... I don't want to hear another word. Just tell me you love me. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. like a woman, Abigail. And what does that mean? Well, it it shows that no matter how intelligent a woman may be, in the end she has certain weaknesses that, that, well, there is no such thing as a ghost. What's that? Oh, tell me there's no such thing as a ghost. Well, uh... uh, Well, what, John? uh, Are you about to start talking like a woman? Our mystery drama, Ghost Powder, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Marion Seldes and Michael Wager.
If you were to say to John Adams, you can't tell the players without a scorecard, naturally, this great American wouldn't know what you mean. But if somehow you could explain it, he would fix you with that level, steadfast look of his and say that you couldn't tell the players even with a scorecard. Here was John Adams in 1784 getting more flack from our recent French ally than from our former English enemy. Here he was, ambassador to Paris from the United States, and nobody really quite knew just what the United States was or were. His colleagues, Franklin and Jefferson, were great men, as we all know, but very difficult to live with. His wife, Abigail, insisted that she couldn't run the embassy properly on his meager salary. And when he asked the Congress for more money, their answer was to cut his wages. In addition, their rented chateau, a place called Auteuil, was haunted by a ghost. But, oh, he swears he heard him. Which one is Henri, Abigail? Henri is the one who cleans the floors. When did anyone ever clean the floors in this place? Well, Henri does the best he can. It isn't good enough. Now, dear, about the ghost. There is no such thing as a ghost. Let us discuss this rationally. How can you possibly discuss a thing like a ghost? Rationally, it's a contradiction in terms. John, you simply cannot close your mind. Are you telling me you actually believe I am that... telling you what Henri said. I see. An illiterate French peasant has suddenly become a respected authority on the supernatural. Why don't you talk to him? How can I speak to him? I don't speak his language. Ah, but he speaks yours. I noticed that. You noticed what? The aha, he speaks yours. The ah of reproach. See how this humble, uneducated man takes the trouble to learn your language while you will not bother to learn his. That isn't what I meant to say. But now that I hear it stated, I must say I agree with it. I am far too busy to study this, this exercise in nasality. But darling, you are the ambassador. Not exactly. I am the minister plenipotentiary. And Mr. Benjamin Franklin is the ambassador. Well, actually, Mr. Franklin is the ambassador emeritus. I wish Mr. Franklin would go home to Philadelphia, where I understand he is worshipped. Mr. Franklin is coming to dinner. Oh, no. <laughs> Why are you so stuffy this afternoon, John? It's so unlike you. I've been away from Boston too long. Now, about Henri and his ghost. I don't wish to talk about Henri and his ghost. What is there that I can say to this superstitious servant who... Why don't you listen to him first? Monsieur Adams, I have heard him. How do you know it's him? He's a voice of a him. And what does he say? He says nothing. Well, well, this is a fuss over nothing. John. Well, how can he hear him if he says nothing? He says something, but I do not understand him. Uh, does he speak French? Francais, no. Does he speak English? Anglais, no. Then... What does he speak? He speaks... He speaks ghost. Ghost? Yes, ghost language. Oh, that's a ghost language. Oh, yes, Monsieur Adams. What is this ghost language? And where do you hear this alleged language? Oh, I hear him all over. But where? Particularly in, in the library, in the bedrooms, and all over. How can I get rid of a ghost? You must call in a witch. A witch? Yes. The witch comes in and says a charm, and the, and the ghost runs away. Why? Because the ghost is frightened. Oh, now look, my good man. There is no such thing as a ghost, and I think you had better get back to work. My uncle, he says the same thing. And one morning he is found. If 
you spent more time getting the place clean as you are paid to do instead of weaving these impossible fables about ghosts. Oh, really, I... the master will give this matter his full consideration and we shall rid the house of the ghost. Uh, thank you, madam. And you may finish cleaning the floor. Uh, I, I go, madam. Now, happy Gale. I do not relish being called the master as if I were some feudal aristocrat. No, oh, but your dear friend Tom Jefferson is a feudal aristocrat back home, and he is called master by hundreds of slaves. We are not discussing Tom Jefferson. We are discussing a matter of gross superstition. Why must I indulge him in this superstitious nonsense? To make my life easier. What does this have to do with you? One day, my dear, there will be another revolution. A revolution of the women. Oh, what on earth do women have to revolt about? It will come in a far away future. I shall not live to see it. My dear, I do wish you would stay to the subject. Although you change it so many times, I confess I, I am at a loss to know where exactly we are. Call in a witch and have this demon, this ghost. This Figment of all these imagination. Well, whatever it is, properly exercise from the premises. My dear, it does the lower elements no good to reinforce their superstition. Perhaps not, but it will do me good. All these story has infected the entire staff. I want you to go along with this mumbo jumbo before they all run away. Oh, let them. We can hire others. No one will want to work here. Oh, please, John. Hire a witch. Do, do you realize what would happen if, if a word of this reached home? I'd be, I'd be the laughing stock of the country. A thing could be done for a single silver franc. Jefferson. What will Jefferson say? I will tell Henri to find a witch and have her here tomorrow. I forbid it. John, I cannot maintain this house without servants. I can't entertain at official dinners, and I insist... I will not reinforce the dark ignorance of the human race. John, please. I have nothing more to say. This is a matter of housekeeping. It doesn't concern you. Whatever lessens the dignity and the sanity of the human race concerns me. You're not making a speech before the Congress. Oh, I I'm, I'm sorry, John. I, I just realized how I sound. Um, well... I realize how I must have sounded. Good. Let's compromise. And call in a witch. No, I cannot permit it. Do you understand? I can no longer be mistress of this embassy. Yes, I realize that, and therefore I shall resign the post. John, this is... This is an impasse, my dear. Each of us is standing on a principle. But you can choose to resign. But I cannot choose to be party to the dark barbarism of the Middle Ages. I cannot sanction witchcraft. Well, the truth of the matter is the French do not wish for us to sign a treaty with England. John, come to bed. And neither Franklin nor Jefferson can see it. Had enough politics for one night. But uh, Franklin to bed. Can't we talk about it in the oh, morning? Jefferson is so grateful to France. John, I'm Why? very sleepy. Tom, understand that we did more for France than France did for us. One day, everyone will understand it. But tonight, France and my... England are mortal enemies. Our independence is a body blow to England. Why do you and Franklin and Jefferson argue so ceaselessly? Each of you has already stated his position. I intend to go back to Boston. Yes, dear. Retire from political life. Of course. Enter the farm. That would be nice. Practice a little law. Certainly. You don't believe what I'm saying. <laughs> Not a word of it. Yes? Madame? What is it, Pauline? Uh, Madame, I, I am frightened. Of what? The ghost. Which ghost? Oh, I would assume it's the same one. Oh, now somebody has to put his foot down. John. Young woman. Monsieur. There is no such thing as a ghost. Oh, monsieur. One does not make the joke about, about the ghost. It is silly, nonsensical, superstition, and I have had quite enough. Now, as master of this house... 
I order you to get to your bed and have yourself a full night's sleep in order that you may be fit for your duties in the morning. Is that understood? But, Monsieur... That will be all. Good night. Not another word. You may leave. You have just transformed a problem into a disaster. You told me these people were pests. And so I thought I would speak like a master. They can't accept you as a master. They can't? Why not? Well, it, it, it has to do with the customs of the country. I am becoming rather satiated with the customs of this country. You do not behave like the master of a chateau. But how do the master... Well, a true gentleman of the blood would have, in addition to his wife, a mistress. I'm not old enough. Perhaps. When I reach Mr. Franklin's age. Oh, John. Tomorrow morning, please hire a witch. You don't hear it? Yes, yes I, I think so. Well, is it your imagination, too? No. What? What is it? It's a... Uh, it's a... Uh, that's it's, uh, a ghost. No, have it. I know there's no such thing as a ghost, but what do you call that? Well, John, I remember my grandfather and my aunt. They'd tell us children's stories about... A John, I'm frightened. Oh, dear, Abby, it's it, 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 impossible. A gloomy, frightening house. Who knows what crimes may have been committed here? Abigail, there... No, no, thing is a ghost. Then why is your hand shaking... Quiet. Look 
I go see. Oh! 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 Just lie quietly, my dear. You have a rather large bump on your head. What? What happened? I, I don't know. I found you lying on the floor in the hallway. The servants helped me to put you to bed. The servants? Especially Henri. Everyone's anxious to know what Monsieur Adam, the ghost, now. I remember. I, I heard that noise and then somebody screamed. That was Pauline. She heard the ghost, and she was frightened. I ran into the hallway. Something hit me on the head. Who? Oh. It didn't have to be a who. It could have been a... a... Well, I, I could have run into that low ceiling being near the stairwell. Something was making that noise. Oh, John. May we have only call in a witch? Abby, I... Dear, what harm can it do? If there's no such thing as a ghost, then all we've lost is a single silver franc... But if there is now, please, John, it's the only way that I'll be able to keep the servant. Oh, right. But no one must know. I'll be silent. Silent as the grave. That is hardly a fortunate figure of speech. John, this is Madame Pinepesta. Monsieur. How you do? And, uh, you are purported to be a witch? Purported? What does monsieur mean, purported? I am a witch. Well, I, I, I mean... Monsieur is a politician. I am a witch. Whose profession is older and more honorable. Well... What can you do for us, Madame Pinipes? The noise you hear is the Duke Dormont. How do you know? He was strangled in the chateau. Why? It was 200 years ago. He was the Queen's lover. She came to visit him here. They were betrayed. These things happen. But if he's dead... What uh... can I say, monsieur? We are told that those who are killed for love never really die. Ah, so he wanders about the chateau, does he? Yes, monsieur. Wandering and wailing for his lost love. And how do you propose to dispose of him? That, monsieur, is my own secret. There are tricks to every trade. I do not ask how you employ yours. Accord me the similar courtesy. Ah, Count of uh, Madame uh, said to wait for you here, Monsieur Adam. Welcome, Your Excellency, to what? Do I owe the honor of this visit? Monsieur... I think we might discuss your rental of several French frigates of war. Your Excellency, we have no need ah, of... Ah, but you have no navy to speak of at present. And the Algerine pirates? Oh, well, yes, we... We do have trouble with the pirates on the Barbary Coast. And uh, since the building of a battle fleet is, of course... Prohibitively expensive. We are aware of the problems involved. It will be difficult to raise funds through taxation. Your countrymen uh, cannot seem to agree on the necessity to tax Virginia planters and Pennsylvania farmers in order to protect the interests of New England merchants. Sir, this is our internal affair. Naturally. Besides, we have other sources of revenue. Have you? I, um, I am given to understand that the Prussian loan is encountering difficulties. Do you, sir? It is common knowledge. Well, I must be going. Good day, monsieur. Such lovely weather. Yes. Thank you. Good 
gone. Tom Jefferson is in the library. Good, we have business. But you and I and Nabby and Colonel Smith were to go riding this afternoon. And John, he wants to marry her. I, Mr. Tom Jefferson, and I reached a meeting of the minds. John, I said... Colonel Smith wants to marry your daughter. Later. No, they don't want to wait. Do you know what Tom Jefferson is doing? He is selling us out to France. John, it's, it's impossible. Oh, defending. Go, truly defending I Tom Jefferson. I disagree completely with his manners, his morals, his philosophy. But I like and I believe he's sincere. Abigail, he has become a creature of the French and I can prove it. Well, John, why did you want to see me? Tom, we must have this out. Hmm? What? Well, George Washington won't live forever. Hamilton, too unpopular, personally. Hancock, they... Thinking nobody really thinks they have enough. Enough of what? Burrs, burrs were slippery. What is... All this, John. This is the talk that's going on at home. This is how people are thinking and speculating. It's going to come down to a fight between you and me. What kind of a fight? Power. Who is going finally to rule our country? I never thought much about it one way or the other. You want the truth, John. I think you're more qualified. You do a better job of it. Maybe you think that, but your friends, your federalist friends, won't let you think that way forever. They'll let you on for their own purposes. Don't you have the same kind of friends that I do, John? Yes, and all with access to grind. And I shall be the victim of my friends, too. And it has to be this way, Tom. Why? You and I. We are on opposite sides of every question. One of us has to prevail. Maybe not. Maybe the people will split the differences between us. Uh, maybe they will. But still, we have to fight it out. We can fight as friends, John. No. You have already betrayed me and the country. Uh, be careful what you're saying, John. Oh, stop talking like a southern aristocrat. What do you propose to do? Challenge me? How dare you accuse me of betrayal? You and I were sitting in this room night before last. We spoke to the progress of the Prussian negotiations. Yes. I had confidential information that things were going badly. You and I were the only ones in the city of Paris who knew it all. So I thought. This morning, the Count de Verdun tried to use that fact to strengthen France's bargaining position. Well, what does that have to do with me? Well, if you didn't tell him, who did? Ben Franklin was also in the room. When I read the dispatches from Prussia, Ben Franklin had fallen asleep. Oh, what makes you think I told their shame? Your friendship for France is notorious. I am grateful to France by helping us overthrow the British yoke. Would you have us exchange the British yoke for one made in Paris? I am here to represent the interests of my country. You were the only one who could have told us then. But I didn't do it. On my word of honor. What am I saying? Why am I trying to insist on something that should be beyond question? My integrity. How dare Tom? We worked on the Declaration of Independence together. How could you even accuse me? Tom, I'm sorry. I I don't know what to think. Some someone is betraying our secrets. Does anyone else know? No one. Are you sure? Can you swear that not one other single solitary soul? Well, yes, I can swear. Well, will what? Abigail, Max. Abigail? Well, I have no secrets from Abigail. But these are matters of government secrets. I know, but Abby is my counselor. Abby is... Only a woman. Only a woman. Yes, but I share everything with her. Is it possible? No, I, I can't say it. Abby could never. Can you forgive me, Tom? Well, I'll well, have to. I'm sure I'll be forced to think, to say certain things in the future for which you'll have to forgive me. 
But how could Virgin have found out? I don't know. Unless the walls have ears. No, that's impossible, John. Who can say, John? After all, these are French walls. John. Oh, did, did I wake you, my dear? Oh, you know I always wait up for you. How was your day? Well, Tom Jefferson and I will somehow manage to live as friendly rivals. The British are impossible. French are unreasonable. They are unmovable. The Prussians are inscrutable. How was your day? Well, we got through it somehow. Has our sorceress managed to exercise the ghost? So far, the staff seems quiet. And could have told her then. Perhaps the courier. Oh, no. I would stake my life on his loyalty. Well, it's a problem we should sleep on. After all, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. I agree. I thought our witch took care of all of that. Something. Uh, Someone uh, struck her down. Have the servants fetch water and bandages. You won't get any servants to come into this room. I'll go myself. Help me. Help me. No, no. Now, just try to be quiet, madam. It's true. It's true. What? What? What is true? There is. I never believed. But. But there is. Such a thing. Because. I saw him. I saw you. You saw him. The ghost. The ghost. Madam. Uh, Madam Pinipas, speak to me. Speak. Say something. Ma- Madam. Uh. That's twice the ghost or whatever has struck. But this blow appears to be fatal. Is it a ghost? Well, we have the word of perhaps a foremost authority, a witch. Who would know more about the subject? You'll get to know a great deal more when I return in just a few moments with Act Three. again, what is so clear in the bright daylight becomes shadowy and blurred in the dim rays of the moon. Madame Pinipet, a sorceress, who has been employed by the Adamses to exercise a ghost, obviously has been exercised herself. And this is no time to ask John and Abigail if they really do believe in ghosts. He is dead, John. Yes. But how? How did she die? Well, I, she... I, I saw her lying on the floor, but I assumed she'd been struck down, but... I, I know there isn't a single mark of violence. Then how did she die? Someone. Something must... Now, we heard her scream. We both heard her. And what was she muttering when we came in here? The ghost. The ghost. Yes, and something else. There is such a thing as a ghost. That's what she said. You see, she never really believed in it herself. To her, it was just a way of making money. But then at the very end, she saw a ghost and it killed her. She... Oh. Well, she may have died of fright. Look, look at the absolutely terrified expression on her face. Have you ever seen such horror on a human countenance? I see it. But I don't believe it killed her. 
Why not? Because she didn't really believe in ghosts. She wasn't an ignorant, superstitious person. Neither are you, neither am I, but we've been having our doubts lately. And what is this? It's been clutched in her hand. Piece of cloth. It must be a ghostly vestment, part of the shroud worn by the unfortunate late Duke de Ormond. No, 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 not this. Look, it, it, it's muslin cloth. But ghosts do wear shrouds of muslin, don't they? John, this cloth is fresh. No. That proves that she was attacked, and she tried to fight. We had better call the authorities. <laughs> And uh, for what purpose had you employed this woman? We, uh, well, uh, we were having trouble with a ghost, Monsieur Commissioner. Ah, so, uh, make a note of that, Sergeant. The house is haunted, then? It would appear to be. If the ghost killed her... <laughs> if the ghost killed her... Oh, surely, Monsieur, you cannot believe in ghosts. Adams, I have an open mind on the subject. But such a thing, it's, it's not. It's not what? Possible? Yes. You and Madame say you heard the thing yourself. Well, we may have heard the wind whistling through the chimney. Surely, Monsieur Commissioner, you were uh, a man like yourself. You cannot believe in ghosts. Monsieur, as a police officer, I must adhere to the facts. And these are the only facts we have. Well, then, at the present, what do you propose to do? Nothing. A, a woman has been murdered. Uh, the physician who examined her could find no mark or sign of violence. But something must be done. I ask you, monsieur, what? If the deed was committed by a ghost, how do we proceed against him? But, monsieur... There is a more convenient explanation. Convenient? Well, perhaps uh, satisfactory. The woman was over 80. It is entirely possible she died of old age. Yes, that would satisfy everyone. Uh, Sergeant, write that she died of old age. The most respectable killer of all. <laughs> My dear, we must have a talk. Yeah. A confidential talk. No way. There is a ghost. Oh, no, 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 Abigail, not you. And I can prove it. Oh, oh please explain it before we catch our death. John, I want you to make up the most far-fetched story you can think of. Why? About politics. And tell it to me in the library. Oh, I don't understand. The more impossible, the better. But why? John... I'm afraid if I tell you, you won't do it. But you'll have to tell me eventually. I won't have to tell you. Then how will I ever know? Oh, you'll find out. Now, please, let's go back to the library, and you must tell me the story with a straight face in the utmost confidence. It must be a very serious matter. You must play your part to perfection. My dear, I, I, I'm not... I'm acting. No, but you're something even better. You are a lawyer. Abigail, uh, b b b b this is incredible. Really? Yes, this message I have just received from St. Petersburg. Really, my dear? Yes, from Count Ramunsev, a confidential minister to the court. But what have we to do with the Russians? Well, the Count believes our two countries have great deal in common. I can't imagine what. Well, no, the Russians are established on the western end of our continent. We may one day become very close neighbors. We share a, a common border. I hadn't thought of that. France, as you know, holds extensive territories to the south, and they fear she will try to expand. Oh? Yes, and, 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 and the Russians 
would rather have us for a neighbor than the French. Well, that makes considerable common sense. And so they are willing to lend us money to aid in our expansion, provided... Provided? Uh, 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 provided we break off all relations with the French. Oh, I see. A Russian alliance. Ah, what an interesting possibility. Tom, oh, you, your early dinner isn't for an hour yet. You needn't expect me to dine in this house. Tom, now, now what is it? You accused me of selling out to France. And all the time you were scheming to betray us to Russia. Me? You needn't look so innocent. I've been told that you're in correspondence with the court at St. Petersburg. For what purpose? How can you ally us to the most... the most tyrannical ruler in Europe? Who, who told you I was in correspondence with the Russians? With a... a confidential source, the Count de Vilzen. How did you know? I shall explain it at dinner. <laughs> say this ghost or whatever overhears our conversation and reports it to the Verger. <laughs> that is our ghost. That sound? Where is it coming from? The library. And well, there he goes now. Where? Obviously he's leaving the house. Well, let us settle this thing, John. No, let me go first. Oh, no. Oh, no danger. I shall have to scout gentlemen to protect me. Now, let me open the door. Hand me the candelabra. Now. Look. Where? Just to the right of the fireplace, you see? On the floor. Foot, footprints. Yes. Those are footprints. Outlined in white powder. Yes. A lady's face powder. <gasps> Cornstarch powder. I sprinkled some on the floor. Someone seems to walk out of the wall. That wall, it must have a false entrance or a hidden panel. We should be in no trouble finding it. Now, now that we know what to look for, uh, there must be a hidden release. Here, tap against every part of the wall. That's it. Keep tapping all over. Wow. Oh, we found it. Oh, look. Look, the center panel is opening. Listen. The ghost noise. Can't be a ghost inside. Or can there? It's a long long passage where I feel the breeze. That's what it is, John. The breeze. The breeze whistling through the passageway when the panel is open. That's what makes the noise. Are you sure, Tom? The Polish panel is closed. You see? The air is no longer rushing along in the passage. Then the noise is created when, when the ghost or whoever... Enters and leaves. And that's why Madame Pinipesa was frightened to death. She encountered him. <laughs> it is the Duc de Omar wandering about his ancestral home. Or is it a spy who reports all our conversations to the Duc de Gavlin? Tom, shall you help me find out? Gladly. But how? The ghost is on his way, obviously, to report to the Count that you and I have had a serious difference of opinion. Let us retire to the dining room and finish our dinner. Give him an opportunity to return tomorrow for his regular evening spy work. It is no secret. What is no secret, Count Razen? That your country's existence is threatened by factional strife. Factional strife may be a sign of vigorous national health. Oh, my dear Adams. Now, suppose France supports your side. My side. Suppose we give you money, even troops, in the event of civil war. Assuming 
All you say is true. Why support me? We would support a solid, uh, conservative person such as yourself. Do I make myself clear? I must say, sir, you seem to have a most incisive grasp of the situation. We have excellent sources of information. So I see. A word to the wise. Consider it. Indeed, sir. I shall. I fear, Mr. Jefferson, that further discussion between us is pointless. I shall write to the Congress. They must choose between you and me. Oh, I shall write in the same manner. I have no intention of listening to further lies and slander on your part. And I have no intention of remaining a moment longer under this roof. Allow me to show you the door, sir. If our ghost was there, we gave him an earful. If he was there. Did you gentlemen stage your call? You shouldn't be here. Why not? Please, it might be dangerous. But it was all my idea. You know, Abigail, sometimes it's difficult for me to believe you're a woman. <laughs> I accept that as the sincerest compliment you are capable of, Tom. <laughs> it was so intense. <laughs> Listen, yes. Our ghost bestirs himself. Hamill has just opened. That the wind, I hope. And now the panel has closed. He must be headed for the doorway to the library. But if he is, I'm ready for him. Now. Ah. Hold him. Hold him. I got him. Abigail, get a light. A light. Get a light. Yes. No. 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 What? Great. Well. It's the police commissioner. Madame. And you. You saw this. What? What? What am I doing here? Ah, yes, you were. Uh, you well may ask. And we are asking. You see... I am conducting uh, an official investigation. Indeed, sir. Yes. Uh, there have been allegations of uh, a ghostly presence on these premises. And so, since ghosts are... Uh, yes? Are, uh, ghosts of what? Ghosts are uh, illegal. You could have told us you were on the premises. No, sir, but it was... A confidential investigation. I understand. Have you found the ghost? No, Abigail, nor uh, do I think the commissioner ever will. Will you agree with me, commissioner, that the ghost would seem to have left these premises for good? Uh, yes, monsieur. It, uh... It would seem that way. And, and we'll mention it to no one. Uh, not even to Monsieur Le Comte de Vergennes. Oh, that uh, would be appreciated, Madame. Uh, besides, the library appears to be too drafty a place in which to discuss various matters in the future. I understand, Monsieur. So I don't think that the ghost will be entertained by the conversation of Mr. Adams and his friends anymore. I uh, understand. Monsieur, Madame, good night. Good night. Well, that's the end of our ghost. I think. That noise. Oh. Paddle must still be open. Let's close it. It's the wind roaring through the passageway. John, look. The panel. It's closed. It's not the wind. It's... Now, now, Abigail, oh. I am sure there must be a reasonable explanation. I'm sure there was. But John and Abigail Adams never found it. Within a few months, they received orders from the Congress 
transferred them to England, where John Adams became the first American ambassador to the court of St. James. And if you think he had problems in Paris, when he arrived in London, he really... Re- oh, but uh, that's another story. I'll be back with a sidelight on this one in just a moment. There's something almost, well, uh, I can't say supernatural about Adams and Jefferson. Natural enemies. They were warm friends. They outlived all the other heroes of the revolution. They became the grand old men of the new country of the United States of America. And America became a fusion of their opposing ideas. And if you really want something to think about, they both died on the exact same day, the 4th of July of 1826, on the 50th anniversary of the Republic. Our cast included Michael Wager, Marion Seldes, 